and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a man on trial for his life, and an A-1 citizen eager to testify. But there it was interrupted. And it wasn't until I found a corpse in a bubbling bath, gunplay in the woods, and lots of blackmail, that the real eager witness had a chance to talk. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, as we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Eager Witness. Court of the State of California and for the County of Los Angeles now in session. The Honorable Albert Winston, judge presiding. Everybody rise. It was the case of the people versus the oft-arrested, never convicted, smooth Earl Jernigan, sometimes bookie, charged in the first degree with a month-old killing of a kindly, gray-haired horse trainer named Kurt Harper, who had once almost been my client. It was the afternoon of the fourth day of the trial. And the prosecutor for the state had already built an almost airtight case against the alleged gambler when my turn finally came. To further substantiate the state's claim that Earl Jernigan did willfully and with malice of forethought take the life of the deceased Kurt Harper. Will Mr. Philip Marlowe take the stand? Raise your right hand. Promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, happy God. I do. State your name and occupation. Philip Marlowe, private detective. Next stand. Mr. Marlowe, on the morning of the 30th day of July last, the day on which the late Kurt Harper was murdered, were you hired as a private detective by the said Mr. Harper? I was. And at that time, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper state his reason for hiring you? He did. He wanted me to act as his personal bodyguard on the following day when he planned to drive to San Francisco. Did he say why he needed a personal bodyguard? He did. He told me he was uh, afraid for his life. That he refused the gambler's demand that he drug a certain racehorse a week earlier. That that gambler had threatened to kill him. I see. <laughs> now, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper name that gambler? Yes, he did. Who was it? Earl Jernigan. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Counsel for the defense waves cross-examination, Your Honor. The witness is excused. Didn't make sense. No cross-examination. Because from the opening adjective, the counsel for the defense, a dapper item named Calder, who always appeared in French cuffs, gray gabardine, and a cocky, uninviting smile, had raved, ranted, Your and Honor, practically spit at each witness the state had presented. So the courtroom was left with a tingling impression that Earl Jernigan's attorney had something of a surprise waiting up his legal sleeve. Later, when Calder was on his feet and addressing the jury, that something started out fast. Now that the state has taken the trouble to offer so much circumstantial evidence, so much hearsay, rumor, conjecture, now will I smash all of that with the testimony of one man. One man known to all of you as an outstanding citizen of this city. A prominent real estate broker, an unimpeachable witness eager to testify, Mr. Leonard Gaines. It worked. Landed in each and every lap like a live grenade and exploded all the way around at once. And when the eminent Mr. Gaines, gray at the temples, maybe 45, a neat and expensive midnight blue flannel with giant stick pin to match, took the stand. And in his own meeting of the board, tone of voice told the court that Earl Jernigan had spent the entire day and night of July 30th last with him at his Malibu Beach home. The prosecuting attorney's jaw dropped to his chest and he stared dumb. day or night did Mr. Jernigan ever leave my home. And as for the hour of the murder, 8 o'clock in the evening, we were having dinner. After that, we played gin rummy until... Oh, until midnight. Are you sure of that, Mr. Gaines? The hour of your dinner, I mean. I am positive, Mr. Calder. No, you can't be. You're lying. Quiet, quiet in the court. Order, Miss Harper. Order in the court, please. No, I won't be quiet. I won't anymore. Miss Harper, quiet. Order, order. This court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.
Another scotch and soda, mister? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, wait a minute, baby. I think I'm going to have company. Mr. Marlowe, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm getting... Gail Hopper, yeah, I know. <laughs> what I don't know is why you're not doing 30 days on a rock pile for that rumpus you just kicked up in court. Would you like a soft drink? No, thanks. All right, just one, baby. Jack. The judge said he understood and left me off with a short lecture, which is what I accounted on. Oh. You mean all that fireworks in there was planned, not just spontaneous combustion? That's right. I had a half time. <laughs> Look, Mr. Marlowe, will you work for me? Oh, well, now, look, will baby... Will you help I... me prove that Mr. Leonard Gaines is alive and that Earl Jernigan did kill my father? Well, take it easy, Gail. It's a big mouthful, you know. Mr. I... Marlowe, listen, please. There isn't much time. we got to prove this tonight or never. By noon tomorrow with the outside, the case will go to the jury. Okay, what do you want me to do? Take over where I left off. But first, let's get out of here. All right. And never mind that drink, miss. Where do we start, honey? With Leonard Gaines' ex-wife, Debbie Jansen. Here's a snapshot of her. Mmm. They were divorced about six months ago, Mr. Marlowe, and she wasn't very happy about it. No, huh? Made you figure she was your in? Yes, and I was right. Mr. Marlowe, it took eavesdropping, bribery, second story work, but I found out plenty. I'll bet you did. Like what? Oh, hold it, Gail. Lights red. Like the fact that Debbie and a guy called Eugene Mowry are putting a bite on Gaines for $20,000. Mm. Blackmail, Mr. Marlowe, with the payoff schedule to be made sometime tonight. Right now, she's staying at the Sunland Sulphur Springs Lodge out in the valley. Gaines used to go there once in a while for his arthritis. And the why of the whole business is a letter Gaines once wrote to his ex-wife. No fooling. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, tell me, what's that to do with Jernigan's trial and Gaines being a... Oh, it's green now. I think there's a connection, because yesterday I overheard Debbie tell this Maui something about Gaines' scheduled appearance at the trial today, and... <gasps> oh, oh, Mr. Marlowe! Hey, hey! Those jerk California drivers! <laughs> the man behind the wheel. What about him? That thin-faced, blonde hair. I've seen him before. I know he was trying to hit one of us. Oh, fine. Well, that'll keep things from getting dull, won't it? Then, then you're gonna help me. Well, now look, I. <laughs> uh, who could resist you, baby? Okay, tonight I check in at the lodge at Sunland Sulphur Springs. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> It was 8 o'clock and almost dark when I reached the foothills of the mountain range that separates the San Fernando Valley from L.A. proper and turned off onto a narrow dirt road that ran through a twisting gorge past a moon-faced watchman who asked no questions as he slowly opened a sagging wooden gate faintly labeled Sunland Sulphur Springs where Mother Nature's remedies bubbled from the earth private. <laughs> it was another five minutes along the same dirt road uphill and through thick foliage before I was at a parking space out of my car and walking the last quarter of a mile saw the lodge itself that was spotted with widely separated cottages also sagging. And each tagged casa, and followed by something Spanish and hard to pronounce. Inside the place was cheap porch furniture and occasional threadbare rugs over scarred pine and deserted. Except for a sleepy old guy with thick-lidded eyes and an accordion wrinkled face who was slouched in a heap behind a sign on the reservation desk. The red Maynard Sharp, no less, night manager. When I gave him my name and said that both my rheumatism and I needed a rest, he came too, almost. Uh, Rumi, Mr. Marlowe. Well, let's see. Can let you have most any one of the cottages. Half of them are empty. Things kind of slow this time of year. How slow can you get? You'd be surprised. Uh, how's about uh, Casa Francisco de Leon? Casa Francisco, hmm? Yeah, that'll be fine, Mr. Sharp. All righty, sir. Now, if you'll just sign the register here, I'll get your key. But, uh... You'll As have I to signed my name, I checked the yourself. guest list quickly. And the next second found what I wanted. Night. Deborah Jansen. Oh, folks, and next to that, and in a different hand, her cottage for the night. Yeah. Uh, Casa Rolando de... Uh, Baron Dido. That's close enough. Well, anyway, it was all I needed. I took the key from Mr. Sharp, a misnomer if ever you heard one. Learned the location of my quarters, paid him in advance, and left. Thanks, Outside, I turned to my right, past a large open bath that smelled like rotten eggs and talked to itself like a junior Vesuvius, as more warm sulfur water is equally unpleasant to smell, bubbled from a pipe in the center. Beyond that was the first cottage, another casa I couldn't pronounce, and it stayed like that all the way down the line until I reached the second one that showed light. It was the casa known as Rolando de Barandido. And when I moved closer and around to a window that was screen only, I knew that my client had done her eavesdropping well. Because in the center of the room and putting on her coat was the ex-wife named Debbie. And standing nearby and holding on tight to the cigarette in his hand like it was support. 
There what had to be the boyfriend, you're sure Eugene you know Mowry. You're, doing. You're, you're sure that Gaines will go through with this all right? For the hundredth time, Eugene, yes, I'm positive. Can't you understand? He has to. Besides, $20,000 won't break him. It won't more than bend him a bit. Now, stop worrying. But I can't. Debbie, wh- why must you go alone? Now, why can't I go with you? Eugene, please, we've been over that. I told Leonard that I'd meet him in town at the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 and alone. He agreed to also be alone. Except for the month. Debbie, you do handle things well. Come here, darling. The kiss for your brilliant. Oh, please, Eugene, there isn't time. Oh, what's the matter? Are my kisses losing their flavor at this point? Don't be a fool. Look, it's late, Eugene. It's after nine already. I've got to hurry. Now, go on. Go on, be a good boy and leave now. We shouldn't even be seen together tonight. Well, why not, Debbie? It's not smart. Yeah. Meet me at the tulip room, darling, at 11 as we plan. And you, too. We'll have time and reason to relax. 20,000 bucks worth of reason. <laughs> As Maori oozed toward the door, I slid away from the cottage and into the shadow of a clump of trees nearby. I stayed there as he walked out of sight down the road that led back to the parking space. Then a few minutes later, when Debbie clicked off the light and left, I moved out of hiding and started slowly after her at a safe distance. Until from some place in the night, an ugly, snub-nosed automatic that belonged to someone blonde and thin-faced as a near automobile accident stopped me cold. Where are you going, Jack? For air. I love to walk in the country at night, okay? I wouldn't know, Jack. I'm a city boy myself. But as long as that's what you want, it's Jake with me. As long as it's where it's good and dark. Now, go on. That way. Move. All right, Jack. That's far enough. Hold it. Turn around and face me. Why, so I can watch you pull the trigger? Never mind why. Just turn. Okay, turn it is. That's better. Now, one step closer. One step closer. Hey, what's that? Now, present, my friend, taking wing. <coughs> now, before I beat you in little pieces, let's have it. Who are you? Who do you work for and what do you want with me? Come on, gunman, uh, talk. Okay. Okay, uh, no more. My name's Langley. Work for Earl Jennigan. Oh? Uh, yeah, I've been watching you ever since the trial started. Jennigan didn't want you moving in, man. Which is why you tried to pick me off with a car when I was with Gail Harper this afternoon, huh? Come on! Yeah, 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 yeah that's why. Now, now, what are you going to do with me? For the time being, Buster, leave you as is. Flat on your back, because I've still got to catch up with a lady before she reads a letter! City boy... In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, because of the sharp rise in America's birth rate during the war, we face a very serious educational crisis. Many communities will find that their schools lack sufficient teachers, classrooms, and facilities. Citizens must get together and work for better schools, more teachers. If we want all of our children to have a chance for a good education, we must take action now. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Eager Witness. It was strictly hit and run. I piled Langley into the Manzanita and didn't even wait to see him bounce. Instead, I took off through a gully that was a shortcut to my car because I knew that Jernigan's watchdog had nothing to offer compared with our hot-headed Debbie Jansen who at the moment, no doubt, was well on her way to the Beverly Crest Hotel and the blackmail rendezvous that was a cinch to wind up in the final destruction of the letter. That was my theory. But I dropped it like a hot rock just as I crossed the path to the sulfur pool. Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Somebody screamed! Yeah, he's there by the spring! Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! It was nothing but sulfur fumes and the thick gurgle of the springs until Sharp played his flashlight over the pool. Then we saw. Oh, my gosh. And the water that was turning red from blood oozing around the knife in her back. Look, it's Miss Jansen. Come on, Pop, give me a hand. Let's get her out of there. Come on. Take it easy now. Take it easy. That's it. Debbie. 
Never should have tried it. Tried what? Did? Who was it, Debbie? Who did this? He, he, he got the letter. Who? Who got the letter, Debbie? Debbie. Mario, did she, did she pass out? For good, man. She's dead. Oh, uh, she, she seemed to be mumbling something about a letter. Did you get what it was? Yeah, only part of it. A killer apparently took the letter away from her. Believe me, that's bad. Letter? What's a letter? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, it's probably that pheasant again. Letter? Pheasant? What are you talking about? Oh, I guess I'm just getting jumpy. Hey. Hey, there is somebody. Come on, Pop. Sounds... Sounds like he's over there, Marlo. Yeah, I can hear him. Now, that, that ain't going to do you any good, son. Not in that brush, it ain't. And what's more, I wouldn't go any further if I was you. But, Pop, all he needs is ten seconds and he can destroy that letter for good. Well, just the same, there's a million and one places a killer can hide in there and lay for you, son. Yeah. Yeah, Pop, well, it's the moment it's a stalemate. I'd sure love to find out who that snake in the bush is. You know... I've run a peaceful place up until it's getting to be like one of them there movies. <laughs> Only thing left out is a posse. Yeah, you're so right. Murders in the night, lost letters. It's corny enough without a posse. Yeah, and a uh, mite dangerous, too. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Are you ready to, uh, to... Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'll lead you back to the office. My Jasper, I don't understand this one bit. Miss Jensen is stabbed to death over that letter, and in her dying... Hey. Ma- huh? What is it? Shh. Up ahead there. Wait. Somebody duck behind that big tree. Keep the chair going, man. Walk what? on up the path. Don't let him know we spotted him. Go on, talk, talk. Oh, wait, I... Uh, okay, sure, sure. I was saying, I don't understand. Well, our place here is generally as quiet as a tomb. As the old now, man grimly had led his way up the path, I followed a few feet behind. When he got even with the tree, I turned suddenly, took three fast steps, and grabbed Come here, you. Hang on to him. Hang on to him. Well, well. Mr. Leonard Gaines, the unimpeachable citizen himself, stands still, Gaines. Uh, uh, a gun. What's the idea, Marlowe? Try running and it'll come to you. I suppose you've got a legitimate reason for being here all thought up? I, uh, I'm here because I, I've got a touch of arthritis. I need a treatment and a night's rest. Arthritis isn't all you're going to have if I find what I think I'm going to find in your pockets. Empty him, Buster. I'll I can't empty him. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll empty them. That's better. A sharp, you're a witness, and I demand that you... Now, uh, just a minute, Mr. Gaines. You're in a pretty bad spot to demand anything. There. There's our baby. There's a the letter we've been looking for. Pick it up, Gaines. Pick it up and read it. Now, now see here, my See there, Gaines. Read it while you're able to. Yeah. My dear Debbie... If I didn't know you so well, I'd resent your stupid accusations. Now, look, Mark. Read it. We've already made our property settlement, as you're well aware, and you'll be a long time finding a court that says otherwise. Now you know where you can go, so why not get started as ever Leonard? Oh, fine. This is about as incriminating as a lecture on the family meat bill. Sharp, whose jurisdiction are we under here? Uh, Juris... Uh, why, uh, county sheriff's office. All right, call him. Also, call your man out on the highway and have him lock that main gate. Main gate? Yeah. Say, now, that's a good idea. I'll do it right now. now. Wait a minute. Have you got a gun? Yep. Got a rifle. Been in the family for years. Can you use it? Well, yeah, I reckon I can. Well, where are you going? Out the roundup Langley. And be pushing hard to give his boss's star witness here a big helping hand. I want to be in shape to push back. And remember, Pop, uh. keep your eye on Gaines and out on the phone when you make those calls. I'll see you. The second time that night, I started down the hill and toward the car lot, keeping in the shadows and moving slowly this time. Because it was odds on that Langley had taken everything in. And I knew that he'd try to part my hair with a gun barrel and pull Leonard Gaines out of the jam he was in the very first chance he had. So I stayed off the paths long enough to have both socks full of burrs when it happened. But not what I expected. It was the sharp family blunderbuss that had exploded with a blast like a small howitzer. So also, for the second time, I turned and ran back up the hill, this time to the office. 
I got there just as Maynard climbing hand over hand up a smoking rifle barrel made it to his feet. Maynard! Maynard, what happened? Where's Gaines? Well, I, I, I don't know. I got away, I guess. Well, the shot. What about that? It went up there, through the roof. Oh, fine. Well, gosh, I, I, I didn't suspect a thing. He just said he wanted to smoke. But he didn't happen to have a match, I know. So you hung your rifle over your arm, stuck both hands in your pockets to find one for him, and that's when he took you. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. But how'd you know? Never mind, pup. Well, I, 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 I made a grab for him, though. Uh, ripped his coat about halfway off. Oh, that's great. That's uh, great. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure sorry he got away, Mark. All right, don't worry about it, will you? Can't get far with the gate locked. Well, I, uh, I got bad news there, too. Oh, oh, the gate's locked all right. But uh, there's a back road. There's a back what? Back road. Road, yeah, well, uh, right yeah. It ain't ain't much. It's uh, rough and rocky, but it's passable. And uh, anybody has been up here as often as Mr. Gaines has, it sure know about it. Oh, great. Look, Pop, can't you understand that there was a murder committed here tonight and we had the murderer? Yeah, but no what? buts! <laughs> Fell for the oldest gag in the world. But I was Mario... a sucker to turn him over to you. And will you stop waving that envelope? I just think you ought to see this. All right, what is it? Uh, oh. Where'd you get all that loot? Gaines dropped it when I ripped his cot. Twenty grand, it says here on the wrapper. There's something else written here, too. Casa Rolando de Barandito. It's him. Casa Ron... Pop, that's it. That's the answer. Come on, we got to get down that back road in a hurry. The shop at the wheel of the pickup truck, we bounced over the pair of sometimes parallel ruts studded with stones the size of bowling balls. It was called a back road the better part of two miles before he cut lights and motor and whispered that if Gaines was going to get stuck at all, it was sure to happen in a dry wash just around the next bend. I told him to wait and went ahead on foot. He was right. Gaines was stuck in more ways than one. His car was up to its hubcaps in sand and his wallet up to its stamp compartment at blackmail, conducted by his ex-wife's murderer with the same leather she'd had, a letter. It was Eugene Murray and clenched in his hand was a tattered white envelope, nothing more. I'll make it easy for you. I held my 38 in close my to my side and edged up behind him. Twenty thousand. Now, Maury, uh, I don't have that much. You lie. You're going to pay her that. I don't know. I know because we, we, we worked the deal out together. Only she got greedy. Tried to double-cross me and pull it alone. Uh, so you killed her? Yes, I, I didn't intend to, but when I found out that she tricked me, I, I was furious. <laughs> the first thing that I knew, I, I, I stabbed her. Uh, that's enough of that. Just give me the money. You've nothing to worry about. Now, listen, Bowery, I no, tell you I... you listen. You're in no position to buy. It. It's better than having your $200,000 gambling debt exposed and your reputation ruined, isn't it? Uh, or facing the trigger man, Langley, if you refuse to alibi for Jernigan, isn't it? Or bucking a perjury charge if you do alibi? Oh, no, no, no. You've got yourself in the corner again, so pay off. It's only 20 grand. But I tell you, Bowery, I don't have it. You're lying, lying again. No, he isn't. Oh, don't don't move. move. I don't want to be. Leave your hands where they are. I got the 20 grand right here, and it's pretty well earmarked as blackmail payment already. But just to round things out, Maury, I'll take that envelope you've got there. This? Well, what do you want this for? Funny man. Because it's no doubt postmarked with an hour, a date, and a location. Which, together with Brother Gaines' own handwriting, places him out of town on July 30th. The time he swears he was at his Malibu home all day with Jernigan. Right, Gaines? Uh, smart boy, aren't you, Marlowe? You've still got a chance, Gaines. You'd better gamble with me. You've got nothing to lose now. I'm with you. Stand still, Buster. So help me out. Now, Gaines, go! Oh! Oh, my leg! Were you thinking of going someplace, Mr. Gaines? Uh, no. No, I... I'm not going anyplace, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Well, Gail, the big show's about to start. Court will be in session in a few minutes. I know. And different from yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you did a swell job, Mr. Marlow. Gee, gee, I don't know how to thank you. Save it, baby. If that scale Lady Justice holds in her hands is in better balance today, it was your hunch and old Maynard's blunderbuss did as much to put it there as my running around through the brush at Sulphur Springs. But all I knew was that game was lying. I didn't know it was as complicated as it was. Well, that's because Debbie Jansen was twice as treacherous as we figured. I still don't understand. How did you know that Eugene Maury had killed Debbie? Well, you see, baby, I overheard her tell Maury that she was going to meet Gaines in the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 for the payoff. Uh-huh. But I figured that was a lie strictly for Maury's benefit when Pop gave me the packet of money Gaines had dropped. It had that complicated name of a cabin in the time of the appointment, which was also 10, written on it. Mm. 
So I knew the real meeting was scheduled to take place out there. See? Oh, I see. And she was going to send Maury off to the Beverly Crest while she collected the money at Sulphur Springs and then beat it alone. That's it, honey. You see, if her cabin had been named something simple like uh, Number Four, then Gaines could have remembered it. Instead of that Casa Robino del Bangadoro, <laughs> whatever it was, he had to write down, you see? Well, then things might have been different. Ah, oh, you'd have found a way. After all, you figured out it was the postmark that was important. Only after I'd been slapped in the face by a perfectly harmless letter with no envelope. Had to be the postmark. What else? Isn't that Oh, they're starting. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Morrow. Give them the work. Don't worry, baby. I'm the eager witness today. We're going to knock them dead. Literally. <laughs> they got it coming. I watched Jernigan's face as the preliminaries got underway. The killer was beaten. When the court finally settled down to work and the prosecutor took over, I listened to his deft build-up as he primed the jury and the dramatic ringmaster voice he used when he called... Will Philip Marlowe take the stand, please? Now, Mr. Marlowe, you told us yesterday that you are a private investigator. Now will you tell the court in your own words what happened to you last night? I sat there looking into the cold, baleful eyes of the prosecutor and thought of a paraphrase on that wonderful quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's not enough to ask for justice. One must also hope for mercy. Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Well, it began here in this room yesterday afternoon at about 3.30 when the counsel for defense called a witness, a Mr. Leonard Gaines, to the stand. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joy Terry, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Junius Matthews, Ben Wright, Lou Krugman, Larry Dobkin, and Bud Whittem. The special music is by Richard Orant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... The trail started in Montana with a bum with two names rushing away from his lady love and led fast into L.A. past a southerner from Canada, a worried wool dealer and a chorus girl with a forty-five. When it finally stopped at murder in the park, the tramp was still in a hurry. <laughs> At the first sign of a cold, take Rexall antihistamine. Bottle of 15 tablets, only 39 cents, at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And now listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? What's the matter? You got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I... Hey, now take it easy. Sit down. Oh, no, Sit down. You, you gotta listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call the doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been friend... knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here, here, take this. They're right behind me. I'm gonna call the doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key or west. Get envelope to the. Oh. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no. 
The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in a called homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope, stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Oh, hey, excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute. We want to ask uh, you Later, stop. later. I, I got hey. me a letter. Hey, stop him. Don't let him nail that thing. They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. Uh. Oh. to you. Oh, where are your wings, honey? You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey, I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Is someone dead? Certainly. That guy right over... What guy? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh, Rather than try and convince you, maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, well, that's too bad. I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Oh, well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues' gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh... Well, uh... Oh, Mr. Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Giardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities. In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. My home is in Bogota. No. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Giardo, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Uh, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. The house was my father's. He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. It's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. And that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller set a competition? It looks beautiful with the lights on. There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? 
Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably arriving. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Why don't you leave them on? Your guests would, would love it. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man. Never noticed myself. Well, I have. I like you. Uh, where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician, huh? That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick. Yeah? Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in. And that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong. Nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high-tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Signor Giardo. Well, I must say good night. Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Giardo. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Oh, I'm exhausted. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints? You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Really took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. Now, when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. What? You ever heard of a man named Guillardo, South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Well, nothing. I met him at the party tonight. Not... Hey. <clears throat> hey, what's the racket? You met this guy at a party and, and what? Rick. Rick, what's the matter? Come on, Rick. Who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mr. Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again... Listen carefully. Okay, go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it, all day if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. 
I tried to fight it, but it... But it was like being on a sinking ship. Trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down and I swallowed up in the black water. The next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light. Overhead, like the sun, if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices. Far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait. Give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. Hey, uh, you want a sandwich? As the feeling in my fingers yeah, began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. There's a restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, you're coming out of it, huh? You're trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. The man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. The effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of this stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yeah. And uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Eh, no record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy, I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. Can you make anything out of it? Oh, water, section of land, and here's a, oh, here's a longitude reading, but uh, hmm, no latitude reading. Probably on the other half. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang, then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Giardo. You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Giardo, Senor Giardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Giardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government failed. Yeah, listen to this. Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. 
Perfect. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Artez shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Wall, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him and hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. All eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Now, uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. Well, I'm glad to know you, Diamond. We just got a teletap from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, now that's hard to say. I'll have a check. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought them into Key West. Mm -hmm. They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. You may have died here very recently. And you think this year Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that goal. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the gold's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, well, those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over and have a talk with him. on the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop? Hey, Bishop. Door's locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. yeah. Bishop, you... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, and his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking. It didn't take long. No, Captain. Party hiding my ship ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. Ortiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just ran them and keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. Well, they'll wait till the last minute. Hmm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Not enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Uh, hey, hold it. That them? Ah, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? Well, I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They'll probably be checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take them. Yep. 
We're gonna have to jump. Look out for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop! You! He's going over. Well, my man will pick him, huh? Yeah. I'm going below. Captain, what's the world? Hello, Nancy. How did you find me? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet Key West's chief of police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authorities. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs, so we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Yeah, we're back at the dough. Uh, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. And if I do help? I can't promise a thing, but it will make a difference with the court. Julio's waiting ten miles down the coast. We were to pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hid below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America with a show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. We located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold and his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles. I'm glad it's over with. I see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side. And the chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped our tiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rode and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick. Yeah? We headed right. I don't want to turn around. You're headed all right. Rick, my husband has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio. Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Save the girl. Let him go. My men will pick him up. I got a score to settle. Ortiz, stop. Okay. Well, that, that makes the assassination permanent. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell may currently be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Barton Yarborough, Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Luke Krugman. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, there's something about me that is to trouble what molasses is to flies. I never go around looking for trouble. Trouble goes around looking for me. Now, take that afternoon a few months ago when I walked into the press room of the Hall of Justice and found, among others, Clark Ames, the young city hall reporter for the Chronicle, expounding on his favorite subject, a deep hatred for a man named Fred Curtis, nicknamed the Alibi Master. Ames and the other newspaper men had watched Curtis win acquittals for a dozen different clients and always by the same route, unbreakable alibis. This made the clients very happy and the district attorney very miserable. The Chronicle, a crusading newspaper, had, at the instigation of Clark Ames, been running an anti-Curtis campaign, bordering pretty close on libel. And Curtis, who was sharper than a razor's edge and harder to catch up with than the horizon, hated Ames with a wonderful passion. Curtis had won the last round, and Ames was telling me about it. So Curtis goes to Williams, my managing editor, and threatens a libel suit. Well, I had gone a little overboard, I guess. And Williams had to let me go. Temporary layoff until the heat died down. But now I'm back on the job, Brogue, and I'm solid. And you wait until that phony Curtis sees me sitting here. Wait till he finds out I'm back on the job. Huh. Look, Ames, uh, I've been around this town for a while, and if I'm picking out a guy to buck, it won't be Fred Curtis. Huh? How come you decided to make a career of locking horns with the smartest mouthpiece in the business? How do you expect to win? Oh, don't worry about it, Rogue. I got that phony right where I want him. You wait a couple of days, that's all. Mr. Alibi Master Curtis is going to be nailed to the Chronicle's masthead. Oh, uh, hello, Ames. Did I hear you taking my name in vain? Could be. How uninteresting. What are you doing sitting around in the press room? It's reserved for the working press. Hello, Rogue. How are you? How's your trial going, Curtis? Oh, my client will have dinner at home tonight. Jury just retired. Your client is guilty as the devil, Curtis. What's his alibi this time? Now, you know he couldn't have committed the crime. I've just proved to the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time the murder was committed. How are you getting along on your unemployment insurance, Ames? <laughs> it was a pleasure getting you fired. Too bad it didn't last. Well, I'm back on the job, which means I'm right back on your trail. That's bad news for you, Curtis. Uh, do me a favor, will you, Ames? When you call in the report of the not guilty verdict the jury's about to bring in for my client, tell your stupid managing editor I'm filing a libel action against him the first thing in the morning. Uh, look, uh... Curtis, let's go in the courtroom, will you? I'm going to be there when the jury comes in. Okay, Rogue. Oh, here, Ames, here's ten bucks. Go get a haircut, will you, kid? And have your suit pressed. And don't forget to spell my name correctly when you phone that story in. Here's your ten right in your face, Curtis. I'll see that your name is spelled right. In the biggest type in the shop, right at the top of the page, when you're tried for falsifying evidence. And that's going to happen to you awfully soon, wise guy. Here, here, here. Take it easy, Ames. Oh, let him talk. Let me give you something to kick around in that warped mind of yours, Curtis. You remember a guy named Don Thompson? Your alibi witness for Ed Harris a year ago. I'm sure you remember Thompson. What about him? Would it put a crimp in that famous poise of yours if you knew that Thompson had given the Chronicle a sign and witness statement admitting that he had perjured himself in that alibi statement for Harris? That is preposterous. Is it? Well, you'd be in quite a spot if the Chronicle happened to have a statement like that, wouldn't you, Curtis? A statement that swears that you paid Don Thompson $1,000 for the perjured testimony that kept Ed Harris out of the gas chamber? That'd sure stop your clock, wouldn't it? Have you been drinking, Ames? <laughs> you sound even a little more illogical than usual. Oh, that's right. You like logic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, figure this one out. I've been trying for some time to get convicting evidence on you. You got me fired for trying. The Chronicle was scared of a libel suit. But... All of a sudden, my managing editor, Williams, doesn't seem to be very afraid of your suing the paper. Now, what could be the reason for him giving me my job back? It could be that that statement from Thompson did it, couldn't it? All right, now, sweat it out, Curtis. You'll be seeing your picture in the Chronicle with bars in front of you and a number on your chest in about 48 hours. Not even one of your phony alibis can keep you out of this rap, big shot. I suppose I should be annoyed by such juvenile threats. But I just don't seem to be able to take you seriously, Ames. And the next time I give you my attention, you'll never work on a newspaper again. Coming with me, Rogue? Uh, no, not now, no. I think I'll stay here and use the telephone. You could see and feel the hate that hung in the air in that press room like a cloud of poison gas after Fred Curtis left. 
Clark Ames went all to pieces as soon as we were alone, paced the floor, said he'd talk too much. He was as worried as a man with a three-horse parley and two winners. Pretty soon, though, he, he left, and I used the telephone to call a couple of girls I know. They, uh, <clears throat> they weren't home. I was about to give up and go to dinner by myself when I turned around and saw Betty Callahan standing there behind me, looking like a million dollars, which is a nice figure, which is what she has, if you know what I mean. Betty had a funny little quizzical smile on her face. Hello, Richard. What's the matter? Aren't you having any luck? Well, honey, honey, I was just going to call you. You mean that if Alice isn't home and Liza doesn't answer, I'm next in line. Oh, now, you know better than that. You're always first on my list. Remember, Richard, I was standing here when you were phoning. Sure, sure. I was just, uh, just trying to get a substitute, that's all. Uh-huh. Well, what do you want? The names of some girls and a few phone numbers? Now, don't look at me like that, Betty. The only reason I was calling those other girls was because I couldn't find you. Well, I'll forgive you if you'll take me to dinner and then to the theater to see Tallulah Banker. Oh, my goodness, you have such expensive taste. Oh, really, my dear man. I have something infinitely better. I have two passes for the shelf. Well, good. I've got two passes for a drive in. <laughs> Come on, I want to see if I can walk through that door without eating the jam off of it. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. That's the only reason you have a date with me tonight, Richard. Well, then come on. <laughs> All through that hamburger, I kept dividing my thoughts between how such a little girl could eat so much food and that scene in the press room at the Hall of Justice. I knew Fred Curtis for what he really was. Cold-blooded and completely ruthless. I remember that look in his eyes as he left the press room. A little puzzlement, a little fear... And a great deal of malice. Even if nobody else believed the story Ames told, I was sure that Curtis more than half believed it. And that meant trouble for somebody. Betty and I finished our dinner at last, and in spite of everything she could eat, I still had money enough to pay for it and a cab to the theater. We were just back in our seats after the second act intermission when I heard my name being paged. If Richard Rogue is in the audience, will he please report to the lobby? Mr. Richard Rogue, please report to the lobby. Isn't that a sort of obvious piece of publicity, Richard? Well, how the devil did anybody know I was here? You better go see what's so important. Would you hurry back? I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> I had a bad hunch as I walked up that aisle. Those little chills that always race up and down my spine when I'm walking into trouble were acting up. I didn't know what to expect as I walked out into the lobby. Then I saw Clark Ames standing there. His face was as white as a dove's wing, and his eyes had the strained look that is the aftermath of seeing violent death. Rogue. Yeah, what's the matter, Ames? You look like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something worse, Rogue. You gotta come down to the Chronicle with me. Now get a hold of yourself. You're shaking like a dice cup. What's the matter? Williams, my managing editor, was just killed. Huh? Murdered in this office. Well, that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment, but first, here's Jim Doyle. Romance and soft feminine glamour are back in style. Women are taking off the bandanas they donned in war plants and are again letting their hair reflect moonbeams and stardust. That's why Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is in more demand now than ever, because Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the radiant beauty of your hair. Its fragrant, creamy lather cleanses so thoroughly and rinses out so completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, so no special after-rinse is needed. And best of all... You can wash your hair as often as you like with Fitch's saponified shampoo, and it will never become dry or harsh feeling. That's because this shampoo is made from pure, natural oils that keep your hair ever soft and lustrous. Ask for Fitch's saponified shampoo the next time you're at your beauty shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now we return to Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Well, I was working. 
the publisher of the Chronicle was paying me a grand for putting the long, cold finger on the murder of Williams, the managing editor. I was pretty sure I knew who the murderer was, so it looked like a soft buck. When Ames and I arrived at the Chronicle, homicide was already there. My friendly enemy, Lieutenant Urban, was in charge, as usual. He walked over from where he was ex- examining the remains of the late Mr. Williams. Hey, Sam, help me with this. What are you doing here, Rogue? Now, Urban, you know whenever anything comes along you boys can't handle, they always send for me. Who's paying you? The publisher of this paper. Now, shall we go on with the third degree or shall we get the work of the murder? What do you know about it? More than you do. When was he killed? The medical examiner says he got it about two hours ago. Mm. Stabbed the death of his own copy shares, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the last edition had already gone in. No one else was in the city room when it happened. Found a motive? Well, look at the office. Every file's been emptied. The murderer was looking for something, Rogie. Yeah, I wonder if he found it. Uh, he wouldn't know what it was, would you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I might. I might at that. I heard the Chronicle had a signed confession from Don Thompson. I will go run it tomorrow. Now, what was Thompson's confession? Come on, Rogue, you might as well give me all of it. Well, it seemed Thompson was confessing that he had been paid a, a, quite a sum of money for a job of perjury by Fred Curtis, commonly known as the alibi master. In words of one syllable, so you can understand it, Irvin, Thompson... Uh, Sold the Chronicle information, which would have put Curtis away for about ten years. Curtis, eh? Well, looks like this is going to be a simple case. Could be, yes. Hey, Ames, you know where Williams kept that Thompson confession? It was in the top drawer of this file. It's gone. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I guess that settles that, Urban. Ah, it's too easy. Curtis knows every trick in the book. Hello, Urban. May I come in? Yeah. We were just talking about you, Curtis. You're very welcome. I figured I would be. Why did you kill him, Curtis? You knew you'd be the number one on the suspect parade? Oh, that's not very smart, Rogue. If I had killed him, I would have been much more clever about it. I wasn't within a hundred miles of here when he was killed. Well, that sounds familiar. I, uh, I know I'm wasting my time asking this, Curtis, but, uh, you can prove that alibi, can't you? Of course. I was on my ranch in Antelope Valley when I heard over the radio that Williams had been killed. I suppose my friend Rogue has told you of the fantastic story a drunken reporter named Ames was shouting in the press room at the Hall of Justice today. Yeah, I told him. He knows all about it. Oh, incidentally, uh, Thompson's little composition is missing. The man who killed Williams lifted it. Very convenient for you, wasn't it, Curtis? Convenient? Oh, there never was such a confession. There couldn't have been. Because there wasn't the slightest background of truth for the wild tale Ames told today. Okay, Curtis. We'll let you know what we think of the story after we've checked your alibi. You were on your ranch in Antelope Valley when you heard the report of William's death. Yes. That's about a hundred miles from here, right? Approximately. As soon as I heard the report of the death, I knew I would be a suspect. So I started to town. I stopped in a bar in Palmdale for a drink on the way in and then came directly to the Chronicle office without stopping. My car's at the curb now in front of the building. Ryan, check those alibis. Oh, they'll check, Lieutenant. I'm sure they will. The alibi master would never slip up on his own alibi. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Rogue. Uh Uh-huh, and, uh, I'm sorry to be disappointed, Curtis. You sure you don't know anything about this murder? You you didn't hire someone to do it for you, did you? Of course not. I had nothing against the man. Why should I want to kill him? You can go, Curtis. We'll try to break that alibi or find the boy you hired. Until we do, take it easy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Oh, you can reach me at my office if I can be of any further use to you. Oh, uh, Curtis, are you... Going back toward the Biltmore Theater? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to get back there. I left my car there. And, oh, brother, Betty. Ooh, she'll massacre me. <laughs> I'll give you a lift. Come on, Rogue. This Curtis guy was strictly the deluxe type. His car was a long, sleek, black job, a few sizes smaller than the Queen Mary, but with approximately the same amount of power. We got in... Curtis turned on the ignition, and the gas gauge swept clear across to full. Curtis had said he drove directly from the bar in Palmdale to the Chronicle office without stopping. Uh About 70 miles. Mr. Curtis's carefully planned alibi was not so carefully planned. I was enjoying a short ride with a murderer. He saw my eyes on the gasoline gauge, followed them with his own, and then put his hand in his coat pocket. I knew there was a gun in it. As we drove away from the curb, I picked up a copy of the Chronicle, which had been lying in the seat beside me. I thought perhaps if I could hide my thoughts a little better, I, uh, if I pretended a great nonchalance, with no part of which I felt. 
Curtis was not sure that I'd attach the proper importance to the story the gas gauge told. He, uh, he was being nonchalant, too. I, uh, had a little dough riding on prevaricator. Seventh today. When I came out. Ought to be in that paper. Final results. Where'd you get it? I bought it in Palmdale. Then? Huh. This is the Bulldog edition. Oh. The Bulldog edition is sold only on the streets in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake, huh, Ron? Yes. I'm afraid you've made two of them, Curtis. This paper and that full gas tank. You didn't drive 70 miles in this gas eater without stopping and arrive here with a full tank, did you? You're very observant. Looks like you're cracking my alibi, huh? You killed Williams, didn't you? Yes, I had to. I had to get that confession of Thompson's that would have ruined me. I owe that impetuous reporter a great debt for tipping me off to the Chronicle's plans for crucifying me. You, uh, have any plans for me? Yes. Yes, I think I have it worked out. I'm going to drive you out to the suburbs to a spot I know that's probably deserted by this time. Now, if you were found there, shot. Aren't you overlooking something? If I'm found there, shot, Urban is going to pick you up fast. (laughs) You're going to do better than that, Curtis. Well, if there were signs of a struggle and your wristwatch had been set an hour ahead and smashed to set the time of death, and I was at Lincoln Heights Jail talking to a client at the time the police would figure the murder took place, that might do it, don't you think, Rogue? No. It's no good, Curtis. You're slipping. In the first place, there's always the possibility that a shot would be heard. The district I have in mind is deserted by now, or will be, before I consummate my plan. And Urban is no fool. He'll be awfully suspicious. Might give you the paraffin test on your gun hand. You know, I, I, I don't think you're going to handle the situation that way, Curtis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be kind of hard to handle, even for you. You know, Rogue, it's amazing how fascinating crime, I mean the actual act of committing a crime, can be. Have you ever killed anybody? No. Now look, Curtis, I suppose you know that you're going to get caught. I know nothing of the kind. Successful crime is nothing more than planning, careful planning. Oh, I'll grant you, Rogue, that I'm going to be suspected of your murder. I'll never be convicted for it. I won't take any chances. You're wrong, Curtis. You talk like a sick man. You can't beat the law. If you commit a crime, you're going to pay for it. Let's go down to police headquarters and talk this thing over with Urban. What do you have to win by adding another murder to your score? Mr. Rogue, I love life too much, and I love success too much to let anything stand in the way of my life as I live it. You, you just can't understand that, can you? You think that a man of my background and position must be horrified at the thought of taking the life of another human being. Well, you're wrong, Rogue. I have my own code, my own ethics. You know and I know hundreds of reputable businessmen in this town who spend their days and nights, their lives, grasping for money, for power over the lives of more and more people. (laughs) Well, when one of them wrecks another man's life or his business, it amounts to a victory, which is celebrated by the wrecker at his club that evening. If the victim commits suicide, and he often does, they're sorry. That's all. It's just business. What are you trying to prove, Curtis? I'm explaining why I killed Williams. Why I have to make sure that you and the knowledge you have of my affairs are disposed of. It's a matter of business, Rogue. Now you're crazier than a coach. You know that, Curtis. You're not talking like a rational person. You're going to pay for this crime. Don't move. Put your hands back in your lap. I think you know that I won't hesitate to kill you here on the road if it becomes necessary. Set your watch up an hour. One hour, Mr. Rogue. Okay. You got a new plan? Yeah. We're on the outskirts of town. I'm going to stop the car when I come to an advantageous place. Then I'm going to knock you unconscious with a tire iron, smash your watch, throw you onto the road and run over you. To all appearances, your murder will be the result of a hit-and-run accident. I will have an alibi which will make it impossible for me to have been in the vicinity at the time of the accident. That, I think, is a perfect plan. Ah, uh, it's full of holes. In the first place, Urban will check the tread on your tires, and in the second, he'll never fall for that smash watch trick. You'll never get away with it, Curtis. You've been buying up juries and alibis and evidence for so long that you've forgotten that they're honest people. People who can't be bought. Urban's one of them. He'll stay with you until he gets you for killing me, Curtis. Now, you'll have to come up with a much cleverer scheme than what you've thought of so far. Maybe you're right, Rogue. What are you doing? What I'm going to do now, Mr. Rogue, won't need any alibi. Look out, you fool. Curtis! Curtis! Give me that wheel! Sit back there, Rogue. Get your foot off that accelerator. You're going to hit... Turn that wheel! Give me that wheel, Curtis! Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. Let go of that wheel. Let go or I'll shoot!
continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. Time is a valuable thing these days, and no man wants to spend any more of it than possible on shaving. So you busy men who want to cut down on your shaving time, use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. This swell cream gives you a close, comfortable shave in a hurry. It's an expert blend of three important shaving ingredients. These ingredients enable your razor to fairly sail along without nicking or scraping. The creamy, non-greasy texture of Fitch's No Brush saves you time, too, for it won't clog your razor or the drain. And with all your speed in shaving, you'll find that Fitch's No Brush leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. You men who prefer a lather cream will find Fitch's Brush Cream also gives quick, comfortable shaves. It makes lots of rich lather that stays moist all during the shave, then rinses off easily. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. For shaving speed and shaving ease, switch to Fitch. Now back to Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. When I saw what that madman Curtis was going to do, I knew I had nothing to lose. He had that big, powerful car wide open and heading straight for a stone wall. I tried to grab the wheel and turn it. He fired at me just as we crashed into the wall. I only remembered turning the wheel enough to deflect the shock a little. And then, oh, then I was on cloud number eight. Hugo was there, waiting for me. <laughs> oh, Chief, you had a close call there. Hey, hey, Hugo, where have you been? Well, I had a little trouble with the old PA about cloud eight. And I had to go and see them. Oh. Then I had a tough time getting a reservation back. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, Rogie, with your usual bump on the head. Oh, am I dead? <laughs> Only the good die, young Rogie. Hey, you got company. An old friend of yours is up here. Look, over on cloud nine. See him? Oh, Curtis. He isn't dead either, huh? Oh. I sure thought I was out of a job when I saw you slamming into that wall, Rogie. You ought to take better care of yourself than me. Yeah. Look, I gotta get out of here, you go. How badly am I hurt? Oh, you're okay. That car was built to take it. <laughs> you won't be playing any gin rummy for a while, and you can't collect on your insurance. Give me a little boost over the side, will you, you go? I gotta get downstairs before Curtis does. Sure, Chief. Here you go. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Rogie. Rogie. Uh, hello. Hello, Irvin. Mm, fancy meeting you here. Receiving hospital? Yeah. What have you been up to? What were you trying to do? Kill yourself? No. No, no. Is, uh, is Curtis here? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll ask the questions. What happened? How badly is, uh, Curtis hurt? Leg broken, that's all. He's still unconscious. Look, uh, Urban. He, uh, he killed Williams. He, he, uh, tried to kill me. He admitted it, eh? Yeah, after I caught a couple of flaws in his alibi. You got enough dope on him to make it stick? I don't know. I don't know. It would uh, be my word against his. But I got an idea. An idea that might sense the deal. Mm, every once in a while, you do have a good one. Get the get the chief surgeon over here, will you? I'm going to need his help. Okay. Here, here, here. Lie down there. I, I don't want anything to happen to you, Rogie. I was worried about you. You're such a pest. I'd miss you like the devil. I'll get the doc. <laughs> Outlined my scheme to the chief surgeon. He looked for a minute like he might call in the head of the psychiatric ward. But with Urban's help, I finally got him to agree to play it my way. He bandaged Curtis from head to foot. 
put conspicting straps across his chest and cinched him down like a saddle on an outlaw horse. Then they put him in an oxygen tent and brought him out of shock. Urban pulled out all of the stops as he stood by the side of the hospital bed and talked to the murderer. Like a father. Curtis, can you hear me? Yes. Who is it? Lieutenant Urban. Did the doctor give you the bad news yet? Yeah. Crushed chest. Nothing they can do, I guess. No. You haven't got long to live. Anything you want to tell me? Might as well go with a clear conscience. Did you kill Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. I had to do it. I killed him. I killed him. Well, that was the end of the case. Brilliant piece of work on my part, I, uh, I thought. Going through that little tableau of making Curtis believe uh, he was on his deathbed and had nothing to lose by confessing the murder. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that urban. He's so proud of the fact that he confined his remarks to the truth when he was talking with Curtis. All he said was, you haven't long to live. Remember? Huh? That, uh, that was true enough. Curtis was executed a few months later. Which proves that the theory about perfect crimes is as foolish as a sure way to beat roulette. And, uh, Betty... Well, I, uh, I left her in a theater when I started out on this case. It cost me about, uh, oh, just about what I made, a thousand bucks, to get her over her peeve. So, I broke about even on the deal. Oh, well, you know the old saying. A fool and his money are some party. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about uh, the last time rogues saw prison. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Peter Hanley at Western Maritime and Property. Oh, yeah, Mr. Hanley. I found this message to call you. You're still in town at the Beverly Hilton. Yes, that's right. I thought you'd be back in Hartford by now. When I can enjoy a spot like this on expensive count? What? This California weather, this swimming pool here at the hotel? Uh, wait, no, 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 wait. You say on expense account? Why, sure. Dollar, you cleared up that matter for us. You proved conclusively that Randolph Merrill did not lose his yacht, that the explosion and the sinking were fake. That's right. And incidentally, as you anticipated, the yacht was found in a small Mexican seaport, all ready to be rebuilt and repainted to thoroughly disguise it. Good. Now, Mr. Hanley... Oh, by the way, in spite of his earlier vindictiveness, Merrill has decided to plead guilty and throw himself on the mercy of the court. Has he signed a confession? Uh, well, no. Then I'll bet he changes his tune by the time he goes to trial. 
Oh? Sure, that's an old trick to slow things up, gain time. Are you having Mrs. Merrill held as an accessory? The Merrill has made and signed a statement completely clearing her, so to hold her now would only complicate matters. Hanley, either you haven't yet read my expense account report, no, I or I yet. forgot to or I forgot to tell you what tipped me off that that bear was trying to pull something on us. Oh? What was it, Mr. Dollar? Her jewels that you'd insured for $100,000. Oh, no. Oh, yes, Hanley. That jewelry Mrs. Merrill showed us was fake. Oh, paste. heavens. I, 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 Dollar? You, uh, you still think I ought to go back to Hartford? No, 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 no. Not until you found out where the real jewels are. Uh, can you come down to the office, Mr. Dollar, right away? Sure, if you like. No, 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 no. I'll drive out there to your hotel. Whatever you say. Yes, I'll, I'll drive out there. I'll, I'll be there right away. Scotch and soda be all right? Yeah, uh, what? You uh, suddenly sound as though you could use a drink. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Wayward Diamonds matter. Expense account item one, two dollars and a quarter for drinks in my room at the Beverly Hilton. By the time room service had delivered them, collected the tip and left, Peter Hanley arrived. Yeah. Come in. I make no bones about it, Mr. Dollar. I had completely forgotten about those jewels of Mrs. Merrill's. Yeah, well, I can't say that I blame you. We were so intent on exposing the so-called sinking of that yacht. Exactly. All right, all right. Relax. Here, come on now. Sit down and relax while we map out a plan of action. Thank you. After you hung up, I suddenly remembered that you had mentioned the fact that those jewels were fake to Mrs. Merrill herself. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, well, how did you know that they were fakes, Mr. Dollar? You remember when we sat in their living room out in Westwood while they gave us that cock and bull story about the yacht going down? Yes, yes, I remember. All right. She handed me the jewels to look at. I kind of absent-mindedly dragged one of the so-called diamonds across the glass top of the coffee table and realized it didn't scratch it. Oh. Nor did any of the others, which proved they weren't diamonds at all, but some kind of imitations. Look, why why kid about it, Hanley? Up to that point, they'd had me believing their story about losing that yacht. You weren't alone, Dollar. You weren't alone. But now I suppose we'd better call in the police about that jewelry. Why the police? Well, to, to, to see if they can find the original. Now, look, look. The Merrills are a clever pair. They proved that when they almost got away with a $150,000 claim against you. For a boat that didn't sink after all. Very true, Dollar. Very true. So you can be pretty sure they didn't take the diamonds out of that jewelry and just hand them over to some fence around here. Yes, you're right. Later, I suppose, she figured to lose the fakes, have them stolen, and then claim the insurance. Yeah, probably. If we hadn't nabbed the old man for the yacht fraud. You say she hasn't been held? No. But I see now that we she should have been, in spite of her husband's statement that she was completely innocent of any complicity in the whole scheme. Yeah, yeah I think she should have. You know, it's going to take a lot of money to defend him. And with him in the clink, she's the logical one to raise it. With the diamonds. The real diamonds. Uh-huh, that's my guess. Very well, then. I'll go over to police headquarters right away, charge her with fraud. You know, because of the diamonds themselves, and see that she is held until she tells us where we can recover them. Hadn't you better get evidence of fraud first? Well, the mere fact that she substituted paste for the real diamonds in that jewelry, Dollar. Well, a lot of people do that. Never wear the real stuff in public unless they have a lot of guards around. Well, even no, so... No, no, Hanley. You've got to prove that she's actually got rid of the real ones. Or tries to. You see, I don't think she's had a chance to yet. Why not? No, no, listen. I'm running up a nice fat item for you on my expense account. What kind of an item? Well, so far it only amounts to $100 and $150. What for? Fee to a private detective agency. Somebody to tailor 24 hours a day. In the hope of finding out what she's doing with the genuine stones? More important, to find out how she'll try to dispose of them. But she may have done that some time ago. No, I doubt it. Why? It's only recently they've needed dough. Granted. They had two plans. The phony sinking of their yacht, and later, if that worked, a phony loss of their phony diamonds. But why later? Well, to run them both together would look suspicious. 
What's more, apparently saving the jewels made the yacht accident look legitimate. Yes, I suppose so. Sure. And remember this. She made a big thing of having saved her jewelry. When we still believed the wreck was legitimate. That's right. She made a big point of displaying those phonies to us because she wanted to be sure we'd not only see them, but believe they were the originals. That we'd be witness to the fact she still had them. Yes, I see... But you must recall that you finally recognized them as Pace. Yeah, but like you and I almost forgot about it simply because they had nothing directly to do with the matters at hand. Yeah, and she may think that we have forgotten. I mean, hmm? I doubt it. The point is, now she needs money. He saw to it that she stayed free to raise it. And the diamonds are probably her only way of getting it. Which is why I put a detective on her. Oh, excuse me. Johnny Dollar. Yeah? What? Well, how did... Yeah. Uh, well, look, I'll be right over. What is it, though? Oh, that detective I was talking about has just lost his job. I don't understand. He just came to. Came to? Yeah, at the home of Mrs. Merrill. He... He's in her home? Yes, but she isn't. She's gone. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Although most men by nature don't feel in a combat mood much of the time, there are some who just can't get enough of a good fight, particularly if there's a good sound reason for it. In July 1900, when American fighting men were protecting the rights and liberty of their fellow countrymen during the Boxer Uprising, the battle was a furiously fought affair. Army Private Robert H. von Schlick serving with Company C of the 9th United States Infantry Division, was in the thick of the fracas. Although he had been wounded previously while carrying a wounded comrade to a place of safety, he rejoined his command, which partly occupied an exposed position on a dike. Private von Schlick remained there after his company had been withdrawn and, in spite of the hail of bullets around him, single-handedly continued to fire into the enemy ranks. Oblivious to the fact that he was a conspicuous target, he refused to leave the fight until he was literally shot off his position by the enemy. Private Robert von Schlick earned the Medal of Honor for valiant devotion to duty and added heroic background to the code of conduct of American fighting men. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Diamonds Matter. <laughs> In separate cars, I still had my rental job. Pete Hanley, the insurance man, and I drove out to Westwood, just beyond Beverly Hills. You're sure that detective was here at the Merrill home when he called you? Well, that's what he said. But if he was supposed to simply oh, tail... Oh, come on, come on. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. And I take it you're Sam Bench... Holy smoke, what happened to you? Where's Mrs. Merrill? Well, like I told you on the phone, Mr. Dollar, she's gone. Any idea where? Oh, sir. Hey, you mind if I sit down? I, I don't feel so good. No, no, go ahead. Go on, sit down. All right, you all set? Yeah. Now, what happened? Well, I, I was walking up and down the street. Huh? You know, real casual, so it's not there. I was no You've suspicion. been walking up and down in front of this house all morning? Well, yeah, all morning. But like I say, real casual, so Where not... did you ever learn to be a detective? Some correspondence course? Oh, now, look, Dolly, you shouldn't talk like that. I resent it. Okay, all right, go ahead and resent it. But prowling up and down in front of the house... Well, my brother runs a very good detective Your agency. brother? Yeah, and if he didn't think I was a good operator, okay, if he wouldn't... Okay, all right, what happened? Well, <clears throat> I see her come out the back door. You know, Mr. Merrill? Wow. And I see her go out and she opens up the garage. And where were you? Well, by good luck, I just happened to be in front of the driveway about then. So, real casual, I lean over and I start tying up my shoelace, yeah. you know, so she won't get suspicious of me, you see? Go on, go yeah. on. Well, when she gets in the car and she gives me a look, but that's all. So I figures me being so casual and all, she's not wise to what I'm doing around here, you know? Uh -huh, mm. I bet she wasn't. But that's where you're wrong, Dollar, because somehow she must have figured it out. Even with me being so casual. All right, all right. What happened? Yeah. Well, Dollar, she comes bound out of that garage so fast, I didn't have hardly and time to maybe... And she casually ran you down. So I was casual about it. By the time I picked myself up and I find out I got any busted bones, she's down the street and around the corner. <sighs> what kind of a car was she driving? Uh, 
Gee, no. What was the license number? I don't know. You don't know? Well, then how will happen so fast? Hey, look, whoever assigned you to this job ought I to have I told you, there. my brother. And don't you go say anything about my brother. How did you get into this house? Well, my order said if she made any move, I was to phone you. Well, I figured the nearest phone was in here. How did you get in? Well, I looked around to see when the back windows was open. You have so any I... authority to enter this house? A warrant, maybe? No, but I have my orders to phone you just as soon as I could. And like I said, I figured the nearest phone... You want to see my orders? No, I don't. Well, look, see here. Now, you here. look. You can take those back to your office and shove them in your darling brother's face. Oh, now you, you say it to you Just my don't forget Should've to tell him you're fired. Oh, now look, Dollar. Anybody can make one little mistake. You what? asked me, you made them all. Now, go on. Get out of that chair and get out of here. Oh, now, listen. Oh, and I uh, suppose that car that's parked right across the street, I suppose that's yours. Oh, sure. Oh, no. <laughs> so as if she made a move, I could follow her without wasting no time. Real <laughs> casual, huh? Sure. So she wouldn't know you were following her. Well, of course. All right, go on. Get out. Oh. Now, look, you wasn't really serious about, about what you being said fired. About... You bet I was. And you can tell your brother he and his agency are... Oh, go on. I'll, I'll settle with him later. Look, I, I'm not used to being treated like this. And when I told oh, my brother... Oh, brother. Well, Hanny, it looks like I called in the wrong detective agency. I'm sorry. I'm afraid so. And I suppose you and I have no more right to be in this house than that idiot had. So perhaps we'd better leave. Yeah, sure. But not until you get on the phone and call the Department of Motor Vehicles. Oh? Find out from them the year, make, and model of Mrs. Nancy Merrill's car. Oh, better still, I can, I can call my office. Your office? Well, yes, we uh, issued the insurance on that car. Well, good. Meantime, rather than just sit here and twiddle my thumbs, I'm going to have a look around. Uh, but, Dollar, if our simply being here is illegal... Uh... Will you stop worrying about it and get on that phone? In the bedroom, I found the jewel box, all right, but no sign of the jewels. However, in a desk, I did find a receipt. A receipted bill for some work done by a jeweler in Westwood Village. And the amount of the bill? Yeah. It was more than enough to cover the substituting phonies for the diamonds in that jewelry. So when Hanley got the description of Nancy Merrill's car, I sent him over to West L.A. Police Headquarters to have my pals over there put out an APB on it. Then I hopped into my own car and headed for the jewelry store in Westwood. And you know something? If I'd had any idea of what was waiting for me there, believe me, I'd never have gone alone. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kentucky's state flag is dark blue, with the seal of the Commonwealth encircled by a wreath of goldenrod, the state flower. Within the seal, two friends embrace, their right hands clasped, their left resting on each other's shoulder, their feet on the verge of a precipice, which illustrates the motto beneath them. United we stand, divided we fall. Kentucky's state flag, the flag of the 15th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 26, 1918. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Diamonds Matter. Howard's Hillcrest Jewelry is a small but very exclusive shop on Weyburn Avenue in the Westwood Village section of Los Angeles. There, with the help of a receipt I'd found in Nancy Merrill's desk, I hoped to get on the track of the missing diamonds. I entered the snooty little shop and asked for the owner. I'm sorry, my good man, but Mr. Howard Howard is engaged with one of our important clients. Well, I'm here on rather important business. Well, if you care to leave your name and he wishes to see you, perhaps we shall call you. Ah, oh, Mrs. Smythe, Ken hey, look, Worthy. Buster. How delightful to see I you said... again. And did little hmm. Chichi like the jewel color we selected for him? Chichi. Such a lovely yeah. puppy. You know, he's the favorite of all my doggy friends. Just as you're my favorite. Maybe I'd better look for this Howard myself. <laughs> Mrs. Smythe, Kenworthy, you have no idea how it brightens the day to have you drop in. Oops. Now, wrong department. What can I show you today? Some little trinket for your pussy cat rat. We have some perfectly privacy things and real emeralds. No. No. But you huh? must please. Oh. Nancy. Nancy, my dear. Yes, Howard. My pet, when I removed the genuine diamonds from your various pieces and replaced them with paste. It was with the distinct understanding... I know, that... dear, I know. But now I have to have the real stones put back. Why? As I understood, it was in order to have the fake gem stolen so that you could collect on the insurance. Oh, of course it was, of course. Not so loud, Nancy, please. Howard, 
Our plan to claim that the yacht exploded failed. Randolph is in jail. He didn't involve you in that, I must say, rather foolish plot. Oh, no, but I have to go through the motions of getting him legal help. Excellent, my dear. I hope they keep him in jail. Howard. Randolph has stood in the way of our romance too long, my pet. Now, Howard, please, listen. Because of the yacht, they sent an insurance investigator out here. Investigator? Yes, a Mr. Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Good heavens. You know him? I know about him. I don't like this. And he found that these jewels I have now are paste. Now, you've got to put the original stones back so that when he sees them again, he'll think he was mistaken. Impossible. I've already disposed of them through various connections. Why did you show him those fakes? Well, I, I thought... I thought... You thought wrong, you stupid wench. Oh, how... Don't you see? You may have opened the door to investigation of some of the other favors I've been doing you and other customers to beat your insurance company. Oh, but I didn't think... Oh, of course you didn't. But if Dollar ever connects me with those imitations... Oh, dear. Oh, I know. And if they ever find out that the loss you faked here in the store that you collected so much on... Nancy, if they ever discover that that was faked, I'll go up for life, thanks to you. Oh, no. I could kill you for being such a fool. Oh, but, darling, I didn't know. I didn't realize... You don't know anything. Howard, please. Oh, shut up. Shut up and let me think. Oh, if there's anything, anything I can do... I said shut up! Howard... Will you be quiet? I've got to think this thing out. I knew from the beginning that that stupid trick with the yacht wouldn't work out. I told you so. But it fooled the police and the Coast Guard. How were we to know the insurance company would send that Johnny Dollar out here? Will you stop talking about him? We've got to figure our way out of this mess. Now, who else besides Dollar knows about the phony jewels I made up for you? And no one, Howard. Except my husband, of course. Are you sure? But how could they know? Well, what if your husband talks? Oh, he doesn't dare. Don't you see? He's the one who sent me here to get the stones back. So the dollar can't prove he saw the imitations. And I tell you, I can't get them back. They're probably scattered all over the country by now. But don't you see? Unless we can show them to him, the real ones, I mean, show them to this Johnny Dollar... No, no, then he... no, it's impossible. So, that means only one thing, Nancy. Replacing the fakes with some other genuine stones? No, no, that would take months. No, Nancy, it means that I have to get rid of this man, Dollar. <gasps> that gun! That's right. Uh -huh. You'd... you'd kill him? Yes, Nancy, I'll kill him if I can find him. I'll save you the trouble of looking for me, Howard. What? Dollar! And is that the gun you plan to kill me with? Yes, that's right. And I think I'd better kill you right now. Oh, Howard, darling, please. Oh, put that thing down, Howard. You're not going to shoot with customers out front. My private vault is just outside this back door of my office, Dollar, and it's open. In there, the sound of a shot won't be heard out front. No kidding. No kidding. All right, walk. Out that little door. Walk. Well, you don't really leave me much choice, do you? I'll open it carefully. No tricks. Tricks? With a gun on my back? All right, open the door. Go ahead. Oh, it seems stuck. Maybe you'd better open it. I said no tricks. You open it. Oh, Howard, you don't know what you're doing. You bet I do. Go ahead, Dollar. You may be sorry for this, you know. Will you quit sawing and open it? Whatever you say. Mr. Howard! Mr. Howard! Oh, no. What? Mr. Howard, there are some men here to see you. Nancy, go out there. Tell them I'm not to be disturbed. I'll see them in a few minutes. Oh, please, dear. Go ahead. Go on. Mr. Howard, these men are from the police. The police? Well, bless Peter Hanley. Oh, no, you... Ah! Yes, I do. Ah! Dollar. Dollar, are you all right? Those shots are... Johnny. Hiya, Pete. Huh? Oh, oh, thank heavens. Thank heavens. Yeah. Looks like he's okay, Mr. Hanley. But, Dollar, what under the sun did you do to our friend Howard here? Well, we had a little argument, Sergeant. I'll tell you all about it, and then you can haul him off to the clink. Oh? Hey, listen, if you've got something on Howard Howard, you'll be our friend for life. Sergeant, I've got plenty. Good, because, brother, we've been trying to catch up with him for years. Oh, incidentally, have you got a cell for Mrs. Merrill, too? You bet we have. <laughs> Expense account item two, fifty dollars in legal fees to make a deposition so I won't have to hang around for a trial or two or three. 
And I have a sneaking suspicion that Howard and Merrill and his wife are going to have a long, long time to think things over. Expense account total, including additional mileage on my rental car and the trip back to Hartford, $218 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. There are some men who, after being practically pushed into the service, find their element and commit heroic deeds. Frank Luke was that sort of young man. Soon after the United States entered World War I, Luke was taunted by his patriotic family into joining up. He was commissioned a second lieutenant after completing his flight training with the Signal Corps Air Service, that small beginning of today's mighty Air Force. Lieutenant Luke found it difficult to accept the discipline so necessary in the military. When he got to France and was assigned to the English Spads, his attitude worried his commanding officer. But Luke's performance in the air didn't. In less than two months in aerial combat, he accounted for seven enemy aircraft and earned himself the nickname of Balloon Buster for knocking down 11 or 12 of those menaces to the ground troops, the observation balloons. For his gallant action in the face of great danger and overwhelming odds, he was awarded two Distinguished Service Crosses and the Medal of Honor. Shortly before the end of the war, Lieutenant Frank Luke made his last heroic combat flight. After having just returned from a sizzling air battle, he refueled his spad and took off on an extra duty mission. Pursued by eight enemy planes, he shot down three balloons. He was wounded, and his plane was so badly damaged in the action that he had to make a forced landing in a German cemetery. Perhaps the irony of it struck him at the time. When called upon to surrender, he preferred to open fire with his automatic and fight to the death, though he was only 21 years of age. Lieutenant Frank Luke may have had trouble adjusting to the military life, but when he did, he was a gallant fighter and a credit to his country. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a quiet little fishing pier on the coast of California. Only they call it the Pier of Death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Paula Winslow, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Jack Edwards, Marvin Miller, and Joseph Kearns. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the Great White Way, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Yeah.
In the summer's heat, Broadway is a wasteland, sullen, a place of regret. It's a time when the breeze puffs in from the river, dies suddenly before it touches your dampened cheek. The time when you wake up already exhausted, then pause before your office door and consider arson. Broadway fans itself with a newspaper and finds fascination watching a fat fly crawl against a sweating window. The thing to do is give up, except you've got a job, except you've got to pay the rent, pick up the check, buy the beer, leave the tip, meet the installment. July or not, you've got to make a living, kid. For my part, I would rather have been at Jones Beach, but I wasn't. The apartment was expensive, but something had gone wrong. The upended furniture, the torn drapes, the slick paintings abstracted into crazy angles against the wall, the empty liquor bottles. The place was a mess, which included the man who nagged at me. You've been doing nothing but walk around. Say something to me, so I'll know you're working. I'm working, Mr. Chelsea. I walk around and observe and jot little things down in this little book, and that's what I get paid for. You don't care, do you? What do you care if someone's been killed? Slashed to death. Show me a body and I'll help you weep. If you'd only listen to me, stop walking around and hear what I've got to say. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Chelsea. Something's happened to Celia. Celia Jordan, that's the name, isn't it? Uh, so I'll know. Why don't you pay attention? Look at those spots over there. Blood. I'd say they were blood. Drunks have a habit of getting themselves nicked. I can show you statistics. Something's happened to Celia. Mr. Chelsea, why are you here? What are you doing in this apartment? I asked you that ten minutes ago, and you told me something's happened to Celia. What are you doing here? I I had a date with her tonight. I have one with her almost every night. I see. Is this Miss Jordan's photograph? She's young, about uh, 22, I'd say. But then I'm not very good on guessing ages. For instance, I'd say you were about uh, 53. 51. You see what I mean? I'm not very good about ages. Something's happened. Don't do that again, Mr. Chelsea. Well, something has. And I know why, too. Now I'll listen to you. I've known Celia for three years. Met her at a banquet for my corporation stockholders. She was there because... Well, if you must know... Well, she was in a cake. You met her in a cake, Mr. Chelsea? Well... Well, I pulled the ribbon that was attached to this big cake on the table and... And Celia popped out. That sometimes happens. And it was just about this time that Cliff went away. Cliff? Cliff Moore. A boy that Celia used to know. He was in the Army, went overseas with the occupation forces three years ago. I see. And you took over. Cliff is back now. Celia told me. She said she saw Cliff on the street and he recognized her. But she didn't recognize him. Oh? Why? Why? She found out Cliff was discharged for mental reasons. Something about he was hurt on maneuvers. Oh, I don't know. You're trying to say that this Cliff... That this Cliff has done harm to Celia. That's what I'm trying to say. What about those bloodstains? What do you think I'm doing? It could have been nothing, or it could have been what the man said. A violence, unknown, unshaped, born and nurtured in the December love of the man for a woman. And finally, the violence assuming its pattern and its texture. The room torn in anger. The room empty of the woman. The room stained with blood. And the policeman has to make sure. He calls the men from technical, and they come with their scales and their rules and the sharp little knives. And they scrape and measure and weigh. The blood is human blood. Does it equal death? And that's an equation a policeman has to solve. At the hotel where Cliff Moore lived, they told me he'd checked out. No, he hadn't left a forwarding address. And that meant an all-points bulletin on Cliff Moore and Celia Jordan. And in a few hours, a call from Detective Mugovan. A bartender on 3rd Avenue had recognized a picture of Celia Jordan. Would I care to come down and check? I cared. Hi, Danny. Hello, Mugovan. Which one recognized the picture? Uh, uh, Charlie over there. Hey, Charlie! Sweat's coming up, Detective Mugger. No! Uh, no, Charlie, just you, no more beer. Uh, what'll it be, Detective Mugger? Uh, this is Danny Clover, Charlie, the detective handling the case I was telling you about. Well, Charlie. Well, I'm glad to know you, Danny. Muggerman tells me you recognize Celia Jordan's picture. Was she in here? Well, no, she was that. And not alone. With a man, and well, she might be. She's that pretty. When was that? Oh, yesterday, toward the cool of the evening. In the twilight cocktail hour. 
They sat at that marble top table with the romantic crack in its surface. What time did they leave? Oh, around eight, I'd say. They were hungry, went off to eat. How do you know? The girl was so pretty, I kept hovering around the table. That way, willy-nilly, I was forced to eavesdrop. <laughs> were you forced to hear where they went? Oh, I was indeed. To Matthew's, the steakhouse on 2nd Avenue it was. You waited on this girl? Hmm. I'm certain of it. Of course, yes. Was she with anyone? She was. A young man. A nervous, temperamental type, I'd classify him. Uh, the way he handled his eating tools. Uh, the way he addressed himself to his food. All symptoms of... How long left. were they here? Mm, a modest time. They ate neither too quickly nor too slowly. Uh, rather rare in these times. How long? An hour and a half, an hour and forty minutes. What does it matter, one way or another? They left here around ten o'clock. Mm-hmm, around ten o'clock. Did you... Uh, uh, permit me to anticipate your question, friend. They left by cab. Yellow cab. I picked them up at a steak joint on second. What's the matter? They committed something? Where'd you take them? To the girl's apartment on 63rd. Man tells me to wait. I wait. An hour, an hour and a half, two hours. My meter is a bloom with money. Donnie comes and spoils it all. Alone? All alone. I gather that they, uh... <laughs> what does it matter what I get? Anyway, I take the guy to the address he gives me. Where? The Suffolk Hotel on 71st. He committed something? Come on in. Well, don't stand there. Come on in. You're Cliff Moore? I'll close the door and sit down, will you? We've been looking for you, Cliff. No, that's mighty nice. The police. Oh, I know what. The census taker missed me. You know why we've been looking for you? Gosh. Huh? I don't know you well enough, so I said, gosh. That's because my cigarette just rolled off the table. Step on it, huh? Hmm. Thanks. You were looking for me. Why? Because of Celia Jordan. She's coming back to me on bended knee, and she's roused to the whole police department to find me. <laughs> Good, sweet, four-square Celia. She's missing, Cliff. We found bloodstains in her apartment. That guy, that Paul Chelsea beat her up? Oh, I'll bet she had fun. Cliff, we know you were with Celia last night. We know you took her home, spent some time in her apartment. Swell, swell. What happened between you and her yesterday? Walked and talked and sipped a few and had a steak. You know, boy and girl, hand in hand. The things magazine ads are made of. What happened in her apartment? Oh, sad time. She had a smile all rehearsed to drag out for the occasion. You're a nice boy, Cliff, and we did have fun, but you're broke. The best you can expect is 50 a week if you're your type of successful. Anyway, Cliff, there's the thing. She didn't know how to say it, so she called it the thing. She said it in capital letters. About what? I got a medical discharge from the Army because... Well, because I'm a nervous boy. Post-war Germany made me nervous. Also a live landmine during maneuvers. What else? I don't know. So you can't find Celia, huh? No, we can't. Now, when you find her, let me know if she needs any help. Sure. Don't run away, Cliff. <laughs> you kidding? I sit here and run away all the time. Because I'm a nervous boy. Danny. Nice surprise, huh? Huh? Come on, sit down, Danny, and I will cater what to you. In the name of Iced tea, Danny. Look, boiled hot water, courtesy the lab boys with their Bunsen burners. Cubes of ice, courtesy the deft hand of Gino Tartaglia, per learning from a water cooler. Tea bags, courtesy Mrs. Tartaglia, who is friendly with the friendly jewel tea man. Glasses, courtesy. Uh, Gino, Gino, what have I ever done? Well, you have been considerate and kind to me, Danny. So, this is just a small token of the... <clears throat> well, uh, how do you want it? With or without lemon? With. The best way to fight the heat. Hey, coming up, Danny. Gino? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You want to know, is there any progress in the search for one Celia Jordan vanished? Possibly mayhem committed upon. Possibly deceased. Uh, stop me if I'm wrong. No, no, go ahead. There is no progress. Anything else, Danny? No. No, I guess there's nothing else, Gino. Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, certainly. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. I understand you've been looking for me, Mr. Clover. Who is this? Celia Jordan. 
Are you all right? Not a mark on you, Mr. Clover, anywhere. Come see for yourself. You really should. It leaves your mind. But we thought... Where are you, Miss Jordan? At the Amsterdam Hotel on 34th Street, room 2412. I'll be ready for you. You see... You see, Mr. Clover, I'm perfectly all right. My arms, my legs, my throat. I wore this sunsuit especially for you. So you could see I was all right. All over, I'm all right. Miss Jordan. Except inside. Since I called you, it's funny. Inside, it doesn't feel so good. Inside, it hurts. Here, let me help you. Lie down here. On this couch. Thanks. <laughs> you know something is... Coming. Don't talk. I'll go get a doctor. No. Oh, don't go. It really hurts. It, it hurts bad. Don't go. Help me. <laughs> Even after death touched her, whispered to her, her eyes pleaded with me. And the attitude of her body was a beggar's, contorted in pain, twisted in longing, grotesque with despair. And suddenly she could no longer reject it. And her body eased with the acceptance. It was still because the poison inside her was stilled. Its shadow on her lips, in her eyes. And the violence that had been marked for Celia Jordan was finally hers. Celia Jordan was dead. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, Treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Summer begins its long dying. Broadway reacts to the process about the same as anywhere else, with regret, with a smile and closed eyes. Except on Broadway, there'll be more things to remember, huh, kid? The evenings, just as twilight washed over you, and the lights on the translux flicker like fireflies, and dance out the dance of how it is to be at war in the summertime. And the cool evening breeze from the air-cooled movie, refreshing, till the newsreel sends out a cold wind, and you shiver and move to another place. Because in summer, a man needs something he can hold on to. Something to latch on to, like the murder of that girl there in that hotel. In the sunsuit, poisoned, murdered. Saying the last word she ever said into the ears of a policeman. And the next morning at headquarters, the policeman sits in his office, remembering her words. But finding in them no trace of a murderer's name. And then a door opens, and a voice that's welcome calls you. Danny? And it's Dr. Sinsky. Uh, Danny, this heat, this inferno... Can take the heart out of a man. Well, sit over there by the window, Doctor. Yeah. Pretty girl might walk by and set a cool breeze in motion. <laughs> Dreamer. Yeah, it's no good, huh, Doctor? You can't put it off, huh? No, Danny, that's why I'm here. Yeah. I wish it could be just a chat, but man wishes and death. Ah, the report on Celia Jordan. Poisoned? You were right, Danny, the girl was poisoned. What kind doesn't matter much. What matters is that there was enough to kill her. What pain must have been hers? How long? Poison that takes maybe three hours to act with five minutes of terrible pain at the end. Hmm. Anything else, Doctor? You asked me to examine her for a cut or a wound. Well? There was nothing, Danny. Her skin was not even scratched. Not even the shadow of a bruise. This is important? Yeah, because it might give me her murderer. Uh, excuse me, Doctor.
Mugovan here. Danny, I want you to take a plant, Mugovan. Okay, Danny, where? Who? Suffolk Hotel on 71st. Cliff Moore. 71st Cliff Moore. Got it, Danny. Uh, this Cliff Moore, he murdered the girl? Maybe, but I don't think so. Oh? Uh, this is a day for riddles, huh, Danny? No, Doctor. This is a day where I get a choice. I get two suspects for the price of one. Yes? My name's Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Are you... This is Chelsea. You have the correct house? Yes. Well, then, please come in. Thank you. Mrs. Chelsea, I... Sit down, please. All right. Yes? Uh, I wanted to talk to your husband. Oh, I'm afraid not. He's not home, you know. I stopped at his office. He wasn't there either. No, of course not. Then where is he? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you that. I really don't know where he is. The bother of Don't it, you it... care where he is? Paul? My husband? Oh, no. Mrs. Chelsea... Is I... Paul in trouble? Yes, he is. I'll fix your drink if you'd like. No, don't bother. It's in connection with a murder. Yeah, the one in this morning's paper. Celia Jordan's. You know about her? Well, Paul doesn't think I do, but I know all about her. I'm fortunate. Some women never know why suddenly they come to hate the men they used to love. They blame it on routine, getting old, habit. Huh, so silly. And you hate your husband? Because of Celia Jordan. Has he murdered her? Maybe. Maybe someone else. We'll find out. Oh, I wouldn't suspect anyone else if I were you. That'd be stupid. Paul killed that girl. He told you he did? Well, as much as did that. Oh? Uh-huh. I confess it. I listen in on his telephone conversations. He thinks I eat chocolates when I lie in bed. Oh, I do, but I listen to his conversations on the extensions. Not much fun, but then it's not much effort either. What are you trying to tell me, Mrs. Chelsea? That girl was blackmailing Paul. Oh? $50,000. Was your husband going to pay it? Well, he said he'd meet her at the Amsterdam Hotel, but I know it wasn't to pay the money. Oh, my, of course not. $50,000, Paul? And I guess he did commit murder if what you say is true. Please understand me. I'm plump, I'm a hen I eat chocolate, and I sleep most of the day. I'm a woman in her late 40s, so I would lie. But not to help Paul. Not Paul. Then you're glad your husband might be held for murder. Well, I'll miss him. His not coming home when he usually does might throw my days off. It'll be an effort to get used to it, but on the whole, Mr. Clover... Yes? On the whole, I'm glad about it. Delighted. As a matter of fact, nothing nicer's happened to me in a long time. I'd like that drink, Mr. Clover, wouldn't you? I said no thanks, which gave Mrs. Chelsea reason to pop a fruit-filled nougat in her mouth. She didn't offer me one of those, so I knew my time was up. I left. I checked Mugovan. Cliff Moore hadn't stirred, Mugovan told me. Then to find Mr. Chelsea. Back to his office. Not in. Try his club. I tried his club. Not in. Try the bar around the corner. Not there. So I went to a place without being told. The apartment where I'd first met Mr. Chelsea. Why, I reason, shouldn't Mr. Chelsea be there again? For the sake of sweet old nostalgia. The door was open. I walked in. The place looked better. Neat. Everything in its place. The pictures. Furniture. Mr. Chelsea... I knew it was him because once I'd noticed he was getting bald. The pattern of it was the same. But Mr. Chelsea had been battered, beaten with a fury that demanded a lot of pain get there before death did. The pain had made it. So had death. Now it gave me a new place to go. Here, Danny. Here I am. In the shade of this doorway. Cliff Moore? He's in his room in the hotel. Hasn't stirred from him. What's the matter, Danny? You don't look good. Looks like more than the heat. I just cut myself a murder. Oh? Yeah, Paul Chelsea. Well, that should make you look good. 
Or anyway, better. Those blood stains he showed me in Celia Jordan's room, there were hairs from a cut under his arm. I saw it. I took the bandage off. So why so gloomy? You got him. He staged the whole thing, the room in a shambles, the blood stains on the floor. He figured killing was easier than paying blackmail, but he made a mistake. What's the matter with you, Danny? Of course he did, so why... Not that kind of mistake. He got himself beaten up, beaten to death, but for sure, with an andiron. Cliff Moore? I think so. Go back to headquarters, Muggerman. I won't need you anymore. Come in. Oh, it's you. You came back to me. Isn't that interesting? You are, Cliff. Doctors find me so. Sometimes kids. And women. This I understand. But you? Now that throws me. You interest me because you're a murderer. <laughs> Point of information. Who did I murder? Paul Chelsea. Oh, him. So why did I murder him? A simple motive, an old one. You loved Celia. You beat Chelsea to death with Andiron because he killed your Celia. Every minute I learn new things. This Chelsea, Celia's good companion, he killed her, huh? I think so. A puzzle. Why did this old Mr. Chelsea murder something young and precious and vibrant, like they say, like Celia? You can answer that all by yourself, can't you, Cliff? Yes, I can. He killed her because she was going to blackmail him. <laughs> did you know this whole blackmail thing was all my idea? Because I'm cynical and sick? <laughs> the proud possessor of a medical discharge? Let's go, Cliff. <laughs> Stop it, Cliff. I said, let's go. Let's go on and hit me. There's nothing I could do to you, so hit me. What? Look at my hands, my arms. I can't lift them no more than that. That live mine I told you about, it fixed them like that. I can lift them maybe four inches. That's what makes me so interesting. That's how I can take an andiron and beat a man to death when I can't even open a door or lift a cigarette off the floor without crawling like an alamo. <laughs> you call me a murderer? Oh, thanks, Mr. Clover. Oh, hi. And I was just dozing off, too. What now? May I come in, Mrs. Chelsea? Oh. And I was just dozing off to... I have to talk to you. Oh, please come in. Oh, I hope this won't take too long. Sit down. No, I don't think so. No. What now, Mr. Clover? But Paul. Oh, Paul. He's dead. Oh, you're silly. He's dead, Mrs. Chelsea. He is? Paul? What? Why, you're not kidding me. He really is, isn't he? Uh Uh-huh. Well, you better leave me alone, Mr. Clover. The things I said about him, you won't believe me if I cry. No, I won't. I don't blame you. Please, please go away. Who killed him? You don't know? Who killed Paul? It was this way. Your husband murdered Celia Jordan. I told you that. Because she demanded blackmail. Because she threatened to tell you about what Paul had been doing. And I knew about it all the time. Errors. A comedy of errors. Tragedy. The blackmail was a scheme whipped up between Celia and her boyfriend, Cliff Moore. And this boy, this Cliff, he killed my husband. Why should Cliff do that? Why? Oh, my. You ask me that? A police? Yeah, that's what I asked you. Well, I think it's obvious, don't you? Paul kills his girl, Cliff shoots my husband. I didn't say your husband was shot. Oh. Your husband was beaten to death. Oh. Cliff beat him to death. You know, I've... uh... Come to know your husband working in this case, digging into small corners of his life. He was a man I can understand. I feel sorry for him. Hmm. Tell me how, so I can feel sorry for him, too. I suppose I owe that to Paul. The man is 50. He knows it, realizes that the rest of his life has to be lived. Something he wanted all his life and missed. Something like that passes close to him. He clutches onto it. I don't understand you at all. Something like a beautiful girl, a sympathetic girl. Celia? You can't really blame him now, can you, Mrs. Chelsea? After all, he... He had his own home. He had me. What's wrong with me? Go ahead, tell me. I can take it. What's wrong? You couldn't hold your husband. Why? 
Why couldn't I hold him? Tell me why. Celia Jordan, young, beautiful, warm. Her mind was lithe, young. You filth, you like Paul. Was kind to Paul. Filth. Something he wanted all his life. Filth. Something he didn't have with you. <laughs> That's why you killed him. Beat him and beat him and beat him until he was dead. He died too quickly. He wouldn't even give me that satisfaction. Valve! Let's go, Mrs. Chelsea. When dawn touches Broadway, the shadows linger for one final caress, then leave and take away the night. The cloud drifts, and far away a bird dips and touches it with a wing. The time has come for the day. The people wake. The fury gathers. The crowd funnels into the streets. Walk easy, kid. The shock is on. It's Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. Included in tonight's cast were Irene Tedrow, Joyce McCluskey, Jack Crucian, Earl Ross, Jack Edwards, and Tom Holland. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Ed Barrett at Tri-State Life and Casualty in New York. Oh, hi, Ed. How are you? A little sick at the moment. Oh, what's the matter? I was planning to go up to the fishing lodge of a friend of mine over the weekend, Tommy Hargrave. Oh, but now you've had to call it off, and brother, I know exactly how you feel. Oh, Johnny, I don't think you do. Look, Ed, I'm a fisherman myself, and when something interferes with going... What was that? I just received word that Tommy had a car accident up there. Car rolled over on him. He was killed instantly. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed. Yeah. And company policy being what it is, since he carried 70000 in insurance, double indemnity, since there was an accident involved, well, I got to order the usual investigation. Yeah, sure, I see. Who's the beneficiary? His wife, Mary. They, uh, they get along all right? No, as a matter of fact, that... Now, nah, now, nah, look, Johnny, don't get any crazy ideas. Just go on up there and help her all you can. Oh, sure, sure. Where, Ed? Place is called Shadow Hill, near the little town of Bethel. New York? Yeah, up in Sullivan County. The police department is a man named Skinner. Police? If everything's okay? It was Skinner who called me, that's all. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, Ed, I'm on my way. And uh, if I dig up anything... Johnny, I assure you that everything's all right about this one. Oh, sure, sure. You say that as though you don't believe it. Well, <laughs> just my suspicious mind showing, I guess. Forget it. Hmm. <laughs> Bailey, 
in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, New York, New York. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the gruesome spectacle matter. Expense account item one, 620, fare and incidentals, Hartford to New York. Item two, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I swung north, crossed the George Washington Bridge, then picked up Highway 17 through Goshen with its famous racetrack. Through the summer resort town of Monticello, then past White Lake, a good fishing spot, to the little town of Bethel. It really isn't much more than a crossroads, a couple of filling stations, a general store and post office, and Emmer's Hotel, where I park my bags. Shadow Hill, however, turned out to be a beautiful summer lodge, sitting high above the edge of a nearby private lake. From the highway, I could see the narrow winding road that led from the lodge down to the lake shore. I could also see the spot where a car had apparently taken a corner too quickly, skidded and rolled over to where it lay on its side. Then, shortly after pulling off the highway, I could see something else. Another car, just short of where the accident had occurred. It was half hidden in a clump of trees that bordered the road. And as I slowly pulled up to it, a man suddenly jumped out and leveled an old 30-30 rifle at me. Stop right there. Don't come any closer. Oh, well, now, just a minute, mister. Who are you? What are you doing around here? Stranger, huh? Yeah, I guess you'd call me a stranger, but look... Then maybe you're the stranger I'm looking for. Get out of that car with your hands up over your head. And don't try no funny business. Hey, what is this, a holdup? Do like I tell you to. And be quick about it. Okay, whatever you say. <clears throat> come, come on, come on. I like can't seem to... This door doesn't seem to want to... <sighs> Trying to pull some trick? No. Open that door. Well, it's stuck, I guess. Right here. I'll do it. Now then. I'm sick. Yeah, now I'll take that gun. Oh, no, you won't. <laughs> All right. No. No. All right, up on your feet. No, just a minute, son. Turn around. Go on, go on, turn around. You just look here, son. You just take it easy, old man, and remember I have the gun now. Uh, I'll lock you up for this. That's what I'll do. You what? Yes, sir. Interfering with the law this way. The law? You? That's right. See? Here's my badge. See? Oh, okay then. Look, Mr. Skinner. Uh, you look, you young... Hey, how'd you know my name? You are Mr. Skinner, aren't you? Well, sure I am. Amos Skinner. Only it's Chief Skinner to you, Police Chief Skinner. And if you think you're going to get away with this, you... What's your idea? Oh, Chief, it looks like you're just the man I came to see. Huh? Hey? Only, maybe you'd better have your gun back here. Well, all right. All right, now, you... You just put your hands up and... Say, now, just a doggone minute. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Is that what you said? That's right. The Johnny Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, praise be the bit. Well, I might have known him was someone like you, the way you outsmarted me, banging the car door against me that way. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Chief. Well, Johnny, I'm, I'm real proud to meet you. And believe me, son, I'm, I'm just mighty glad you're here. Oh? Why do you say that? Well, just you look here, Johnny, over the edge of this road. Look, you see it down there, that car? Is that the car in which Mr. Thomas Hargrave was killed? Oh, you know about that. That's what I came here to investigate. Well, all right, then. Now, you listen here to me, Johnny. Well? I'm the one that telephoned down to Mr. Hargrave's insurance company down to New York. So I understood. I did it as a favor to Mary, and his wife, on account of she was so broke up and all. Never did like her, but she was, well, she was pretty upset. Very considerate of you, Chief. And I told the insurance company, just what I told everybody else, that Tommy Hargrave took this turn in the road too fast. Now, you see the turn right above here? Yeah, that's a sharp one. Well, he took this turn too fast and skidded off the side, and the car went over and pinned him underneath it, and that was that. Killed him. Well? 
Well, all right. Now, Johnny, I just come over here from old Doc Walton's. It was down to Doc that I took Tommy's body yesterday just after it happened. And you know why I come back here? Well, I can think of one good reason. Yeah. From something you just told me. Yeah. And from what I can see of the car down there. Yeah, well, it was because I suddenly started thinking how could a man who knows his road so well ever make a mistake of... Hey, what were you going to say? Well, Chief, that car was coming down the road, uh, down from the lodge, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. That means he made a left-hand turn right here. Correct. The car went off the road, fell on its side, and leaned right where you landed, right where you see it, right on top of Tommy Hargrave. That car is a sedan. Yeah, that's right. And even from here, I can see that the windows are all closed, except for the one next to the driver's seat. Correct. But now... Then it's obvious it didn't roll completely over. No, sir. It just flipped over on its side and slid down there. And yet you say that Tommy Hargrave's body was under it. That's right. Under the right side of the car where we practically had to dig it up. Hey? Uh Uh-huh. Can you tell me how he could have fallen under that side of the car, windows closed? Johnny. Yeah. Tommy was murdered. That's what. And the car pushed over on him... To make it look like an accident. And, 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 Johnny, you proved it. A couple of other things we've got to prove, Chief. Hey, Like what? Who murdered him? And why? Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. Rhode Island state flag is white with an anchor first used as a colony symbol in 1647. The motto Hope was added in 1664, when the government was organized under a charter from King Charles II. A circle of 13 gold stars were added for the original 13 colonies. This is the flag of a unique colony and state, which carried out a most noble experiment in freedom. The Royal Charter of 1663 reads, To hold forth a lively experiment, that a most flourishing state may stand and best be maintained with full liberty and religious concernments. Rhode Island state flag, the flag of the 13th state to enter the Union, was adopted on May 19th, 1897. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the gruesome spectacle matter. Chief, tell me this. When and how did you learn of this so-called accident that killed Tommy Hargrave? Well, from Mary, his wife. Oh? It was like this, Johnny. I was sitting down at Bob and Ernie's. And... Who are Bob and Ernie? Well, they run that mobile gas station down the highway you pass on the way. Oh, go on. Well, we were just sitting there talking about the Hamiltonian and all the... Well, what do you mean, the Hamiltonian? Well, you know, the big harness race they run down to Goshen every year. Oh, yeah. Why, it's world famous. Bigger than the Kentucky Derby. Yes, I know. Go on. Well, <clears throat> we was talking about how much money Barney Marston has made taking bets on those races, and we would... Oh, well, Chief. You mean you have a bookie here in Bethel? Well, now, John... And that you, as chief of police, condone such goings-on? Well, now, we... Oh, I'm surprised at you, Chief. Oh, well, it's just a little sort of harmless betting is all. Oh, sure. Every man's entitled to a little... Well, you know how it is. Yeah, I sure do. Now, let's get back to the subject. Uh, Yeah, sure. Well, like I say, we were sitting there talking... And we seen Mary Hargrave driving by on her way back from New York, where she'd gone to do some shopping that day. She wasn't here when it happened? Well, no, sir. She couldn't have been. You're sure? Well, like I told you, she was in New York. Anyhow, she drove on up here, saw what had happened, and drove right back to tell us at the gas station. We came up here, dug Tommy's body out from under, took it down to Doc Walton's office, and that was it. How carefully have you inspected that car down there? Well, that's what I was about to do when you come. All right, come on. Let's take a look at it. Well, sure. Sure. Have you any way of proving Mary Hargrave was actually in New York? Proving? Well, no, I guess not. Hey, look here, Chief. Huh? Keys are still in the ignition. But the ignition's turned off. You're right, Johnny. You're right. This car wasn't rid over the side of the road. It was pushed. Here. Let's see if we can get this door open. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you... 
Ah, let's see if some of this... Yeah, very good. Well, what are you doing with that handful of dust? Well, it's not very professional, but some of this fine dust ought to bring out any fingerprints on the oh. steering wheel, and we'll be... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No prints there, that I can see. Oh, you're right. Chief, this wheel has been carefully wiped off. So whoever did it... Hmm. Huh? What'd you find? Hmm. Did Tommy Hargrave wear glasses, spectacles? Tommy? No, sir. What? Come on, Chief. First thing I want is a look at his body. At Doc Walton, you say? That's right. Then let's go. Well, as a matter of fact, it was I who suggested to Amos, to Chief Skinner, I should say, that he go back and have another look at that car, Mr. Dollar. Just why, Dr. Walton? Uh, because a couple of things about this body made me, well, made me wonder. Look here. The way the clothes are torn, as though he'd had some kind of a struggle. Uh, scratches and contusions on his hands. But more important, here. Yeah? Here at the base of the skull, this mark. Up where that car is, there are no rocks, no stones, no anything that could make a mark like this. And uh, there's another on the face below the eye. You know what that looks like to me, Doctor? Oh, what's that? The mark from the butt of a thirty-eight automatic. And I've seen plenty of them. My Betsy Johnny, you're right. Then that would indicate Hargrave was murdered. And the car pushed over on him to make it look like... Yes, sir. And Johnny and me found a few other things around that car that would indicate the same thing. Doctor, I understand Tommy Hargrave did not wear glasses. No, not that I know of. Of course, Mary, his wife... She wears them? Yes, she does. Can't do without them. What kind? Well, just regular tortoise shell, you know. Something... Something like these, maybe? Well, no. Granted, one lens is smashed and part of the frame is broken, but is this the kind she wore? Yes, Mr. Dollar, I'd say so. Of course, a great many Johnny, people... Johnny, surely you don't think his own wife... They didn't would... get along too well, did they? Well, no, but after all, when any couple's been married 10, 11 also, years... Also, she just happens to be the beneficiary of his sizable insurance policy. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I think we'd better pay a little visit to Mrs. Mary Hargrave... Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Many times in the history of mankind, nations have pooled their forces to exert a greater strength against a common aggressor. This happens not only in the face of a world war, but between such giant holocausts as during the Boxer Uprising in China in 1900. Six nations combine their forces to come to the aid of their citizens. In the thick of the fight... Undaunted by devastating enemy fire, Chief Boson John McCloy of the United States Naval Contingent distinguished himself by meritorious conduct above and beyond the call of duty. For his valorous action, he was awarded his first Medal of Honor. But a man of action doesn't get the job done because of possible awards. It is the spirit of his code of conduct that guides him. John McCloy was guided by that code again and again. In June 1914, during the Mexican campaign, when the government of the United States was put upon once more to aid its persecuted citizens, Chief Boson John McCloy was constantly risking his life. Our landed troops were in danger of being annihilated on the beach at Veracruz when McCloy voluntarily filled three picket launches with riflemen and led them along the seafront to draw the enemy fire. Though badly wounded... He remained at his post and gallantly directed his part of the campaign. For this action, Chief Boson John McCloy was awarded a second Medal of Honor. But he hadn't been concerned with medals. His only concern was conducting himself as a man should, and that is according to the code of the American fighting man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Gruesome Spectacle Matter. The three of us, Dr. Walton, Police Chief Amos Skinner, and I drove up to the lodge outside the little town of Bethel, New York, to see why Mrs. Mary Hargrave had killed her husband, made it look like a car accident. That is, if she did it. And what little evidence we had pointed right straight at her. The obvious fact the car had been pushed over on him after he was killed. The mark showing he'd struggled for his life had been struck with the butt of a pistol. The fact he and his wife hadn't got along too well, that she was his beneficiary. And finally... There were the glasses I'd found in the car. My 
I bet she, I wonder if she found out you were here, Johnny, and has flew the coop. Isn't that her car in the yard? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, it is. All right, then. If she is here, well, sir, I'll arrest her right on the spot. No, no, let me handle this. But, Johnny... I said we... please, let me handle this. Yes. Oh, Dr. Walton and Chief Skinner. That's right. And this here is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Barrett at the insurance company phoned that you'd be here. Won't you come in? Well, Surely. Thank you. I'm sorry to have been so slow in answering the door, but I seem to have mislaid a pair of my glasses. Yeah, that, Johnny. I'm blind as a bat without them. Won't you all sit down? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mary. I've been using an old pair of steel rims with an old prescription, but they look so terrible. I when, to... uh, when did you lose your glasses? Oh, I... I must have mislaid them a couple of days ago. Ha! Now, what do you mean by that, Amos? You know very well what I mean. Um, you... You don't seem terribly upset about your husband's uh, death, Mrs. Hargrave? Why should I, Mr. Dollar? We haven't been exactly getting along for years. All he seemed to care about was his fishing and betting on the horses day after day. Oh? And I never did care about spending every summer up in this stodgy little town with all its stodgy people and... Well, I... Oh, I didn't mean you, Dr. Walton. Oh, yes, thank you. The first thing I'll do when I collect the insurance is sell this place and go back to the city where my friends are. Where there's some excitement and... Mr. Dollar, are those... Are those my glasses you have there? Are they? Well, they, they look like mine. Only what happened to them? Uh, sure, they are hers, Johnny. What? No, no, Dollar. No, I don't think they are. Uh, 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 let me have them, please. Sure. Here. Uh, what's going on here? Johnny, we're just wasting time. No, 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 wait. These can't be hers. I should have realized. Sure, dear. Gentlemen, are. Gentlemen, please. I've seen your glasses, Mary, many times. Uh, very thick at the edges, very thin in the center of the lens. Well, isn't this pair? Well, this lens, the one that's still intact, bears no resemblance to yours at all. Oh. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait. Listen, Mrs. Hargrave. Will, will somebody please tell me what... Listen, will you... You say your husband was always playing the horses. Yes, of course he was. But do you mind telling me what Even that... while he was up here... Yes, all the time. Mr. Dollar, I don't see what you're driving at. I sure don't. Mm, brother, this is probably the wildest touch I've ever had. What? Mrs. Hargrave, did your husband owe a lot of money on his betting? Owe a lot? I should say not. Just the opposite. He's been going around for nearly two weeks boasting about the big killing he made. If he ever collected... Doctor, let me have those glasses. Oh, yes. Look, yes. here, this little mark inside the temple. Oh, that's the mark of the optometrist over in Monticello. Here, you see... The same mark as in mine. Yeah, okay. Now, just sit tight, the three of you. Oh? No, Mr. Dollar. Now, you look here now, Johnny. And Amos, don't try arresting anybody while I'm gone. But it Johnny... might make you look a little foolish when I get back. Back from where, Dollar? I'll see you all later. <sighs> well, that's really just about all there is to this case. Oh, Except, of course, for the fact the optometrist in Monticello had no difficulty at all in matching the glasses I'd found with the prescription of... Yeah, you guessed it. They had belonged to the bookie Chief Skinner had told me about, Barney Marston. Of course, Barney wanted to put up a fight when we faced him with the facts. But then he couldn't seem to explain the various and sundry bruises he was carrying around. Until we reminded him of the fight he'd had with Tommy Hargrave. Yeah, he'd killed him and pushed the car over on top of him. The reason for it all, simple. Tommy had won a cool $25,000 from him. Had threatened to put him out of business if he didn't pay, which he couldn't. So, Barney killed him and tried to fake the accident. And you know something? I have a sneaking suspicion Chief Amos Skinner isn't going to stand for any bookies operating in Bethel, New York from here on out. Oh, and Mary Hargrave found the glasses she'd mislaid. Expense account total, including mileage on the rental car and the trip back to Hartford, $148 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kansas state flag is dark blue, and in the center is the state seal, 
surmounted by a large sunflower, the official state flower. The seal reflects the history of Kansas, the train of ox wagons going west, for most of the great roads passed through Kansas. An Indian is depicted chasing a herd of buffalo, recalling the words of the official state song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. For this truly was the home of the buffalo and Indian. The east is represented by a rising sun, and the promise of future prosperity is indicated by the steamboat on the river and the farmer plowing the field. Above a mountain range are 34 stars, for Kansas was the 34th state admitted to the Union. Over all is the state motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Kansas state flag, the flag of the 34th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 23, 1927. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, well listen... I promise you the most unusual case and some of the most unexpected people you ever... Well, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Junius Matthews, and Joe Kearns. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective Agency. Hey, it's me, hey, Sammy the Spade. Sam, Sam, it's not true, is it? Every word of it. What? That you've been consorting with unsavory characters? Well, uh, she was a savory enough girl, Effie, although a crook. Well, according to the paper, she's practically a murderess, not to mention that she's dancing the Roomba with you. That's a lie. There's a picture of you. Virginia Vale, gangland glamour girl, caught at the Club Eye Barrier... In barefoot Roomba with private eye. It was not a Roomba. It was a bambuco. Da, 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 da. Oh, boom. Sam, not over the phone. Boom, I can't stop it. Boom, 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 boom. Stay where you are. Boom, 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 boom. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the lawless caper. Boom, boom, boom. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye... And William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, have you gotten acquainted with Wild Root Cream Oil yet? Tell you what, mister, if you haven't, even if you don't use any hair tonic at all, why not ask at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or tomorrow for the brand new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil. you like the way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. You never dreamed one hair tonic could do so much. So give it a try. Get the generous new 25-cent bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Don't 
I think I'm getting an act. You've lost your shoes. Ready, sweetheart? Yes, Sam. Uh, no questions? No, Sam. That uh, picture in the paper doesn't mean a thing, Effie. There was nothing between Virginia and me. Just wasn't room. Well, uh, that bambuco, you know, that's the way we dance it. Authentic. Sam, I trouble to call my girlfriend, Edna Mae Schwartz, who is an instructor at Arthur Murray's. Mm -hmm. I quote, The partners exchange graceful nods in the center of the dance floor and then separate. Well, uh... As a senorita provocatively leads the pursuing caballero through a series of gay whirls, turns, and figures. There, you see, provocative. But he never catches her, Sam. Well, I had my shoes off. That gave me the advantage. <sighs> you know best, Sam. Well, that clears that up. Uh, date? Uh, August 29th. I will give the date. Fill it in. That still doesn't explain you're operating on the wrong side of the law. Down, Effie. This goes to John M. Lawless. A known gangster. What else? From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Boom. Thank you, Effie. Subject, uh, Joe Morales. Uh, dear Johnny. You, uh, hired me yesterday morning, but the real start of it was back in 45... Flashback. San Francisco was just recovering from VJ Day, and crime was practically at a standstill. Because your number one competitor in the West Coast mobs had just been rubbed out, and you were on trial for same. Nothing about the trial made any sense. The tea time chatter in the better pool rooms was that you were taking the rap for your worst enemy, Joe Morellis. What made even less sense, the lawyer defending you was Joe's brother. So I wasn't a bit surprised to receive your check for $25, together with an invitation to be in the third row of the courtroom when the jury returned the verdict. I was. The defendant will please rise. <coughs> Step forward, please. <coughs> Have you anything to say why judgment of this court should not be passed upon you? Yeah. It's a bad beef. <coughs> the judgment of this court is that you, John Lawless, for the crime of manslaughter having feloniously run down, run over, and killed with a certain automobile the deceased person named in the indictment, and having subsequently departed the scene in violation of the hit-and-run statute, are hereby sentenced to a term of three to ten years in the state prison of the state of California. You didn't even look at the judge while he was dishing it out. Your eyes were on the man sitting directly in front of me. The man you were supposed to be taking the rap for. The man you had deliberately planted me behind, Joe Morales. I wondered what that meant. When the judge brought down his gavel, I found out. You came up the aisle with a deputy on one arm and your lawyer on the other. He seemed upset about something. I'm sorry, Johnny. I did the best I could. They give me the judge I asked you for. You passed on the jury, you cheap shyster. Okay, just wait till you get my bill. Shut up. Oh, wait a minute, Sheriff. I want to speak to a friend. Hey, okay, Johnny, hurry up. We got a train to catch. Hey, you, Joe. Yeah, Johnny? I got just this to say to you. I'm going up, but I'm not staying, see? If I'm not paroled out in three, I'll break out. Either way, I'll get you, even if it means a murder rap. Oh, now, listen, Johnny. You, you heard know... me, Spade? Yeah, Johnny, I wish I hadn't. Well, Johnny, we've got to go. Okay, okay. Don't forget what I said, Joe. So long, Sam. Good luck, Johnny. Hey, Sally. Yeah, Joe? You hear what he said? I know. He's going to knock me. Hey, this guy's a witness. Name is Spade. Spade, uh, my brother Sally. Salvador Morales. You may have heard of me. Yeah, if I'm ever up in a hit-and-run, remind me not to hire you. <laughs> Come along, Spade, where we can talk quietly. Just over here. My conference room. Look, uh, we got nothing to talk about. Oh, yes, we have. Watch it. I just got this suit press. Yeah, right in here. <laughs> Sally, is it all over? How did it come out? Where were you? In here. I couldn't force myself to stay out there. What did he get? Three to ten. Three to ten? Is that... Oh, I mean, how terrible. How terrible. Best I could do... This is Sam Spade, my dear. This is Virginia Vale, Johnny Lawless's fiancée. The San Quentin widow. Well, uh, how's tricks, Virginia? Why did they bring you here? Maybe they know. He's a witness. Witness? To a threat Johnny made against my brother's life. My own client. <laughs> What's well, funny? Ask your brother. That threat wouldn't even get you a writ against him to keep the peace. What do you mean, Sam? Uh, sweetheart, threats don't mean anything in law unless they're backed up by some action. Even if he told you the when, the where, and the how, it wouldn't be worth anything until you're dead. But it would be worth something then? Sure, it shows premeditation. And if he knew he was overheard, you'd be forced to testify if anything happened to Joe. Hey, he... beautiful, what are you trying to do to me? Oh, I mean, he'd think twice before he tried anything. You'd be safe, Joe. Well, honey, I, uh, I didn't know you cared. About you, I don't. I just wouldn't want Johnny to do anything foolish. Foolish. <laughs> 
End of flashback. That was uh, three years ago. A lot of big news has broken since then, but the only items that interested you in San Quentin were printed on the inside pages of the local press. Item. Virginia Vale, your fiancé, got herself engaged to Joe Morales, your worst enemy. And item. Salvador, Sally Morales, your mouthpiece, had taken over your mob. Which brings us up to yesterday morning. Yeah? Got you, Sam? Who's this? Johnny Lawless, remember me? No. I was hoping you'd say that. Look, Sam, I, I got a job for you. Call Peeper Breen. He may need it bad enough. I've got no contacts in the mobs anymore. This is clean. How clean? A chance to save an innocent man from the gas chamber. Well, There's I... a grand in it for you. Wait till I get a pencil. Now, uh, what was the address? The Alma Arms on Pine Street near Jones. Yeah? Buzz me three times. One long, two short. And make sure there's no one on your tail. Got it. I was not tailed. I found your name on the bell panel, buzzed one long and two short, and the automatic lock clicked me in. You were waiting, one flight up, in the open door of your apartment. You didn't say anything, just made sure it was me, motioned me inside, locked the door, and led me back to a bedroom. Well, there it is, Sam. Mm Mm-hmm. Joe Morales. Dead about three hours, I'd say. Four slugs, chest, shoulder, and head. Looks like amateur work, a professional aims for the belly, or did you mean it to look like an amateur job? Would I be sap enough to drop him in my own apartment? Besides, he's my lawyer's brother, and I might need Sally again. Why did you call me? Well, you heard what I said to Joe after the trial. Who told you that, Virginia? Yeah, but she didn't have to. Didn't I ask you to sit there? Well, that's one thing that worries me. Look, uh, let's go in the other room, huh? I feel like a drink. Well, here's my pitch, Sam. I checked out of San Quentin yesterday morning. I didn't have a mark against me. The warden himself put my case before the parole board. He called me the ideal prisoner. Shall we dance? Okay, Sam, okay. But a man can change a lot in three years. So can a woman. (laughs) Virginia met me at the gate and we drove into the city. We didn't have a thing to say to each other. The way I felt by the time the ride was over, Joe could have her and welcome. I had other plans. Such as? Well, the parole board was getting me a job with a mining firm, a, a surveyor. I took a course up at Quinton. You uh, seriously expect me to swallow this line of guff? Listen, you don't get fat making a living on the mace. Take half of these guys you hear telling the world what wonders they are at puffing boxes, knocking over joints, and the rest of the lays. Yeah, not half of them make three meals a day at it. Then what chance has a guy without a regular racket? And brother, that's me. I'll buy that for now. Let's uh, talk about that dead body. All right. Well, I, uh, I called Joe on the phone this morning, see, and I told him to meet me here at three this afternoon. I wanted to tell him, forget about what I said about how I was going to get him. Not that I wanted to write off that rap I took for him. But if he was scared, he might come gunning for me. I might have to break parole to defend myself. About Virginia, like I told you, we got nothing to talk about. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful while it lasted. So he was due here at three, huh? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was held up. As a matter of fact, I was with my lawyer at the time. Sally? Yeah, I, uh, I phoned the building and uh, told the superintendent to let him, let Joe in, and then I got here about a quarter past four. But I didn't find him till just before six when I called you, Sam. How come? Well, I, I just didn't look in the bedroom. I figured he got uh, tired waiting and left, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Well, look, uh, Johnny, assuming your story is true, and if it isn't, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, who do you think did it? Well, that depends on why. If it was somebody gunning for him, it would depend on what's going in the mob since I've been in Quinton. You know more about that than I do. If it was somebody trying to frame me... What do you mean, trying? Hey, wait a minute. I got a phone homicide. You must have known that when you called me. Yeah, that's why I ripped the wires out. That's cute. That's very cute. That makes you look real good. Look, look, Sam, look. I'm not asking you to do anything extracurricular. Sure, you have to yell, cop. But you'll do it over a pay station downstairs. And by the time anybody can get back up here, that stiff will be out. It will. Well, how's that going to be done? I, uh, I got a friend in the undertaking business. Met him up at Quinton. He just installed a new crematorium. You should have called him first. I did, but I can call him off. You're stir happy. Look, Sam, look, how about it, huh? So the cops come in tonight, tomorrow. Who cares? Not Joe, the weather he'll keep. What do you say, Sam? What do you say? I say you're probably bluffing, that you got no way of getting rid of the stiff, but on the outside chance that you might not be bluffing, I'll swing along with you for a couple of hours. If I don't turn up anything by then, the deal is off. 
Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, but this isn't... Uh, hey! Sorry, I got to do it! No! Oh. I hated to do it, Johnny. You were out of condition and you weren't expecting it. But I wanted you to look like a hospital case. After you went down and out, I transferred my fee from your wallet to mine, examined your wounds, and decided you were good for two hours at St. Agnes Hospital, where I know the head nurse... Uh, incidentally, that reminds me. Uh, uh, so without further delay, I toted you downstairs, threw you into a taxi, and delivered you to the ambulance entrance. That's when I remembered that I had forgotten one thing. I hadn't given you a chance to call off your alleged undertaker friend. I was sure that that part of your story was bluff, but just to make sure, I rushed back to your apartment in less time than it takes the average undertaker to back his hearse out of the garage, I thought. When I got there, I wasn't so sure. The apartment had been tidied up, ashtrays emptied, glasses put away. They'd even vacuumed the rug. The blood-stained bedspread had been removed, and with it, the corpus delecti. I found myself humming an old tune. I ain't got no body. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the lawless caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. In most murder cases, there are too many suspects, too many motives, and too many clues from the very beginning. I'd been on this one three hours, and I succeeded in turning up no suspects, no clues, and the most shameful thing of all, I had lost the body of the victim. I consoled myself with the thought that he was in no condition to tell me anything anyway, but then neither were you, Johnny. You'd uh, checked out of the hospital, no forwarding address. But in a gin mill down in the mission, I found a character with the unlikely name of Porky Grout. Uh, Porky is theoretically alive and will tell all he knows about anybody, which is plenty, for two fingers of rye. I gave him a handful. Uh, uh, easy, easy. Uh. Uh, the, uh, the Joe Morales smiled, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, they dusted this town. They moved to Las Vegas five, six months ago. Uh, how come uh, Joe stayed in San Francisco? Oh, uh, him and his brother had a beef with each other. That's uh, Sally Morales, the lawyer? Yeah, the mouthpiece. No, uh, not, not too close. <laughs> Yeah, what was it all about? Oh, that dame, Virginia Vale. You know, after she and Joe framed Johnny Lawless on that hit-and-run job, well, they disagreed on methods of administration. <coughs> uh, not so close. No. So she and Sally team up. And Sally uses his business connections to pull off this big combine, you see? Yeah, I heard of it, Las yeah. Vegas. Uh, how do I get to Sally? <laughs> Oh, my, my throat's dry. I can't hardly talk. Uh, hey, uh, Riley, put out the bottle. Uh, and bring an airwick. Yeah. 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 That's right. Oop. It's a sloppy. Easy, easy. I'll help you. Uh, great, huh? Great stuff. Uh, not too close. Uh, now, uh, when do you want to get to him? Tonight? Uh, right now. <clears throat> Let me see now. 
The dame don't dance to nothing but rumba music, and she don't drink nothing but imported French champagne. Yeah, but yeah. Furthermore, she don't go nowhere where she don't get her picture taken, and he don't dare take a drink in a place that pays him protection. Well, this being after hours, there's only approximately one place they could be at. That's the Iberia, out on Van Ness. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, and good night, Porky Grout. If your friends won't tell you, I will. Please don't bother to answer. I didn't have any trouble picking out their table. Virginia spotted me at about the same time, grabbed up her purse, muttered an excuse to her escort, and edged around the dance floor. She caught me in the middle of a bambuco, a combination of a rumba, a samba, and guarasha. And whirled me lightly out onto the floor. I followed as best I could. Listen, you shouldn't have come here. Uh, how did I know? Our first dance would be at Don Puco. Oh, you danced divinely. Oh. But you must leave at once. Uh, Sally is insanely jealous, and he's in a especially bad mood tonight. Yeah, so am I. I know why you came. Yeah, you won up on me. Johnny Lawless has been in touch with you, hasn't he? You uh, talked to him since yesterday morning? No. He's bound to get in touch with you. Yeah. I don't know what story he's told you, but don't believe a word of it. He only wants to get you out of the way so he can get back at Joe. Still thinks Joe framed him into San Quentin. Oh, you can stop worrying about Joe. Uh-huh. Sam, what are you... No, he's dead, if that's news to you. I... I think you'd better talk to Sally after all. Come on. Well, just getting the hang of it. Well, my dear. So you've met another old friend. Huh? Hello, Sally. Hello. Sit down, Spade. Thanks. Sally. Huh? Sam says Joe is dead. Joe? Murdered? Yeah. <sighs> well, it was bound to happen. I warned him to get out of town before Johnny Lawless came back. Johnny says he was with you when it happened. <laughs> Juries don't go for alibis, Spade. Best defense I could give him would be that I defend him despite the fact he's accused of killing my own brother. But look here. As his attorney, I have the right to know what he retained you for. To find out who did kill Joe. Yeah? That's what he said. Have you found out? Not yet. Any leads? Not many. Now, what's the difficulty? The corpse. Somebody swiped it. You can't mean that. I can, and I do. Well, that doesn't make sense. Unless Johnny arranged it himself. But he couldn't have. No contacts. Of course, he might have disposed of it without help. It's been done, you know. Not tonight. I'm his alibi there. I don't believe it. You're just telling that story to see how we'll react. That's why I'm telling it, but it's not a story. It's the McCoy. Sally, what can it mean? If Johnny didn't do it, then somebody must have done it to frame him. And if they did that, they wouldn't turn around and get rid of the evidence, would they? What? Well, the whole thing is wild. Wild. You know, uh, there might have been two people who thought they were a team, but one of them was really working against the other and for Johnny. Huh? Well, that's absurd. Isn't it, Sally? Is it, my dear? He's trying to play us off against each other. Don't fall for it, Sally. I had nothing to do with any of it. You've got to believe that. Yes, I was sure of you when Johnny was out of the way. You wanted him out of the way, you admit it. You're still in love with him, aren't you? Aren't you? Alice, you're hurting me. Hurting you? I'll help the DA write his brief. You'll go to Tehachapi for body snatching. Go ahead. I can't wait to get on the stand. The things I'll tell about you, how you let Johnny go up on that hit and run when you knew it was my idea and I was in the car with Joe. You will. Not a jury in the country would blame me for protecting my own brother. Protecting him. You were framing him even then. So you can have me for yourself. Oh, I'll have you in the gas chamber if you keep insisting. Uh, Your own brother. Squeeze out of that one if you can. How I about can. the body? Love of woman surpasses brotherly love. <laughs> I can see the jury now, eating it up. Victim of a designing woman caught in the well, toilet. You... Nuts, nuts. I don't care whether either of you is guilty or both or neither or whatever. If I get that body back tonight, I'll let the cops worry about it. If I don't, I'll confess to everything myself and name all three of you as accomplices. You... All right. All right, Spade. You say your only concern is that body. Right. Right. Here. Here's $500. Another 500 when you find it, huh? that convince you? Well, it helps. Here, my diamonds. Take them all. Now, now, keep the diamonds, Virginia. If Sally gets sent up first, you'll need them for your defense. Think it over, kids. I'm calling the cops right now. Lieutenant Garrett. Uh, Roy, Sam Spade. Where's Dundee? Oh, he's asleep. Sam, I've been trying to reach you. Yeah, but do you know why? Why, sure, about Johnny Lawless. I... Is there something we don't know, Sam? Well, uh, I'll uh, come down and give you a statement. It's about Joe Morales. Well, what about him? 
Well, he got knocked off, and uh, somebody lifted the corpse. Oh, Sam, nobody lifted it. Uh, uh, then who did? We picked it up, Sam, right after you called us. Right after I... Oh, yeah. Yeah, what time was that? Uh, let's see, I got it here. Uh, 20 minutes past six. Lose your watch? That ain't all. What's that, Sam? Call you back. What's up, Sally? Come on. Come out of there. Well, I wasn't planning to spend the night in a phone booth. Why the heater? It's for you, Sam. You must be nuts pulling a gun in a crowded joint like this. <laughs> hey, stop looking at it. Come on. Up those stairs. Now, look, Sally. In there. Easy. Where's your girlfriend? Well, I... I sent her home, Sam. She can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> <laughs> you clown. Oh. <laughs> you were pretty funny, too, when you made that phone call. I didn't believe you'd go through with it. What makes you think I'm interested in that old rap? Johnny's already done the time for it. Joe can't talk, and I don't want to. I don't care what you want. It's what I want. That's what counts. Does it? You want it, Virginia? You got it. Oh, not the point. Just doesn't sound good. Salvador Morella's sweetheart going up on a murder rap. Well, you trimmed it down to manslaughter for Johnny Lawless, and she's enough prettier to rate an acquittal, or are we talking about the same killing? <laughs> you think Virginia killed Joe Morales, don't you? Why? I... Because she seems so anxious to pin it on Johnny Lawless. Well? Well, nothing. Only I've got a score to settle with Johnny Lawless myself, you see. Uh... He uh, left me out in a limb with that body snatch. If I can pin the killing on him, i got a story for the cops. Now, show how smart you are. Shoot me. I fully intend to. Now, look. Well, hold it, Sally. Hello, Johnny. Hey, you can do it yourself, Johnny. I was going to do it for you, but you can I do it yourself. I don't get it. He's trying to pin that murder on you, Johnny. Like you pin that old hit and run on me? But it's not the same, Johnny. Joe's killing is worth life if you're lucky. I never had much luck. Let him have it, Johnny. What have you got to lose? Well, you want me to... No, no, no. Uh, step back, Sally. Okay. He dead? Yeah. You planned it different, didn't you, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, but I might as well get two for the price of one. Yeah, I planned it different, but I don't seem to care anymore. Well, then you won't need that. Huh? Sorry, Johnny. By the way, I'd like to thank you for keeping me in the clear. How come? That phone call you made the homicide using my name. Without that, I might be going up with you. How'd you figure it? Nobody but you had anything to gain by making that body seem to disappear. You knew I wouldn't check with the police till I'd made a try at locating it on my own. You knew I'd use the disappearance as a handle to shake what I could out of Sally and Virginia. You knew they'd suspect each other because I had you alibied for the time of the body snatch, and that would start them screaming accusations at each other. Did they say enough to send them up? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much will stick, but enough. They both admit Joe did that hit-and-run job I was sent up for? He and Virginia together. So she was with him. Three years ago, I wouldn't have wanted to know that. Now it sounds good. <laughs> I didn't think it really sounded good to you. I was sorry to hear it myself, and after all, I'd only danced a bambuco with a mouse. I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, and it's a little late to be making with the advice, but, uh, well, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glade. The what? And, as you say, what chance has a man got without a regular racket? Period. End of report. Well, heavens to Betsy. Oh. How can you be so sympathetic with a girl who did all those terrible things? Oh, I know, F. I know. It's a silly dance, but she looked cute while she was doing it. I don't mean the dance. You mean the best laid plans? What does that mean, Sam? That gang after glade? I'll give you a hint, sweetheart. It's something you never need worry about. No. no. Here's why, men. Here's why Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally without giving it that plastered-down look. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes that loose, ugly dandruff. So if you're not using it now, or if you're not using any hair tonic, get Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter in the new 25-cent Get Acquainted Size bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Terribly confusing. I sensed that somehow. Who was that hit-and-run victim? 
Well, they named that dance after him, uh, George L. Bambuco. I don't believe it. <laughs> Sam, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know... A uh, gang after Glay? Snafu. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> Dialects yet. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dow. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root running. Away. 50,000 Americans die from tuberculosis every year. Yet tuberculosis is curable. The disease can be wiped out. The secret is discover it in its early stages. Why not be sure you and your family don't have tuberculosis by getting a chest x ray right away? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday evening and time for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. From the hints you gave us last week about tonight's story, it sounded like quite a yarn. It took place in Paris, you said. Yes, my boy. It was in that colorful city of bright lights lilting music and beautiful women that Sherlock Holmes and I had one of the oddest adventures that ever happened to us in our long association. I call the case The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Sounds mighty intriguing, Dr. Watson. But first, men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. I've heard many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Kremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed all day long. Every hair in place. Kremel gives hair a rich, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. And how the ladies admire that natural, well-groomed look which Kremel always gives. Yes, Kremel gives your hair a handsome, clean-cut appearance. As if you had just combed it, and it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about your new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm? Well, Mr. Bell, though that singular affair took place in Paris, I suppose the story really began on an October evening in in Baker Street, a long, long time ago. I'd been more than usually busy with my practice that day, and I returned to our lodging shortly after nine, I remember. As I entered the living room, Sherlock Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing gown and working hard over a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Finally, 
he brought a test tube containing a solution over to the table. In his right hand, he held a slip of litmus paper. You come at a crisis, Watson. If this litmus paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. Good Lord Holmes, really? Aha. As I thought, it turns red. And now to send a telegram to Scotland Yard, and I need have no further connection with the case. Well, you didn't tell me that you were working on a new case, Holmes? It was a shoddy little affair, my dear Watson. An orthopedic shoemaker in Wapping became somewhat fretful with his wife. He added poison to her morning pot of tea and was stupid enough to leave a sample of the deadly brew. It was purely a routine matter. Let's forget it. You look tired, old chap. Yes, I'm home. Busy day. I hope you won't be too tired to accompany me to Paris tomorrow. To Paris? Why? This afternoon I received a very rare visitor in these rooms. My brother Mycroft. All is not well at the foreign office. They need our help. Well, what's wrong, Holmes? An international spy ring is at work. In the past few months, important secrets have leaked out. Vital secrets that might bring this country to the verge of war. Good gracious me. Two of the foreign office's brightest young men have committed suicide rather than divulge how they betrayed their trust. Mycroft tells me he has reason to suspect a beautiful and dangerous young lady in Paris who inspired these men, uh, in these men, a loyalty even above patriotism. And they want you to try and trap her, is that it? No, Watson. They want us. Oh, oh us. Yes. Mycroft and I agreed that you would be perfect bait to use in such a trap. Bait? Makes me sound like a piece of cheese. Only metaphorically, Watson. You must agree that your imposing appearance, your open countenance and hearty manner would attract the attention of any female spy. Yes, I see what you mean. Perhaps you're right. In any case, we shall make you doubly desirable by entrusting you with uh, uh, certain invaluable naval secrets. Masterly, Holmes. Masterly. You will entrust me with utterly worthless documents, spread the story that are valuable, and uh, wait for the woman to approach me. Precisely. I shall accompany you as a bodyguard, but uh, leave you largely to your own devices. Yes, Watson, I have high hopes of this trip to Paris. With you as the worm and me as the hook, I think we may snare this evil loveliness. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, you have shown me your credentials and explained your mission. We are aware of this firing. We are on constant watch. But I think you would have done better to have stayed in your own country. We of the Paris police are perfectly capable of handling such an affair ourselves, I assure you. Inspector Rigaud, the fact remains that two foreign office men died here under sinister circumstances. Yeah, nasty business, you know. British officials. Uh, monsieur, I myself investigated the deaths. They were both self-inflicted. We of the Dersian Bureau cannot fathom the mind of a suicide. Quite. But I doubt if the deaths were coincidental. Surely there must be some connecting link between them, Inspector? The only facts I can give you, monsieur, are these. Both men frequented an American-owned gambling casino in Montmartre. The name of it, please? Slater's en room for Dane. The only other fact I can give you is that both the dead men were seen there in the company of a certain Mademoiselle Elvira. Ah, that must be the woman that Mycroft spoke of. Can you describe her, Inspector? Oh, what a woman. Although she is very young, princes have dueled for her favors. Oh, really? At the moment, a high official of the Bank de France lies in a prison cell because he appropriated funds that he lavished on her. She is a femme fatale, messieurs, but she is as elusive as the wind. Well, Watson, our first move is obvious. Tonight we shall visit Slater's gambling casino on the Rue Fontaine and try our luck. <laughs> I say, Holmes, this is all rather exciting, isn't it? Paris at night, and we're on our way to an American gambling casino in the hopes of meeting a beautiful young spy named Elvira. <laughs> Just like a novel. Quite. Incidentally, since the young lady apparently moves in high society, I think it would be wiser if we give you a more impressive name. A uh, fictitious title, perhaps. Well, how about the title I used once before? Sir William Norton. Splendid. Sir William Norton it shall be. And I trust that Sir William remembers the role he is to play? Yes, indeed, Holmes. If I do meet the young lady, I'm to appear very susceptible to her beauty. Uh, not too hard for you, I imagine. And... Uh... And I'm to drop dark hints about the valuable secret that I'm carrying. Precisely, Watson. And uh, if the lady proves as intrigued as I hope she will, you will follow the matter through to its uh, logical conclusion. Well, logical conclusion, Holmes? Yes, I don't quite know how to take that. Ah, here's the casino. Courage, Watson. And good luck. Good evening. I'm Sam Slater. 
You gentlemen haven't been here before. No, Mr. Slater. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and uh, this is Sir William Norton. How, How do you do, do Tommy? Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, the detective? Not here drumming up business, I hope. Oh, no. Just showing Sir William some of the sights of Paris. Fine. Then relax and enjoy yourself, gentlemen. Forget your profession, Mr. Holmes. In Paris at night, there's no crime. <laughs> or if there is, the police are conveniently blind to it. Glad to have you. Oh, nice place, Holmes. I think perhaps I'll take a little flutter at the tables. Uh, pardon, monsieur. Do you wish to speak to me, sir? Uh, yes. I could not help but overhear Slater mention your name. It is a great honor to meet Sherlock Holmes. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am Andre Flandon. How do you do? And this is Sir William Norton. I flatter myself that, uh, myself that perhaps you have heard of me. My poetry has been published in England. Oh, poetry, oh, Lord. Uh, no, Monsieur Flandon, I'm afraid it's escaped me. You have not heard my verses. Etant, etant selon, où seront jamais mon cœur. <laughs> Charming, do you not think? Quite. Though the metaphor seems a little involved, if you don't mind my saying so. What do you think, Sir William? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one language. That's English. <laughs> bon. Then I shall recite a poem of mine in English translation. Oh, must you? I say, Holmes, look at that stunning creature sitting by herself at the Chemin de Fur table. <laughs> She's smiling at me. Oh, you are fortunate, Sir William. That is Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira? Oh, never heard of her. And now, gentlemen, in translation, my poem begins... A grave as the grave, August as August heat. Yes, I think I'll try my luck at the tables over there. I'll see you later, Holmes. Much later, I hope, Sir William. William Norton, is it not? Yes, it is. I can't think how you recognize me, Miss, uh, Madam... Uh... You may call me Elvira. Oh, really? <laughs> Friendly of you? Uh, Elvira? <laughs> how do you know me? Sam Slater told me who you were. He knows that I have a certain penchant for distinguished Englishmen. That's extremely flattering. Perhaps you'd care to join me in a glass of champagne. Oh, yes, I would like that. Let's sit at this table. Monsieur, uh, garçon, garçon. Oui, monsieur. Uh, de champagne. Uh, uh, bon champagne, too. Oui, monsieur. You are here in Paris on business? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I am. Important business. You see, I'm, uh, well, uh, I'm uh, handling an extremely delicate and confidential matter for the British government. Oh, how very impressive. And I suppose you will be too busy to let me show you some of the sides of Paris. Oh, no, I don't think so. All work, no play, you know. I, I'd be very flattered to escort you, madam. Oh, good. <laughs> then if we are to be friends, hmm? I can't go on calling you Sir William. I think I shall call you Willie. Willie, no, 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 thank you, Willie. Go through the champagne. Oh, yes, thank you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I'll open up, will you? Oui, mercy. Well, we must uh, drink a toast, do we? May I propose one uh, to Willie, the man of mystery? Oh, thank you, my dear. And I shall drink to uh, Elvira and to our better acquaintance. Mm. Good night, Willie. I shall see you tomorrow. Yes, rather. Uh, how about how about breakfast? Oh, it's nearly breakfast time now. Oh, is it really? How about lunch? Yes, yes, of course, my dear. But your important mission for the British government. Uh, when will you attend to that? Well, in a day or two, Elvira. Uh, good night, my dear. Come here, Willie. Closer. Good night. What? You, you kiss me, you little darling. Think so, Flair. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson. Splendidly. Keep it up. Oh, she's a sweet little thing, Holmes. It's hard to believe that she's a spy. I told her that I was here on a secret and confidential mission. I even told her that I was carrying important naval plans. She didn't seem particularly interested. Of course not. She's much too clever to use the clumsy approach. She'll work slowly. She'll wait until she thinks she's got you completely captivated before she goes after that secret. Oh, then I'm just to carry on the way I did last night. Yes, old chap. Oh, good. Wine her, dine her, send her flowers, buy her jewelry. Make her think you're head over heels in love with her. I suspect that you won't find the job too unpleasant. Oh, I'm sure I shall. <laughs> Three days now, Elvira. 
Well, you've been showing me Paris, but this is, this is the first time I've actually been in your flat. You like it, really? Yes, very much. I thought it would be much quieter here. At dinner, you said you were going to explain some of your important business to me. You were going to show me what a secret treaty looks like. Yes, I know I said that, but... Uh... Well, a pretty girl like you wouldn't be interested in, in such matters. Oh, but I would. You have the treaty with you? Yes, I have. Then please let me see it. Oh, please, Willie. Oh, I can't go through this masquerade any longer. Masquerade? What do you mean? Well, I've, I've grown really fond of you in these last few days, Elvira. I can't let you walk into a trap. Trap? What are you talking about, Willie? I'm not Willie. I'm... I'm not Sir William Norton. My name's Watson. Dr. John H. Watson. My closest friend is the detective Sherlock Holmes. We came to Paris to try and trap you. Me? Oh, my dear girl, you're suspected of being mixed up in a spy ring. What? Well, that's why I pose as a, an important embassy from England. From England. Trap! Are you doddering old fool? Oh, no, don't say that, don't say that. I'll teach you about trap. Elvira, put down that revolver. No, I'm going to. I'm oh, going to... you're going to drop it, my dear. I can't do it. I'm just a stupid, weak female after all. I've grown fond of you, too. The bumbling old walrus. Oh, there, 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 there. You remind me of my father. He was such a sentimental old fool. Like you. Just as sweet. Oh, there, you're young. I know you don't really want to stay mixed up with a bunch of criminals. No, no, no. Now, now, look, look here. You tell Sherlock Holmes and me what you know about this firing, and we'll see that no harm comes to you, my dear. I have wanted to get out of it for months. It was rather glamorous and exciting at first, and they paid me well. But I hate them now. And yet when I told them I wanted to get away, they threatened me. Oh, we'll take care of you. Just tell us who's at the head of the organization. That I don't know. But I can tell you a lot about some of the members. That's splendid. And slip on your coat and a funny little bonnet and, and we'll go over and talk to Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and have him see me looking like this. Oh, very I in red. Oh, no. You go and bring him here. By the time you get back, I'll be more presentable. All right, sir. Uh, I'll go and get him at once. Watson, I'm occasionally astonished at the many facets to your character. Oh, thank you very much, Holmes. It's nice of you to say so. Your personal charm has apparently convinced a dangerous woman that crime does not pay. It's remarkable, if it's true. What do you mean, if it's true? Surely it must have occurred... Even to a man burning with the zeal of one who has snatched a convert from the fiery flames, that this could be a trap for us to walk into. The delay, while the young lady makes herself presentable, would provide an excellent opportunity for her to summon her associates. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're utterly cynical. I don't believe you have a heart. Possibly not, but I do have a head. Well, here's her place now. Stop, Kebby, stop. Arete. Oh. I'll bet you a hundred pounds to a shilling that she's still waiting for us and alone. Long odds, Watson. Very long odds. Look, look, look. The concierge is sweeping up the steps. He'll be able to tell us if anyone's been here since I left. True. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Vous parlez anglais? Uh, yes, monsieur. Splendid fellow. Paul is anglais. Uh, look here, we were, we were calling on Mademoiselle Elvira. Has anyone been to see her in the last half an hour? Oui, monsieur. A man. She left with him only five minutes ago. Though I do not think she wished to go. You mean that she was taken away by force? Not exactly, monsieur. But I could swear on the sacre coeur that the man who accompanied her was holding a pistol to her back. You don't mean it. I uh, think she has been, uh, how you say, kidnapped. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. 
Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. And always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, once again you left me on the edge of my chair. So when you went back to the girl's flat, she'd been kidnapped, hmm? What did you do next? Well, fortunately, the concierge was able to give us a good description of the cab driver. And with the aid of Inspector Rigo, we were able to find the man and question him. He'd driven the couple, he told us, to a vala pash den in the alleys of Montmartre. Uh, a club known as the Scarlet Worm. Holmes and I, accompanied by the French inspector, lost no time in taking a cab to the place. Monsieur, I should not permit you to visit Le Ver Eterlat, the Scarlet Worm, as you would say, without my protection. It is a cesspool of the underworld. Men have been known to enter there and make their exit by back door, head first into the sewer. Oh, Lord, they've taken that poor little girl there. Uh... Inspector Rigo. As I said, Mademoiselle Elvira told my friend that she does not know who is at the head of this organization. Have you any suspicions? Yes, but little else, my friend. One thing we are sure of, this man of mystery, the brain behind these criminals, is not French. Probably he is English. An Englishman or so sure not. Ah, Le Ver et Carlat is waiting for us. Be on the alert, my friends, and keep close to me. Oh, you there's Sam Slater, the man who, who owns the casino we went to the other night. Yes, and he seems to be involved in a violent argument. Yeah, a rattle like this? You don't know what you're doing, sir, but... What's up? You know what you in here? Stay in your own golden fish time. Who's the man that Slater's arguing with, Inspector? Well, that is Chabert, the owner of this establishment. Oh, Slater's leaving. I wonder what he was doing in a place like this. Uh, come, we'll speak to Chabert and find out. Et bonsoir, Chabert. Uh, bonsoir. Ah, et uh, mon heure with a visit from the inspector, the detector. Que voulez-vous? Since when does a visitor from the deuxième bureau have to explain his business, Chabert? Tell me, why was Slater here? And why did you argue? Bah, for sure. He comes here to try and hire uh, some of my apache. He has trouble collecting his gambling debts. I spit on him and his like class victims. Let that kind stick to themselves. And not bother the bed. Let's sit at the table, shall we? We might as well be as unobtrusive as possible. I shall rejoin you in a moment, monsieur. I wish to make some investigation. Watson, you seem to be a positive magnet towards the fair sex. Look at this uh, young lady heading for you. Red hair, belly, and a painted face. Not my type, I'm afraid. Bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, run along, young lady, and don't sit there. Oh, no, no, Watson. Where's your chivalry? Please sit down, won't you? Merci, monsieur. Pretend you don't recognize yes, me. I don't. Never saw you before in my life. Whereas I've been keeping silence, Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira! The wig is excellent and the use of makeup superb, Mademoiselle. But I recognized you at once by the confirmation of your earlobes. Elvira, why are you disguised? Why'd they bring you here? Shh. I cannot speak now. You must get me away at once. Be careful. I'm being watched. We can't leave by the front way. But I know a back staircase that leads from the cellar. But there may be trouble. You take her, Watson. I'll guard the retreat. When the music starts again, dance with her. When you get to the back of the hall, slip out. I'll join you at the hotel. Oh, Lord. Look, 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 Holmes. Look who's coming to our table. It's that ghastly poet fellow we met at the casino. Andre Flandon. Pay no attention. I'll take care of him. Ah, once again, I meet my friend Sherlock Holmes. I have a new poem that I've composed in your especial honor. Dance, Watson, and good luck. All right, you are, Holmes. Come along, my dear. Come along. Your friends leave. Au revoir. Now, I shall tell you my poem. It begins... Well, Vera, my dear, I can't tell you how relieved I am to find you all right. Don't look so serious. Pretend that I'm some girl that you don't know. Laugh. 
That's it. That's better. Now, dance me toward that door in the corner. There we are. Now, let's slip through it. I don't see a thing. Follow me. There are stone stairs here. Careful. Where do these lead? To an alley. Oh, careful. The stairs turn here. Look up, there's, there's a light coming up the steps towards us. Shove it! You did not think you could live so easily, did you, Elvira? Uh, I've been waiting for you. Look out, he's got an eye! But he can't see without his lantern. Where's that path? Uh, run, Elvira, I'll follow you. Run, run, run. You will follow me. Oh, won't I? How'd you like that, you filthy swine? Watson, are you all right? Yes, Holmes, I'm quite all right. Then run, old chap. I'll take care of this end. See that the girl is safe. Well, now that we're all safely back at the hotel, I can tell you, Holmes, that I hated leaving you in that filthy den. Inspector Rigo had a revolver. It's more efficient than a knife, eh, Inspector? It was a near thing, Monsieur Holmes. You fought bravely. And so did your recumbent friend on the sofa there. Andre Flandon, the poet. I wondered why you brought him back here. For a poet, he uses his fists with surprising skill. He must be hurt. He seems to be unconscious. I think he's suffering from the effects of a trifle too much absence. I hadn't the heart to leave him. Ah, there you are, Mademoiselle Elvira. You're feeling no ill effects, I hope? No, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. Then now that we're all assembled, supposing you tell us your story. Who kidnapped you tonight? It was one of Chavez's men. They made me disguise myself and swear never to see either of you again, on pain of death. Instead of which, we came to see you. We knew that Travers was connected with the spies. Now he is safely under lock and key. But we still don't know who is at the head of this organization. Can you give us any clues, mademoiselle? I, I think that the man you want was waiting in the cab that took me to the Scarlet Worm. But he was masked and he never spoke. Can't you recall anything that might give us a clue? Oh, one incident, if it means anything... Chavez's man said to him, We go to the Scarlet Worm, eh? That is good. You also, you make worms, no? And then he laughed. He said this in French, of course? Yes, yes, he did. Then the case is solved. I'm an idiot. I should have spotted it sooner. The man you want, Inspector, is lying asleep on the... Look out! He's not asleep. Watson, he's got a revolver. Oh, no, you don't. Oh! He's gone to sleep again. Really, Watson, you're in splendid form tonight. But, Monsieur Holmes... Why do you say that man is the culprit? You yourself gave me the clue, Inspector, when you told me that the criminal was an Englishman posing as a Frenchman. But you only met the fellow on two occasions, and then not for more than a few minutes. It was long enough to realize that Flandre was really an Englishman. The first time we met him, he quoted a poem that he said was translated from the French. The translation was, Grave as the grave, August as August heat. The poem could not have been translated from the French because both of those puns are possible only in the English language. But how did my repeating the conversation in the cab give you a clue, Mr. Holmes? Because it was another pun. In French, the word for worms and for verses is the same. There, spelt V-R-S. I see it now. When the man in the cab said, you make worms, he also meant, you make verses. Precisely, Watson. And thereby pointed directly at the poet there. With André Flandin, or whatever his real name is, in prison, I'm sure Mycroft will have no more trouble with his spy ring. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair, but just a word of caution... There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And that's why I advise you to always use Cremel shampoo. How right you are, Joe. Lovely Powers models were among the very first to discover the amazing, beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, after a Cremel shampoo, your hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy today that has a beneficial built-in oil base, 
which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel Shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week, what shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of how Sherlock Holmes, by solving an ancient musical cipher, managed to save the estates and restore the fortunes of the Earl of Moultrie. I call it The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey. Tonight's new is Sherlock Holmes' adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Naval Treaty. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. Sherlock Holmes' series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Moultrie Abbey. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Portrait of Rocky. It was the stifling sort of night when you expect people to stay at home and out of trouble. Later on, it got a lot hotter. I wasn't exactly done in oil, but I was plenty burned up. The night air out of the desert was thick and depressing, and the windmill fan and the tambourine made it even worse. At 11 o'clock, I sent the help home, figuring to close up early. The only trouble was a couple of customers. One was over in a corner nursing some cognac, a big shaggy specimen, dark eyes, gray showing in his beard. Might have been American once. The other one was easier. He hung on to the bar and let you know about himself. Ah. ah, tell you right to Monty I've signed it to his nose. Oh, I get the idea. You and Montgomery, like that, huh? Yeah, just let me tell you a week before Tobruk what I'm saying. I'm standing in a tank. How about finishing it off, huh? Closing time. Oh, wait a minute, Governor. I haven't told you. Hey. Hey, hey now. Cut an eye full of that bloke, would you? Oh, the beard over there? Staring at me, he is. Why does he get off staring at me like that? Oh, take it easy. It's me he's looking at. You, me, what's the difference? He does it every night. Why does he get too fast? Hey, put down that bottle. A man's got a right to his privacy, ain't it? I do, me. I said take it easy. I'll teach him as we both his eyes for All him. right, Aussie, you asked for it. Let go, me. Don't you go. Come on. Oh, I'd wipe the floor with you, too. Good night, Aussie. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Don't bother to come back until your tank's empty. <laughs> Don't worry, Governor. I ain't bad for the last couple of drinks, remember? What's in Matilda? What's in Matilda? Oh, no, no. <laughs> What's so funny? All of it? Anger, drink, man? Yeah, well, you're next, you know. I'm closing, do you mind? Ambition is funny, too. Hatred? Well, sort of. And love? <laughs> That's the most humorous of all. Look, philosopher. Sit down, sit down, Jordan. Have a nightcap with me. Thanks. I'm having a cold shower alone. Just a friendly little cognac. You know, friendship isn't so funny. Look, pal, what's it all about? Who is he? The Australian? Yes. You heard him, a buddy of Montgomery's. Tell me, Jordan. I told you, I don't know. No, you don't, do you? Now, let me lock up, huh? Jordan, would you like to make ten pounds? That's all I have. How? 
Find out about him. Uh Uh-uh. Please, Jordan, I need your help. I must find out. Will you tell me why? I wish I could tell you, Mr. Jordan. It's just a... a feeling. That man... I don't know. Then skip it. Doesn't make sense anyway. The guy's been in here once, and you've been in three or four times. Only every night you stare at me. Oh, that. You have a face, that's all. Don't most people? Most people only have license plates. Here. Here, I'll show you. Pencil. You know, there's something in your eyes that belongs to you. One ear's a little larger. That's it. You're an artist, huh? You draw pictures of everybody you meet? A mouth that's for chewing instead of advertising. Yes, yes, I'm an artist. Jeffrey James. Jeffrey, not Jesse. (laughs) But you've never heard of me, have you? Don't let it worry you. Renoir, Michelangelo, and Rembrandt, that's all I know. Here. Here, keep it. A souvenir. Ah. It's not bad. You sure you won't reconsider? About checking on the Australian? I don't like trouble unless I know what it is. Yeah. You're smarter than I thought you were, Jordan. Thanks for the picture, Mr. James. Yes. Good night. Well, he hunched his shoulders and shuffled out the door. I watched him until his dirty white suit rounded the mosque at the corner of Bengeza. The street was empty, except for the night. Then I heard a motor start across the alley. Against the low yellow moon, I could see it moving. It was one of those army surplus jeeps that are all over the world. It kept its lights off and it slowly rounded the same corner, tailing Jeffrey James. Exactly one minute later, before I'd barely started to get the place cleaned up for the night, I heard something else. Hey! Hey, Australia! Ah, where, where, where? Still open for business, eh, Governor? Uh, come in here, will you? I want to talk. <laughs> Ain't that a coincidence now? There was something I forgot to say myself. Huh? This... <laughs> well, it figured I made my mistake when I thought he was drunk. He wasn't. Neither were his brass knuckles. I came floating back to life maybe half an hour later. I was alone on the floor. The door was open and all the bugs in Egypt were holding a filibuster around the bar light. Everything else seemed to be okay. Nothing was missing. The cash register was still full. I still had my wallet. Yeah, nothing was missing except one thing. That pencil sketch the artist had drawn. The pencil sketch of me. I'd been rolled before for a wallet or a wristwatch, but never so someone could steal a pencil sketch of me by some down-and-out artist. But I never did like getting rolled, no matter what the reason. Well, I finally got my cold shower and tried for some sleep. I was awakened way too early by someone banging on the front door of the tambourine. It was Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. Good morning, Jordan. Sam, I'm not entertaining. What's the idea? A small matter. Well, let's save it till later. One moment. A beggar saw a man in your cafe last night. That unusual? An Australian, talking to you at the bar. Sure, name's Bertie. Short, shifty eyes, seersucker suit. Why? Your memory's rather sharp, Jordan. It ought to be. Got a little noisy. I threw him out. A few minutes later, he came back with some brass knuckles. I took the count. And you did not notify the police? You want me to call you every time somebody gets rough in my cafe? Jordan, this is more serious than you think. The man you call Bertie was just found back of the tambourine. He's dead. What'd you find on him, Sam? Very little. Why? Did he take something from you last night? Uh, no money. Only a picture. P- what kind of a picture? A pencil sketch of me. Uh, <laughs> of you, Jordan? Are you suggesting that a picture of you is motivation for murder? All I'm saying is he knocked me out, took it from me, and it's gone now. Mm-hmm. Well, perhaps when this Bertie sobered up and got another look at your picture... Okay, have your laugh, Sam. But think about it. I have much more important things to occupy my mind. Come on, Jordan. We had a look at Bertie. That didn't help my morning any. And Sam kept asking the same questions that always kept leading back to the missing pencil sketch of me. So when Sam left, I decided to dig a little... The artist, Jeffrey James, figured to be information, please, so I tried to run him down. 
couple of art stores knew nothing about him, so I put in a phone call to somebody named Tuga Bey, Egyptian art critic on one of the newspapers. Yes, this is Tuga Bey. I'm uh, trying to locate a guy named Jeffrey James. He's a... Uh... Jeffrey James. I'm afraid I do not know. Uh, he's an artist. Oh, that James. An artist, you say. <laughs> bah, bad. No style. Uh, look, I'll read about it in your column. All I want to know is where he lives. Well, he used to have a studio at number 16, Street of Many Moses, but I don't know. Thanks. I didn't have any trouble finding it. It was down a dusty, narrow street full of flies and herb smells and peddlers. And up some outside steps to the top floor of number 16, Street of Many Moses, a peddler was doing a sales job and a very sleek young lady standing in the doorway. Madame, wait! Do not shut the door. I have the samples, many samples. Please, no, no, go Brushes, away. Brushes, postcards, neckties, snake balls. Take your foot out of the door. Sample for every human need. Oh, Effendi, for you too, a man, I sell something. No, I'm not buying. Brushes I got. Oh, careful, mother. My foot is still there. You heard the lady, brush. Effendi. Go on, Imshi, beat it. Oh, but Effendi, if you would but look, it's simple. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Now, skip it. Now, now you go away, too, please. I want to come in. No, please, no. I'm looking for Mr. James. So? I'm Rocky Jordan. I'd like to see him. But, but your name means nothing to me. Mr. James is not here. Where is he? And, and the studio is so dirty. It's so poor. Well, that's it... all right. He told me he wasn't selling like Renoir. He... He said what? Oh, never mind. Oh, wait. You know... Uh... Wait, I must cover the paintings. What's, uh... What's the matter with them? Only that... They're of me. You're his model? Yes. Oh. This morning, I, I came to work on time, but... How do I know I can trust you? Well, you don't, but, uh, He says I got a nice face. Yes, I can see that for myself. Come on, tell me. What is it? This morning, I found a note. I, I have it here. Jeannie, I'll not need you this morning. I may never need you again. Stay here. You'll hear from me once more. Well? His bed wasn't slept in. Uh, what do you know about him? I've been modeling for Mr. James for almost a year, but I know so little about him. He He's such a strange man, so so alone, so tragic. Yeah, he thinks he's a failure, but he's got some friends, some enemies, something. No, no, there's just me. I, I'm like a daughter to him. Um, a guy in a Jeep and an Australian. You ever seen them? Why, no, I don't think so. Okay, then I'll call the police. The police know. Why not? Well, it, if, if something's wrong, don't you understand? It, it would only be worse for him. Yeah, I see, all right. I see nothing. Please, please, for my sake, have faith in him. I just need you to help, Rocky. Well, what's your suggestion? Wait with me, please. It's only hot outside. You could draw the blinds to the window, and it's cool here. I'm not so bad to wait with, am I? Some other time, sister. I'll see you later. Hey, hey, you toothbrush. Oh, Effendi, get away, Effendi, get away. Keyhole boy, huh? <laughs> yes. Look at what you are looking at. The rod, artillery, pistol of her. Listen, brush boy. Brushes? Oh, a disguise, Effendi. Now we are the musing before she sees us. Okay, okay, quit shoving. Uh, hurry, please. This way. This way, Effendi. This way for a little ride with me. Oh, so that's it. You drive a jeep. All the modern appliances, Effendi. Uh, in, please. In. Where are we going? You do not ask questions. This is a caper. You know all the words, don't you? Hmm. On the shortwave radio, I am listening to Sam Spade. I know my stuff. So beware. Well, now I heard everything. Uh, permit me to present myself. Ali Ben Seamus. Seamus? Egypt must have her national character. Seamus. I am calling myself the private eye of the desert. All right, what's it all about? Why have you been following me? Well, if you please, uh, tail and plant. Last night you were following the artist, James. Why? Oh, but uh, I lost him. Uh, that is why I follow you. So you don't know where he is? Oh, no, Effendi. Some lessons I have not learned so well yet. Uh, you're not good at a lot of things. Oh, all I am trying to do is, is to, to raise business. I find a caper, I get myself a commission. Doing what? Well, that is the only thing I do not know. Look, Buster, spit out the sand. Who hired you? Where are you taking me? Uh, your name is Jordan Effendi, and I think maybe you will hire me. Uh, I already got a dishwasher. No jokes, please. 
We are going into the Royal Galleries, room 12, left wall. You will hire me. Now, uh, out, please. Sure. Well, somebody else is here, too. Look behind you. <laughs> Look behind you. Even Sam Spade is not falling for that one. Uh, have it your own way, but I happen to recognize Captain Sabaya of the Cairo Police. Uh, 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 goodbye, Fendi. Hey! Well, Jordan, who is your hasty friend? Oh, he's a nut, Sam. If you want to crack him, you better get going. I have done enough chasing for a hot day. The one I want is you. Me? Why? A few more routine questions. Okay, just stay with me. Come on. Uh, Jordan, where are you going? Into the Royal Galleries to get you some answers. I grabbed Sam's arm and pulled him into the Royal Galleries. It was all crazy, but I had to take a look at what had been in the Seamus' mind. He'd said, room 12, left wall. I found it all right. It wasn't the same sketch Jeffrey James had drawn last night. This one was fancier, but it had the same lines, the same style. Underneath, a little bronze plate said, Portrait of a Gentleman. Original sketch by Renoir. Worth 5,000 pounds. Only I knew better. Why? Because it was a picture of me. Rocky Jordan. You are listening to Portrait of Rocky, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Today we salute San Francisco CBS station on the occasion of the change of the call letters from KQW to KCBS. For the best entertainment on the air, for the nation's favorite personalities, remember it is now KCBS at 740 on the radio dial in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Portrait of Rocky. Well, there I was, framed very nicely in the art gallery. A pencil sketch of me valued at a few thousand pounds, done by Renoir. Well, somebody had themselves a deal, selling phony pictures by old art masters and collecting a fancy buck for them. But who? The artist who drew them? The Australian who stole the sketch from me and ended up dead? The model or Ali Ben Seamus? There are a lot of people in the play, but as we stood there in front of the picture in the gallery, Sam Sabaya kept looking at me, because he was interested in finding a murderer. Mm, yes, Jordan, it, it might be you, the... There is a certain resemblance. I tell you, it is me. If you could see that fast sketch James did of me last but night. But art is not one of my specialties, Jordan. Murder is. Now, who killed the Australian? Oh, how should I know? How should anyone else know? <laughs> I, I will search for the others you speak of, but I would not want to lose you, Jordan. Look, Sam, look here at the nose. The ears, one's bigger, see? What are you trying to prove, Jordan? That this artist you want to help is some kind of a forger, a crook? Uh, that's the hard part. Well, anyway, Jordan, it is not likely the Royal Gallery would accept a fraud, is it? This uh, Renoir is on loan from Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth. She's very important, very skillful, very rich. Okay, I'll see her myself. Why, Jordan? I am the police. Don't you understand? It's my face. She can look at my face. <laughs> yes, your face. The police can hardly protect her from that. <laughs> Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth lived in a private pyramid with a view of the Nile. She was maybe ten years older than she tried to look. When I got there, she was pouring tea for a, a slob in a fez. It was Tuga Bay, the art critic I talked to on the phone that morning. Yes, yes, we talked on the telephone, didn't we? You were looking for that fellow James. Dreadful sense of color. James? James? Never heard of him. Who is he? Uh, sugar and milk, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, thanks. I'd like a slice of lemon. May I ask why it was you wished to find him? Really? I don't particularly care who he is. You needn't bother telling me. Oh, it's frightfully hot. I uh, wanted him to paint me a mural, Mr. Bay, that's all. Oh, yes, yes, of course, that's it. A restaurateur, you say you are. Uh, I own a place. Oh, people eat so much, don't they? 
What? It would be nice, wouldn't it? One of those lovely panoramic things over your bar, I suppose. With simply acres of female flesh. Bad for the digestion, though, I should think. Uh, Mrs. Wentworth, about your Renoir. You were saying you bought it here in Cairo just a day or two ago. Did I? Oh, but of course I must have. How much did you pay for it? Oh, uh, um, oh, blast, how should I know? Was it five pounds? That's what I printed in my article. There you are, young man. Newspapers never lie. Isn't it just possible that your Renoir isn't real? That you threw away over $20,000 on a phony? <laughs> That's a ridiculous notion. I'm an expert, Mr. Jordan. And to here, he's frightfully keen. The picture is perfectly genuine, defined of the season. Mrs. Wentworth, take a look at me. Oh? You've studied the drawing. It could be my photograph. What? It's me. Look at me. Don't you see it in my face? Really, young man. All I can see in your face is my desire to be 25 years younger. <laughs> there, now. That's the nicest thing I've said all day. Thank you, Mrs. Wentworth. I wish you were. Goodbye. Oh, Jordan. Jordan, wait a moment. Yes, Mr. Bay? Um, about that picture. What about it? You said it was genuine. And I am certain it is. I have staked my reputation as a critic on the authenticity of that Renoir. Then we haven't anything to talk about. No way, Jordan. You interest me. Tell me, does Jeffrey James have any connection with this, uh, this impossible theory of yours? Nothing much, except that he drew my picture and sold it to Mrs. Wentworth for 5,000 pounds. That is preposterous. Is it? Why don't you ask Jeffrey James? I most certainly shall. And immediately, Jordan. <laughs> Tuga Bay moved out fast. And next I went looking for the agent who'd sold the Renoir. Only he'd taken off the day before to visit the Louvre in Paris. I got around, talked to a lot of people, but they all thought I was nuts. And an hour later, I began to think so myself. I headed back for the tambourine about sunset. I was just crossing the street in front of my place when a little jeep whirled around the corner and I jumped for the curb. Oh, I offended Jordan. I find you. Uh, Ollie, the Seamus. Where you been? Well, that I have come to tell you. I am convinced the life of a private eye is a bomb racket. All right, come off the spade routine, Ali. I'm not buying. Oh, but this you should know, Effendi. There is a murdered man. I discovered him a short time ago lying in an alley back of the street of Many Moses. You discovered who? The art critic, Tugabe. Tugabe is dead? Yes, Effendi. He had been shot only a short time. Come on, let's go. Where, Effendi? Back to Tugabe. Now, start it up, Ali. As you wish, Effendi. And now, uh, suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything you know. But there is nothing you do not know yourself. You're avoiding the police too much, Ali. Why? Oh, please, you are touching a sore point, Mr. Jordan. All right, let's have it. Even in Cairo, the eye must be legit. Oh, no license? Natural intelligence, they admit I have. Uh, but I am handicapped. How so? M mirror vision. Say that again. Oh, please, it is not good for my ego... The world I see backwards. Only a few people are so afflicted with mirror vision, and I am one. Yeah. Something's beginning to add up. What did you say, Effendi? You're the only one who looked at the Renoir and said it was me. That is true. Nobody else could see the resemblance, because that drawing is wrong side, too. Like I see myself when I shave every day, like the guy who drew it. Uh, like he what, Effendi? Jeffrey James sat in my tambourine night after night, staring at me in a bar mirror. That is it. He studies you. He is making a sketch. He sells it as a master for big money. He made another for me in the tambourine freehand. Oh, yes. Evidence against him. A mistake. So when it falls into the hands of the Australian, James must kill him. No, I don't need a diagram. I put Tuga Bay on the artist's trail today. So James had to kill him, too. Ah, so, I think, Jordan, we have got our man. Ali Ben Seamus parked his jeep a couple of blocks from where he discovered the body of Tuga Bay. A crowd of natives was milling around the spot, so we knew the police were there, too. I didn't want to talk to them just yet, not till I paid Jeffrey James a visit. So I headed on foot for his studio, and the eye of the desert flapped along behind like a... A boy scout on his first snipe hunt. It was dark by now, and the street of many Moses didn't look quite so shabby. We groped up the rickety steps, and Jeannie answered my nod. Mr. Jordan, what do you want? A word with your artist friend, Jeffrey James. But I told you he's gone. I still haven't heard from him. I, I'm so worried. Why? 
Well, so many strange things are happening. Yeah, like the murder of Tuga Bay. Mr. Jordan, no. no. What are you doing? Getting a look at these pictures you covered up this morning. Please, I... Yeah, I... have a look, Ali. They're not all pictures of Jeannie. Renoir's, Monet's, Gauguin's, all phonies by Jeffrey James. Right, Jeannie? Why, yes, but, but what does it matter? It adds up, Effendi. Now we know this girl is covering up for the artist. You're right, Ali. I don't understand. What is this all about? Well, it's simple, Jeannie. Your boss has been playing people like Mrs. Wentworth for suckers, selling his own stuff as originals of masters, then killing when anybody got in his way. Oh, no, this can't be. Jeffrey's like a father. He couldn't harm anyone. Yeah. Where is he, Jeannie? I don't know. Now, please go. Let them stay, Jeannie. Jeffrey. It is the artist. Watch him, Mr. Jordan. Calm yourself, my boy. It's as Jeannie says, I would harm no one. We've got a different idea, James. Yes, I know. I heard everything. You've made a great mistake, Mr. Jordan. Oh, yeah? Like spotting these masterpieces as phonies you drew yourself? Is that a mistake? Not at all. For many years I've known that I wasn't a creator. So what better could I do than imitate the work of great artists? Sure, then sell them as originals. Mr. Jordan, do you think I would represent my feeble efforts as the work of masters? There's a picture hanging in the Royal Gallery, says you would. One moment. Let me show you something. What is this, F.N.D.? Just watch you, Molly. We'll move this Renoir over under the light. Now, with my mat knife, I will scrape off the name of Renoir. Now, step over here, Mr. Jordan. Read what is underneath. Imitation of Renoir by Geoffrey James, 1947. Now you realize I couldn't possibly have represented the sketch as anything but my own. Ah, you're clear, Geoffrey. Sorry I didn't get it right the first time. So, Mr. Jordan... Why don't we forget this whole affair? That's not so easy. Somebody sold that picture hanging in the Royal Galleries as a genuine article, and two people were killed because of it. The police want to know why. Are the police necessary? Yeah. Very well, Mr. Jordan. Let us go to them. I will confess to the murders. Jeffrey, what are you saying? Quiet, Jeannie, my dear. It's the best way. So, Effendi, uh, Geoffrey James is the killer. We have apprehended him. No, Ali, but you'll get your badge. We have the killer. Please, Mr. Jordan, let's say no more. The cover-up's the other way around, isn't it, Mr. James? If you look in Jeannie's room, I'll bet you'll find the 5,000 pounds for that picture. Wait. Recently, I've been aware of many things. But for Jeannie's sake... You'd do anything for her, wouldn't you? Even after she's made a sucker out of you. Mr. Jordan... Try it this way. Jeannie knows how you feel about her, so she gets away with plenty. She and Tuga Bay hatch up this idea of selling your imitations as originals. When you start getting wise, they put the Australian on your trail. You learn too much. He was killed. Not by Jeannie. What difference does it make? Then Ollie here scratched around too much. Things begin falling apart. So Jeannie decided to get rid of Tuga Bay and keep all the money for herself. Oh, it's all so easy. You take the blame, Jeffrey. You're the sucker. Please let her go, Mr. Jordan. She and I will go away together. No, Jeffrey. Only I will go away. Effendi, she has a gun. Yes, and there are enough bullets to kill all of you. Please, Jeannie, my darling. Shut up. I'll do it quickly. Why do you cringe, Jeffrey? Effendi, Jordan, what do we do now? You're a detective, Ali, you tell me. Oh, yes. Uh, Sam Spade, he would think quickly. He would move in. Ali, no. So you're the first. She swung around, but he kept coming, and she fired on him point blank. That was my chance. Before she could swing back, I had her by the wrist, and the gun dropped. Jeannie scratched me up a little, but she knew she was through. And all this time, Jeffrey James stood as though in a stupor. Well, as usual, Sam Sabaya was moving around a couple of steps behind me, and the gunshot brought him quick. Jordan! All right, here's your killer, Sam. She just tried it again. Yeah. Greco, Hamud, take everyone into custody at once. At once, if it... uh, Lay off the artist. He's okay. I will get a full statement at headquarters from everyone. Uh, Jordan, who, who, who is this? Ali Ben Seamus. She only creased him. He's coming out of it. Ben... Is this the, the, the pest who is always hounding me for a detective's license? Yeah. And I think he won his color, Sam. Oh, wait. Oh, uh, Fendi, uh, I did not do so well. I fear capers are not for me. Yeah, well, think again, Ali. I got an idea you'll get your license now. Can it be, Fendi, that I will be a real private eye? How about it, Sam? Hmm? Uh, oh, uh, well, Jordan, uh, if, if what you... Uh, 
Uh, perhaps. Oh, so? Now, when the telephone rings, I will say, Ali Ben Shamus, the license number 34687. Oh, but uh, now I am tired. Sure. Do you know what your friend Sam Spade would say in a case like this? What, if Andy? Good night, sweetheart. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by Jackson Gillis and edited by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arunt. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? At the moment, you. Huh? Johnny, you've been working too hard. Oh, this I've been convinced of for years, Pat, but I've never been able to convince <laughs> anybody else, especially you. Okay, I'm convinced. What you need is a nice vacation. All expenses paid. Whoa, whoa. Now, Southern California is very nice this time. Of I year. just came back from there. The beaches, the swimming, sun. Golf, night Look, life. Pat, thanks a lot, but no thanks. Well, now, Johnny... The last time you invited me to take one of your vacations, I got hit over the head, almost run down by a truck, and kicked around by a yeah. guy seven feet tall. Yeah, but this one's different, Johnny. It's a real simple job. Oh, they all are, according to you. All I want you to do is pick up something out on the coast and bring it back here. That's all. Yeah, what? A hundred thousand dollars. Oh. Oh. I'll be right over. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Johnson payroll matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty-five cab fare from my apartment to the office of Universal Adjustment Bureau in Pat McCracken. thousand bucks made you prick up your ears, Johnny. <laughs> Sit down. Okay, Pat. What's the deal? You hear about the Johnson payroll robbery last week down in New York? I read about it, but there weren't too many details. They got a hundred thousand, and the payroll was insured by one of the companies we represent. How many in on the robbery, do you know? Oh, uh, we're not sure. There were several. One of them was fatally wounded. Was he able to talk before he died? Yeah, just enough to tell us the plan was to split up after the robbery, meet in another city to divvy up the loot. Uh-huh. And you think it's out in California now? We also think one of the crooks may be trying to double-cross the others. Hiding out from them, maybe? That's the general idea. We got a call from Los Angeles this morning. The fellow wouldn't give his name. But he claimed he could give us a lead on the one who has the dough. For a price, of course. Oh. So you're to meet him in L.A. and find out what he knows, if anything. What do you figure his angle is, Pat? Oh, maybe several, Johnny, but I don't care. What I do care about is getting the money back. All right. How do I contact this man in Los Angeles? You don't. He'll contact you. At your hotel, the Nestor. The Nestor. Okay, Pat, I'm on my way. Oh, just one thing, Johnny. Yeah? Maybe it's occurred to you, maybe it hasn't. There will be others looking for that money, too. The other guys involved in the robbery? Yeah. Of course, if you can get there first... I'll try. Oh, and don't bother telling me to be sure to get back here in one piece. Hmm? 
That I'll really try to do. Expense account item two, $187 even, air transportation and incidentals to Los Angeles. I've been told to stay at the Hotel Nestor, so I took a cab. That's item three, five fifty from the airport. It was just getting dark as my cab pulled up in front of the place. Before I could get out, somebody got in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know this cab was occupied. Well, that's okay. Welcome aboard. Here, I'll get out. And... Oh. oh, it's okay. I've got you. I'm sorry, I lost my balance. Must have got my heel. <laughs> you may be sorry, but I'm not. I can't think of a better way to arrive in a strange city than with a beautiful girl in your arms. You let go of me. Oh, oh yeah, well, if you insist. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. You can have this gear as soon as I get my stuff out. Oh, that's all right. I'm in a hurry. I'll get another one. Goodbye. Oh, wait a second. I mean, after all... Oh, well... Yeah, that's the story of my life. The best ones always seem to get away. I went into the hotel lobby to register, but found a message waiting for me from the informant who'd phoned to Pat. I was to drive to the little town of Corrado Beach down the coast and meet a man there first thing in the morning. There was a map showing me the way to a small pier where the meeting was to take place. Hmm. Looked like Los Angeles had suddenly got too hot for him. Expense account item four, fifty dollars to rent a car. I left word where I'd be, drove to Corrado Beach, and checked in at a motel. Then early next morning, I went out to the little pier. It was a ramshackle affair with a couple of beat-up boats tied to it and an old character fumbling with the door of a little bait shack. I went over to him. Hi. Good morning. Having trouble? Yeah, some kid's been monkeying with this lot. You want some bait? No, no. This is one trip I didn't come to fish. How is it, by the way? Fishing? Yeah, fine. Oh, just my luck. No, I'm supposed to meet somebody here. Oh, must be that fellow out there. He was already there when I got here. Oh, where? Well, do you see that boat, the bottom side up on the pier near the end? You mean the man sitting beside it? Yeah. Got himself a fishing rod, looks like. Could be one with some bait. I'll, uh, I'll walk out with you and see if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. So the fishing's been good, huh? What have they been catching? Oh, quite a few bass last couple of days. Off the pier? Yeah. There's some kelp beds in close. Brings them in around here. Funny. Hmm? I'm your friend there. You don't seem... Hey, sleep, I guess. Hey, watch out. He's living. Drive him. I got him. But... Hmm. Hey, mister. Mister, he... He isn't sleeping. That's right. He's dead. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Georgia's state flag displays the state seal on a strip of blue. The seal symbolizes the fact that constitutional government rests equally on the three major branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, and that all three must be guarded equally if a sound government is to be maintained. The greater portion of Georgia's flag is crimson. On it is superimposed the Blue Cross of St. Andrew, bearing 13 white stars for the original 13 colonies. This cross, made in the form of saltier or X, was adopted from the national flag of Scotland. Georgia's state flag, the flag of the fourth state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1956. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Johnson Payroll Matter. I'd flown 3,000 miles to meet a man, only to find him dead at the end of a rickety little pier at Corrado Beach, a knife between his ribs. I searched him while the old fellow at the bait shack went to call the police. But I didn't find a thing on him to help me. No identification, even. Later, talking to the police... Well, they didn't have any line on him either. My only lead on the payroll robbery was dead. I waited around the motel most of the day, hoping the police could turn up something on the dead man, but it was no soap. Item five, two dollars for drinks in the town's only bar while I tried to figure out my next move. 
And my next move was to the phone booth in the corner to call Pat McCracken back in Hartford. Collect. Oh, tough luck, Johnny. But are you sure the dead man is our informant? There was no identification on him, but he was right where he told me he'd be in the message he left for me in L.A. Uh, probably not much doubt about it, then. Oh, incidentally, I sent some mug shots out to you. Some men yeah. might have been involved in the Johnson payroll job. Send them airmail special. Yeah, I got them about an hour ago. We're not sure if any of them are the ones or not, and we don't have any line at all on the leader of the gang. Well, what's your next move, John? Uh, search me. Right now, I'm right in the middle of nowhere. I guess I... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Maybe I'm not out of leads after all. What do you mean? Pat, I'll call you later. What pulled me off that phone in a hurry was a glimpse of somebody over near one end of the bar. I slid out of the booth and went over. Well, hi. What? Imagine meeting you here. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. You're the girl who got into my cab in Los Angeles. I I'm afraid you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm sorry. No, I have no, to go. No, no, just a minute. I'm beginning to think it wasn't just coincidence you got into my cab. Maybe we'd better have a little talk. Please, go over my arm. You've made a mistake, and there's nothing to talk about. Is he annoying you, lady? Now, look, bartender, I'm just trying yes, to find... Yes, he is annoying me. Take your hands off her, buddy. Now, look, Joe. I mean it, and my name ain't Joe. I got you outweighed by about 40 pounds, buddy. You don't understand. Just let go of her, and we'll talk it over. I... Okay, okay. Thank you. Now, just what is it I don't understand, buddy? Skip it. Buddy. So she got away from me. I grabbed my top coat off a hook and stepped outside the bar. It was damp and foggy out there. I put on the coat and started looking around for her, but it was too late. She was just plain gone. Then walking along with my hands in my coat pockets, I realized there was something in one. A key to a motel room, but not mine. Funny. Then I remembered I'd had the coat beside me in the taxi when the girl climbed in back in Los Angeles. Yeah, she could have slipped it in the coat pocket then. But why? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. I looked up the motel. It was about a mile down the highway from mine, room seven. Yeah, the key fit all right. Then as I opened the door, I realized I had company right behind me. Freeze, Dollar. Huh? Who are you? Never mind. Inside. Move. Okay. Get that blind down. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Your face looks familiar. Yeah, those mug shots McCracken sent me. You must be slattery. Right, boy. One of the guys they suspect of pulling the Johnson payroll job. Too bright for your own good dollar. You must be the one who killed the man out on the pier. The man who was going to tell me where the payroll door is. That's a nice stall, dollar, but it won't work. What do you mean, Slattery? Blake killed him, and you know it. Yeah? Who is Blake? You want to play it coy, huh, Dollar? Okay, we'll do it your way. Blake's got the payroll dough, and you're working with him. Just how do you figure that? Blake's girlfriend climbed in your taxi in Los Angeles. I figure she slipped you the key to this room. Hey, look, you got a few things all twisted. Shut up and stand still. This gun has a habit of going off sometimes. No kidding. So where's the dough? Take it or leave it, Slattery. I don't know. Well, it better be in this room. Yeah? And if it isn't? You guess. I don't think I need more than one. If it isn't here, I'm not leaving. Is that the idea? Oh, you leave, all right. It's just that you won't be walking out of here. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Over 150 years ago, the Swiss poet Henri Amiel wrote, Heroism is the brilliant triumph of the soul over fear. Heroism is the dazzling and glorious concentration of courage. During the Korean campaign, Corporal Ronald Rosser was attached to the heavy mortar company of the 38th Infantry, 2nd Division, United States Army. Rosser, a veteran of World War II, rejoined the army and shipped to Korea when he heard that his brother had fallen in the winter assault of the Chinese communists. One day, Rosser's company moved into enemy territory. At the time, the corporal was a forward observer and carried a radio. Suddenly, 
In the midst of an enemy attack, Rosser handed his radio to a buddy, slipped the safety off his carbine, and filled his shirt with hand grenades. He charged at the enemy through fierce mortar and artillery fire, shooting from the hip. Straddling a bunker, he riddled its occupants. Still advancing, he accounted for two more of the enemy, shooting one through the head and clubbing another to death. Continuing his one-man charge, he jumped into a trench full of enemy soldiers, opened fire and forced his way relentlessly down the length of the trench, killing right and left with grenades and carbine fire. Out of ammunition, he returned to his company, where he replenished his supply. Then he charged the enemy again and again. Finally, he returned to his own area, and taking the radio back from his friend, he moved out with his company. Corporal Ronald Rosser was awarded the Medal of Honor for his action. Action which had shown the enemy that his personal code of conduct wouldn't let them push around either his kid brother or his country. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Johnson Payroll Matter. <laughs> Look, Slattery, you've torn this motel room completely apart. Obviously, that payroll money isn't here. That's right, Teller. So now you're going to tell me where it is. Oh, brother, you take a lot of convincing. I told you, I don't know. So why don't you put that gun away and listen? You're the one who takes the convincing, Dollar, so I start convincing. Oh, That's not going to do you any good. No? Well, for sure, it's not going to do you any good, so... Now, wait a minute, look. Look, I'll give you the whole story. And I'm supposed to believe it, huh? Staring down that gun barrel, I'm not about to lie... Let's have it. All right. A guy called us from Los Angeles, said he could give us a lead on who had the dough from the Johnson payroll job. It was Hollis. He was hoping you'd lead him to it. Hollis? Yeah, yeah, the guy you found out in the pier dead. And you said a man named Blake killed him. You know Blake killed him. You know Blake engineered the hole up and then ran out on Hollis and me. Do I? Sure, because you're in with him. I seen his girl get in your cab in Los Angeles. Okay, so she got in my cab, but I didn't know her. I'd never seen her before. She slipped you the key to this motel room, didn't she? Yeah, now I think I know why. She was trying to sidetrack us. Lead us to think the dough was here so it would take the pressure off Blake and her. That part of your story I don't buy, Dollar. I think you know where that dough is and I want it. Now look. Talk! If you think I'm going to take any more of this... This gun says that's exactly what you're going to do until you decide to talk! I roll with this next one and let my eyes droop when my knees sag. He reached out to steady me, and I gave my left foot in the stomach to flatten it. By the time he got to his feet, I was out the door. I dove behind some bushes down the road, and I waited. He pounded right on past me, gun in hand. I waited until he was out of sight, then doubled back to my car. Apparently, Slattery didn't know Blake's girl was around here somewhere. One thing was sure, I had to find her, but fast. There were only three motels in town. The one I was staying at, the one where Slattery had been playing patty cake on my jaw, and a third off the highway near the beach. I drove to that one and checked the register. It showed a minor grant in number eight. Oh! Hello, minor. No, please, get out. Oh, no, sorry. We're going to have that talk right now. I tell you, you've made a mistake about me. Oh, come on. Drop the act, minor. I know you're Blake's girlfriend, that you slipped that motel key in my coat pocket in L.A. to get me off the trail of the Johnson payroll money. The the what? I also know that Blake masterminded the robbery and double-crossed his buddy, held out on him. Oh, I... I guess I knew it must be something like that. What are you talking about? Mr. Dollar, I... I haven't known Fred Blake very long. A month, maybe. I didn't know what he did for a living, and I didn't ask him. Two days ago, he said he was in trouble and needed my help. He wanted me to slip that key into your coat pocket in the taxi in Los Angeles. To take Slattery off his trail. Then he told me to meet him here at the beach. When I saw you in the bar a while ago, I got panicky. I didn't know what to do. But that's all I know about it. Mr. Dollar, I didn't know Blake was a criminal. Honestly, I didn't. Yeah? Now, will you help me find him? Yes. I will, Mr. Dollar. If I can. The trouble is, right now, I don't know where he is any more than you do. Oh, 
Pull it, Pete, folks. Hey, wait a minute, buddy. Ain't you the one that was molesting this young lady an hour ago? Oh, Tarzan, buddy, my molesting days are over. Oh, it's all right, bartender. I'm sorry I caused you the trouble. No trouble, ma'am. Just glad it turned out all right. Things uh, happen fast here at the beach, I guess. I don't suppose you've ever heard of a guy named Fred Blake, have you? Well, not that I remember. You looking for him? Yeah. What's he look like? Medium height, uh, dark hair and brown eyes, and yeah. regular features. Yeah, that description would fit half the guys that come in here. Sure, fishermen, salesmen, vacation. No, only that kind don't come in here anymore. Salesmen? No, fishermen. I thought the fishing was good here. Been no fishing around here for months. Huh? A fella told me they were getting a lot of bass right off the pier. <laughs> it was pulling your leg, buddy. There's a chemical plant nearby. A lot of stuff got dumped into the water by accident a few months ago. The fish haven't been back since. Wait a minute. Sure, right under my nose all the time. What do you mean, Johnny? Mine, I'll see you later. I got in my car and headed for the pier. As I turned off the highway, I could see a car a couple of hundred yards back following me with its lights off. But I couldn't stop now. I parked near the pier and headed for the bait shack. The windows were still boarded over, but I could see a crack of light between the boards. I eased over to the shack. Oh, no. I flattened against the wall as the door came open and Blake came out with a gun. I hacked it out of his hand. What? All right, the hold dollar. it, hold it, Blake. Well, the fisherman's friend, huh? Look, you the... killed that guy on the end of the pier just before I showed up this morning. You didn't have time to leave, so you're covered by making like you worked here. Then it occurred to you this was a pretty good hideout until Slattery got off your trail. Look, look, maybe we can make a deal, Dollar. Oh, we're going to. You turn the stolen money over to me, and I turn you over to the police. Drop your gun, Dollar. Huh? Drop it. Okay, Slattery. <laughs> Hello, Blake. Glad to see me. Look, Slattery, I, I wasn't trying to cross you. I, I was going to get in touch with you when things quieted down. <laughs> sure you were. Let's have the dough. Uh, all right, it, it's in the shack. Blake half turned, and I saw his hand slide into his coat, a second gun. He whipped it out, but Slattery had seen it, too. Uh, he got Blake, but his eyes were off me for a lucky second. I checked Blake. He was still alive. Yeah, they'd both keep for a long time. Item six, $174 even, air transportation and incidentals back home. Expense account total, $526.50. Remarks? The payroll money is back where it belongs. And Slattery and Blake are back where they belong, with Blake facing a murder rap to boot. Funny, I probably wouldn't have nailed him if he hadn't told me that phony story about the fish biting near the pier. Teaches me a lesson, Pat. I'm not going to tell any more fish stories. They can kill you. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Ohio's state flag is the only pennant-shaped flag, or burgee, as it is correctly called. The Buckeye banner is the creation of an engineer who created a blue triangle for the hills and valleys, red and white stripes for the roads and waterways of the state. There are 13 stars for the original 13 colonies and four extra stars to indicate that Ohio was the 17th state admitted to the Union. A white circle with a red center represents the initial letter of Ohio and suggests its nickname, the Buckeye State. Ohio's state flag, the flag of the 17th state to enter the Union, was adopted on May 9, 1902. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a pair of common, ordinary glasses solve a case for us. The gruesome spectacle matter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Today's story was written by Robert Stanley. 
Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Forrest Lewis, Shepard Menken, and Frank Gerstel. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Richard Diamond, the smiling gumshoe. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the laughing hyena. The lieutenant in? Yeah, go on in and spoil his afternoon. You know, Otis, I think you've got the kindest, most wonderful face in the whole wide world. You do? Absolutely. But I do wish you'd do me a favor. Well, sure, anything. Stop wearing it upside down. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, what's doing? Want a sandwich? Mm, I'll take some of that coffee. Sure. Something on your mind, Rick? No, just got tired of sitting around the office. No business? Not in a week. Hmm. <coughs> got any sugar? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here. Yeah, Otis? Uh, Lieutenant, I got some guy on the phone who won't give me his name. Says he wants to talk to you. Matter of life and death. Okay, put him on. Right. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I'm going to say this once, so listen carefully. Tonight, somewhere in New York City, I'm going to kill a man, and there's nothing you can do about it. What? Promptly at 8 o'clock, somewhere in this city, I'm going to kill a man. Hello? Hello? Something wrong? Some guy says he's going to kill somebody at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, dandy. Crank. Did he say who his victim was going to be? No, just a crank. I should have humored him. Made suggestions. My landlord, for instance. Be a little gruesome if he really did it. Yeah. You'd have a hard time protecting eight million people from a killer you don't know anything about. Hope it was just a crank. Otis. Yeah, what's that? If that guy calls back, put him through and trace the call. Right. It sure would be miserable if that call was on the level. Oh, relax. I'll have some more coffee. I had some more coffee Walt worried a little, not a lot Because the big precinct caters to a good number of cranks every day We talked about old times And around six I matched Walt for dinner He stuffed himself at the automat Until I ran out of change and begged for mercy Then he dropped me off at my flat on 53rd And went back to the precinct I showered, shaved Slipped into my blue suit and headed for the door Yeah. Do me a favor, will you, Rick? You gotta stop stuffing yourself, Walt. You sound like you got indigestion. I'm down at the morgue. Meet me here, please. Oh, now look, I got a date with a live one. I'm in on the start of some trouble. It's liable to grow. That guy who called made good. He stabbed a man to death on Broadway at eight o'clock. <laughs> Yes, Lieutenant. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming down. Okay, Hal. Who is he? Or, uh, who was he? Brother identified him. Abraham Weiss. Stabbed in the heart from behind with a long, thin instrument. On Broadway at 8 o'clock. That's right. Mm. A dozen people saw him stagger to the curb and fall. Most of them just thought he was drunk. You think your boy on the phone did it? 8 o'clock, right on the nose. Whoever did it must have walked up behind him, jabbed him just below the left shoulder blade, and kept on walking. What do you want me for, Walt? If this guy on the phone did kill Abraham Weiss and we can't find a motive, it's a little more than a simple killing. We may be mixed up with a madman. Oh, so I qualify in that league. 
You're one of the few guys who really is interested in criminal psychology. Well, I think it's the answer. You can't stop something unless you know the cause. Will you give me a hand, Rick? Sure, sure. I've got Weiss's family at the station. Let's go see them. Weiss? Why, Lieutenant, why did this happen to Abe? That's what we're going to try and find out, Mrs. Weiss. We were hoping you might help us. Well, he, didn't, he didn't have any enemies. He was a good man. We have three children. I left them with Mrs. Bellotti, my neighbor. It, it's going to be hard on them. You're sure your husband didn't know it? No. He didn't have any enemies. He was a good husband and a good father. Everybody liked him. Well, only last week, Mrs. Dowd up the street from us. We'd like a list of your brother's friends, Mr. Weiss. Where he worked, people he had business with, anyone you can remember who might give us a lead. Been sitting out there thinking about that. There just isn't anyone that I know would want to kill Abe. He was a good guy, did his job, took care of Louise and the kids. He didn't bother nobody. How long were Louise and Abe married? For, uh, no, six years. Maybe a little more. Nice girl, Louise. Oh, the best. Good wife. What happens to her now? I'll take care of her. You're not married, huh? No. Quite a job taking care of a widow and three kids. I'm doing all right. It's the least I can do. You got a girl? Yeah, why? Maybe going to get married, huh? Well, I'm engaged. I've been thinking about it. It'll have to wait for a while, I guess. Until Louise gets back on her feet. Okay. Tell us about some of your brother's friends. Well, I guess his best friend was Art Brearley. They were all close to me. He told us about everyone he could think of. Gave us a dozen names and addresses we could check. Like Louise, Martin couldn't figure why anyone would want to kill Abraham Weiss. The next was Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Tired. The hurt in her eyes enough for all the mothers who had raised a son and lost him. We'll try not to keep you too long, Mrs. Weiss. It's all right, Lieutenant. You want to help. Would you like a glass of water? No, no. When will I be able to see my son? It's right that I should see my son. A few questions first, if you don't mind. I know you're trying to help. Just me a few questions. As many as you like, Lieutenant. Not long with Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Nothing that would help to catch her son's killer. So we checked the people who had known Abraham, and there were plenty. His boss gave us a few more names to add to the long list. All of them friends who couldn't imagine why anyone would want to kill a nice guy like Abe. At 7.30 the next morning, Walt looked at the reports and poured more coffee. Here. I'll put sugar in it. Ah, thanks. If that phone call was on the level, why would a guy kill like that? Call us and tell us he was going to do it. What would be his reason? Uh, well, couldn't guess. But if that guy who called did do the killing, you bet he'll phone again. Why? Well, he bragged he was going to do it. He'll want the credit. Well, I'm going to get some rest. A couple of hours anyway. Let's both get a couple. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. That doesn't matter. Lousy dream. What time is it? Five o'clock. Oh, I died, didn't I? A boy called again. Oh? You trace it? Phone booth in Grand Central. What do you have to say? How much. Wanted to know how he liked his handiwork. What's a good answer to that one? Well, I said a few things, but I guess he figured we weren't satisfied, so he promised he'd kill somebody else tonight. Hello, Rick. Seen the papers? No. Here. Hmm. Fiend terrorizes city, unknown killer murders at will, police and baffled. Everybody's on my back. Exactly. What did he say? You want to hear? I made a recording. Let's hear it. Okay, Otis, put him on. Hello, Lieutenant. Yeah. What do you think now, Lieutenant? 
I did what I said I was going to do, didn't I? Look, who is this? The man who called yesterday and said he was going to kill someone at 8 o'clock last night. I don't believe it. Well, certainly you do. You'd like to stall so you can have this call traced. Well, you'd better listen. I want everybody to know just how stupid the police force really is. I'm going to kill again tonight, and there's nothing you can do about it. Look, you, whoever you are, if it's the last thing I ever do, I'll... Tonight at 8, another innocent victim will die because the police can do nothing about it. Hello. Hello. Oh, this. The call came from a phone booth in Grant. He said another innocent victim. Yeah, so he's a nut. For some reason, he hates the police force. There's your motive. Well, I guess it's possible, but something sticks in my craw. Yeah? What? Eight o'clock. Why pick eight o'clock both times? Well, I guess like you said, he wants the credit. We're liable to get a couple of killings in an evening. He wants us to be sure which one he did. Okay. So he makes it eight o'clock the first time. Why the second? Why not six or seven or ten or... Just following a pattern, I guess. Uh, maybe so. Well, what do we do? I got every man possible on the streets. But, Rick, let's face it, this is a pretty big city. And it's six, two, and even. If he does kill again, it won't be anywhere near the scene of his first stabbing. I guess we just wait. Yeah. A little over an hour to go. So we waited. Walt got the coffee going, and I went through a whole package of cigarettes. Somewhere in the middle of New York, probably on a crowded street, a man was walking, waiting like we were for eight o'clock. Waiting to stab someone through the heart. Waiting for eight o'clock. Want coffee? No. Give me a cigarette. You don't smoke. Want a bet? Ah, uh, here. Got a match? Got a lighter. Ah, uh, this is no good. Yeah? Let's go. Where to? Entrance to Madison Square Garden. Man stabbed to death in the crowd going into the fights. Right at 8 o'clock. A man murdered going into Madison Square Garden to see the fights. Stabbed through the heart while he stood in the middle of the large crowd. We went through the same routine. Identify the body. Question witnesses who had been close to him. See his friend. Anyone who knew him. Name's Leon Ellis. Small-time fight manager. No family. Handles a young kid named Billy Martin. Wasn't fighting last night. At 10 o'clock the next morning, we found Billy Martin working at the East Side Gym. We talked to him for a while, but he couldn't help much. So we kept going. Making our list of names, talking to everyone. All morning and into the afternoon. By 4.30, we were holding each other up. Look, we're working with a madman who kills anybody close to him so he can show how helpless we are to stop him. The whole city's in a panic. The newspapers are blasting everybody in the department, yours truly in particular. Yeah? I got him on the line again. He even bragged to me about this last killing. Trace it as fast as you can. Right. Start that recorder, Rick. It's our boy again. Okay. Go ahead. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. You can skip the formalities, Lieutenant. Your sergeant told you who was on the line. Well, I did it again last night, didn't I, Lieutenant? Okay, so we can't stop you. I admit it. I'll admit it to the papers. That should make you happy. The police department can't do anything about it. That's what you want, isn't it? Again tonight, Lieutenant. One more person will die. Now, wait a minute. At least give me a chance to talk to you. While you trace the call? No. Tonight at 8 o'clock, and you can't stop me. Hello? Yeah? Call came from a phone booth in Rockefeller Center. Picks the right place to call from. We look pretty silly rounding up everybody in Rockefeller Center. Walt looked sick and I felt it. What could we do? We knew nothing about our killer or where he'd strike next. Walt called in the reporters and gave them the story. The papers were blasted to the department, but it was the best way to warn the public to stay off the streets. The department was alerted, radio stations were given bulletins to broadcast, and Walt and I climbed into a prowl car and started cruising. At 8.5, it came in. Attention, all units in the vicinity of Zone 12, a 211 in front of 415 West 64, 415 William 64, ambulance, dead body, car 73, come in please. 
Seven three, go ahead. Two eleven at four fifteen. West six four is a stabbing, Lieutenant. Roger. That's it, Rick. The victim was an elderly man dressed expensively and lying face down on the sidewalk. Again, no witnesses to the killing. Most of the people who had seen the man fall realized almost immediately what had happened because of the publicity on the last two killings. But like one man said... Well, how are you going to see who killed him in a crowd like this? Maybe a hundred people on the block when it happens. Boy, you guys better start doing something. Yes, sir. Does Mr. Arthur Reeves live here? Yes, sir, but Mr. Reeves is not in at the moment. I'm from the police. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Homicide? I'd like to talk with everybody in the house. Certainly, sir. Has something happened to Mr. Reeves? He's been murdered. Oh, no. No, not Mr. Reeves. How many people in the house? Myself, the maid, and Mr. George Reeves, Mr. Reeves' nephew. Tell him I'd like to talk with him. And we talked with the three people in the dead man's house. The maid, the butler, and George Reeves, the nephew. I warned him not to take his walk tonight. I showed him the papers. Did he usually take walks at night? That's for the past 15 years. Know why anyone would want to kill him? Mr. Reeves? Of course not. You know very good and well it was that fiend what did it. How about you? Can you think of why anyone would want to kill your employer? No, sir. I've been with Mr. Reeves for over 20 years. I'm acquainted with most of his friends and associates. Look here. I can assure you that my uncle knew no one who would want to kill him. You're his nephew? That's right. Your uncle took walks every night? Yes, every night. Well, if you don't mind, we'd like you all to come down to the station to make statements. Okay, we got the statements and other list of names and a long one. None of these killings tie together. Nobody on the first list has any connection with anybody on the second list. Let's face it, if that madman calls again, we can't stop him. Oh, take it easy, Well, you? can we? I want to talk to the maid, the butler, and the nephew again. Why? It's just the same as all the others. I want to talk to them, okay? I'm sorry. Getting jumpy. No, you're tired. So am I. Otis, send in the maid. What are you doing? Fixing the recorder. I may want to listen to it again. So we again talked to the maid, then the butler... Then the nephew and the tape recorder picked up everything they said, and it sounded very much like everything everybody else had said after the first two killings. Walt let them go home and went up to talk to the commissioner. When he came back, he looked pretty discouraged. I'm sure on the griddle. Solve it or turn in my badge. I want you to listen to something. Oh, sure. I've cut out sections of tape, stuck them together. Mr. Reeves took walks every night after dinner, and dinner was always at seven? That's right. Then he always left sometimes close to eight? Yes, 7.30 or a quarter to eight. He was never gone more than half an hour? No. What time did he leave tonight? About a quarter to eight. Weren't you worried when he didn't come back within half an hour? Well, certainly. Both the maid and I were very anxious. Were you all in the house between a quarter of eight and the time we arrived? Yes, sir. Where was Mr. Reeves' nephew? In his room. He went up right after dinner. How wealthy was your employer? He was very wealthy. Mr. Reeves, who inherits your uncle's fortune? Why, I do. Was Mr. Reeves ever longer than half an hour with his walks? Never more than a few minutes, one way or the other. Who handles your uncle's affairs, Mr. Reeves? Well, Richard B. Gregg. He's been my uncle's attorney for many years. Young Mr. Reeves has always been excitable. Gotten a lot of trouble in the past. Yes, he argued with his uncle many times. No, Mr. Reeves didn't come down and ask why his uncle had been gone so long. Certainly I worried about my uncle, but I thought he might have stopped along the way for something or other. Okay, so you took out pieces of the testimony and stuck them together. So what? Just this. Every one of these killings have taken place at 8 o'clock. I know, and it's worried you. Now, this is the first time that one of our victims was certain to be out on the streets at 8 o'clock. Coincidence. Ah, uh, maybe, maybe. Mr. Reeves was a wealthy man, very wealthy. And the nephew gets his money, and the nephew was in his room at the time of the killing. Who saw him? The butler and the maid both say he was up there. So he climbs out a window. His uncle was killed only two blocks from the house. Plenty of time to stab him, get back through the window. You're really reaching out, aren't you? Uh, sure I am. What do you want me to do? 
Well, the nephew's voice certainly doesn't match the ones we got on the threatening phone calls. So he disguises it. I got an idea. What? Let's put a tail on all three of these people anyway. It's not much. It's all we've got so far. I'm going out to check on something. What? Here's something that'll make your hair curl. I just saw the attorney for the Reeves estate, and he said the old man was planning on changing his will, leaving all his money to charity, not his nephew. He was supposed to meet with Mr. Reeves this morning. And Reeves gets killed last night. Pretty convenient for the nephew. We can't arrest him on that. No, but it makes a good motive. You think the nephew would kill two men and then his uncle, just so it would look like a madman had picked out another innocent victim? You've got to admit it'd be pretty clever. There's an understatement. Yeah. He's on the line again, Lieutenant. I'm tracing him. Oh, no. Our boy again. There goes your theory. Hello. You can't do anything, Lieutenant. I've killed three men and you can't stop me. I'm going to kill again tonight at eight. Hello. With him, all right. Tonight at eight. Rick, we've just got to do... Yeah? Call came from Grand Central again. Okay. Well, what happens to your theory now? Well, he might do it again. Expect you to react just this way. Uh, who's tailing George Reeves? Harrison. When does he report in again? Checks in on the hour. Last time was about 20 minutes ago. 40 minutes ago, huh? No way of contacting him? No. Nope. Okay, we wait. Yeah? Yeah? Where was he at 446? Don't let him out of your sight. Well? At 446, George Reeves made a phone call from a booth in Grand Central Station. He's home now. Well, we had something. A motive and a man calling from Grand Central, but not enough to make an arrest. We waited until 7 and then headed for the Reeves house. The area is surrounded. He'll have two men on him no matter where he goes. He's still in the house? According to Harrison. No, I want to do more than pick him up with a knife. Here he comes. Yeah. Climbing into his car. Attention, cars 314-15. Suspect heading east. Proceed east on your street. We tailed him, keeping in contact with the other cars as they stayed parallel. When Reeves turned off, we went on ahead, notified the car in our right or left to pick him up. That way, Reeves wouldn't suspect a tail. About 7.30, we got a call that Reeves had parked. We headed to the spot in a hurry. Suspect is heading north on Calder. Oh, well, get ahead of him. Park at the corner of Davis. We'll pick him up there. We stopped at the corner and got out of the car. We waited until we spotted Reeves walking in our direction and then let him pass and followed, staying close. We kept after him until five minutes to eight. He swung out on Broadway and was pushing his way through the crowd. Then it happened. Where'd he go? We've lost him. Come on. Three minutes to eight. Let us through, please. Well, I never... Get out of the way. Oh, you're pushed. Shut up. You see him turn off? No, he's got to be... Walk, walk. Crossing the street. Let's go. Breathe. No. Look out for the knife. No, no. Let me go. Let me go. Drop it. You okay? Yeah. Here's the knife. Young man. Young man, what right have you got to hit that nice gentleman? He was helping me across the street. I have a good mind to report Lady, you. lady. If this man was helping you across the street, just forget about him. Go bet on a horse or something. This is your lucky night. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Pat Novak for hire. Sure. I'm Pat 
Novak for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Because around here, a set of morals won't cause any more stir than Mother's Day in an orphanage. Maybe that's not good, but that's the way it is. And it wouldn't do any good to build a church down here. Because some guy would muscle in and start cutting the wine with wood alcohol. All you can do is try to make the books balance. And the easiest way to do that is keep one hand on your billfold and the other hand on somebody else's. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that'll buy a warm winter. Works out all right. It saves the government a lot of money. But if anything goes wrong, your trouble comes hard. It doesn't do any good to sing the blues because down here, you're just another guy in the chorus. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. It started to rain up by Pier 19 and I knew there was a storm on the way. The bay looked flat and smoothed over. But you can say that for a lot of quarrels. So I closed the office and walked down to the barber shop for a shave. The barber lathered me up so I couldn't answer back and started to tell me how Dean Atchison ought to handle things. About five minutes later, somebody walked into the shop and started to tap on my foot. He got tired of that and moved up to my chest. Hey, you listening? Hey, stop pushing. That's my chest, not a buzzer. Are you listening? Yeah. What's on your mind? Hey, I want to talk to you alone. He's a barber. He won't listen. Let's go alone. All right, let's go. I'll be back in a minute. How do you like that? I got a 14 to to my wife. He says... I... I want to hire you tonight. Will you do something for me? Not for friendship. I give you $200 to follow a woman. I've done it for less. Not this kind. Her name is Agnes Bolton. You'll find her at 7 o'clock tonight down at this bowling alley. Here's the card. Mm -hmm. The address is there. How do I spot her? Read it off an ankle bracelet? You won't have any trouble. She's a large woman about 50 years old with a reddish face. Well, that's no help. For 50, she sounds normal. Not Agnes. She couldn't pass for 90. She'll be playing in the last alley with a woman's team called the Playmores. Yeah. You'll follow her out of the bowling alley. Somewhere along the line, she'll pick up a green leather bag. After that, I need your help. It doesn't sound like love. She'll go to the Yacht Harbor. Get aboard a boat called Seventh Heaven. I want you to have your boat ready and follow her into the bay. She'll leave that bag aboard some ship. I want to know the name of it. Now, is that $200 worth? Yes. I'll wait for you in your office. Contact me there and be careful. Is she that tough? No, but her friends are. With a figure like that, how come she's got any? They're holdovers. Now, just be careful. Yeah. Well, it sounds easy at these prices. That depends on your luck, Mr. Novak. If it turns bad, you've been cheating. He stood at the door for a minute and his eyes swept the shop like a $10 broom. And then he turned around and walked off. Now well, you couldn't tell anything from his face and his smile was as smooth as a pound of liver and a bucket of glycerin. Well, after I finished, I went down to Pier 19 and I took the boat up to the Yacht Harbor. I tied up near the 7th Heaven and I started downtown to that bowling alley. It was ladies' night. And I stood against the back rail and watched the women bowl. Most of them were wearing slacks, and if I ever get a few bucks ahead, I know the right business. At least the demand is there. About ten minutes after I got there, Agnes Bolton showed up, and I knew right away Max Hunter overrated her. She was at least fifty, because you can't get that ugly without years of practice. She was wearing a green woolen dress, and her figure wasn't any worse than a bale of cotton somebody's cut the wire on. The fat hung down from her arms, and there was so much of it, you knew even her bones were plump. And Max was right about her complexion. It was red and scratchy as if she used a bag of sand for cold cream. Well, I must have stood there about ten minutes watching him bowl when the other girl came up. I didn't see her, but I felt her as she brushed up against me from behind. She leaned on the railing close to me, and when she started to talk, it was like grafting a hot iron onto your spine. You look sad, Mr. Novak. Is it the view? What are you, the repair squad? No. I want you to do me a favor. You do me one. Hmm? Slide over. I bruise easy. Oh? No, what's on your mind? I want you to do me a favor. Don't follow Agnes Bolton. You're pretty, but I got Max Hunter's dough. I'll help you spend it. 
Don't let Agnes Bolton get to that boat. Look, Angel, go warm up an armory. I got a deal. Suppose I tell Agnes Bolton you're going to follow her. You tell her first without tagging by here. Now, if you got something on your mind, lay it on the line or relax. I want her worse than Max Hunter does. When she gets that green bag, I want you to bring her to me. I couldn't move her that far. You better rent a derrick. Please, Mr. Novak. It's important to me. I want to talk to Agnes Bolton. I can give you more money than Max Hunter. You haven't got enough to cover, lady. You're talking about kidnapping, and that's a federal rap. The answer's no. You're sure? Unless you want to change the offer. I hope you make it, darling. I may. Don't bet you $200. It's bad to die broke. Is anybody that tough? Now it's my turn to brush you off. Go ahead and follow her, Mr. Novak. But I'll bet you have to roll her the last couple of miles. Hmm? And unless you can prove it's an election bet, the police will cause you trouble. Well, I watched her as she turned her back and walked out of there. She looked real good. She was wearing a tight jersey dress that gave you the idea she either thought the weather was warm or she wasn't much on details. Well, I turned around and looked for Agnes Bolton. The game was breaking up and she started into the dressing room. A few minutes later, she came out and started down Market Street. There was no trouble following her. You could see her in the crowd. And she rolled from side to side as she walked, and when she bumped into anybody, they looked back at her as if they'd been hit in the chest with a sack of jelly. She crossed the street at Stockton went into a little coin shop. She came out about five minutes later with a green leather bag. She strapped it over her shoulder and she held onto her purse with the other hand. At Powell Street, she got on the cable car up near the front. I moved up there to be safe. She looked heavy enough to tip a cable car uphill. In that light, she didn't look any better. Part of her hair had come undone and hung down in her face like the branches on a dead tree. I noticed her eyes for the first time. They were small and so close together they could have saved time and put them in one socket. Well, she got off the cable car at Geary and walked into a hotel. I followed her and watched her squeeze into a telephone booth on the other side of the lobby. The way she fit, a sardine ought to be happy. She took some money out of her purse and started to dial. A couple of people moved in front of her and I didn't get a look at her for about five minutes. And When they moved away, she was still talking to somebody. I looked up about ten minutes later and I knew something was wrong. Her head was pressed against the phone. She'd run out of conversation. I walked across the lobby and opened the door to get to the phone booth. She fell out as old as she'd ever get. There, hey, help me get over to the couch, will you? Yes, sir. Was she your wife? Well, she was. This is the way I'd want her. Her purse is spilled all over the floor. Sure is a mess. Yeah. She's some relative, huh? Look, mister, stop trying to pair us up. I was around when she tumbled out, that's all. Yeah. What'd she die from? I don't know. I just figured you might know what she died from. No, I don't. It's a simple question to answer when you know what all she right, died all from. Right, let me through here. Come on. All right, stand back. Give her air. She can't use any more copper. Huh? She quit about five minutes ago. Who are you? I'm not dead. She is. Well, then who's she? You better check on her stuff. And don't forget that green bag. Yeah. I... What bag? The green bag over there on the floor. Well, it was over there a minute ago. The same one the little guy had? What little guy? The one who was talking to you, he just walked out of here carrying a green bag. Well, I got out on the street, and the little man had just crossed Geary. He turned and looked back once, and I saw him melt into the crowd and disappear quick like the wake of a ship on a dark night. When I came back to the lobby, the copper was over by the couch making noises in his throat as if he was trying to eat a pound of cellophane. The manager of the hotel was wringing his hands and making little steps like a ballet dancer with a hot foot. The copper took my name and put in a call to homicide, and a few minutes later, I got into that phone booth. There was a number on the pad, and I took it down. It was Greystone 42961. Well, it didn't prove much, but Agnes Bolton wasn't out to prove much tonight. I began going through the phone book, but there was no Max Hunter listed, and when I called the office, nobody answered. I knew there was as much chance of him showing up as a second piece of butter on a 50-cent lunch. I ran down that Greystone number and found out it was an address out on Post Street. I walked through the lobby and out the side door. Some of the people were out of the dining room and they looked mad because Agnes Bolton had died during the roast beef instead of later. Well, I walked down Geary to the Union Square garage and gave the guy my ticket. He started down the ramp for the car and I stood there waiting. I must have looked lonely because Hellman from Homicide shoved up near the cashier's cage and started over. He made his way through the cars, and as he squeezed by the last one, he looked like a sea lion. 
Hello, Novak. We identified her. Well, you had lots to work with, Hellman. Where are you going? Out on Post Street. I'll go with you. Her name was Agnes Bolton. You read it somewhere? She was a government agent. They got their money's worth. Coroner says she died of quick poison. How quick? Five minutes. You're working him too hard, Hellman. He's got a license. He says five minutes. She was in that phone booth ten minutes. Nobody got to her. She looked dead to me, Novak. I don't believe you. Well, I'm hurt. I don't believe a thing you say. That's up to you. I'm not starting a religion, Hellman. I watched her for ten minutes. Nobody got to her. You better check on that little guy. Yeah? She was carrying a green bag. A little guy walked out of there with He sounds hard to find. You don't. Hey, mister, is this your ticket? Yeah, it's a blue nag. You better come down and drive it up. Why? I can't get to the wheel. The guy on there won't move. Huh? I don't blame him either. When you're dead, you got a right to rest. Hellman stood there a minute, wiping his teeth with his tongue, and it began to sound like somebody beating the bathtub with a piece of steak. When he finished making noises, we walked down the ramp to the car. It was the little guy who had taken the green bag. He was hunched over, and he was grabbing the wheel as if he'd just married it. Hellman lifted his head up and laid him across the seat. The light was bad, but you could see a little of his face. It was watering around his forehead, and the damp hair was plastered down under his hat brim. The perspiration had broken up and started to run down his forehead like tears, and you got the idea he cried out of his hairline instead of his eyes. He didn't look surprised or pained. He just stared with a puzzled look as if he'd missed part of the conversation. Hellman stood there trying to wipe some egg off his coat and turning to look at the guy to make sure he didn't leave. So what happened, Novak? So he had an automobile accident, Hellman. I don't know. He's your passenger? He bummed the ride himself. When I saw him, he was on his way with that green bag. Where is it? He got talked out of it. You better check on a guy named Max Hunter. Uh, whose cousin is he? He gave me 200 bucks to tail Agnes Bolton. I got another offer, too. Yeah. A blonde biscuit, and she said everything on the beat. For a total stranger, you sure met a lot of people. You better meet a lot of them, too, Hellman, because one of them got to Agnes Bolton. How about Junior here? Did he crawl down the ramp and die on your seat covers? I don't know how he got here. Well, maybe you left him here and forgot. No, he wouldn't slip my mind. I haven't murdered anybody in the front seat. I bet it's lively, though. You better get a story, Novak. You already got mine, Hellman. You won't like the ending. No, but I bet you do. I like it fine, Novak. You're the only lead on Agnes Bolton. I'll shop around and get enough to pin you down. You couldn't pin down a dead butterfly, Hellman. You better look up Max Hunter and check on a boat called the Seventh Heaven. I will, and I'll put a tail on you, Novak. Follow you all over San Francisco. He'll go any place. That's fine, because I got a suggestion. As soon as Hellman left, I took a cab out to that address on Post Street, but it was a waste of time. I might as well have been peddling tip sheets in a monastery. It was a brown house on the corner, and there was a big curved window that stuck out from the rest of the house like a wart on the back of your neck. A toothy old man answered the door and said he didn't know Agnes Bolton. I was pretty sure he was on the level. He just kept nodding his head and rubbing the wrinkles on his face. There were enough of them there to bundle up and sell as a canal. I left though downtown again. On the way, I went by the yacht harbor, and the seventh heaven had moved out into the stream. Well, it was raining harder now, and the rocks looked shiny as if somebody had given them a coat of egg white. Well, I had a couple of places to hit, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy who never learned that if you keep your foot on a bar rail for 20 years, it'll do more good for your arches than it will for your brain. I finally found him in the hunt room of the Bellevue Hotel. A drink for Mr. Novak. Uh, something to take off the chill. No, I don't want to drink, Jocko, and you've had enough, too. I refuse to shiver to death, Patsy. I'd look terrible with a blue face. Will you stop drinking, Jocko? I hate whiskey, Patsy, but I'm drinking tonight with a purpose. I made a deal with Charlie the bartender to buy every eighth drink, and I've got him on the run. By morning, I'll have him in bankruptcy court. Look, Jocko, I'm in trouble. I always know when I've had enough to drink, Patsy. When I tilt the glass up, the rim rubs against the bridge of my nose. It's a sort of safeguard so that when my nose begins to break out in blisters, I know I've had enough for the night. Will you listen? Patsy, you sound like a young girl coming home from boarding school. You'll never be on the right side of things. You'll always be in trouble because you're a bad citizen. You're a shabby half-step in the march of progress. All right, Jocko. You don't know the difference between good and evil. For you, all of human endeavor is a vague blur in high heels. And your vocabulary is a few gutter terms sandwiched in between yes and no. You'll never be any good, Patsy. Yeah, yeah. You might as well try to recapture melancholy or ventilate a swamp. You haven't a chance, Patsy. You'll never be any good. Are you all through, Jocko? 
Yes, if you're going to be touchy. Hellman wants me on a murder rap. Yes? Some tubby woman died in the hotel lobby. Sounds like his mother. She was a government agent. I followed her in there. Patsy, you've got to start trusting the government. I was paid to follow her, but she ate some poison somewhere along the line. Ah, uh, that's the trouble with food. I got hired by a guy named Max Hunter. Look him up and resign. That's the best way out of this thing. I don't know where to find him. And I think that Max Hunter's a phony. Oh, you got to help me. Yeah? Now, he gave me this card. His prints must be on it. Check it down at headquarters, will you? Find out if he's got a record and then tag by my place. Yes, uh, I better have a drink first. There's an ugly taste in my mouth. I, uh, I think it's saliva. Will you hurry up, Jocko? All you do is drink. That's all I have left, Patsy. I'm too young to die and too old to do almost anything else. Yeah, sure. It's true, Patsy. When you get to be my age, most of the quiet pleasures are fattening, and most of the active ones would kill me. Good night, lover. <laughs> Jocko, I dropped by the Chronicle morgue to look up Max Hunter. There was nothing under Hunter. I looked through every Max from Bear back to Beerbum, and I couldn't find a thing. Well, it was close to 11 when I rode down to the office for a final check. It wasn't raining hard anymore. It was a nice, easy drizzle, and you could hear it playing against the sheds along Pier 19. It sounded quiet, almost private, like the sound a woman makes when she runs her fingernail up and down her stocking. It got on your nerves at first, and then you began to enjoy it. The minute I got to the door, I knew something was wrong. There wasn't any reason, but I got the feeling. The same way you know sometimes when you're going to get the busy signal on the phone. I could see her lying there on the floor before I turned on the light. You took one look at her, and you knew she was the sort of girl whose name ought to be Pearl or Myrtle. Somebody would sapped her, and she was lying with one hand stretched out and the other under her hair. It wasn't really hair. It looked more like a pelt or a raccoon just after a shampoo. It was fuzzed up on the sides, and on top she'd combed it back so tight it was about to go under the scalp. She began to move a little. When I bent over, she started to mumble. What do you want? The red, if you're going to stay long. Here, put your head up. Are you Mr. Novak? It's too late to change. Where's Agnes Bolton? Where'd she go, Mr. Novak? I don't know where she went. Was she a good girl? Something's happened to her. Don't worry. It won't happen again. Who sent you here, Max Hunter? Yeah. Please help me out. All right. Come on. I'm Francine Kane. I came to find out about Agnes Bolton. You're a deep sleeper. What happened? You wouldn't know her. I would if she's a tall blonde on the make for that green bag. Who is she? Joan Haywood. You can find her at the Geary Theater. Is she an actress? Not exactly. Yeah. Her stray talents, Mr. Novak, are dimensional rather than dramatic. If you're smart, you'll stay away from her. Don't tell him anymore, Fran. He's paid up. Hello, Hunter. You oversold me. You give me back the 200. I'm going to give you lots for your money. Don't include Agnes Bolton. I don't know anything about her. Is that a lie? Might be. There's a green bag. Joan Hayward has it. Is that a lie? The little guy didn't think so. She left him dead in my car. Let's go, Fran. No, you're in a hurry, Mac. You're not. I hope you like your office, Novak. Huh? Because this is where you're going to spend the night. <laughs> Don't let him feel bad, lady. It must have been his turn. When I left, he was crumpled up against the desk and she was staring down at him as if she forgot to water the plants. When I rode by the Geary Theater, it was dark, so I looked up Joan Hayward's address. When I got out to her place, I knew I'd made a mistake. The landlady clutched her bathrobe like a bar of solid gold and told me Joan Hayward left the house ten minutes ago. There was a cabbie at the corner, and he said he dropped her at the gold bar club a few minutes before. I got down there about one o'clock, and Hellman was wandering around, stopping every few feet as if he expected to hear something. The bar was dark except for a light over on one side, and over near the jukebox, Joan Hayward was stretched out as dead as a deer on a fender. At first, Hellman didn't pay any attention when I walked in. I stood there for a while and looked at Joan Hayward and... She still looked pretty, except in the dim light her skin looked coarse and reminded you of a piece of felt that was almost worn out. But the rest was all right, and Hellman came over for another look. What did you forget, Novak? My black tie. How'd it happen? The bar was closed. Where were you? Crawling out from under your thumb. Yeah. We're going to keep that coroner. It was quick poison. Yeah. We found a needle in her coin purse. She didn't know about it and ran into trouble when she started to call up. 
You better find this guy, Max Hunter. That's going to be hard. Yeah? There is no Max Hunter. Does she believe that? Your shicker friend came in with a card. We went over the fingerprints. They belong to Jackie Wren. He's wanted for espionage. For more than that now, Hellman. Maybe. Where have you been? Look, Hellman, stop needling me. I won't go on the block for her. Don't you like her? I got an alibi you can't break. I've been all over town. Ask your tale. Ask your tale where I've been. That won't get it. Huh? He reported in at 11.30. You got the wrong idea, Novak. You don't raid over time. <laughs> left there, I knew everything was downhill. Hellman could stick me for everything but Dan McGrew. My only out was to find Jackie Wren, but you can't ring that many doorbells in one night. I went through the book, but there was no Jackie Wren or Max Hunter listed. I went home to get some sleep, and if they turned Gabriel loose tonight, it was all right with me. Jocko called up about nine and said there was still no trace of Wren. Well, some mornings you can't trust yourself with a razor, so... I got dressed and went down to a Greek's on Geary Street for breakfast. The murder was all over page one, but there were so many pictures of Hellman, you couldn't tell who was dead. I was about halfway through breakfast when I noticed the story down in the corner. A girl named Tony Pritchard had been found dead out in the marina. The story said everybody liked her. The police didn't have a lead, and they couldn't find a reason. It seemed kind of funny, but when I got to the last paragraph, I began to wonder... It said she was employed by the Musitone Company and worked the late shift as a switchboard operator. I wasn't sure, but you can't pass the dice when you only got a buck left, so I jumped down to see Frank Lupo. He said the Musitone Company owned the jukebox and the gold bar club, and that it worked like all the rest. People use a little microphone in front of the box. They call into a main switchboard for songs. I grabbed Jocko, and we got up to the Musitone Company. The guy in charge said, sure, they recorded some of the talk just to check on the girls, and sometimes the girls did it just for laughs. Well, we started through the recordings, and about a half hour later, Jocko rolled a seven. No, Patsy, they're all old ones. Try this. Yeah. Well, put it down. I'll handle the needle. Uh, there. You're crazy, Jackie. She'll know something's wrong. Let me handle it, friend. You'll just get into trouble. I don't want you to get into trouble, Jackie. Will you let me worry? You get back to the hotel. I'll meet you at the Kenwood right after. It's too late. She's coming now. I think I'll as soon as you call, Jackie. You made a mistake, Joe. It's one time you shouldn't have hurried. That's enough, Jocko. Let's get up to Kenwood. Why don't we think it over a while? Put the record down and come on there at the Kenwood. You heard the shots. That's what I'm worried about. If that fellow's any kind of a mechanic, he's had time to reload. <laughs> I got down to headquarters and told Hellman why that girl, Tony Pritchard, lost her vote. We rode out to the Kenwood, and Hellman started through the register. There was no Jackie Wren listed, and we didn't have any better luck with the girl. I briefed the desk clerk, and he said he thought there were two people in the hotel who looked like that, but he didn't know their names. Well, all we could do was wait for him to show. So Hellman and I walked down the street and slid into the car. It must have been about 3 o'clock, and for the next four hours, we sat in there. About 7 o'clock, it began to rain harder. It wasn't easy to see the front of the Kenwood. I got out to wipe the windshield, and that was a mistake, because just then, the door of the hotel swung open. The girl came out first, and then Jackie Wren. He saw me right away, and the two of them jumped over to the curb and got into a car. Riding with Hellman's, just about as safe as eating an arsenic sandwich. When we got to the corner, they turned east and started down Bush. It wasn't easy to stay behind them. The rain was hitting the windshield, and it was like trying to see through a mint julep. When we got past Jones, Hellman began to close in. It must have scared Wren too much because it stopped and he swung the car around with Hellman a few feet behind and it was a dead end both ways. He can't get out now. Open the door. Yeah. There he is, over to the wall. Over here, Hellman. He'll go down that embankment on the other side. Well, he can't. It's too steep. Stay on this side. Can you see him? No. But he's around, I think. You got a chance now, Ren. Come on out. I don't like you that well, mister. Over there by the embankment. Can you see the girl? She's with him. Over to one side. Move up in front. Oh, you're confused, Hellman. I pay the taxes. It's gonna hurt from now on, Ren. I'm coming over. I hope you make it, copper. All right, copper. Unless you want a medal, I'm through. You don't need the gun, then. Get rid of it. Just toss it over there. I can't even lift my arm. Throw it down, mister. Jackie, Jackie, please. I'll throw it right at you. Cop! Ah, good Francine, you crazy woman, you crazy. 
You let him kill me. He's going over that embankment. You let him kill me right in front of you. Ah! No. No, Jackie. Please, Jackie. I tried to stop you. I tried to stop you, Jackie. Grab her, Novak. She's going over. Leave me alone. Who on him? Jackie, I want you. Grab her. I want you, Jackie. At least they can let me have this. Jackie! No! Long way down. Yeah. Too bad her name wasn't Jill. Last I saw Francine, she was lying down at the bottom in the rain. Her head was over to one side, and you knew with a little push she'd roll around as easy as a ball bearing on a plate. Her face was clean, but the rain was beginning to wash the dirt down, and when I left, she wasn't pretty anymore. Jackie Wren outlasted her by a few hours, and Hellman used them all. Agnes Bolton was carrying government papers bound for China. The four people were split into teams... Jackie Wren and Francine were trying to outbid Joan Hayward and the little guy. The way Jackie had it figured, he'd find out what ship they were going out on and pick it up from there. Joan Hayward knew he was dealing with me, so she followed me after I left that barber shop. She saw me park the car in that garage and tailed me down to the bowling alley. She planted the needle in Agnes Bolton's purse, and the little guy tagged along behind waiting for something to happen. Just to be on the safe side in case anything went wrong... Joan doubled by the office and gave Francine a headache. When the little guy got the green bag, he took it to Joan. It was too good to split, so she killed him and left him in my car. Well, then she made a mistake. When Jackie called her up and asked her to come down to the gold bar club, she bought the story. Well, it would have worked out fine for Jackie if he hadn't talked in front of that microphone. But a nosy girl heard it and tried to put the screws on him. Well, Hellman asked only one question. About that conversation between Jackie and the girl. Why would a person say anything that private in front of a microphone? I don't know. But I told him about a couple of others Jocko and I heard. He didn't say anything. But I'll bet he gets a hold of those records and plays them every night before he goes to sleep. When the will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it. And that included me. But I changed my mind after spending a night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And 
now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Where There's a Will. I had spent the whole day on a noisy job which had concerned itself with a lot of people who talked a lot and said nothing. When I finally locked up my office for the night, I was worn out. As I drove slowly along the street, I was glad to be heading for home and a little peace and quiet. At least, that's what I thought. But when I pulled up for a full stop sign, only a half a block from my apartment, something happened which brought my little dream of peace and quiet to an end. The car door opposite me flew open and something mighty excited jumped in. I'm being followed. Drive on, please. The law? No, please drive on. Okay, lady, get a good grip on the upholstery. to do it. Now, what's the... Say, you look a little pale and beautiful. I'm always pale when my heart's in my mouth. Well, then why don't you swallow once, take a deep breath, and tell me who was after you? There isn't much to tell. It was a nasty little man, that's all I know. So thanks for making like Barney Oldfield, and good night. Hey, hey, not so fast. <laughs> it's impolite to hitch and run. Look, mister, right now I'm up to my earrings in trouble, and that leaves very little time for small talk with strangers. Even nice ones. Well, in that case, the name is Philip Marlowe, which takes care of the stranger part, and I'm a private detective, which makes trouble my business. <laughs> Where do we go from there? No place. $300,000 worth of hidden bonds, a screwy old lady and a sculptor with a red beard are too much for any one-man police force, Mr. Marlowe. So again, good night. Before I could say anything, she was out and gone. There was only the heady scent of taboo in the air. And the memory of a gorgeous profile with jet black hair and pale blue eyes. I sighed like a schoolboy and decided to put her under the heading of things that pass in the night. But I couldn't. Why out of all the cars in Los Angeles should she have picked on mine? Well, the next morning as I was walking down the corridor to my office door, I was still seeing pale blue eyes. Maybe that's why I didn't notice the man who waited outside my door until I was almost on top of him. He was well-dressed and about 35. He looked like a man who had forgotten how to smile. Marlowe. Right. I want to compliment you on your behavior last night, Mr. Marlowe. Barbara told me about it. Oh? Come on in, Mr. Uh... Shields. Edward Shields. Would you be interested in aiding three people in a search for more than a quarter of a million dollars in negotiable bonds? One percent of which will be yours if the bonds are found? Uh, being a fairly fast man with figures, yes. Yes, I would. Splendid. I'd like a few details. Well, Mr. Marlowe, my aunt, Bernice Mayhew Shaw, died, leaving her entire fortune to charity, with the exception of the bonds I mentioned. Those are to be divided equally among three of us, the sole heirs, if we find them within 24 hours. Hmm, that sounds like something you dream about after a midnight snack of pizza and pig's knuckles. Perhaps, but you didn't know my aunt. Beside myself, the beneficiaries are Barbara Haynes, the girl you met last night, she was Aunt Bernice's personal secretary. And another nephew, Harlan Crane, who at the moment happens to be a sculptor. Happens to be? Six months ago, he was a sailor. Before that, a <laughs> writer. Without even a rejection slip to his name. My cousin is irresponsible, impetuous, and completely self indulgent uh, The will but... itself, Mr. Shields, what are the exact conditions? At precisely noon today, the three of us are to meet with Luther Willard, my beloved aunt's lawyer who will give us each a large sheet of tissue paper covered with specific markings. Individually, the sheets mean absolutely nothing. But combined, one over the other, the transparent sheets form a coherent map to the location of the bond. But uh, why all the intrigue? My dear departed aunt had a peculiar sense of humor. In addition to this, she was never particularly fond of any of us. She was sure that our individual shortcomings would make cooperation among us impossible even for so short a period as 24 hours. And the fact that a man followed Miss Haynes last night convinced you that there was something to that, huh? Convinced me? No. He may have been nothing but a purse snatcher. Nevertheless, I do feel that to play safe a fourth party, a custodian of the map, so to speak, would be advisable. That's fine. When do I go to work, Mr. Shields? At noon, at the lawyer's office. However, I regret that first you must be approved by the third heir. 
I don't like to ask this, Mr. Marlowe, but would you mind very much calling on my cousin, Arlen, personally? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I think he might prove very interesting. Yes. I'm sure he will. As interesting as an ape in the zoo. <laughs> felt like saying, look, Shields, I'm not as gullible as I look. But then I thought a client's a client, and I decided to play along. Holland Crane, six-foot, red-bearded giant, talked as he worked, wielding a ten-pound sculptor's mallet like it was an 18th-century quill. I'll be frank with you, Marlowe. Money isn't everything to me and never has been. Over $100,000 will buy a lot of marble. Half the state of Vermont, I'd say. But coming to the point, Mr. Crane, do I get your seal of approval? Oh, I imagine you'll be all right. Anyone who can get by seals, the all-American Scrooge ought to do. Thanks, a million. I'm not being personal where you're concerned. It's just a matter of facing a fact bluntly. Edward Shields is conniving, avaricious, and dull. I heartily recommend him to nobody. And the girl, Barbara, you feel the same way about her? No, I don't. And the truth of the matter, Marlowe, is that I know very little about Barbara Haynes. What I do know, I like very much. Yeah, that I can understand. Marlowe, do you realize that once you have the whole map in your possession, you're worth an awful lot of money? Of course I do. The whole map, I have a market value of exactly $300,000. <laughs> That's right, fellow. $300,000, dead or alive. <laughs> I know it was small of me, but I didn't exactly see the joke. And things got less funny as time went on. Later, as me and my trio got off the elevator at the lawyer's office, old Luther Willard, Aunt Bernice's attorney, was waiting for us, so excited he could hardly talk. I... I've been held up. What? what? Yes. A little man. He wanted the map. He a little man? The... Dark complexion? Yes, yes. Had a scar on the side of his neck. How are the maps all right? Hmm? The maps? Oh, yes, yes. They're all right. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, everybody. Give him a chance. Mr. Willard, tell us exactly what happened. Uh, this is Mr. Marlowe. We told you about him, Mr. Willard. Uh, of course, yes, yes. Uh, can I come into my office? Uh, you see, I was putting some papers into my safe when this little man stepped up behind me and uh, demanded the maps. Well, were they in the safe? No, no, thank heavens. Uh, or make yourselves comfortable. The please. maps, Mr. Willard, where are they now? Uh, well, right here, where they were all the time. Here under the blotter on my desk. <laughs> Clever of me, wasn't it? <laughs> Wax seals, still intact. I'll take all three of them right now, Mr. Willard. That is, if there are no objections. <clears throat> all right, then I guess we can be on our way. Hold on, Mr. Marlowe. There are still two things you people must know. First, in the event the bonds are not recovered within the 24 hours, I am instructed to open another sealed envelope, which I am happy to report is kept in my bank vault. That envelope contains a complete and simplified map and is to be turned over to a designated charity. And second, if any of you die before the allotted time is up, the bonds are to be divided among the surviving persons. And if none of us survives, Mr. Willard... Why, in that case, the bonds again go to charity. You see, Harlan, your aunt was a very generous woman. After arranging to meet with the three heirs at Shields Place later that afternoon, I headed for the nice and public public library where I figured I'd be able to examine the maps in safety. By placing the three maps exactly one over the other... I saw that the bonds were hidden on the larger of two squares of land called Twin Islands, which were the personal property of the late Bernice Mayhew Shaw, and located in Indian Lake in the San Bernardino Mountains. As I left the library with the three maps in my pocket, I, I felt like a well-fed mallet on the opening day of hunting season. And then I knew I was being followed. As I slipped into a doorway and turned, I saw it was the nasty little man with the scar. All right, you, we're through playing tag. Oh, well, let me go. Ooh. Not yet, Shorty, not until you talk loud and clear. No, no, don't hit me, please. Please hit me down, I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. All right. If you're sure you can get it all straight the first time, <clears throat> there. Now, the whole story, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Yeah, like you say, whole story. Okay. Starts. Like this! Oh. By the time I figured out that it, 
had been the sawed-off end of a broomstick that had slammed my stomach up against my backbone. The little man was out of sight. Another five minutes went by before I quit calling myself sucker and I started to think straight. The nearest public locker was in the Santa Fe Trailways bus depot on Cahuenga. I went up there and deposited two-thirds of the map for safekeeping until we were ready to leave for Indian Lake. And I found a telephone, and a half a dozen calls later, I knew that a caretaker named Jumbo was the sole inhabitant of Twin Islands. And my last call was to him. I wanted some kind of a welcoming committee ready for us. When I left the phone booth, it was only one o'clock. So I returned to my apartment where I figured I'd rest until three, when we were all to meet at Shields' place. But that was my second mistake. Because the moment I closed my apartment door, I was positive I wasn't going to get much rest. I had an unannounced visitor. Yeah, you look surprised, Mr. Marlowe. I am. I didn't recognize you at first without your broomstick. Yeah, I traded that in on this twenty-two target pistol here. It's more expensive, but it's better. It makes me as big as you are. Maybe bigger. Yeah, but how much does it do for your personality? Quite a bit. Gives me poise. And poise gives me manners. So in asking for that map in your pocket, I'll even say please. Come on, Milo. I won't say please twice. No, I don't think you would. Here. Thank you. Now, before I go, one more thing. The hall outside here is straight and narrow, right to the stairs, and that makes it fine for shooting. So after I step out, don't do anything rash. For a while. So, loving life as I do, I didn't do anything rash for a while. In fact, I could have whipped up a nice seven-minute frosting before I moved at all. And I phoned the three heirs to get together at my apartment. When I finally had them all seated in front of me, I related the saga of the little man. Including my premonition that one of the three present was signing his paychecks. Of course, I got nothing but Cupid doll innocence out of any of them. So after adding that we'd get underway just as soon as the missing one-third of the map was returned to me, I threw my trench coat over my arm and told them I was going for a walk. But before leaving them, I reminded them that whoever was behind the little man could fire him. Because I would never have kept all three maps in one place anyway, unless all of the heirs were on hand to watch one another. And then I left. I hadn't walked more than a half a block up Franklin when I stopped at the sound of Barbara running after me. Bill, Bill, I'm scared. Harlan and Shields are acting like a couple of wild men, calling each other every name under the sun. What'd you expect? Chit-chat about the weather? I quit acting like a bobby soxer within squealing distance of Sinatra and try a cigarette. It'll calm your... What is it, Phil? Why are you smiling like that? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Barbara, nothing. <laughs> it's just that I found this in the pocket of my trench coat when I went for my cigarettes. It's the map. That's right. The missing third. It's back already. When that missing third part of the map turned up so fast, I figured the heirs had decided to play ball. But I made a mental note to keep my eyes on them anyway. At three o'clock, I went to Edward Shields' hillside house in Laurel Canyon for the scheduled meeting. Shields wasn't home yet, but Cousin Harlan was there admiring the view. Barbara showed up a few minutes later in a convertible, and Shields arrived last by cab. It finally began to look as though we might actually start out all together. Well, I see we all arrived safe and sound. Yeah. Disappointed? Only by your clumsy attempts at humor, Harlan. Stop it, boys. Let's get started. Phil, have you looked at the map? Where are we going? To Indian Lake. It's a four-hour drive, so if you're all ready, I suggest we get started. Very well. I'll go up to the garage and get the car. So Aunt Bernice hid the bonds in a roost at Twin Islands, eh? Well, well, well. <laughs> Nobody seemed surprised at the location Aunt Bernice had chosen to hide her bonds. And Harlan, Barbara, and I stood on the front porch watching Shields as he climbed the very steep driveway to his garage in the car. But Barbara got more of my attention than Shields. Ah, she made a mighty dreamy picture. And she leaned casually back against the rail of the porch. She wasn't aware that I was watching her. And I suddenly saw her go tense, her eyes filled with fear, and I quickly turned to follow her stare. Shields' car was going at a rapid clip down the steep driveway. I still couldn't figure out Barbara's concern, and then she started screaming. The car is out of control. The car was headed for the edge of a cliff. His brakes are out. You go over. The tree. The 
tree stopped him. Shields, are you hurt? No, no, I'm all right. The, the brakes, I, I tried to stop you. You hadn't hit that tree. You'd have gone over the edge. Let's have a look at those brake shields. Well, no wonder. What is it? Brake lines broken. Every drop of fluid drained out. I might have been killed. No might about it, Shields. We stood there for a while, all looking at one another, but nothing was said. Brake lines rarely snap accidentally. And I remembered that Holland had been at Shields' house early, and the car had been in the garage, and Barbara... Well, I had to admit that she actually had anticipated the car going out of control... Well, the 24 hours for finding the bonds were slipping by, and I knew we had to get to Indian Lake. We held a short powwow without passing the peace pipe, and we decided to take Barbara's car. We picked up the rest of the map, which I checked at the bus station, and we shoved off. After a four-hour drive that was about as relaxing as the thought of an overdue time bomb in a day nursery, we finally pulled up to the shores of Indian Lake. Jumbo, the caretaker, was waiting at the dock. He knew how to handle a boat, and a few minutes later, we could see Twin Islands. We headed for the smaller of the two, where I could make out a rambling lodge. The other island, a quarter of a mile away, seemed deserted. Shields was the first one ashore. Here, Barbara, let me help you. Run along, boy. I'll help Barbara. Thanks, Harlan. Well, Marlo, what now? Well, first we go up to the house. Oh, Jumbo, you got everything ready for us? Hey, Jumbo. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure, everything's ready, Mr. Marlo. It's like you said, I opened four of the upstairs rooms. Open the rooms? We're not going to sleep out here, are we? We're going to try. But this isn't a vacation. We're here to find the bonds and get out. You realize it's almost nine already? That leaves us just 15 hours, Marlo. Yeah, I know. I got a good watch and I count to 24 and I'm also giving orders to Don't you three. Don't get high-handed, Marlo. You're an employee of ours and that's all. Let's get the map together and start looking for those bonds right now. Take it easy, big man. The bonds are hidden on the other island. The map is as tangled as a second-hand spider web. We wouldn't get anything at all down in the dark. That's your opinion. Look, you I... people hired me to help you find those bonds. If I have to get nasty to make you take orders, I can do that too. Now let's play like we're smart and go up to the lodge and relax. All right, Marlo. But remember, we'd better have those bonds by tomorrow, or someone else will be nasty. Very nasty. And I mean me. What? You too? <laughs> Getting the three heirs settled down at dinner table was quite a chore. And when I was sure they'd keep an eye on each other, I slipped outside. I hid one third of the map in a drain pipe. Then I went upstairs to my room and I hid another third in the window shade. Now the maps were settled and I began to think about other things like... like the accident to Shield's car. And there were too many accidents and coincidences to suit me. So I decided to drop in on Cousin Holland's room to see what I could see. After 15 fruitless minutes, I was about to leave when something in the wastebasket caught my eye. A corner of a half-hidden handkerchief monogrammed H.C. I had just picked it up when I saw Jumbo standing in the open door. That handkerchief there in your hand, that blood on it? No. No, it looks more like brake fluid. And in this case, it's practically the same thing, huh? I think we'll leave it right here in the wastebasket, Jumbo. No, oh, did you want something? Just wanted to say I'll be in my own place out back if you want me. Okay. You know where Mr. Shields is? He's out in the veranda. Alone? Yeah. Thanks, Jumbo. If I need anything, I'll call you. Good night. Shields. Oh. Oh, it's you, Marlowe. What's wrong? You sound like a man expecting trouble. <laughs> I was nearly killed in my car this afternoon, and I don't think that was the end of it. Yeah, and don't stand too close to high windows. Thank you. It's comforting to know that I am not alone in my suspicions. Maybe, uh... How are you betting? On the beauty or the beast? Don't be absurd. I hope someday to marry Barbara. Yeah? Well, a guy might be beating your time right now with a sculptor's mallet. You may be naive, Mr. Marlowe, but Barbara isn't. I saw them just a moment ago walking down to the boathouse. Harlan's galloping after her like a half-baked idiot, as usual. But if Miss Haynes prefers me, what can he do about it? There was an answer for that, but it seemed a little obvious under the circumstances. But a few minutes later, Shields went inside, and I made a beeline for the boathouse to water down a certain hot-headed sculptor named Harlan. When I got within earshot, I knew I'd be as welcome as whooping cough at a glassblower's convention. So I stopped and listened. 
Barbara Dolly, I'm falling in love with you. You know that, don't you? Let me hold you close. Harlan, I... Oh, Harlan. This is real, Barbara. For the first time in my life, I'm truly in love. I want to do things for you, make you happy. Please, wait. I'm not completely free. There are still ties with Edward, you know. Fields. That fat, stingy Babbitt. He's no man for you. Why, if he so much as touches you from now on up... Wait a minute, Barbara. Marlowe, you cheap snooping eaves. Up He's dropping some minor vice compared to some of the shenanigans going on around here. Just what do you mean by that? A word to the wise is sufficient. You, I'll give a few more. Now, somebody's trying to cut our little triangle down to two sides before noon tomorrow. What I've seen so far, I don't like, so I'm warning everybody. Just what are you accusing me of? Well, Marlon, I'm... stop it. Don't be a fool. Will you cavemen control yourselves until those bonds are found? Come on, Harlan, let's go in. Good night, Marlow. Don't get your head caught in any transoms. Deciding sleep wouldn't be very healthy for a man in my position, I decided to sit up that night. And it was about two o'clock when I looked out the window and saw something mighty interesting. A light was moving on the other island opposite us. I got hold of John Moore and we went over there as fast as we could. Uh, uh, there we're beach. That light's dead ahead, Mr. Marlowe. Looks to me like it's up in the picnic shelter. Yeah, I'll see you later, Jumbo. Well, who's there? Guess who. Oh, Marlowe. I didn't hear you come up. Wind's too strong, I guess. I'm glad to see you. Spooky here all alone. Oh, sure, sure. What's the idea? Decide to do a little freelance prospecting? Oh, that's right. Bernice Mayhew loved this spot. And I had a hunch she hid the bonds here in the base of this table. Well, I guess I was wrong. Oh, come on, Marlo. Limber up. You can't blame me for trying. Listen, beautiful, don't flap your eyelashes at me. I can't see anything but double crosses right now. All right, if you've had your fun, let's go back to the lodge, Don't huh? be that way, Phil. Phil... The sun will be coming up in two or three hours. Why not wait for it here with me? Barbara, baby, don't burn up too many calories with that routine. Because I only keep one-third of the map on me. You think you're so smart. Bright ideas hatch in that cute little brain of yours, too. Now let's... Oh, comes the gun with a pearl handle, no less. Stay away from me, Marlo. Over there. Hey, what's going on here, Eddie? Jumbo! Look out, Jumbo! <laughs> Jumbo stepped into the light and Barbara turned. I made a swipe at a gun hand that knocked pistol, purse, and lamp all over the picnic shelter. I found the gun and gave it to Jumbo. Then I started to pick up an assortment of knickknacks that had spilled out of a purse. But I never finished. Because one of the items made my eyes pop. It was the monogrammed handkerchief covered with brake fluid that I'd found in Holland's room. It all made sense now. It tied up everything that I'd suspected right along. Only two of my trio had planned to split up the $300,000 worth of bonds from the first. As I ran for the motor launch, I yelled at Jumbo to bring Barbara over in the rowboat. All the way back, I had the panicky feeling that I was probably too late. But when I sneaked in the front door of the lodge, there were still two voices. And they came from the open kitchen door. With my hand on my gun, I edged along the wall and peeked in. Seals, you're a fool. Perhaps. But I'm going to kill you and have a perfect case of self-defense. What are you talking about? Your hopelessly framed cousin, Harlan... I ruined the brakes on my own car. I planted your handkerchief, stained with brake fluid in your room. Marlowe found it. He's convinced that you tried to kill me. He's also convinced that he was brought into this whole thing by coincidence. He doesn't know that he was deliberately involved in our search for the bonds, just so he'd make a reputable witness. You're out of your mind. Not at all. I'm going to kill you and say it was self-defense. Marlowe will testify that you tried to kill me before. What Marlowe's going to do is blow your head off if you don't drop that gun, Shields. Marlowe. Yeah, Marlowe. Who knows he wasn't brought into this thing by coincidence, but has stuck around to see the fireworks and almost saw them just now. Bill, what's happened? Barbara, I... couldn't you hold Marlowe on the other island? You shut up, Shields. <clears throat> Barbara's little mistake was that she should have gotten rid of Holland's handkerchief after she took it out of his room so he wouldn't see it. Barbara, I don't understand. You you planned all this with Shields against me? Well, I, I did in the beginning, Harlan, but I changed my mind when I fell in love with you. I, I let Marlowe find the handkerchief in my purse... I wanted him to stop, Edward. Oh, darling, don't you see... Come on, Miss Bankhead. Cut the dramatics. The show's over. Let's have it straight, huh? All right. We might as well if we're going to find those bonds before it's too late. 
Edward and I did plan it. We even hired the little man who tried to get the maps from you. And when that didn't work, you planned to get rid of Holland and split the 300 grand. So we failed. So what? We're right back where we started. A hundred thousand apiece. Now, let's go find those bonds. Not so fast, beautiful. What happened to Holland just now was a little more serious than a hot foot. It was attempted murder. He can slap you two in the jug this minute if he wants to. But I'll leave it up to him. Okay, Holland, what do you say? It's your move. No. I've got a better idea. Marlow, one third of that map is mine. Give it to me. Okay. There it is. Harlan, what are you going to do? Harlan, no. Don't burn it. There. Now we all lose. Now none of us will get the bonds. That's probably how Aunt Bernice wanted it anyway. It was almost noon. I was standing on the veranda of the lodge and a scrawny old crow was perched up on the roof. I saw Barbara and Shields quietly pull away in a boat with Jumbo. And I saw Holland lumbering off to the far end of the island to sulk. And as I watched the three of them, I couldn't help thinking. A pig in a pinstriped suit, an ape with a red beard, and an alley cat in nylon. Yeah. Keep laughing, Aunt Bernice, you were right. Greed, treachery, and rashness don't mix, even for 24 hours. And the 1% of the bonds I was to get? Well, that's my contribution to charity. Who knows? Maybe I can take it off my income tax. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Mary Ship, Parley Bear, Don Diamond, Ted Von Elts, and Wilms Herbert. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard Orant. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... When I got the crisp $50 bill in advance, I figured my client had a heart of gold. But after I was beat up, double-crossed, and shot at, I realized just how hard a heart of gold could be. Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, John Dixon Carr. Three great names in the world of mystery and thrills. One down, two to go today on CBS. Now that you've heard Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe in action, CBS invites you to hear Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade in action tonight, followed by John Dixon Carr's personally written radio series, Cabin B-13. Chandler, Hammett, Carr, today and every Sunday, over most of these CBS stations. It's a mystery if you miss them. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse in every plot. Oh, Rick, that's awful. I know, Helen, but my sense of humor is out of gas. Oh, what's the matter? No business? Not for a week. If a client walked in now, I'd probably swear it was an hallucination and referred to Bellevue. Walk and trying to get you. He called here about five minutes ago, said it was important. I just got in the office. I'll give him a call. Am I going to see you tonight? You know it. 
me and my empty wallet will be glad to stop over for dinner. Well, I'll have Francis fix something healthy. Tell him to cook some money. <laughs> I'll see you around seven, then. Don't forget to call Walt. Bye. Bye. An Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's fine, I'm on in Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Oh, you want to talk to me, Fatty? Rick? How many people call you Fatty? Where the devil have you been? I called you at your apartment all morning. Uh, Helen just told me I slept late. Well, why didn't you answer your phone? Rent was due. Could have been a trap. Can you come down here? Well, if it's important, I can come down. But if a potential client gives up because he can't find me, I may have a crying jag all over your office. I'll stock up on hankies. I wouldn't ask you, Rick, but it is important, very. Well, don't sound like the last course of gloomy Sunday. I'll be there. Relax. I knew Walt was on the level because every time he thought something was important, he came on in a higher register and began to sound like a harp. Well, I closed the office, set the bear trap in front of the door in case of a client, and left a box lunch. I might be gone for a good while this time, and if I caught something, there was no sense to let it starve. The 5th Precinct was 20 blocks away, so being a practical man who always regards that lonely feeling in his pocket as the sure makings of a pedestrian, I insulted a few well-meaning cab drivers, and 30 minutes later, I limped into the squad room of the 5th Precinct police station. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? In my business, you have to be conditioned to anything. Nothing should surprise you. But in my business, like any other, there's always a first time for everything. And it looked like this was it. For over a year, I had been walking leisurely into the squad room of the 5th Precinct and smiling inside when I spotted the cop with a battering ram for a head and landing barges for feet. He was always the best straight man I'd ever run across, and his name was Sergeant Otis Loveloon. But this day, dear old Otis was not to be found. Instead, sitting at his desk, looking up at me through a pair of thick horn-rimmed glasses, was something else. It pulled out a clean white handkerchief, removed the glasses, clouded them up with a quick breath that filled the room with the essence of Sen Sen, and said, Well, where's Otis? You mean Sergeant Loveloon? He's been transferred. He's been what? Transferred. Who are you? Sergeant Andre Klum. Is there something I can do for you? Andre Klum? Sergeant Andre Klum. Sergeant Andre Klum. Uh, just one moment. Yeah? Where do you think you're going? Uh, look, uh, uh, Sonny, I'm going in to see the lieutenant. You'll have to wait until I find out if he can see you. Oh, he'll see me. He just called me. May I have your name, please? What? Citation. Mr. or Mrs. Hey, this may not be so bad after all. No? No. We're going to have fun, Andre. Are we? Yes, indeed. Now, call in to the lieutenant and tell him Mr. Diamond is coming in to see him. Yeah? The gentleman you were expecting, Mr. Diamond. He's getting introductions now? Send him in. Yes, sir. The lieutenant will see you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Sergeant Clume. And uh, something else, Mr. Diamond. Yes? Sergeant Loveloon warned me about you. And I can assure you right now that I have no intention of becoming the brunt of your obvious crude comedy. Sergeant Clume, I don't think there's much you can do about it. Oh, Walt, I want to go on record right now as saying don't. that I... Don't. I know. Well, what is that out there? The commissioner says he's one of the most valuable men on the force. But how can you put him in a cop's uniform? It's like dressing Rasputin and the Mother Hubbard. I miss Otis as much as you do, but strictly off the record, Sergeant Clume has relatives. Oh, I thought so. And scratching all the way in here. Otis moved over to the 11th Precinct. Who's he working for now? Lieutenant Crawford. They've had a suicide watch on him all night. What's this Andre Klum supposed to be so good at? He's only been with us for a couple of days. I don't know. Well, if I keep thinking about him, I may have to be dipped in hot tar. You better tell me what you want to see me about. You may not like it, Rick. Oh? This is new? Remember Ralph Baxter? Sure. I sent him up while I was still on the force. Yeah. Well, you worked on that case for over a year, didn't you? You were in charge of the department. You know darn well I did. Rick, you knew Baxter's habits better than anyone on the force. Oh, now, Walt, Walt, what's it all, what's it all about? Is uh, Baxter loose? Very loose. Busted out at 8 o'clock this morning along with seven other guys. Oh, all got away clean? Every one of them. One of the best planned breaks I've ever heard about. Now, if Baxter was in on it, it had to be. He's a smart boy, Walt. One of the smartest. Yeah, well, the commissioner says we've got to pick him up before he does any damage. Just like that, huh? Just like that. 
I need someone who knows him so well he might have a chance of nailing him before the trouble breaks loose. And you know Baxter and trouble. How come you're in on this, Walt? Somebody already get killed? Truck driver. Oh. Baxter's an unhappy boy. He kills to make up for it. Really does a fancy job. You want to help me out? You're in trouble if they don't nail Baxter in a hurry? The commissioner is uh, relying on me. Okay, then. Now, it's got to be official in case you have to make an arrest. Oh, now, wait a minute. Got to swear you in as a deputy. Uh-uh. Look, Rick, we've got to. I don't really care how you bring Baxter in and who gets the credit, but, but what, what would, would the, the commissioner, commissioner say, say if... Uh... Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry, Walt. Every time I used to put on that badge, a book of rules and regulations went with it. I do it my way or not at all. But, but... Now, but... don't start running your motor. I don't want the credit. The department can have it. Besides, it's 20 to 1 in any man's book that I'll never even get close to Baxter. And well, you stand more chance than anyone else. Okay, then. You still don't have to worry about the credit. It's 50 to 1 that the newspapers will read. Private detective found with his head missing. Okay, Rick. Your way. Andre. Yes, Lieutenant? Andre. Yeah, some name. I beg your pardon? Uh, bring in all the information on Baxter and the seven other men who were in on the break. Yes, sir. Andre. Andre Klum. Yeah. Yeah, you are, Lieutenant. You want to look over this stuff, Rick? Yeah. I want to know how, how the brake was pulled off. Maybe if we can get a line on who helped them, we can get it back to that way. A truck was used. Mm. A Ford pickup that hauled garbage regularly. The large garbage cans were placed on the truck and taken off to a dump. The seven men in Baxter hid in the cans and were covered up with garbage. Oh. The men in the prison kitchen have all been questioned, but none will admit a thing. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Maybe you can tell us what happened after that, Sergeant. Several miles outside of the prison, the men got out of the cans. One man climbed up into the cab of the truck and ordered the driver to stop. He shot the driver, and the men climbed off the truck, rolled it over a 44-foot hill. 44 feet? 44 feet, 9 inches, at the first point of impact where the truck went over. The hill, of course, varies at other spots. Of course. Two cars were waiting for the eight men. Tire tracks were found and casts made. A report on these casts should be in at any minute. Synchronize your watches, then, Rick. Tell me, Sergeant Klum, have you any idea who might have been driving the two cars? No. Turning your MIGs and your ray gun, you're through. Very amusing. Now, please, Rick, for the sake of my psychiatrist, don't start on Klum like you did on Otis. Might be a woman. Klum? Driving one of the cars. Oh. Baxter was a known woman hater. You don't say. I suppose the other seven guys got together with him and formed a club. Four of the seven men were known to have had women friends at one time or another. But only one woman remained loyal after the men were sent to prison. How do you know that? I remember things. He remembers things. Oh. She visited the prison many times to see Tony Leggetti, one of the escapees. Maybe you can remember the dates? The first time was right after Tony was sent up. Uh, November... All right, all right, Sergeant. Uh, what's the girl's name and uh, where does she live? Jean Lawrence, 1782 East 12th Street, Apartment C. Uh, no, B. Butterfingers. I'll take this list of histories on the seven guys. You going to check on the girl? Yes, and... Uh... Thank you, Sergeant Andre Klum. You've been a brick. I left Klum polishing his glasses, but Walt looking sick. Jean Lawrence did live at 1782 East 12th, Department B. So I looked up the landlady, a nice old reproduction of Worcester's mother with a hangover, Mrs. Shook by name. She was a little unhappy that I'd bothered her, but I finally sold her on the idea that she could shave any time, and aided by my best smile and the promise of a fast fifth, I finally got her to open the door to apartment B. There you are, lover. But I can tell you right now, Jeannie ain't in. Mm. Well, what's in this room? Bedroom. She didn't come home all day yesterday or last night. She didn't, huh? You know, I shouldn't be showing you around like this. <laughs> Except that you look like a real nice fella. And you're thirsty. Oh, go on. You see anyone else hanging around, say, in the last week? Yeah. Come to think of it, about a week ago, some dark fella started coming over to see Jeannie. Used too much hair oil. Greasy type. Think you'd recognize him? Hmm. You bring me that present, lover boy, and I could recognize a clove of garlic in an onion warehouse. <laughs> I'd make book on it. May I use the phone? Go right ahead, lover. Oh, uh, by the by, hundred proof, huh? Hundred proof. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, well, this is Rick. I'm up at the girl's apartment. Not here. But the landlady says she can identify some guy who's been hanging around here for the last week. So look up... Oh, and... Hold it a minute, Rick. Something coming over the hot shot. Okay. Oh, uh, 
Bottle and bomb, is that right, dear? Oh, lovely, lovely. <laughs> lovely. Rick? Yeah? Get that landlady in here, then meet me out at the end of River Street, Pier 14. Something up? Sus came up. Someone didn't want it to. When she hit bottom, the bricks in the sack must have torn it open. What? A dock worker spotted her floating near one of the pier pilings. Jean Lawrence? Yeah. I'll see you over there. Something happened to little Jeannie. I could hear... Found what... her floating in the river. Oh. Well, if we're going down to the station, can we stop off and get that present? Yeah. Bottled in bond, you promised. I grabbed a cab and took Mother McCray over to the 5th Precinct, making one stop on the way for the promised present. I turned her over to the desk sergeant and took off for Pier 14 at the end of River Street. When I got there, I spotted the homicide prowl car and Walt standing near the ambulance. On the wooden floor of the pier, covered with a sheet, was the dead body of Gene Lawrence. The coroner had just finished his examination. Well, I'll give you a full report as soon as I get to the lab, Lieutenant. Well, this is a rush, coroner. It always is. Well, hello, Rick. Hi, Charlie. Shot twice, then thrown in the drink. Yeah, nice, nice. Anything else? Book of matches in the coat pocket. Probably don't mean a thing. Lieutenant, we just got a report from the precinct. Hello, Diamond. Oh, good afternoon, Clum. You're looking fine. Oh, you'll be kissing each other on the cheek in a minute. Oh, what about that report, Sergeant? The landlady Diamond brought in 22 minutes ago has just identified a picture in the morgue as a man who had been visiting Gene Lawrence for the past week. Anyone we know? William Nash, alias William Barnes, uh, alias Bootleg Barnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, five feet 11, black hair, brown eyes, slight scar. Oh, whoa, uh, oh, oh, hold it. What about his record? Uh, nine arrests, two convictions, robbery and assault. In the cafe business now at... Uh, Red Dot Inn? Yes, sir. Matches you found the girl, Walt? Yeah, Red Dot Inn. Let's take a run over there. Yes, Jess, what'll it be? William Nash, you around? No. Police. He still ain't around. You got an office? Well, I... Uh... He got an office. Yeah. Where is it? Top of those stairs. Down the hall, last door. Go around to the back of the bar, Clum. Yes, sir. Hey, now, wait a minute. You ain't supposed to come back here. See that he doesn't have any way to let Mr. Nash know we're coming up. Just go ahead and tend your bar. You guys want to get me in trouble? Not unless Nash is really in his office. Then you don't have to worry about trouble. You're in it. Let's go, Ray. Down the hall, he said. Last door. We both go? Yep. Fire escape down there. This way, Sergeant Clume covers him. Can uh, Clume shoot? I forgot to ask him. You get on there by the fire escape in case he gets past me. Who is it? Fire department. What? Yeah, we received a report that your cafe isn't properly equipped in case of fire. Are you nuts? I just had no extinguisher. William equipment. Nash? Yeah. Now, what the Let's devil... Let's go. Huh? You heard him. Hey, what is this? Police, let's go. He's clean. All right, copy. You want to haul me in. What's the charge? Murder. Murder? Now, listen, Start you Start walking. Who's murder? Gene Lawrence. Down the steps. I don't know any Gene Lawrence. Sure, sure. Everything all right, Lieutenant? Go upstairs and watch this guy's office. Yes, sir. You need a warrant for this, you know. I'll get one. I tell you, I don't know any Gene Lawrence. My friend, I know a little old lady who thinks you wear too much hair oil. She's going to make a very big liar out of you. NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. All right, Sergeant, get the lineup going. Yes, sir. Henry Phipps. Henry Phipps, alias Henry Phipps. I've never alias seen Henry a lineup Henry before, Henry lover. The man you identified Henry earlier from the picture. See if you can pick him out. George Chalmers. No, nope, ain't him. George Chalmers, alias George Lippert, alias Geo the Lip, George Petty. Ain't him, Chalmers. neither. William Nash. William Nash. That's him. William Barnes. All right, hold him. You sure that's a man who was calling on Gene Lawrence? Yep, that's him. Why don't he use bay rum on his hair? Nash. Yeah? Yes, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. You know Miss Gene Lawrence? I told you I don't, Lieutenant. He sure is a lousy liar. All right, run him off. Step down. Hal Ennis. He killed Jeannie. 
We don't know. Yes, sir. He sure should use bay rum. Well, Walt and I and a couple of the boys took Nash downstairs and worked on her for about a half an hour before I got tired and decided to see what I could turn up myself. Nash still wouldn't admit he knew the dead girl, and we still weren't any closer to finding Ralph Baxter. I was pretty sure that Nash was connected with Baxter in some way, or he would have admitted knowing the girl and denied the killing. So I went back to the Red Dot Inn with a warrant to search Nash's office. Sergeant Andre Clune was guarding the door in the best prescribed manner. Legs spread, arms folded, back straight against the door. You're flat. Mm-hmm. What? Oh, oh, Diamond. Uh, I have absolutely no excuse. I, I'll understand if you report me to the lieutenant. Uh, no one could get by, could they? Not without waking me. Mm, then you did what you told to. You guarded the place. But there is no excuse for falling asleep on duty. Unless you get tired. Now forget it. I got a warrant here. Let's give this officer going over. And that's exactly what we did. We took the place apart, piece by piece. And I have to go on record by saying that Clune really knew his business. He didn't miss a thing. This might be important, Diamond. What is it? Bills to William Nash from the garage. Let me see. Mm. Nick's Garage, 13th Street. 1,000-mile service on both cars, 1490. Parking space rental on both cars, $25. Two cars. Mm, may not mean a thing. I'll check it anyway. Two cars were used in the escape, Diamond. Now, don't get excited. You stay here. I'll call you from the garage. I left Clume and went over to Nick's garage, looked up the owner, and he showed me the two cars, both sedans. 48 Chrysler and a new Hudson. Nick told me that both cars had been taken out the night before and returned early that morning. He said that Nash had driven one and the girl the other. So I put in a call to the Red Dot Inn and Sergeant Clune. Yes, the lab has two good casts of the tire prints. Well, put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to get right down here with him. I hope you'll forgive me uh, being a little premature, but... You uh, already told him to come down. Uh, yes. Mm. Tell me, Sergeant, you don't know anything about the fifth at higher layer, do you? One by uh, step up in one uh, and... Goodbye, uh... Sergeant. Well, this is Nick Miller. Runs a garage. Hi, Lieutenant. Hello. How about the cars? Uh, this one and uh, that one. Hold this cast. I'll try the other one. Okay. Fit? No. Those tread prints on that cast supposed to fit the treads of one of these cars? We hope so. How about that one, Walt? Like a glove. Try your cast on that car. Uh-uh. Fits this one, Walt. Rick, both of the cars were used in the getaway. What happens now? Go back to headquarters and tell Nash we got him dead to rights. We'll sweat him till he cracks. I got a better idea. Turn him loose. What? Nash knows that it's only a matter of time until we turn up his evidence anyway. And he knows something else. He knows Ralph Baxter. He knows if he spills anything, Baxter will kill him, sure. But we'll promise him protection. Against Baxter? Baxter'd get him if it took ten years. Not if we get Baxter first. Nash probably knows where he's hiding out. Walt, even if Nash knows where Baxter is, he'd be a long time telling you. In the meantime, Baxter can cause a lot of trouble. All right, so I let Nash go. So what? Get a hold of the newspapers. Tell them to run a story that you've picked up Nash for questioning in the prison break. But that you had to release him because of insufficient evidence. You think Baxter will go after him? Well, he'd at least send some of his boys. I think the girl was knocked off because she got out of line. You can bet that Baxter won't want Nash around for a witness. Okay. Gee, you're kind of making Mr. Nash a sitting duck, ain't you? Oh, I guess you'd say that, Mr. Miller. Now, why don't you come on down to the station with us and answer a few routine questions? Uh, hey, I don't know nothing about this. That's what Mr. Nash said, but you can see what a liar he turned out to be. We went back to the precinct that the garage owner was held for questioning. In the meantime, two men were sent to the home of William Nash and the phone tapped. Two other men took their places on a stakeout at the Red Dot Inn, another pair at the garage. The garage owner was cleared of any suspicion and told to go back to work, but warned not to say anything. About four in the afternoon, a call came over the hot shot at the 5th Precinct. My name is Barton. I've just been robbed. Where are you calling from? I own the Rome Jewelry Store. Three men came in and tied us all up. They stole over $100,000 in gems. Anyone hurt? My clerk. He's still unconscious. All right. What's the address? Uh, corner of Wilmot and 21st Street. It looked like just a routine robbery at the time. 
So the robbery detail took over. Walt released Nash and called the papers. Around 4.30, Walt got a call from robbery. Levinson. Jennings, Walt. Those guys are held up the jewelry store over on Wilmot Street. The owner just identified one of the holdup men, Tony Lugetti. Oh, thanks. Rick, Tony Lugetti, one of the guys that busted out with Baxter, has been identified as one of the holdup men in the jewelry store. Now it starts. The gang had gotten away clean. No trace except a cab driver who spotted a green sedan in front of the jewelry store. Three men in it. We waited. Levinson. Sullivan. Nash just got a phone call. Man said he wanted to see him for the payoff. Said to meet him at the place, Nash left the house, Fisher's tailing him. Right. Nash just left the house, got a call. Let's go. We piled into the squad car and headed across town in the direction of Nash's house. A newsboy on the corner yelled the planted news of Nash's arrest, and the car radio told us what Nash was doing. Suspect just went into garage. We're parked across the street. Instructions. I'm about two blocks away. If he gets in his car, let me know. He's coming out, turning north on Chestnut. See him? There he is, Walt. We've got him, Jennings. We'll tail him. We followed Nash until he hit the outskirts of town. He drove for another good half hour, then pulled into a roadside eating place with a motel off to the left. Uh, This looks like it. Yeah, yeah. Drive past. We'll swing back. Nash is going into the diner. We'll walk up. Attention, all units. I'm at a roadside diner. The stop a while motel near it. Suspect just went into diner. All units proceed with caution. A whole bunch might be in that motel. Mm-hmm. I hope the boys get here before things start popping. You said it. We can't go in. Hey, there's uh, Nash at the counter. See anyone else? Not from here. Let's walk over to the other side. Hey, Walt. What? Over there by the gas pump. Green sedan. You think it might be the robbery car? Uh, nobody in it. Look. Two guys coming out of the restroom. Yeah. And one of them, Tony Leggetti. Baxter's boys. I got a hunch Baxter's around. I got Tony's going in the diner. He's going in to pick up Nash. Probably going to take him for a ride. Let's take this guy before Leggetti comes out. He hears us. He's turning around. Police. He's going for a gun. You knocked him cold. Nice tackle, Rick. Vassar, 28. Here's his gun. I'll dump him in the car. Here come some of the boys. I'll wave them off. You get in the back of the car. Okay, I'll get in with you. I wonder where Baxter is. Can you look out that back window without being seen? Yeah, yeah. Two more prowl cars pulled up. Mm, the boys in the diner don't spot them. Nothing yet? No, no. Hey, here they come. We're getting a Nash? Yeah, holy cow, the whole bunch. There's Baxter with them. Yeah, and one, two, th- five others. They've spotted the cars. They're headed to this car. You go out that side, I'll go out this. You're boxed up, Baxter. Look out, Rick! Two of them down. Baxter's heading around back. Rick, don't go after Malone, you crazy. Now he tells me. Stop, Baxter. You get him, Rick. Yeah, but just barely. That was my last shot. How was the dinner? Oh, if I'd eaten any more, I'd, uh, I'd need a new belt. <laughs> you gonna tell me what you did all day and why you were so late? Mm, went for a long walk in the park. Oh, that's what I love about you. Gone all day. Come in smelling like a shooting gallery until you tell me you went for a walk in the park. Oh, no. I'll get it. Yes? Oh, Rick, you gonna give me a routine or do you want to hear about Baxter? Oh, Harold Applenocker's tired. Let's have it. Getty's dying in the hospital. Two of the other boys died on the way. The guy you tackled is singing all over the place, and Baxter will have a quiet funeral tomorrow. The others we got locked up. Your boys all right? One of them got it in the leg. Otherwise, okay. You were right about the girl. Baxter killed her because he was afraid she'd talk. Seems she had a beef and walked out. Baxter got worried. Nash was to get his tonight, just like you figured. 
Okay, Walt, thanks. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And thanks, Rick. Sure. Well? Well? Wanting to know if his boys were all right. Now, Rick, you've been doing something exciting, and I want to know about oh, it. Honest, baby, the park's very dull uh, in the afternoon. Want to go stir up some action in it now? Good move. Rick, why do you lie to me? Mm. Oh, all right, come on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're forgetting something. I got to sing a song first. Oh, Rick, now that you brought it up, I want to go to the park. Well, this will only take a few seconds. You just pucker up and hold. Well, 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 look who's here. I haven't seen you in many a year. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. Baked the cake, baked the cake. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. Grandest band in the land. Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. And spread the welcome mat for you Now I don't know where you came from Cause I don't know where you've been But it really doesn't matter Grab a chair and fill your platter And dig, dig, dig right in If I knew you were coming I'd have baked the cake Hired a band Goodness sake If I knew you were coming I'd have baked the cake How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do Now I don't know where you came from Cause I don't know where you've been But it really doesn't matter Grab a chair and fill your platter And dig, dig, dig right in If I knew you were coming I'd have baked the cake Hired a band Goodness sake If I knew you were coming I'd have baked the cake How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do Oh, how'd you do, how'd you do, how do you do Miles, still puckered? Mm-hmm Think you can hold it till we get to the park? Mm -hmm. You see, if you're patient, I always make it up to you. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle and Wilms Herbert. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Richard Diamond's Private Detective will next be heard two weeks from tonight. Check your local newspaper for the time of broadcast. Listen next week at this hour for Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, Soldier of Fortune. Remember, at this time next week, it's Dangerous Assignment on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us two weeks from tonight when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For all the family, try Father Knows Best tomorrow on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Fall Guy. Three o'clock in the morning is just about the same all over the world. The streets and buildings and rooms and people are full of sleep. And even in Cairo, Egypt, you can't expect anything different. The whole town's packed with a kind of air that moves all around so you can't hear it, like a lady in a soft dress. I don't generally sit up and wait for three in the a.m., but last night was different. I was working on the books in my place above the tambourine when things got noisy. 
From my window, I made out a couple of Egyptian police waving pistols in the air. I didn't know what the show was about, but whoever they were shooting at figured to be the leading man. I didn't have time to pick him out because just then he picked me. Open up, Rocky. Rocky, it's me, Johnny Servant. Open up, quick. Help me, Rocky. Help me, they're after me. Uh, short change somebody at the club, Johnny? This is serious. I'm in a spot. You can tell by the noise you ought to keep a curfew. They were shooting at me. They won't give me a chance to talk. It's a cop Greco. He's bucking for a promotion. I'm one more strike. All right, take it I... easy, Johnny. They're coming here. Help me, Rocky. I've always been a hard luck guy. Greco would kill me just for the fun of it. You know what he's like. He won't give me a chance. Nobody will give Johnny Servi a chance. Rocky, please. We're old pals, you and me. You give me a chance, please, Rocky, huh? Okay, Johnny. Oh, thanks. I haven't got time to hear your story now, Johnny. But if this is a wrong thing, I'll break you like they never could. I wouldn't get you in any trouble, Rocky. Honest. I'll tell you everything just the way it is. Open it in Open up. It's Greco. All right, in the closet there. Close the door and don't breathe. Yeah, Rocky. I got you. Open up with that. It's the police. All right. All right. Ah. You look hot, Greco. The stairs too much for you? I am looking for a friend of yours, Mr. Jordan. He came in here. Huh? Which one? Johnny Servi. And I will take him dead or alive. It doesn't matter to me. Now, step aside. Uh, you got a warrant, Greco? I don't need one with you. Tonight you do. You will please step out of the doorway. I'm coming in. Uh, you... <laughs> You're too shovey even for a policeman. But I am a policeman, and I want Servi any way I can get Back him. to your beat, Greco. One moment. Rocky Jordan might have been shot accidentally in the line of fire. If you make out the report, is that what it would say? That is exactly what it would say. Do I come in, Mr. Jordan? Ah, I don't argue with a police special. Sure, come on in. Greco! I better tuck it away, Greco. Sam still runs the apartment his way. Hmm. Well, Greco. So we've lost him, eh? No, Captain Sabaya. He is hiding here in Mr. Jordan's cafe. Uh, hiya, Sam. Everybody gunning around tonight? Jordan, are you hiding this man? We know he is a friend of yours. Oh, he had a lot of friends. Have sir. you seen Johnny Servi tonight? Jordan, an important diplomatic official was robbed at the International Club tonight. The charge is against your friend Servi. It is a serious situation which might bring about complication. Now, Jordan, is this man here with you? I can make him answer that question, Captain. Greco, we represent the law. We do not violate it. You ought to remind him more often, Sam. He forgets easy. Within the hour, I will have a warrant issued to search these premises, Jordan. For your sake, as a guest of the Egyptian government, I hope we do not find Johnny Servi here. I hope so, too. All right, Greco. You mean we are not going to search this place now? We will do everything the law enables us to do. Jordan. Yeah? Friendship is a most admirable attainment. It is the single proof that men are no longer barbarians. Sometimes, however, it is taken advantage of. And then it is a sin against civilization. Hmm. Good night, Sam. Good night, Jordan. I heard their story, Johnny. Hope you write a better one. You're covered for me swell. Come on, give it to me. Give it all to me. All right, all right. You know, I reckon the chips were Ed Solomon at the International Club. Yeah? Well... Tonight, a guy from one of the embassies takes the plunge. Loses more than he's got with him. He leaves his briefcase for security. Well, I figure the briefcase, full of important papers, will bring him back with the money he owes the house. What does that lead to? Well, the next thing I know, Greco and a couple of uniforms are knocking on the door, telling me how I robbed the embassy guy of his briefcase. You made a break for it? Well, I told Greco what really happened, but he wanted to write it his way. And it'd look good, him hauling me in. Even better if I came dead. People talk in places besides Cairo with an embassy guy in the deal. Greco would get a promotion, and I'm his water boy. They did real good, Johnny. What happens now? Big Ed Solomon, he owns the International Club. Greco wouldn't tangle with him, and Ed could do all my talking to the right people. Now, you can help me, Rocky. Keep going. Ed Solomon lives in an apartment on the river. Will you see him for me, Rocky? Will you tell him what happened and get me out of this? Uh, I'm not going to get any sleep anyhow. Oh, you're a pal, Rocky. And I sure can use a pal. Yeah, Johnny. That's what scares me. I made sure none of Sabaya's boys were hanging around Then I hustled Johnny Servi into a cab And dropped him off at a friend of mine's laundry shop I didn't figure Sam or Greco would go through somebody's dirty burnooses looking for him Then I headed over to the Nile Street apartment house where Big Ed Solomon lived it turned out to be one of those chunks of white granite and copper window frames that makes Cairo, Egypt, look like a, a suburb of Michigan Boulevard. 
Inside, you know, it took a lot of British pounds and American dollars to keep the place up. I waited over a carpet that dragged on me like a Florida swamp and finally found a door marked Mr. and Mrs. Edward Solomon. I figured 500 pounds a year for a good lease. She was pretty. Black hair and green eyes. 24, maybe. But she could have looked 16. Yes? Oh, I hate to bother you this time of morning, but it's very important. I've got to see Ed Solomon. Who's calling? Rocky Jordan. Oh, come in, Mr. Jordan. I'm Connie Solomon, Ed's wife. Yeah? Perhaps I can help you. I'm doing this for a friend, Johnny Servey. He's in trouble and Big Ed can help him. Oh, I understand. Well, I'm sorry my husband's not here, Mr. Jordan. I've been sitting up waiting for him. Uh. I haven't seen Ed for five days. Oh? I've heard of you, Mr. Jordan. You run a cafe here in Cairo. You're an American like myself. Oh, uh, let's get back to your husband. Where is he? I don't know. I'd like to see him, too. Well, the world's full of people who want to see him. What's your story? Well, I used to sing. Three years ago, I was stranded at the Shepherd Hotel. One day, a big man came in and heard me and sent me flowers after the show. Well, that'd be Big Ed. After that, he kept coming in, and, well, I, I began going out with him, and when he asked me to marry him, I married him. And I didn't ask him what he did for a living or how he spent his time. Oh, he was good to me, and he's always been good to me, and... Well, now he's gone. You sound like he's gone for good. We've never been parted more than five hours since our marriage. He's given me everything. He's done everything for me. You never ask questions? Never. <laughs> you, you want him, Mr. Jordan, and... And I want him. You know where to look and who to ask. Oh, find him for me, please. Yeah, from pictures I've seen of Big Ed Solomon, he'd be a pretty hard man to lose. Rocky, I'm scared. A partner of his, a, a man named Axman, was here last Monday night. That was the night Ed left and never came back. Axman? Mm -hmm. well, he's new to me. I was in the bedroom. I thought I heard them quarreling, and when I came out, Axman had his hat in his hand and was leaving, and Ed went with him. Uh, is that all? Oh, I haven't seen him since. Do you think anything's happened to him? Do you think he's all right? I think you ought to try the truth. What? All the pictures I've seen of Big Ed Solomon were of a big man with a pipe in his face. I don't see any pipe racks around here, but I see where they might have been. Why, And if you... I went to the closet, I bet I wouldn't find any of Ed's clothes. What'd you and Ed argue about? The same things we've been arguing about for three years. He drinks too much and he plays the horses too much. And besides, he hit me. Ah, oh, that's better. So I finally got fed up and I told him to get out. Only now you want him back? Long enough to serve him with some divorce papers and get a property settlement. Yeah, thought it'd be something like that. And, but about Axman, I wasn't lying. He hates Ed, even if they are partners. Well, it's something from the old days. Well, Axman walked in when Ed and me was having our knockdown. If he wanted to bump Ed, he could do it. And well, somehow he fixed it so it looked like I'd done it. He's that kind. It'd make me look pretty sick if Ed turned up dead somewhere. Yeah, I would. Uh, wait a minute. You still want to see Ed, don't you? Yeah. And you're going to look for him? I told you I got a friend who needs... Yeah, that's what you said. Well, remember everything I told you, will you? Yeah, sure. You had a convincing story to begin with. You ever try acting? Yeah. Yeah, once I... Eat... Yeah, there's no future in it. <laughs> Maybe you're right, Connie. Hey, when... When this is all over, let you and me have a drink somewhere or something, huh? Sure, why not? I'd... I'd like to meet a nice guy... A real nice guy. Once. Yeah, just once. Now, when I left her place, the morning sun already had the hangover crowd on the ropes. And it looked like a pretty busy day for me. I'd covered for Johnny Servey, and the only way I could square myself was to find Ed Solomon and clear things up. So I started looking. I ran up a tab at five different places asking questions. Everybody talked, but nobody said anything. That is, until I ran into Sam Sabaya at the Courtney Club. He was standing at the bar, sucking in on one of those long Egyptian cigarettes. His eyes didn't shift when they saw me. He just came my way like they were pulling him around. When he stopped, the tuft on his fez hadn't moved. We search your place, Jordan. Huh? Find enough liquor? Jordan, I have known you for a long, t long time. You, you have a code that puzzles me. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is the difference between the East and the West. Whatever it is, the end is always the same. What are you trying to say, sir? I know that you were hiding Johnny Servey when Sergeant Greco and I were looking for him tonight. I know that you have hidden him somewhere else in the city. Uh, I posted no men to watch your cafe. I hope you can produce Servey when I ask for him, Jordan. 
Why don't you try an American cigarette, sir? And I hope you have done the right thing this time. I'll handle Servia if you handle Greco. Jordan, there are some people who are controlled only with patience. Good night again. Oh, or rather, good morning. See you, Sam. Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Mr. Jordan. What? Where'd you come from, Buster? Oh, no, Buster. I'm Jeannie. I've been searching for you, Effendi. I have some information. Oh, I've already got plenty of that. This is of a special interest to you and your friend. What friend? Inshallah. Yeah. I got the guy. Effendi, Mr. Edward Solomon is a man of peculiar habits. I do not understand them. Come on, Jeannie, let's have it. In Cairo, he maintains a beautiful apartment and a lovely wife from your own country, I believe. Yes, I met her. But on the edge of the desert, away from the Nile, at a large oasis near El Fayoum, he also maintains a home. Not many persons know about it. Not even the beautiful Mrs. Solomon. You seem to know all about it. <sighs> Kiss me. It is fate. I am in a business that makes such information, my <coughs> business. Mr. Solomon went to his desert home five days ago with a Mr. Axman. Is that all? That is all you need to know, Mr. Jordan. Well, if it isn't enough, I'll want my money back. Effendi, I am superbly honest. Here, my home address, in case you wish to talk further with me. You act like this is a sure thing. Nothing is certain in this life, Mr. Jordan. Not even friends. <laughs> You've been peeking in Sam Sabaya's diary. Friendly, I do not understand. Well, uh, skip it. Neither do I. When I left the little guy with all the information, nothing looked right. Johnny Servey's story, Connie Solomon's story, even Sam Sabaya's talk had a rattle in it. But no matter what Sam said at the bar, he was making a deal with me. He meant to have Servey. That meant I had to find Ed Solomon. So I got my car and drove up to El Fayum. The place looked tired and old, like it was a million years away from Cairo. The only thing new about it was a petrol station serving it up out of big five-gallon tins. The guy in the white pants and shirt didn't bother about a hat. I uh, guess he liked the sun. Hey, uh, George. Asalamu. Alaikum. Asalamu. Save it, pal. I never use it. You come from here, but somebody taught you a different alphabet, huh? I had the swami trick in the carny once. Lousy racket. Yeah? What do you do now? Pour gas out of them tens you want some. Those look like uh, quartermaster marks. What difference does it make? You need gas to get back where you came from. All right, you got gasoline. Uh, what about coke? Try inside. The girl will take care of you. Oh, thanks. Don't mention it, Jordan. Did you say Jordan? I don't know. Did I? Uh... Oh, darling, I cannot go on. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were Paul. Paul? Who's that? Paul Carew. This is his place. Oh, yes, I just met him. Nice fellow. He said I could find a Coke in here. Oh, yes, of course. You are traveling far? No, no. No, no, just to the oasis. Oh, that is just over the dune. But there is no there this time of year. Oh, I heard different. Oh, perhaps uh, you had your own home there? No, I'm looking for a guy. Big Ed Solomon. So Solomon? You are a friend of his? No, I never met him, lady. Let me tell you. The car's all ready to go. Oh, thanks. Lisa, don't you think you ought to see how the fire's doing? Fire? What fire? Build one. Of course, Paul, of course. Goodbye, sir. Lisa is too friendly. I like friendly people. So they tell me. Keep the car here, will you? Huh? Uh, going to the oasis. I don't see any road. I'll have to hoof it. It's right about half a kilometer. Your feet will get hot. Oh, I'll bet you got some foot powder. Doc Shaw himself. You want some? Yeah, when I get back. Search yourself. See you around, Allie. <laughs> Big Ed Solomon's house was there, all right. Well-ordered palm trees surrounded by an all-white job with a lot of grill work. I pounded on the door. Nobody answered. I smelled an oil lamp burning somewhere, so I pounded on the door some more. And some more people didn't answer. When I put my hand on the latch, the door opened. People and no people, and I went in. You can believe it or not, somebody was there. 
right in front of the fireplace. Only he was dead, and one side of his head was bashed in. No, you're wrong. It wasn't Big Ed Solomon. It was a guy I'd never seen before in my life. You are listening to Fall Guy, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. For the most exciting mystery, turn first to CBS. There, your mystery programs will be full of the thrills you enjoy, full of the surprises which keep you absorbed in the story until the final climax. On Tuesday night, CBS, at 8.30, turn to a full hour of top mystery. Mr. and Mrs. North first, then Mystery Theater. Two unusual programs, a full hour voyage into the chilling realm of crime and punishment. Beginning at 8.30 on Tuesday night, CBS. Now we return to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Fall Guy. Sometimes you don't know just why you do things. Anyhow, when the police came looking for my friend Johnny Servey, I covered for him. Things like that don't exactly set with the law, so I had to find Johnny's boss and try to clear him. So I started out hunting Big Ed Solomon. All I found was a dead man I'd never seen before. I stood there and looked at whoever he'd been. Nothing in his pockets, labels cut off his blue suit, not even a patch or laundry mark. None of it made sense. I began looking around for a poker or a hammer or something. What I found was a heavy chunk of palm branch that had been polished for a lamp base. One end of it was stained. It was about then I heard somebody come in the door. When I turned around, I was looking at Paul Kiru, the gasoline swami I just met back at El Fayum. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He looked at the dead man, at the piece of wood in my hand. But I was looking at the luger he was pointing at me. Through being friendly, Jordan. This guy's all used up. Know him? Never saw him before in my life. I did. Name's Tom Axman. Friend of Big Ed Solomon. Tom Axman? You killed him? Uh-uh. You did. Why, you... Uh-uh. There was a big fight. I don't know what it was all about. Just heard parts of it from my place. You conked him with that piece of wood. Pretty neat. I saw it all. And Lisa, she saw it too. And that makes me the patsy. You're it, Pally. Let's go find ourselves a cop. Carol waved the Luger at me, and I started ahead of him for the door. He was good at doing frame-ups, and he was good at running things. But he was only an amateur when it came to pushing a man with a gun. I waited to feel it in my back. It was there by the time I got to the door, and that was his mistake. Hey, come back here! I shoved him against the wall, but he held on to the gun. There wasn't anything for me to do but make a break for the Oasis. Come back, Jordan! Come back here! All the rest of that day, it went on in the oasis. Cairo crashing around looking for me. I hid behind date palms and in the underbrush. Found out a lot of things that bug experts would have gone buggy about. But as far as helping Johnny Servey or finding Ed Solomon, I was doing no good at all. As soon as it got real dark, I figured it was safe enough to cross the patch of sand and hit the highway. Cairo must have figured the same way, because I didn't hear him crashing around anymore. So I went back to see Paul Cairo's wife, Lisa... Who is there? Easy, baby. It's me. Oh, Mr. Jordan, it is you. Paul is looking everywhere for you. He says you killed a man, Tom Exman, over in Mr. Solomon's home. Yeah, that's what he's saying. But you did not kill him. I know that. Yeah? You must leave here right away. Your life is not safe. The way you're talking, neither is yours. I came here with Paul two weeks ago, and everything that has happened has been strange, especially the disappearance of Mr. Solomon. Well, what about him? Have you seen him? A few nights ago, he came here with Mr. Axman. They had been drinking, and they were arguing when they went over to the cabin. Oh, I've heard that before. What else? I've not seen them since. But Paul has Mr. Solomon tied up in one of the cabins. He's been taking food to him. Then who killed Axman? I'm afraid it, it was Paul. You've only got some of it. We'd better get to Cairo and see Sabaya. Your husband has my keys? Yes, yes. Uh, Solomon's car here? Yes, and the keys are in it. Where's the car? In back. Come on. Of course... 
This will mean the end of everything between Paul and myself. Oh, he doesn't strike me as good husband material. Love is a strange emotion, Mr. Jordan. It makes what is wrong very right. Can't put that on a police blotter. Yes. Yes, I know too well. I... I don't know whether I should go back to Cairo with you or not. Lady, all he'll give you is a lot of grief. You know that. But I love Come him. on, come on, get in. It was Cairo off in the dock somewhere, shooting at anything that moved. Lisa fell off the running board. I scrambled down, but when I got one look at her face, I knew she couldn't use any help. So I shoved the car into gear and burned tires straight for the road to Cairo. It took me two hours to get there. The guy at the laundry said Johnny Serby taken a powder ten hours before. The sergeant at the desk said Sam Sabaya was where he couldn't be reached. Well, that left only one guy to see, Jeannie, the information boy who had sent me on the chase to the Oasis. I pulled his card out of my pocket and found his place off in the native quarter, in between a phony rug maker and a lady barber. Oh, 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 Mr. Jordan. Buster, I've been up almost 24 hours without sleep. I saw one dead man and one woman killed. I don't feel good, and I want more information. Oh, Mr. Jordan, I told you where Mr. Solomon could be found. I gave you information. Uh, <laughs> you didn't give it all. Please, friend, the, the thing you find, Mr. Solomon. I found a playmate of yours who likes to shoot people and beat their skulls in and hang phony raps oh, on moment, me. Oh, friend, please. Oh, start uh, talking. Please, I know nothing of a man who would do such things. I know nothing of that man. When a uh, punk like you comes silent uh, up to me and tells me out of a clear sky where to find my man and doesn't argue about what I pay him, that means he's already been paid. Uh, and they only pay you for working. You... Oh... I am above reproach, Mr. Jordan. I would never become involved in a killing or murder. Yes. <laughs> Who paid you to send me up to El Fayum? Who paid you to frame me with a murder? It was me, Rock. I didn't tell him, Mr. Zerby. I didn't tell him. Shut up. That thirty-eight makes you a foot taller, Johnny. Easy, Rock. Easy. I'll use it right here if I have to. I think you would. Paul Caro phones me from El Fayum. Said you lambed out twice. You're awful tough, Rocky. Too tough to call a friend. Here, take this and buy yourself a new fez, you need. And forget you ever saw Jordan. Oh, yes, Mr. Sir. Yes, sir. All right, Rocky, let's get going. Long drive ahead of us. I'll be able to drive it blindfolded someday. Someday. I'm still the fall guy? I hate to do it to you, Rocky, but you're it. This is my chance not to be a punk anymore. I take you back there and we call Sabaya. Me and Cairo fix it up like you did it all. Now, come on. Cairo will be getting anxious. Well, you can't say I didn't help my pal, Johnny Servi. And you can't say I didn't find my man. Even if he was sitting in that same cabin with a couple of corpses on the floor. Big Ed Solomon needed a shave, but his face was a funny color. Maybe that was because he was looking at two bodies. Axman's and Lisa's. I guess Cairo had brought Lisa over from where she dropped by the car. He was standing there with a couple of big tears in his face, holding a gun against Big Ed's back. Johnny, I thought you'd never get here. Come on, let's get this over with. I'm sorry about Lisa. Never mind. Never mind about her now. Let's get this finished. Don't be nervous, Cairo. Meet Rocky Jordan, Ed. He killed you. Hi, Jordan. You're the four guy, huh? Tough luck. Where'd you find him, Johnny? Where I said I'd find him. You still killing the wrong people, Cairo? Not quite finished, pal. Two down and one to go. I'm next, huh? Sorry, Ed. Business. The bill of sale's all signed. Me and Cairo will take over the international club where you and Axman left off. Yeah, that's good enough reason. Hey, Jordan. We're going to let him rub us, me out, and then pin all this on you, or... We're going to do something about it. Take it easy, Ed. I think we ought to do something about it. Watch him, Captain. Big Ed Solomon was good. He stopped the first two slugs from Cairo's gun and the first two out of Johnny's, all in the chest. By that time, I'd gotten hold of a poker and brought it into Cairo's face. He looked sick in a big way and went down without a word. When I looked around, Big Ed had twisted the gun from Johnny's hand. I think he's already dead when he pulled the trigger. No, Ed! No, no! Rocky, help me. I did once, Johnny. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, no. 
Why'd you pick me, John? The embassy trick was level. I got the idea a couple of days ago. Figured I could get you looking for Big Ed. You set it up with Cairo. <laughs> well, Rocky, you aren't a patsy anymore. No, Jordan. You are not a patsy anymore. <laughs> Cops and everything. <laughs> Hi, Captain. Guess I didn't work it so well. You were wrong when you first started, Salvi. Yeah. Nothing I ever did ever worked out. Hard luck guy. Rocky. Yeah? Rocky. You were a good guy. I guess I was... Oh, you just played in the wrong team, Johnny. You never were... Let's go, Chosen. Yes, Sam. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, Sam and I picked up the pieces later on. It was like Johnny said. The embassy thing that night was true enough. Greco wanted Johnny bad. But Johnny got ideas and figured me for the patsy in his deal with Kiru. He had the guy tip me off to where Big Ed was, and Cairo put Big Ed under lock and key, killed Axman, and waited for me. You know how it happened from there on out. Lisa got in the way, I got in the way, and Johnny got in the way. Sam looked sad when it was all over. Uh, maybe I did, too. You go out on a limb for a pal, and next thing you know, somebody's chopping down the tree. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by E. Jack Newman, edited by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking, this CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Hello, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. This is Stark McVeigh in Minden, California. Yeah? I want to talk to you, Rogue. Well, you're talking. I want you to come up here to Minden and do a little job for me. I don't want you to let anybody in this town know who you are. Uh, you can register at the hotel as a traveling man, a salesman or something, and I... Uh, I... Hold it, hold it, McVeigh. I can't get away right now. I wired you $500 expense money. It should be at your office now. Mm -hmm. We'll talk over the rest of the deal when you get here. Oh, five bills, huh? Well, what kind of a case is it? A case that pays money. You can get out of there at 7 o'clock, and if you want to take a train... I'll I think... drive. I'll leave as soon as the 500 arrive. Take me about two hours to get there, won't it? That's right. I'll contact you at the hotel tonight about nine. Okay. See you then. Carry your bags, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to check in. Here. Thanks. Hey, clerk. Yes? You got a room? Well, I don't no, know. I didn't ask the price, did I? I'll take anything from a broom closet to the bridal suite. Here, buy yourself a box of cigars to smoke while you're thinking it over. Oh, thank you, sir. If you'll just register, I think we can take care of you. Mm, thanks. 
Have my bag sent up, will you? I'll pick up my key in a minute. Hey, Sonny, got an evening paper? Yes, sir. But all the news isn't in that paper, mister. Believe me. What do you mean? There was a murder in town tonight. Just a little while ago, as a matter of fact. A man was shot. Killed. Dead. Hmm. All that? Well, Menden is an enterprising community. Who got the business? A fellow by the name of Stark McVeigh. <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment, but first here's Jim Doyle to give you some smooth talk on a smooth subject. Yes, smooth is the word for it, Dick. That describes Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream to a T. For it has a rich, creamy consistency that spreads over your face like a cool April breeze. There's nothing heavy or greasy about Fitch's No Brush, yet it does a man-sized job when it comes to wilting a tough beard. You see, Fitch's No Brush is a blend of three important shaving ingredients. These are balanced in such a way that you get efficiency in softening whiskers, plus a skin conditioning action that protects your skin from irritation. Yes, they all add up to a shave that's really solid comfort. You men who say there's nothing like lather for a swell, smooth shave will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives lots of dense lather that stays moist all during the shave and rinses off easily. It, too, contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive skins. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush shaving cream come in handy jars, big 25 and 50 cent sizes. For smoother, happier shaves, switch to Fitch. And now we return you to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. This case looked like it was officially over before it started. The man I was working for had just been killed. I found that out while I was registering in Menden's, Menden's only hotel with running water. A bellboy gave me the news. And while I was just standing there with my mouth hanging open, a big, beefy guy eased up to me and said, You're Richard Rogue, aren't you? Oh, my name's Richard. Yeah, I know you're Rogue. I've seen your picture in the paper too often to be mistaken. I want to talk to you. Why? Because I'm chief of police in this town. Oh, oh, well, you just want to have a social talk, huh? Yeah, about a murder. Come on, Rogue, let's retire to the bar and play questions and answers. What about? About what you're doing in town, among other things. Come on, get moving, big shot. Suppose you start talking. What are you doing in Minden under the name of Richard? Hey, bartender, you put too much sugar in this old fashioned. Oh, so you think I like to hear myself talk? I said, what are you doing here? I'm on a vacation. Does a man named Stark McVeigh always finance your vacations? Hmm, McVeigh. Hmm, yes. Well, the name sounds familiar. I'll bet it does. He had a call in for you all day down at the city. He reached you at the Hunt Bar Room a little before 5 o'clock, and he wired you $500 to your office this afternoon. Huh. <laughs> Maybe that's why his name sounds familiar. Huh? Could be that. Well, what was it that made McVeigh think he'd need you five hundred dollars worth, Rogue? He didn't say. Uh, who was McVeigh anyway? I never met the guy. Never heard of him till he called me. You think I'll believe that? How do I know what you believe? I'm telling you the truth. That's all I can be sure of. And what's the idea of the pressure? You got ambitions to hang McVeigh's murder on me? Uh-huh. You know he's been murdered. How did you know that? Well, the bellboy told me. Who did it, Rogue? Who was McVeigh afraid of? I don't know anything about the guy. I didn't murder him. I hardly ever murder strangers. And now, uh, thanks for the drink and so long. Wait a minute. You leaving town, Rogue? I don't think so, no. I like the climate here. It's, uh, it's so peaceful. Well, don't you leave without seeing me. Or you'll come back with your hands cuffed behind you, lying down. <laughs> oh, well, if there's anything I love, it's a clever conversationalist. Huh? Huh? Now, I'll make a rule, egghead. Don't put any of your rural gumshoes on my tail if you like them personally. I don't like to be shattered. <laughs> Here's your ice water, Mr. Rogue. The name is Richard. Skip it, skip it. I heard you talking to Chief Reese. I know who you were anyway. Oh, well, you're a smart lad, huh? <laughs> Did you know Stark McVeigh? Sure. He used to be around here quite a bit. 
from the bar. What was his racket? What did he do for a living? Uh, how long had he been living here in Menden? Nobody knows where he made his money. He didn't work since he moved here about two years ago. Retired, I guess. That's what everybody thought. Always seemed to have plenty of money. Oh, they did, huh? Well, who were his friends? Was he married? Look, if I'm going to answer all of those questions, I want to work on the case with you. You need somebody who knows the town. Now, I'm an ex-GI. I work with intelligence. I can be a big help to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're working. Now, was McVeigh married? No. Didn't run around with women much either. I mean, here. Some blonde came down to see him once in a while. Drove a Cadillac convertible. Looked like a movie star. Mm. Did McVeigh make many trips? Was he uh, out of town much? Yeah, he traveled quite a bit. Mm. Did he have any enemies in town? Nobody knew him well enough to hate him. He was a kind of a stranger, Mr. Rogue. Nobody got to know him very well. Did he live alone? Yeah. He had a woman come in a couple of times a week to clean up. That's all. Good. Well, who do you think killed him? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Any suspicious-looking characters been seen around town lately? Not that I know of. But uh, he could have been here without me knowing it. Okay. Hey, uh, what's your name? Buzz Walters. What time are you off duty? About an hour, nine o'clock. Good, I'll see you then. In the lobby, right? Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do now? Oh, I'm going out to the house, McVeigh's house, and take a look around. You know where it is? I'll find it. See you at nine. <laughs> on the lights. Who is it? Is, is that you, Hank? Yeah. Turn on the lights. Hey, hey, you're not Hank. Who are you? What are you doing here? Will you turn on the lights so we can talk this thing over, Junior? Oh. Oh, you're the guy who, who bumped McVeigh, huh? Okay, Junior. Stay right where you are. And let you shoot at me? That doesn't sound practical. I've got my gun out now. How about taking another shot so I can spot you? Who are you? The law? Oh, it... Okay, Junior, throw that gun away. Oh, don't, don't shoot anymore. You, you hit me. Let me hear that gun hit the wall. Throw it. <laughs> okay. Now, maybe we can talk. Keep your hands down to your sides. Look, I'm shot. I'm bleeding. you got to do something for me. Later, later. First, Junior, you're going to answer some questions. I... Hey, did yeah. I startle you? Huh? Just hold that pause. Who is this guy, Shorty? I don't know. He, he came in here and I, I thought it was you. I, I took a shot at him and, but he, but he got me. Yeah, I see. Well, you better get somebody to take care of your friend here. He's got a bad chest. Don't let him. that worry you. You're gonna have worse before long. And we'll start you out like this. <coughs> oh. oh. How's everything on cloud eight? Oh, it's fine, fine. Say, Rogie, I missed you last week. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I had the flu. Yeah, didn't, uh, didn't Dennis O'Keefe come up to see you? Nah, not that Irishman. He doesn't use his head the way you do, Rogie. <laughs> Say, who did it this time? I don't know, I don't know. But I'm going to get him. If it's the last thing I do. Oh, you better hurry back downstairs then. You're getting further away every minute. Huh? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> You've got a surprise coming, Rogie. You're a side door tourist right now. Huh? Oh, well, that settles it. I'm going over the side. So long, you gore. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Come on, uh, fella. Come out of it. Huh? Oh. Oh. Uh, hey. Uh, hey. Hey, this thing's moving. Sure, friend. It's okay. You're in a freight car. Hmm? A, fr a freight car? Well, how well it seems somebody wrapped you over the skull and threw you in here. Ooh. Who? I don't know. You were here when I got here. Don't worry. You'll be okay. 
Well, thanks for the first aid. I... Where are we? Well, about uh, ten miles out of Minden. This red ball got a hot box and was held up. We're on the big grade going into the mountain. Yeah. Ah, oh, thanks. <sighs> hey, why well, you got around my head? Yeah, you were bleeding. I tore up your shirt and made a bandage of it. Oh, thanks. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump out of this thing. Are you crazy? Yeah, it could be. Uh... Hey, look. Hey, look, I, I've still got my wallet. You have? How come you didn't lift it? <laughs> I didn't think of it. Oh, you're an honest man. Here, yeah, here's a 20. Thanks. Okay. Well, here, here goes nothing. So long. Hey, ride. Hey, driver. Driver. Ride. Driver. You going into Minden? Yeah. What happened to you? Well, I was... I was knocked out and robbed and left on the road. I I, I got to get back to Minden to uh, report it to the cops. Okay, buddy. I wouldn't leave anybody out. But I got a revolver here and don't try any funny stuff. Uh, oh, me? Oh, I don't want to try anything. I, I just want to get back to Minden. I'll take you into Minden. Get in. Thanks. <laughs> Let me out here. Oh, no. Just stay right where you are. Hmm? Hey, what's the idea? Will you get that heater out of my face? I'll tell you where to get out. Oh? Well, when will that be? When we get to the police station. That's where you're going, mister. So I brought him in here to the police station, Chief. He looks suspicious to me. Yeah, nice work, Mr. Pollard. We'll take care of him. Thanks. I hope I did the right thing. Yeah, you sure did. Uh, thanks for the ride, Mr. Pollard. Goodbye. You just go right ahead, Pollard. I'll see you later. Oh, uh, Chief. Huh? There's no reward, is there? Uh, uh no, no, no. So long. Oh, so long. Well... Well, I see you're back, Rogue. I told you you'd get in trouble nosing around in this town. Now, you gonna talk? Well, I haven't much to say, Reese. I went out to McVeigh's house. The door was open. I walked in. Some guy took a shot at me. I shot back. Mm. Got him, and while I was trying to find out what it was all about, another guy sneaked up behind me and bent a rod over my head. I woke up in a freight train ten miles out of town. This, uh, this, uh, Pollard, uh, gave me a ride in. And that's the end of the story. Yeah. Well, how do you figure it? I don't know. But I want to get back out to that house. You coming with me? Well, what do you expect to find out there? We combed the house from one end to the other. Well, there's something going on in your charming little town that needs taken care of, Chief. And how come you don't have men at that house? There was a murder there a few hours ago. Now, don't you tell me my business, Rogue. Oh, I... Something smells. Come on. Let's get out to McVeigh's house. I want to do a little combing myself. Now, you'd better stay in line, Rogue. After all, I'm the chief here, and Yeah, I... yeah, yeah. I've read your star. Do. I don't know whether you're a dumb chief or a smart operator. But we're going to McVeigh's house, and we're going to tear it to pieces until I get a lead. Now, come on. Try the door. Don't knock. It may be open. Okay. Mm. Well, close the door. All right, all right. Mm. Now, the lights don't work. The main switch must be pulled. We'll get by with this flashlight. Come on, let's take a look around. Mm. Hey. Hmm? You see where that lamp is on the floor over there? Uh, Yeah. Well, the guy who was shooting at me was lying right by the side of it after I got him. Oh. Look, there's blood on the floor. You see it? What was that? Oh, seemed to come from that closet. Somebody's in there. Well, come on out. Come on out or I'll shoot that door so full of holes we can pull you out through them. 
Okay. I'll come out. Well, hello, Buzz. Welcome to the party. What are you doing here? Well, Mr. Rogue told me he was coming out here, and he was supposed to be back to meet me in the lobby at 9 o'clock. He didn't come back, so I decided I'd run out here and look for him. You got here a little late, Buzz. Oh, no, I didn't. Well, it was a little late to do you any good, but I saw plenty. I saw them walking around here. Wait a minute. What do you mean, them? Two men and a girl. The blonde girl that used to come here to see Mr. McVeigh. Oh, oh, you mean she was here? Yep. I hid outside of the window and watched them. They were carrying stuff up from the basement. That is, the girl and this man were, and putting it in the car. Uh, Buzz, did you hear them talk? Did the girl mention his name? No, no, she just called him Sweetheart or Honey or something like that. There was something funny about the other guy. What? He never did come out. The other two came out, got into that Cadillac convertible, and drove away about ten minutes ago. Well, then there must still be a man in the house. Yep, he'd been shot. He had trouble getting around. Must have been the guy I shot. I've been looking for him. Well, why didn't you call me? I was working for Mr. Rogue. Uh, I know he'd be here. Oh, good boy, Buzz. Now, come on, let's shake this house down. If that thug is in here, we better find him before he finds us. Well, this is the best kept basement I ever saw in a bachelor's house, Buzz. How about it? It's sure clean. Hmm. And look, there are a few muddy footsteps going this way. They're going both ways, Mr. Rogue. Yeah, yeah right over here and then back out. Hmm, that's funny. Huh. They walk right up to this blank wall and then back again. Maybe the stuff they were carrying out of the basement was stacked up against the wall. I doubt it. Hey, there's nobody up here. Shook down every room, every closet up here. There's nobody. Well, we're even. There's nobody down here either. I tell you, that guy they called Shorty never came out of the house. I was watching and I know he didn't. Hey, you're imagining things, kid. People don't just disappear. If he was here, we could see him now, couldn't we? If we could find him. Hmm. I've got an idea. Yeah? Well, there must be a hidden door of something in this wall here someplace. Oh, now, wait a minute, Rogie. Okay, okay. So I've been reading too many comic books, but I'm making my guess, and I'm going to see if I'm right. You see these footprints coming over here and going back again? Oh, uh, yeah. That, hmm. That's what it is. Maybe there's a loose tile in the wall or something. Yeah. Listen now. <laughs> there it is, Reese, you die hard. Did you hear that? It's hollow in there. Now, come on, let's figure this thing out. Hey, there is a loose tile right here. Huh? Well, let me see. Yeah. Well, I'll be... Are you uh... sure you're surprised, Sheriff? Why, I... There's a regular doorknob in there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Hmm. Well, it's locked, but I think I can take care of that. Look out. Now, well, that ought to do it. Flash your light in there, Reese. Okay. Hmm? Oh, brother, look at that. Huh? Hey, he's dead. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to ask the ladies a question. Have you ever had the shampoo blues? The shampoo blues, of course, is that dejected feeling you get when your hair becomes dry and unmanageable after a shampoo. If that's been your experience, then here's a way to beat those blues. Try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. Use this clear, golden, liquid shampoo as often as you like. It will never leave your hair dry or difficult to manage. That's because Fitch's Saponified Shampoo is made from pure, natural oils. Just a little makes oceans of cleansing lather. Rinses out easily, too, for Fitch's Saponified Shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. It leaves your hair soft, lustrous, and easy to manage even right after you shampoo it. Yes, you can always use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo with complete confidence and freedom from the shampoo blues. So use it regularly. Buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter or ask for a professional application at your beauty shop. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, you could have knocked me down with an atom bomb when we opened that secret door in the basement of McVeigh's house and saw what was inside. It was an air-conditioned room... 
with fluorescent lighting and strictly occupational furniture. And sitting at the table in the swivel chair was the body of the man named Shorty. Buzz, the bellboy, said. Hey, he's dead. Yeah, yeah, they let him have one right through the temple. Good Lord. Two murders in one day in Minton. That'll put the place on the map, won't it? I wonder why they killed him. Well, it looks pretty simple to me. I got him through the chest when he shot at me. And a wounded man is kind of a handicap to a mob that's trying to make a getaway with a set of counterfeit plates. Counterfeit? Is that what they were doing? Yeah. This place is one of the best equipped engraving shops I've ever been in. You knew that right away, didn't you, Reese? Mm. Oh, 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 sure. Right there. That's what McVeigh's racket was, huh? Yeah. Come on, let's take a look around. Here. Look here. Hmm? What did you find? Exhibit A. A whole stack of $10 bills. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> All with the same serial numbers. Oh, there's phonies, of course, girl's accent. Hmm. Well, Reese... Let's get back to town and get some post-mortem fingerprints off your late pal, McVeigh. And some information on the license number Buzz got off that Cadillac. Do you think we'll get him, Mr. Rogue? Oh, we're a lead pipe cinch, Buzz. You know, if you hadn't been sharp enough to jot down that license number, <laughs> we'd have been out of luck. Even Reese can trace that. Yeah... I think it could use a guy like me. Regular, Mr. Rogue? Oh, well, I'm sorry, kid. I, I'm a... Well, I'm a lone wolf. But you'll make some dough out of this case. You can bet your shirt there's a reward out for this mob, and we'll split it. Oh. You know, Junior, if you hadn't been around that house and seen those two drive away without Shorty, this crime may have never been solved. That's right, I guess. Nobody would ever have looked for the secret room. You know... I've always wanted to be a detective. Well, Rogie, the Department of Motor Vehicles says this is the address that car is registered to. Miss uh, Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue in Los Angeles. Well, that makes it my meat, Reese. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on, Buzz. You want to drive to L.A. with me? Sure, Mr. Rogue. I want to be in at the kill on this case. <laughs> This is the house. Oh. Miss Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue. What are we going to do? Well, first you go see if the car's in the garage while I take a look around. Okay. Hey, Buzz, Buzz. Come here. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hey, look in that window out there. Mm -hmm. That man. He's the one who knocked me out. Hmm. Oh, is that the man and the blonde woman you saw leaving McVeigh's house? Yep. That's them. Hmm. Oh, looks like they're having a beef. Ah, that's good. Buzz? We're going to do a little listening. Oh, how are you going to get in? Back door. Come on. But it's probably locked. Yeah, could be. But if I haven't a skeleton key on my chain that'll open that door, I'm going to get a new locksmith. Now, quiet. Come on. You didn't have to kill them both, Hank. You're a trigger-happy fool. Will you stop harping on that? They're dead. That's all there is to it. We're rid of them, and we got the counterfeit plates. We got no more troubles, baby. From now on, it's you and me. It is? What do you mean? Just that I don't have to put up with you anymore, either. One word out of me, and the cops will put you under the jail, Hank. That's what they do with killers, you know? I don't like you. I never did like you. But you're going to keep me in money and minks and everything I want as long as I live. Killer. It may not be long, you little double-crossing. Put that gun away. Hank. Hank, no. So you were going to double-cross no. me. Hank, no, no. So all that sweet talk no. was just an act. No. Well, here's no. my act. No, no, no. Hank, you your eye, Hank. Drop the gun. Pick it up, Buzz. Yeah. Who are you? Well, now, that's not very flattering. I'm Richard Rogue. But we'll talk about that later, lovely. Right now, get up against that wall, both of you. Start singing and make the lyrics cover a couple of murders. Come on, sing! Well, that was the end of that story. It all happened over a woman, almost everything does. When I got through chatting with Sylvia, I, I had the whole story. 
McVeigh and Hank had a sweet little counterfeiting deal all set up and running smoothly. McVeigh, a master engraver, made the plates and hand-printed them in his shop in Minden. Hank wholesaled the stuff. Everything was just too, too divine. Until Hank moved in on McVeigh's girl, Sylvia, and got caught at it. McVeigh wanted to hire me to front for him in exposing Hank as a counterfeiter, and that's what started all of the excitement and the murders. We found the counterfeiting plate in Sylvia's Cadillac, and I collected five grand reward for cracking the case. <laughs> I split it with Buzz. He was a happy kid. Yes, well, as I've always said, sure she left him, to coin a phrase. <laughs> it means find the woman. And by the way, if you have any luck, sure she won for me too, will you? I'm feeling much better and not doing a thing tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean. Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Now, don't forget now, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about a man with a million dollars, a beautiful wife, and an overpowering jealousy. We call it Best Laid Plans. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. And be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And remember, tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Arthur Godfrey, who usually comes around with his talent scouts at this time on Monday, has just about finished his summer holiday. Godfrey will be back with us one week from tonight on August 28th. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent... The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the place you drift to because the other promises you made to yourself never happened. You leave your life behind and stand on a street corner beating down the scream in your throat. It's the best of the thousand and one nights you dreamed of. The one place in the world where something happens to you outside of the movies. It always happens. Something starts it. The tap on the shoulder. The laughter that floats down to your end of the bar. The smile. The special delivery. The phone call. Your phone's ringing, Danny. Now, thanks, Gino. Danny Clover speaking. You gotta help. You gotta come here. You gotta come to my home. Who is this? Mrs. Corey. Please, please, my husband. What is it, Miss Corey? A suicide peck. He's trying to make me. He's trying to force the me to kill myself. Yeah, I Danny. don't want to die. He's gonna make me. Die. Hello. 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 Who is this? What happened? Mr. Corey. I've just killed my wife. Now it's the time for my dying. Listen, don't be a fool. Hello. Hello. Tartaglia. Oh, wait a minute, Danny. What did you say, operator? Oh? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. Party hung up too soon. 
Couldn't trace it, Danny. It began that way, with a desperate protest against private agonies. The protest that can't face the loneliness of death and must kill the loved ones so that the path into darkness will not be walked alone. The man, Corey, murdered his wife and then himself. And a glittering, blood-spangled shriek for attention, final identity, set into motion only an old, a familiar routine. The official collecting of the dead. But first we had to find them. Detective Muggerman brought in the phone book. We sat over it, turned to the seas, found there were 25 Corries. We divided them, went our way. The treasure hunt for the dead. The first Corrie was very much alive. She told me so. Nobody dead here, mister. Everybody much, much alive. Come on in and I'll prove it to you. You live here alone? Uh Uh-huh. I'll take a look. Love it. Come on in. See? Alone. Just you and me. Touch me. I ain't dead. Yeah, sure. My name's Corey. Why do you have to know? man named Corey killed his wife, said he was going to kill himself. Killed his wife, huh? Guts? That takes guts. Where's your wife, Mr. Corey? She's in the kitchen washing out my work pants so I can go out and look for work. Come on, I'll show it to you. Look, mister, even if you're a policeman, it doesn't give you a right to ask me a thing like that. I love my wife. We never say a harsh word. Where is she? She's asleep. This late? She sleeps this late every morning. I was just preparing her breakfast. Call her. Look, mister, you don't know what you're asking. Call her. Fanny. Fanny, uh, wake up for a minute. It's a policeman. He wants to know, did we have a suicide pact? Fanny. Fanny. Oh, suicide pact? <clears throat> Tell him no, but thank him for the suggestion. You finish your list, Danny? Yeah, Buggerman. Find him? No. You? No. Maybe it was a joke, huh, Danny? A practical joke? I don't think so. Did you finish the list? No, I, uh, I got two more to go. I'll take them. The reason I didn't finish, Danny, I, uh, I had to come back to headquarters to... I just got tired. Forget it. Give them to me. Yeah, uh, here, Danny. Two more. Maybe Muggerman was right. Maybe it had been a joke. Someone's grisly idea of a joke to play on the gullible police. There are people like that. There are people who make a pact to die. The first Corey on Muggerman's remaining list of two was an invalid, a bedridden woman tended by her middle-aged bachelor son. He asked me to stay and chat with him. It was such an interesting thing to have happen to them. At the last place, the manager of a plush apartment house just off the park told me, indeed, yes, indeed, he had a Mr. and Mrs. Corey. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, they've been with us, uh, let me see, uh, five years, I should say. What apartment are they in? Uh, 3A. You understand, of course, that solicitors and peddlers are not allowed on the premises. No. I'm from the police. See? Police. Hmm. Police. What is your interest in Mr. and Mrs. Corey? You're perfectly right. Which way is 3A? down this center hall. But we'll announce ourselves first, shall we? Hmm. No answer. Well, they're either not at home or they've overslept. With Mr. and Mrs. Corey, I should say they're not at home. Let's go find out and bring the key. Oh, but that's... Bring the key. Oh, very well. Here it is. After me, please. Mr. Corey. Mr. Corey, I'm sorry, but there's someone from the police. Mr. Corey? Mrs. Corey. Open it. But I... Open it. See? There's no one at home. They've gone out. Where's the bedroom? through here, but I don't believe you have the right to intrude like this. As you can see, everything is in apple pie order. What are you looking for? Why do you pry so? They're dead, that's why. Oh. Oh. 
Well, in that case, you might be interested in something I... In what? A woman called me just a while ago. Said she'd been trying to reach Mr. and Mrs. Corey all morning. On their private phone. There was no answer, so she left the message with me. What message? Uh, her name, her phone number. They interest you? Get them for me. Now, get them. This time it was easier. The message was from one Zella Stanley for the phone number to match. As easy as investing a nickel in the nearest phone booth and telling Zella Stanley you were the police. Asking her if she had been calling the Corries and would she be home, and I wanted to talk with her. Miss Stanley was in turn noncommittal, puzzled, cooperative. Please come up, Mr. Clover. The address is 1520 West 46th, apartment 2A. Mr. Clover? Yes. Please come in. Will you sit down? Let me get these things out of here. I I was so tired when I came home last night, I undressed walking into the bedroom. Now, won't you sit down? Thank you. About Mr. and Ms. Corey... Now, don't put me on the defensive, Mr. Clover. I want to help you with whatever it is, so just let me tell you. Good. Go ahead. I've been calling Alice all morning. That's Alice Corey. That's right. There's been no answer at her apartment. Is that something unusual? Not in itself. I've called people before, and I suppose you have. Called them, and no one answers. Was it important that you get in touch with Mrs. Corey? Not in itself. I, I just wanted to talk to her. I see. Just a kind of, good morning, Alice. How are you? Is that it? Something like that. Just let me tell you. Will that be all right, Mr. Clover? Yeah, it'll be just fine. <laughs> well, I was at the Corey's last night for bridge. There was something in that house that had never been there before. What? Please. Oh, sorry. Something was wrong. No laughter between the two. Silence, mostly. And now and then, a, a bitter word. I've known them for years. The Corys have been the cliché of matrimonial bliss. It, uh, it embarrassed me. I, I, I left early. May I? Of course. You said you were playing bridge. You, Mr. Corey, Mrs. Corey. Who else? And Tom's partner. Tom Corey's partner? His business partner, Henry. Henry who, Miss Stanley? Henry Fairchild. Fairchild of Corey and Fairchild, you know. No, I don't, Miss Stanley. A factory. They make small things, uh, electrical parts or something. I don't know. Uh, tell me a bit more about last night. Well, just that Tom was depressed. Alice looked, well, frightened. i never seen Alice look frightened, but I think that's what it was. Henry did everything he could to brighten things up. It didn't work. You go ask him. Ask Henry. Henry Fairchild of Corey and Fairchild. Ask him. My secretary tells me you're from the police. I can't tell you how delighted I am to see you. Delighted. Thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Come over here, Mr. Clover. Quick, come over. I want you to see something. I'll draw these drapes back so you can see something. Look down there. What do you think? Yeah, it's quite a little factory you have there. It's more than that, Mr. Clover. It's ten years of our lives. Ten years of blood, sweat, tears. No other way to say it. Ten years of that. And he walks on it, squashes it like it was a, a cockroach we'd built. Oh? We're ruined, destroyed, milk dry, all that work sucked dry because he was greedy, hungry for more money. Fifty thousand dollars, like that. Like he was taking it out of a piggy bank. Arrest him, Mr. Clover. Go arrest him. Who? My partner. I'm Corey. Arrest him for grand larceny. Arrest him for dipping his fingers into our till. Arrest him for being an ungrateful greedy. Tom Corey did that? Yeah, here are the books. Look for yourself. But you wouldn't know about a thing like that. Your experts will, though. They'll see how month after month he stole 5,000 here, three here, ten here, two here. Uh-huh. When did you see Corey last? Last night. <laughs> we were playing bridge. He was moody. Rude to his wife, to Alice. I tried to cheer him up because I thought it was dyspepsia or something. This morning I find it was, it was this. When you arrest him, Mr. Clover, tell him I'll make it a point to visit him in jail. You'll give me kicks to see him there every chance I get. Corey killed his wife this morning, then himself. Huh? He didn't have to do that. If he could have come to me, I would have... I'd have helped him, honest. I we can't find them. They're not at the apartment. How about their place on Fire Island? Where? They have a house on Fire Island. You think we should try there, Mr. Kohler?
We did. Mr. Fairchild drove me out to the landing dock, hired the power launch that took us to Fire Island. Then the short walk across the bone-white sands and a small cottage. The front of it was draped with a yellowed fishing net and life preservers whitewashed for the season. Starfish had been nailed over the door. The top of the door was glass porthole, and the door was open. First time this has ever happened. What? Leaving that door open like this. Come on. Where's the phone? In the other room, Mr. Clover. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. What? Oh. Dead. Shot through the heart. Poor Alice. She had nothing to do with it. What about her husband? What? Where is he if he shot himself? Where is he? That's what I said, Mr. Fairchild. Where is he? Wait a minute. Blood here on the floor. See it? Trailing toward the back door. Here. Now the blood stops. But no time. Where is he? You said he committed suicide. I was wrong. He committed murder. You were listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Next week, along about this time, Arthur Godfrey and his talent scouts will be on hand again to delight and entertain you. You'll find that Godfrey's amateur but knowing scouting have dug up some wonderful new discoveries for you. And they'll be here Monday after Monday all season long. By the way, next Monday also marks the return of my friend Irma, the Lux Radio Theater, and the Bob Hawk Show on most of these same CBS stations. Don't miss next Monday evening with CBS, the network of the stars. <laughs> There's this about Broadway. It wants everything neat and in place. A word misspelled on a spectacular can stop traffic. A girl lamenting a run in her nylons, likewise, and for longer. The scream of the loudspeakers has to be adjusted just so. And the deep, anguished weeping in a darkened doorway, not too much. Even death and violence have to meet Broadway's standards. The death of Alice Corey by a bullet through the heart, that would measure up. This violence committed upon her by her husband... It would measure up, too. Very poignant. Very class A. We've stood in line for worse, huh, kid? A man makes a pact with his wife to commit double suicide, kills his wife, only wounds himself. That's hard to do when you're hungry for dying. And harder still to be wounded and disappear from an island. Uh, I'd wanted to kill myself, I'd have succeeded. How could Tom only have wounded himself, Mr. Clover? Maybe that's all he intended to do. Meant to murder, Alice? A policeman has to consider the possibility, Mr. Fairchild. Well, then how, what I asked you before, how could he have only wounded himself? He shot Mrs. Corey in the heart. He must have thought that was the best way, in the heart. When he shot himself, he must have flinched a reflex against his own death. He flinched. He saw he wasn't dead. He liked it that way. It's been that way before. But you said he committed... Murder? That's right. When someone kills someone else like that, we call it Murder. Is there anywhere else on the island he might be, Mr. Fairchild? No, well, we've covered all of it. Places I never knew existed. I don't mind telling you I'm tired, Mr. Clover. And he must have crossed over to the mainland. You know these people at the landing dock, Mr. Fairchild? Well, most of them. Call out and ask if anyone took Tom Corey across. All right. Did anyone here take Tom Corey across today? Did anyone take... No, Graham did, Mr. Fairchild. Where is he? Just the other side of the landing. See his boat? Let's go, Fairchild. You, Joe Graham? Hi there, Mr. Fairchild. Hello, Joe. This is Mr. Clover, Joe. He's a detective. He wants to... I want to know if you took Tom Corey across today. You want to know, too, Mr. Fairchild? We do, Joe. Yeah, I took Tom across. When? You say something, Mr. Fairchild? When did you take him across, Joe? Early day, around noon, Mr. Fairchild. Did he say anything to you? Uh, Tell your friend I'm a very sociable man, Mr. Fairchild. People talk to me. I talk to people. People I care about. 
Mr. Clover asked that because Tom Corey is a murderer. He killed Mrs. Corey this morning. Guess that's why Tom wasn't very talkative. Had things on his mind, just kept biting his lip, just sat huddled there. Didn't think it proper to ask him why. Glad I didn't. Where'd you take him? Well, I always took him to Fairchild, like I've taken you and him and Alice many times. So you could go back to your factory over there. Ask him if he'll take us back. Will you take us back, Joe? You and the detective? Yes. It'll cost you more for him. Hop aboard. I'll take you. Danny? Come on in, Gino. What's on your mind? It came through, Danny. I'm going to miss you. Why are you going to miss me, Gino? What came through? But Captain Julius okayed your vacation request, and so did the inspector, and so did the commissioner. Then back again through the inspector and Captain Julius. So, here it is. Where are you going, Danny? I haven't made up my mind. I've been mulling over the travel folders, me and Mrs. Tartaglia, and we feel the place for you is Mexico. Mexico, huh? See, si, in Ensenada, in Mexico, in the Riviera Pacifico. Imagine you with a serape over your shoulder, huraches on your feet, and a la cucaracha on your lips. See. Si. Mexico, man amigo. Uh, me amigo. And we are friends, aren't we? Uh, Gino. Uh, Lieutenant Clover? Yes. What is it? I'm Dr. Haskell. They told me to come right in. Of course. What is it, Doctor? They said you'd want to see me, that you were working on something that might have something to do with what I want to see you about. All right. What is it? About 20 minutes ago, a man forced his way into my office. I say forced himself because he had a gun. What did the man look like? Oh, about 40, strongly built. I wrote it all down here because I knew you'd want to know. Here. Oh. I knew you'd ask me. Uh-huh. About 20 minutes ago, he came to see you about a bullet wound, didn't he? Yes. How did you know? We're looking for this man. How badly is he hurt? Die. He'll die. Unless a miracle. But then I'm only a doctor. I gave him plasma, extracted the bullet, shot him to the heart. He wouldn't let me give him anesthetic. He's hurt. Unless he's found immediately, he'll die. You let him go? I told you he had a gun. Oh, I see. Where do you live, Doctor? Uh, here. Here's my car. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to tell me? No, I believe that's all. It just came in, Danny, over the teletype. What did? Item about a woman you talked to earlier, uh, Zella Stanley. Off the dime, Muggerman. What about her? She was found in her apartment, shot to death. Pretty expensive dress she's wearing, Danny. Uh-huh. She must have been very pretty once. Zella. New girl in high school. Her name is Zella. Well, she's lying. He must have shot her the minute she opened the door, huh? Yeah. Take the other room, Muggerman. I'll go through this one. Okay, Danny. Danny? Yeah? The radio? Radio phonograph combo. Also very expensive. The bed also, the furnishings. Wonder how she managed. Maybe she was rich, huh? Maybe. I think I find out how, Danny. How what? How she managed. These men's shirts in the bedroom closet. This robe. Let's see them. Embroidered initials in silk. Wish I could afford things like that. T.C., uh, Tom Corey, Danny? Uh-huh. T.C., Tom Corey. So it began to take shape. Tom Corey had killed his wife, turned the gun on himself, had missed his heart. Then he had decided to rid himself of the source of his trouble, Zella Stanley. Committed grand larceny, committed murder, two murders. Now he was a dying man someplace in the city. Find him. We tried all points bulletins, newspaper releases, call on the hospitals, then back to headquarters and wait. Then nodded a man who nudged his head through a door and listened to his story. I run the Diamond Hotel on 37th Street. A little while ago, a man came in my place to register. Why do you think that's of interest to me? The man had no bags. I saw that right away when I handed him the pen to write. Then on top of that, he said, you write my name for me. It's Smith. That's what he said. Write John Smith. I said, Why? He said, because I got my hands in my pockets, that's why. I said, oh, do you? Come to the point, will you? The point is this. 
I looked over the desk at these hands in his pockets just to see what went. What went was the side of his coat was blood. Then I got cagey. Cagey? Cagey. I said, how long you want the room? Months? Day? Week? And he looked funny and said all he wanted to do was rest a while. I said, "Uh uh-uh, because I saw trouble. He left. I came here. I did right, didn't I? Danny Clover speaking. There's a man in my house. Who is this? Mrs. Barry. I live on West 57th Street, 1209. I'm frightened. There's a man in... What man? He rang my bell and pointed a gun at me and walked into my house. Is he still there? Yes. He, he looked tired. He sat in the big chair in the parlor. He fell asleep. He's there now, sleeping. I'll be right there. Can't you understand? He's gone. Well, just ten minutes ago, you called. Ten minutes ago, he was sitting in that chair sleeping. He woke up and left. He had a gun. He... All right, all right. All right, he says. He had a gun pointed at my nose. What did you want me to do? Hit him over the head with a candlestick? Huh. Not me. He left. Look, left blood, too. All over my rug. <laughs> Back to headquarters again. Then a phone call from a pedestrian who'd just seen a man who fitted Tom Corey's description on West 62nd. The man was staggering, Mr. Clover. So Mr. Clover dispatched a squad car to the area. The man was nowhere in sight. Then Mr. Clover sat down and thought about it. Tom Corey left Fire Island by boat, found a doctor on 12th Street in the village. Put a thumbtack on the map. Tom Corey has tried to get a room at the Diamond Hotel on West 37th. Thumbtack. Tom Corey had murdered Zella Stanley, West 46th. Thumbtack. Tom Corey had been asleep in a parlor on West 57th. Thumbtack. Then a phone. Man, probably Tom Corey was seen staggering on West 62nd. Thumbtack. Tom Corey was headed uptown. Tom Corey was crazed with pain. Then a recheck of my notebook. Tom Corey had a partner named Henry Fairchild. Henry Fairchild lived uptown. He lived on West 70th. Maybe I could get there before Tom Corey. Who is it? The police. Danny Clover. Come in. Quickly. I'm glad it's you. You Afraid of something, Mr. Fairchild? Huh? The door bolted, locked. What are you afraid of? I read it in the newspapers. Tom, he's still loose. You still haven't answered my question. What are you afraid of? Isn't it obvious? Tom has killed his wife, killed Zeller. Now he's... That's why you're here, Mr. Clover. You know Tom is on his way. Uh Uh-huh. I figure he is. I'm just wondering why you figured it. You just said it's obvious. Tom is out of his mind. He killed Zeller, didn't he? You know why, too, don't you? No. No. Tell me why. You found his shirts there, didn't you? At Zeller's. How did you know that, Mr. Fairchild? It wasn't in the newspapers. Why? Oh, no, it wasn't. It's simply that Tom told me all about it, about Tom and Zella, how expensive she was. That's why he stole all that money. I see. Uh. Mr. Clover. Put down that gun. But, uh, give it to me. I said give it to me. Stand right where you are. I'll take care of it. Come in, Tom. Shoot him. Shoot him. He killed me. I'll take that gun, Corey. Come on, Corey. I'll help you. Sit down over here. There. Don't believe him, Mr. Clover. Don't believe anything Corey says. Uh-huh. Uh, he's going to tell you I killed his wife, that I shot him, that I stole the money. Ridiculous things, crazy things, because he's crazy now. Tom? Of course, Tom. He's crazy. He's going to say that Zella and I arranged the whole thing to make it look like a suicide pact, that I killed Zella. Tom. Tom. That's right. Tom's dead. He just confessed to a dead man. (laughs) 
Broadway stretches out in front of you, a livid scar slashed into the night. It's a cruel and fantastic carousel, a palace of fun, a hall of mirrors. You pay your way and you take your choice. Me? I get in on a pass on Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield, Janet Logan, Ann Stone, Junius Matthews, Byron Kane, and Jack Crucian. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat. We thank you for listening and hope to return in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Meanwhile, listen to Arthur Godfrey, who returns at the same time next Monday with his talent scouts. There's always plenty of fun on hand when you hear Columbia's Monday night program, Too Many Cooks, The Hilarious Misadventures of a Father, Mother, and Ten Children. Stay tuned now for Too Many Cooks, which follows immediately over most of these Columbia stations. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, where you live life with Luigi on Tuesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets, with danger waiting at every intersection. Until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted. And death brought an end to the game. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Grim Hunters. The morning paper had headlined Prices Rising. My bank statement in the afternoon mail had worn balance falling. And I had wasted the evening on behalf of a client who ran out on me when I tried to collect. All of which added up to the end of the day and me unhappy in my office at 10 p.m. With one hand on my checkbook and the other one raised in almost solemn oath. I, Philip Marlowe, private detective and too often public servant. Hereby resolved to one way or another jockey my budget into something close to equilibrium. And from this day for... Hello. Marlowe speaking. My name is Helen Palmer, Marlowe. I need your help badly. Yeah, but look, I... I'm up at 8700 Magnolia Terrace in the Hollywood Hills. Now, please, drop whatever you're doing and... No. No. No! I must have let go of the phone, grabbed my hat and coat, opened and closed the office door, piled into my car outside and raced up into the Hollywood Hills because... The next thing I remember after Helen Palmer's scream was swinging off North Bronson Drive onto Magnolia Terrace. But a minute later, when I scraped to a stop away from number 8700, scrambled out from under the wheel and started on the run for the front door, I was no longer sure of anything. Because the house in question, a stock southern mansion complete with stable boy statue in the gravel driveway, which according to the book should have been as dark and as quiet as the inside of a coffin, was anything else but... And when I got to the oversized bronze door knocker and dropped it hard, I was beginning to doubt that I had the right address. Can I be of some assistance, sir? I don't know. I'm looking for a woman named Helen Palmer who called me at my office. Said she needed help. 
And the second after that, she screamed. Uh. <laughs> Tell me, sir, what is your name and occupation? In that order, Philip Marlowe, private detective. <laughs> good for Helen, good for Happy, her. aren't you? What's going on here? What is this? Why, it's a party, sir. A scavenger hunt. And it looks like Helen Palmer's the winner. Now, wait a minute, laughing boy. I had a call that was interrupted by pistol shots. And I... <laughs> All just part of the play, sir. Yeah, Helen Palmer had to bring back one private detective. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, you see, Marlowe, each list, aside from the usual hard-to-find objects, had a human being on it. That's right. I had to bring back a Hoover vacuum cleaner salesman, and believe it or not, he's already sold our good host, Thaddeus Grover, the deluxe model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, he did it bad. <laughs> you see, Mr. Marlowe, Helen Palmer wasn't permitted to actually hire you. That's why she had to pretend to be in trouble. With well, a net result that I nearly broke my neck getting up here. Mr. Grover, where is Miss Palmer? Well, I don't know for sure, Marlowe. She called just a bit ago and said that she only had to catch on to you and one other item and be back after that. Which makes her the winner, Mr. Marlowe, because none of us did better than half our list. Oh, by the by, you don't happen to have the breech lock of a 57-millimeter anti-tank gun with you. <laughs> At the moment, no. Nor do I have time for scavenger hunters. Not even when they most cordially invite you in with the finest serve and a party-style southern fried chicken imaginable. Come on, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I... Come on. Come well, on, come on, come it's on. delicious chicken. Come well, okay, the chicken did it. <laughs> the inside of Thaddeus Grover's house was also a stock southern mansion from a giant cut glass punch bowl. Belonged to my mother, sir, first lady of Atlanta, Georgia, sir, to a wide and winding colonial staircase. It left you expecting the descent of Scarlett O'Hara at any moment. There was one strange note in the soft southern surroundings. Pile three feet high in the middle of the room were the crazy quilt results of the evening scavenger hunt, including a wooden cigar store Indian, a pair of Hickok suspenders from a local fire chief, one red motorcycle, a stuffed owl, a set of antlers, and more. And behind all that, my counterparts, the bring back alive items from each list, a streetcar conductor in uniform, a waiter bald and under 40, a school teacher red-headed and over 50. But I was the center of attention. But Thaddeus introduced one after another of the guests to the genuine, 100% non-shrinkable private detective. And now, Mr. Marlowe, sir, a very special friend of mine. At 31, sir, the president of Sample and Claiborne, best building contractors in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, that's so very interesting, Mr. Grover. Yeah, moreover, Mr. Marlowe, Sample made it right to the top in the past two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, ever since old Joshua Claiborne got killed falling off a scaffold. He did. Because between you and me and the gatepost, some folks say it was suicide. Oh, Larry! Larry boy, uh, I, I'd like you to meet Mr. Marlowe, private detective. Mr. Marlowe, Larry Sam. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Glad you're with us. Uh, Thaddeus has Rhonda called in yet. Last time I heard from her was when we split our list in two and she headed out after a Latin American rumba team. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she went after a boy, she'll bring her back. That's Rhonda Langley we're speaking of, Mr. Marlowe, Larry's lady friend. Oh? Nicest person I know. Except, of course, my fiance, Helen. Helen is in Palmer, my Patron, Mr. Grover? <laughs> yes, sir. What well, and the same, sir. Well, we certainly have a lot of fun, even if we don't make much money, have I, Yeah, hey, you certainly. <laughs> Mr. Grover, did you say money? Most surely did, boy. Mm. You know, dollars and cents. Yes. Well, gentlemen, you'll excuse me, please, but I do have to run. Good night, Mr. Sample. Good night. And Mr. Grover, sir, it's been a distinct pleasure, sir. I bid you goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Your card. <laughs> <laughs> I got back to my office, which I had left, lights on and unlocked. My telephone was ringing. At this late hour, gullible me took faint hope that it could be a client who might still save the day. When I picked up the receiver... Marlo? I let go of that straw fast. Marlo? It was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, do you know a girl named Helen Palmer? Helen Palmer? Pa- hey, Ibarra, don't tell me there's a pair of somewhat flat feet on the lady's scavenger hunt list. Very funny, Phil. How do you know her? No, not beyond a panic telephone call that ended in a make-believe scream and a couple of pistol shots. All designed to bring me running to a party at 8700 Magnolia Terrace. Mm-hmm. Well, that adds all right, because the only items not checked off a list are a night watchman's badge and one detective private, which must be you, since your name is circled in the classified directory here in this phone booth. Here in what phone booth? Where are you, Barra? At a closed filling station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, but wait a minute. Why is a girl's list there with you? Because it's clenched in her right hand, Phil, and she's folded up on the floor of this booth, dead. Oh, no. Two bullet holes in her back. Oh, yeah, but but Ibarra, her call was a gag. The shots weren't. 
Anyhow, it looks like a stick-up since the lady's purse is gone and a wino we picked Who? up. A wino we picked up saw what he calls a curly-headed guy with short legs do it and run. Also, the wino says that the murderer had been hanging around for a couple of hours like he was looking for a well-to-do prospect. Yeah, I know, but it's still kind of strange. Me getting that call, I mean. Well, I'll drop around to headquarters tomorrow morning, Lieutenant, if you need any statement from me. I think you'd better make that tonight, Phil. At the 8700 address. I'm sending Mooney up there now. Oh, but wait a minute, Ibarra. You don't need me, and I do need business. If you think I'm going to get it by... Phil. Huh? Phil, let's say that I'd appreciate it if you'd show for a few minutes. Okay? No. Well, okay, a few minutes. Just so long as you appreciate it. Goodbye. Driving back to Magnolia Terrace, I used Detective Lieutenant Ibarra as an oversized whipping boy for the day's disappointments. So when I finally break to a stop behind a half-parked squad car, which meant that police officer Mooney was already on hand, I was about back to normal. But then in the next quick moment, I forgot all about Ibarra because... In the shadows ahead, sneaking away from a side entrance to number 8700, and looking as guilty as Lucretia Borgia leaving a corner pharmacy, was a young lady, brunette and beautiful. She hurried directly to a gray Nash parked in the rear, and without looking back, climbed in and took off. Following her had to be more fun than conversation with Mooney. <laughs> later, the lady came to a stop in front of a dark, politely landscaped cottage on North Ogden Drive. In another two, she was inside and the light was on. When I got to the front door and leaned against the bell, a card over it said that this could be one Rhonda Langley, Mr. Larry Sample's girlfriend. But that same card also gave another name, Helen Palmer, the lady dead in the phone booth. I rang again. When the door opened, it was the brunette, still beautiful. Only this time, something had been added. In her right hand, a forty-five, ugly and pointed straight at my head. What do you want? One straight answer, Miss Langley. <clears throat> Why did you run away from 8700 Magnolia Terrace? And a cop with routine questions. Wait a minute. Who are you? How do you know my name? I'm a private detective, labeled Philip Marlowe. Item number eight on the late Miss Palmer's list. And I know about you because I've already been to Thaddeus Grover's party. Now, after you put this gun away, Sorry. we'll get back to my question. Why'd you run? Come on, talk, lady, now before I yell copper. Well, all right. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I don't think Helen Palmer's murder was any run-of-the-mill robbery. You don't think what? I stayed just long enough to hear the policeman say Helen had been killed. Oh. When I got to your welcome, Matt, I was greeted with a forty-five. Talk some more, Miss Langley. Real plain-like, well, right. huh? Give me half a chance, will you? I didn't say anything to the police about this because I don't want to do any damage before I'm sure about a few things. Like what? Like the kind of a mess that Helen was in. Mr. Marlowe, I need help. I I've got to know some facts. Please, will you work for me? I'll pay you anything. Well, at this point, let's call anything 25 a day in expenses, huh? Right. About Helen and the mess you spoke of, how much do you know? Very little. Only that I think Helen was blackmailing somebody. Somebody who was at the party tonight. Like Grover, your boyfriend Larry Sample? I don't know. Oh, you've got to believe me, Mr. Marlowe. Well, all right. For the time being, I will. Now, first of all, how'd you lash onto this blackmail? Well, yesterday morning, I accidentally overheard Helen talking to someone on the telephone. She spoke of a payoff that was to be made at Thaddeus's party. I don't know who she was talking to, but she warned the person not to try anything rash. As in murder? She didn't say. But she did say that she'd already airmailed a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco that would protect her from any harm. And she laughed about the scheduled scavenger hunt and hung up. Mm-hmm. You said nothing to her about this, huh? Well, no, I, I was afraid... All right, the letter to San Francisco. Did you see him mail it? Well, I mailed it myself earlier in the day, along with one of my own. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it until after her call, when she pointedly asked me if I'd remembered to mail a letter. Uh, my letter, that is. Which she knew that I'd written to an aunt I have in Passaic, New Jersey. Well? Well, that's the whole story. If you want me, I'll be over at Thaddeus's place. Thaddeus? Yes, he was in love with Helen. Yeah. Maybe she was returning that love with blackmail. What do you think, Rhonda? I don't know. The thinking is now your job, Mr. Marlowe. When I left Rhonda Langley and started back to my car as a bona fide private detective with client, I wasn't sure whether or not I was happy about the whole thing. But a second later, at the sight of a man in the dark ahead, half crouched behind a tree, I quit deliberating the point and got ready for trouble because... When I could see, the gentleman in hiding had both the curly hair and very short legs that Ibarra had mentioned as a sign of Helen Palmer's killer. 
I kept walking straight until I was abreast of the tree, and then I pivoted sharply. Took one step toward him and swung! <laughs> Come on, brother. Why, you dirty... You haven't got the time! They believe me! Enough, fella. Enough, will you leave me alone? Sure. Sure I will. After you start talking. Now, get up! Okay. Okay, don't hit me again. I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. Hey. Hey, look there. No! No, don't! Oh, that lousy nut... just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, you can do a lot of singing for $14,500, so they say. And tonight, some CBS listener may be able to speak with authority on the subject because $14,500 is what's waiting for whoever can solve the mystery behind the new Phantom Voice on CBS's great Saturday night quiz game, Sing It Again. Listeners from coast to coast will be quizzed by telephone about the new Phantom's identity. And they'll also be given a chance to win one of the other famous prizes for solving the riddle songs which feature Sing It Again's Hour of Saturday Night Fun. Here, Sing It Again on most of these same CBS network stations tonight and every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Hunters. Shots crashed out of the darkness. The life ran out of the little man like air from a kid's balloon. I couldn't figure exactly where the shots had come from, and I stopped trying when a pair of spiked heels clicked fast across the concrete driveway between me and the house. Then a motor started, and a second later, a car roared by with Ronda Langley at the wheel. I yelled at her to stop as she went by, and ran out in the street after her and yelled again at the retreating car. But she ignored me. When another car came around the curve behind me, I tried to flag it down, but the driver didn't even slow up. So I just stood there while the two cars twisted out of sight down the winding street, leaving nothing but silence and a lot of unanswered questions hanging in midair. I walked back to the corpse, went over it carefully. But there was no identification, nothing but a gun to indicate how he fitted into the screwy mosaic of murder, scavenging, and blackmail. I went inside to call Ibarra, and five minutes of tracers, relays, and busy signals went by before I finally got through to him with my news about Helen Palmer's killer. What? Uh, where are you, Marlowe? In a house on Ogden Drive, 4310 North. It was shared by Helen Palmer, my new client, Rhonda Langley. Uh-huh. Did she kill my suspect, Marlowe? It could be. She left here in a big hurry. Another thing, Ebar, there's more behind this business than robbery. Like what? Like blackmail. Maybe so. We just found the Palmer's girl handbag in a trash can. Nothing left but a lipstick and two letters. Incidentally, one is addressed to your client, Rhonda Langley. That figures. They shared the house, so Helen happened to pick up the day's mail. What's the other letter? It was one return for insufficient postage. They forgot that airmail is six cents these days. Oh, return... Wait a minute. Is that letter addressed to a law firm in San Francisco? No, it's addressed to Sophie Kilbirdy. Sophie of... Kill who? Kilbirdy of oh. Passaic, New Jersey. Why? Oh, Ibarra, listen. Helen was blackmailing somebody, and she covered herself by mailing a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. If that letter was returned for insufficient postage and the blackmail victim knew it, he'd have no qualms about killing her, right? Sure, but the letters were in Helen's purse. Oh. Don't you think she'd have known her protection was gone? Phil, I'm going to put out a pickup call on your client. And you get on down here so we can go over this mess one step at a time. Where's here? Still at the gas station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Okay, Barra. How long are you going to be there? Just until Thaddeus Grover shows up to identify the body and give me some answers personally about that scavenger hunt he threw tonight. What about this curly-headed corpse I've got here? Have you gone over him? Yeah, yeah. Nothing but a gun, some small bills on him. Then he'll keep. I'll expect you in a few minutes. Okay. So long, Barra. When I put down the phone, I was convinced that a big switch was due any minute because... Finding those letters in Helen Palmer's purse made a lot of sense in one direction and not a bit in another. I could have made more heads and tails by flipping a ball bearing than I got out of the facts he borrowed given me. Just then, the shadow of a man slid up the walk. I heard a pair of feet mount the stairs two at a time. It was the Wonder Boy executive I had met at the party. Better hold it right there, Sample. What? Marlowe. Why the gun? So the same thing won't happen to me that happened to the dead little guy outside? Another murder? Marlo, where's Rhonda? Is she all right? She left here as fast as an eight-cylinder motor wide open could move just after it happened. And it was Rhonda I saw. 
On my way over here, a speeding car almost crowded me off the road. It looked like Rhonda's, but I wasn't sure. And Marlo, she was being chased by another car, a fast one. Chased, are you sure? Yes. The first car missed me by inches when it swung around a curve. I don't know yet how she made it. Then a second car came along and passed the curve, but it stopped, backed up, and then took the same road Rhonda had taken. You think she got away? I don't know. Hmm. Well, come on outside, Sample. I want you to take a look at this. By the way, how long have you known Rhonda? About a year. Mm Mm-hmm. She's a brilliant girl, Marlo. Came out from the East, and I gave her a job as my secretary. She's more than that now, huh? I'm in love with her, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. Oh. Marlo, I... I know this man. That's Nate Murdoch. He used to be a foreman with our firm. He left and went back to Atlanta right after Claiborne's death. Atlanta? Isn't your host Thaddeus Grover from Atlanta? I... Yes, he is. Oh, brother. When did you see Grover last? Well, the police asked him to go and identify Helen's body. He left the party while the officer was still questioning the rest of us. Yeah, and on the way, he could have taken time off to drop by here, kill Murdoch, and make a try for Rhonda, too. Come on, let's get to the phone. But why, Marlowe? Good heavens, Grover's our friend. He and Helen were engaged to be married. All right, so it doesn't make sense. But his fiance and his short friend from Atlanta are both dead. And Rhonda's burning the tires off a car to keep out of reach. Those are the facts. It'll make sense later. Now, call Grover's place and hurry up. Yes, that's where she intended to go when she left here, to console him, no less. Scavenger hunt my Aunt Minnie. Did it... Hello? Hello, is Mr. Grover there? No. Well, has Miss Langley arrived yet? Oh, it's the maid, Marlo. Mm-hmm. Rhonda had... What's that? She's coming up the walk now? Uh, hold the line a minute, please. She just got there, Marlo. What'll I tell her? Tell her to leave again. Tell her... No. Where do you live? 4406 Ardmore. All right. Tell her I said for her to wait outside in the back of the house until you can get over there to pick her up. Take her to your place and I'll pin Grover down. Right. Where are you going now? See Lieutenant Ibarra and I can get there faster than I can call him on the phone. Good luck, Sample. (laughs) Sample was repeating my name over to Grover's maid on the phone as I left. And a few minutes later at the mobile gas station off Hollywood Boulevard... I found Ibarra looking sardonic in the blinking light from a flying red neon horse above his head as he flipped through a stack of papers on top of an oil drum. It's about time, Arlo. Where's that client of yours? Now, wait a minute, Ibarra. I had her pegged all wrong. She's a pigeon. Has Thaddeus Grover been here yet? Just left. He's quite a character, that guy. You didn't let him get away alone? Yes, he was... What do you mean, get away? Ibarra, there's a, there's a big connection between Thaddeus Grover and Murdoch, the guy who killed Helen. Now, Grover might have hired him for the job, and now he's trying to get Rhonda. Now, Marlo, how does that figure? It doesn't, but so help me, Ibarra, that's the way it is. Well, Grover was heading for his friend Larry Sample's house, and he left. Happened to know where Sample... Holy smoke, that's exactly where I told Sample to take the girl. 4406 Ardmore. Well, that's great, Marlo. They'll all be together in one place. I'll pick up the whole crew in right now. You're going to pick up the pieces, you mean? You think there'll be a showdown? Any minute, Ibarra, it can't miss. Okay, so we'll take some firepower along. Hey, McGall, Great. Yeah, I... Let's go. Yeah. Come on, Phil. Now look, Ibarra, maybe Sample hasn't gotten home with Rhonda yet. I'll go up to Grover's and try to head them off, okay? Okay, Marlo. But if you get them before I do, bring them in. And no alibis. I'll see you. Ibarra was grim as he climbed in his car and drove off fast. I headed for my car, then as I turned, my arm swept the scavenger list Ibarra had left on the oil drum off onto the ground. When I picked them up, Rhonda Langley's name was on top. Her list was as goony as the others, but near the bottom was an item strangely familiar to me, which hadn't been checked off. It was a canceled ticket from Woodhaven Ballroom. All at once, I realized why it was familiar. The sign I'd been half conscious of on top of the big squat building across the street read, Woodhaven Ballroom, closed tonight. On a hunch, I dug for Helen Palmer's list. Yeah, Ibarra was right. Everything but a night watchman's badge and one detective private had been checked off. And that gave me half of the switch I knew I had to show up. I ran to my car and headed for that southern mansion in the Hollywood Hills. In the end of a very complicated frolic. And with every turn of the road, I gave myself another whack for being such a nearsighted sucker. When I got there, the big house on Magnolia Terrace was dark, except for a light in the servants' quarters. I stepped down the block, walked back, and edged around to the patio where the garage, the hothouse, and the king-size barbecue loomed only as shapeless lumps of shadow. I stood still and watched. And I saw him move, walking slowly, gun in hand along the fence toward the hothouse. I started toward him quietly, just as he found out what he was looking for. Oh, you're clever, my dear. But it's all over now. 
I know you're in there, so come on out with your hands up. Oh, no. You're hanging yourself for murder right now, Larry Sample. I've got all the proof I need. I don't know what good it'll do you, Rhonda. I'll never pay you a cent for it, you blackmailing tramp. I'll kill you first. And that protection letter you wrote to your lawyers was returned, darling. I found it accidentally in Helen's purse tonight at the party. So no one will know. Now, come on out, or I'm going in after you. I wouldn't try that if I were you, Sample. Marlowe's due here any minute now. He called me and told me. That was I, dear. You? I used his name when I talked to the maid. Oh, I should have done this myself in the first place instead of trusting that stupid Murdoch. Are you going to come out of there? No, and I've got a gun. You can't see me, and I know it. But your white dress makes a perfect target, you little fool. Drop it, Sample. (laughs) Now let's have that gun. Well, I... I'm glad you got here. No, no, he's not dead. Oh. And he won't be from bullets. Give me your gun, too, huh? Come on. All right. I I was too scared to use it anyway. Thanks. Now sit down and shut up. We're going to wait for Lieutenant Ibarra, then you're both going to the pokey. What? But... Listen, you, I don't go for blackmailers, male or female. Even the cute ones are ugly, lady. Very ugly. Oh, Phil, wait. You've got to understand something. Two years ago, Larry Sample killed his partner, Joshua Claiborne. I knew it, but I couldn't prove it. So I pretended I could and blackmailed him. Don't you see, if he paid off or, or tried to kill me, that would be proof of his guilt. And he did, Marlo. Mm-hmm. Why should you pull a stunt like that? I'm a divorcee, Marlo. Langley is only my married name. Okay, so what? My maiden name was Claiborne. Claiborne? I'm Josh Claiborne's daughter. Oh. And I can prove that. Is that reason enough? Well... Why didn't you level with me instead of labeling Helen a blackmailer? Helen was already dead, and I needed your help desperately. I thought I had to lie to get it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, baby. Anyone care for more coffee? How about you, Lieutenant? Oh, no thanks, Mr. Grover. <clears throat> well, Marlowe, you got it all to come out even anyway. <laughs> Frankly, that's more than I expected, and I left you at that gas station. Yeah, yeah, we were lucky, Burrow. I, um, uh, guess I owe you an apology, Mr. Grover. Oh, shucks, it's all right, son. It was a shock to me to be accused of poor Helen's murder, but, well, it's over now. Yeah. Uh, you said it was the scavenger list that set you straight. How'd you figure that, boy? Well, there was a Woodhaven ballroom ticket on Rhonda's list, so she had to go there for the ticket, you see. Uh-huh. A sample knew that. And he told his killer, Murdoch, coincidentally, he hired the murder Claiborne two years ago, that the girl who went to the Woodhaven ballroom was his target. Uh-huh. But Helen happened to go there after the night watchman's badge. Which he could have picked up any place in town. Yeah. What a terrible coincidence for Helen. That that was all that saved my life, really. That's right, honey. Murdoch made the mistake, and when he and Sample discovered it, they made another try at Rhonda's house. But I caught Murdoch there, so Sample shot him before he could talk. And when I left, he followed me in his car. I knew they were after me, and I thought for sure they'd killed you, Phil. That's why I ran. Yeah. That threw me for a loop. Then Sample came back to make sure that Murdoch was dead and sold me a great big bill of goods at the same time. Ah, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes, Mr. Grover, it is. Uh, Lieutenant, I want to thank you personally for your participation. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I've got everything I need, so I'll say good night. Yeah, me too. Hey, I... Phil? <clears throat> yes? Yeah. Shall I mail you a check? Why, yes, I, I think... Uh... No, 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 wait a minute. Yes? Yeah. You know, honey, with uh, with your knowledge of postal rates, uh, why don't you uh, just deliver it in person, maybe? Huh? Love to. Count on it, Mr. Marlowe. Good night. I drove down from the Hollywood Hills with a check warming my wallet and the echo of a soft invitation warming my imagination. You know, that was quite a party at Grover's house. (laughs) Scavenger hunt. People determined to have a good time even if it killed them. You know what? It did. I know another game. Associations. It goes like this. Grover's party. Rhonda Langley. Rhonda... Hmm date. Hmm. I wonder if she likes baseball. Listen. 
listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a specially important news for you. This week's issues of the Saturday Evening Post, Life, Look, Collier's, and the Farm Journal carry a two-page advertisement on Rexall's famous one-cent sale that starts October 19th. You'll find 150 guaranteed Rexall products, every one of them offered at two for the price of one plus a penny. And that's not all. There are 53 other specials too good to miss. So be sure to check this ad on Rexall's big one-cent sale, and when you see it, remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm Roger Renard, uh, real estate. Well, uh, have a seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's get right to the point. Oh, so it's me, $100 a day plus expenses. Oh, yes, your uh, fee. Well, it's not much, but it's all mine, and I love it. Uh, <clears throat> What's that racket? Nothing. Excuse me. M- Mr. Diamond, I'm, I'm being blackmailed. Well, it happens in the best of families, especially in the best of families. Mr. Diamond, I'm engaged to marry a very wealthy widow... What's that clicking? Have you got a wild lifesaver in your mouth? I have false teeth, Mr. Diamond. Is that so amusing? When they start making bird calls? Yes. They're new. Just got them yesterday. Hmm. Awful nuisance. Oh. Well, you were engaged to some wealthy widow last I heard. I don't appreciate your humor, Mr. Diamond. I happen to be very much in love with my fiancé. Sorry? It so happens that I dabbled in a rather, uh, shall we say, off-color business in my younger days. Shall we say what we, you mean? Mm, perhaps it would be better, yes. Twenty-five years ago, Mr. Diamond, I became rather discouraged working for a living, especially when I saw less gifted men enjoying the real fruits of life, having some education and a bit of charm. Excuse me again. You know, if you learned the Morse code on those things, it would be the life of the party. Briefly, I courted wealthy women, predominantly widows who sought romance, flattery, etc. Mm-hmm. I married several times without bothering to obtain divorces in between. Oh, well, wait until the Reno Chamber of Commerce hears about you. In due time, the police caught up with me. My accumulated crimes cost me eight years in jail. But when I was released, I decided to turn my talents toward more legal pursuits. Glory be, you're saved. Saved, indeed. <clears throat> Can you imagine what my fiancé would think if she learned of my past? She'd surely suspect my motives. And the irony is that I do love her deeply. Oh, I see. Well, who's the killjoy that shares your little secret? Now, oh, that's the puzzle. Nobody in New York knows of my past. I haven't told a soul. But I received this letter in the morning mail. Here. See how smart you are. He gave me a square white envelope, the dozen for a quarter variety, and I slipped the letter out of it. It was typewritten and point by point looked like a pocket biography of a one-time Casanova. It ended up by ordering Renard to have a $100 bill ready that night when someone called Andy would be at his home to pick it up. I relaxed a little. The case began to look like the standard kind of blackmail as found in the detective's manual. I know you think $100 isn't much. Well, that all depends how often you have to pay it. I don't suppose you know who Andy is. I do not. Oh, well, that makes the next step pretty obvious, Renard. What's your address? Here's my card. I'll expect you at nine. Leave a candle in the window. <laughs> Uh-oh. Nailed down everything, Lieutenant. It's the Shamus. Why, Sergeant Otis, don't tell me it's you. You've brightened my whole day. I don't know why, but that's too bad. Well, the boys in the pool room told me you were drafted. I cashed in all my war bonds. Now I can buy them back. <laughs> uh, Otis, stop trying to figure that one out. What's doing, Rick? Oh, nothing much, Walt. 
How'd you like to come along with me tonight, help me wrap up a screwy blackmail deal? Might learn something. It's a new angle. What's new about blackmail? Well, the whodunit part in this case. My client doesn't know who's blackmailing him, but some character named Andy is supposed to pick up the cabbage tonight. Want to come along or not? I'd like to, Mr. Diamond, if the invitation is still open. Well, that's very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. It's open to you for a nominal fee. Well, I'm prepared to pay. Oh, hey, cut it out, Rick. Can I go too, Lieutenant? Sorry, Otis. This is strictly stag. Oh, I didn't know. Excuse me. One moment. Oh, uh, come in, Mr. Diamond. I... Who is this other gentleman? Roger Renard. Meet Lieutenant Walt Levinson. The police. Mr. Diamond, I expressed they told Take it that... easy, take it easy, Mr. Renard. I'm here unofficially. What time is it, Walt? Nearly nine. Hmm. Quiet. I just heard something. Oh, relax, Walt, relax. Mr. Renard is suffering from a set of mechanized molars. Oh. <laughs> Store teeth, huh? Yes, it has become unbearably embarrassing. Oh, would you gentlemen care for a drink while we're waiting? I'll take a double of anything. Oh, I don't think I'll Oh, have go that. ahead, Walt. Get an unofficial snootful. Hey, oh, hmm. sit tight, Renard. I'll get it. I'll cover you, Rick, just in case. A package for Mr. Raynard. Come right in, Andy. What do you mean, Andy? My name's Sheldon. Are you Raynard? I'm Renard. Oh, sign here. I'll sign it, uh, Renard. It uh, looks like straight goods. We're getting anxious. All right, then. Here. Uh, here's your package. Keep this side up. Okay, Sheldon. Sorry for the trouble. Here. Catch. Hey, thanks. Thanks a million. Uh, false alarm. Hey, that's a screwy-looking package. Look at those holes all over the top. Can't imagine who would be sending me anything. Why don't you open it as long as we're killing time? Yeah, good. Well, heavy cardboard. Uh, there. Rick, what? look. It, it's alive. It's a pigeon. Oh. All right, you. Talk. What are you yelling at that bird for? Well, I thought he might be a stool pigeon. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Gentlemen, look at this nameplate on the bird's leg. Here, underneath the capsule. Says Andy. That must be the bird's name. Let me see that box it came in. Uh, yeah, there's a note. Listen to this. Mr. Renard, by now you have met Andy, my pigeon. You will please roll the $100 bill very tightly and place it in the capsule attached to Andy's leg. Then simply release him outdoors. Please check your watch, Mr. Renard. If Andy isn't safely home by 9.30, your secret will be turned over to the papers in the morning. You will hear from me again next week. Hmm, no signature. How do you like that? You get it, Rick? Andy's a homing pigeon. Oh, don't explain it, Walt. Just pick out a nice hard wall for me to knock my conceited head against. Mr. Diamond, it's almost 9.15. What shall I do? Well, here's my overpaid opinion, Renard. If you don't pay off, you know what'll happen. If you do pay off... We'll just keep working on the case and hope for the best. Rick, do you think we oh, could... Oh, Walt, pro- Walt, Walt, don't say it. The chances of following a pigeon between New York skyscrapers, especially at night, is strictly for radar. Something we don't happen to have handy. Well, what's it going to be, Renard? Uh, I'll pay the money, of course. There's no other way. But this will leave me dry week in, week out. Uh, looks that way. Well, that will be the end, then. I can't raise that much cash each week. Well, here's the money, Mr. Diamond. Will you gentlemen take care of the details? There wasn't any use hanging around. Walt drove me home, and I spent the rest of the night dreaming about flying blackmailers. Sure, we could check the delivery outfit that brought the package, but I'd give odds the turn address was phony. Come morning, I washed the sour taste out of my mouth with some coffee and went to my office. While I was draping some black crepe around my license, business picked up. A nervous young man walked in, introduced himself as John Miller, hemmed and hawed for a minute, and then blurted out with, Mr. Diamond, I need your help right away. I'm being blackmailed. Just because I sat there with my mouth open, he thought I was interested and told me more. He was married, and several years ago, another girl had come along. Nothing serious. The romance had died in a few weeks, but his wife might not understand, so on, so on. Uh, Mr. Diamond, why are you staring at me that way? Who is blackmailing you? What's the strangest part? I don't know. Oh, don't sit there and lie to me. You've got to know. Blackmail means that somebody has got... Oh, no, never mind. Well, there's one thing, though. Tonight at 9 o'clock, someone named Andy will be... Andy? Oh, no. No, no, no! (laughs) 
before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's a lady with a question for our Rexall family druggist. I want to know more about the ad on Rexall's one-cent sale. Well, ma'am, the ad appears in this week's Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and the Farm Journal. Two big pages crammed with 150 guaranteed Rexall products. Every one of them offered to you during Rexall's famous one-cent sale at two for the price of one, plus a penny. Golly, what an opportunity to save. And that's not all. The ad also lists 53 other specials that can help you cut your cost of living to a minimum. Now, in front of every item, there's a little square so you can check what you need in advance. Why well, I can use the ad as a shopping list. That's exactly what we intend it to be. It's your big chance to stock up for months in advance. Because on October 19th, the starting date of Rexall's one-cent sale, you double your buying power simply by adding a penny. Where did you say the ad appears? In this week's Collier's, Look, Life, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal. Look for it. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. So it had come to me as it must to all private detectives. A strange little voice inside my head began nagging. Get out of this business while you still have all your marbles. Get into something sensible like taming Python. It wasn't enough to have one client being blackmailed by someone he didn't know. A second guy has to walk in with the same routine. And the payoff was that a certain miserable homing pigeon called Andy had a feather in the pie. A foul, foul, that Andy. After a while, my second client, Miller, began to fidget in his seat. Probably because I began sharpening my letter opener. Uh, Mr. Diamond, do you feel all right? Oh, yes, I I feel great, simply great. Just keep me away from open windows. I beg your pardon? Oh, forget it, forget it. Now, let's see now. You're being blackmailed, but you don't know by whom. And a certain Andy will be at your office by 9 o'clock tonight to pick up the money. Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, well, now, Miller, I'll I'll be kind. I won't tell you who Andy is right now. First of all, you tell me, uh, do you know Roger Renard? Roger Renard? Mm-hmm. Mm, no, I, I, I don't believe so. Now, think hard, Miller. Small guy, bright blue eyes, cultured voice. No, I don't know anyone like that. Who is he? Well, he happens to be in the same hole you are. Andy paid him a visit last night. Really? Yeah. This is bargain basement day in blackmail. Well, what do you know? Let me think. Renard, Renard. Now, look, look. I got a better idea. You just sit tight and leaf through my collection of unpaid bills. It'll keep your mind off your own worries. Well, there's got to be an answer to this. Hello? Uh, Renard, this is Diamond. Can you get to my office in 15 minutes? Of course. Has anything happened? Uh, don't ask. But, uh... Just it... hurry. There'll be a diagram for you when you get here. When Roger Renard arrived, I introduced him and revealed my last hope. Somewhere, there had to be a familiar connection between Miller and Renard. A familiar place, a mutual friend. Well, they finally caught on and began playing the game known as... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Now, let's see, Miller. Uh, were you in Kansas in the winter of 1942? I had a dear lady friend there at the time, name of Sophie Holloway. Never been in Kansas. I spent uh, two years in Seattle, though, 1938-39. No, never had the pleasure of being in Seattle. Um, pardon me. Bad job done on my new team. Oh. <clears throat> now, about New York. Ever frequent... And so it went on and on. If these guys had been stranded on a desert island 20 feet square, they probably never would have bumped into each other. But the fact remained. Somebody knew about the pass of both and was using the same technique to blackmail them. An hour and three aspirants later, my head began to feel like a ping-pong ball being smacked from Miller to Renard, from Renard to Miller, from Miller... I've done my best to stay away from physical exertion, and I must say that I've been rather successful at it. The the devil take these artificial bicuspids. I go to all the expense of having New York's best oral surgeon work on my mouth, and then some incompetent dentist can't turn out a proper fitting dentist. Uh, Well, we're not getting any place, and I have an appointment in a few minutes. You learn anything new, Mr. Diamond? You'll be sure to call me, won't you? If something doesn't happen soon, I... Well, I just don't know. No, don't worry, Roger. We'll catch the culprit or my name isn't... Uh... Oh, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway. 
Well, goodbye, Mr. Dunn. Goodbye. Goodbye, uh, goodbye Renard. Whew. That guy was driving me crazy with that clack-clack of his teeth. You think an oral surgeon with Cutler's reputation would recommend a competent dentist to his patients? I thought he was great. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, look, Miller, isn't there anything else I can do for you? Find out who stole your yo-yo in 1922 or maybe get look, you... Look, just find out who's blackmailing me, Diamond. I haven't slept in days. I know, I know. And somehow I feel that soon you won't be alone. If you could only find out where that pigeon is. Hello, pigeon. Well, Rick, what are you doing here in the middle of the afternoon? Oh, I'm looking for a place to hide, Helen, dear. Can I borrow your closet? Hide from what? Pigeons, false teeth. A pigeon with false teeth? No, 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 dear. A client with false teeth. The pigeon's blackmailing him. Oh, a stool pigeon. No, I tried that. This pigeon flies. He has a plane? Honey, honey, this is a real pigeon with wings yet. You know, like this. Oh, just lie down on the couch and take it easy. You must be working too hard. I don't want to lie down. You want to fly. No, no. Well, make up your mind. Well, I'm trying to tell you why I came over. Two guys who never saw each other are being blackmailed. By a pigeon. Yes. The same pigeon. Yes. And it flies. Yes, and it goes coo, 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 brr, coo, coo. Uh, are you sure you wouldn't like to lie down? No, I just want some peace and quiet so I can figure this thing out. Rick, darling... At least try and take it easy. No, no, come on. Nothing's that bad. A smile for Helen. Smile? <laughs> oh, come on. Let's see your pearly teeth. Hmm? I said, let's see your pearly teeth. Helen, Helen, that's it. That's wonderful. Now, how about a nice cool drink? No, no, listen. Renard said he went to New York's best oral surgeon. Later, Miller said an oral surgeon with Dr. Cutler's reputation should have recommended a competent dentist. And he was probably right. Now, why don't you just try... How did Miller know Renard was talking about Dr. Cutler? Ouija board? Because Miller must have been treated by Dr. Cutler, too, and knows he's the best oral surgeon in New York. Helen, I've got to make a phone call. I grabbed the phone book, looked up the office of Dr. Cutler, oral surgeon, then called Walt. Twenty minutes later, I met the good lieutenant on the tenth floor of an office building on Madison Avenue. Walt assigned Otis to guard duty outside of Dr. Cutler's office. His orders were to trip any guy in a white smock that seemed in a hurry to take the day off. Walt and I agreed to underplay our police affiliations just in case we were wrong. Then we went in. We slowed up when a white mountain of a woman stood up from her desk and announced she was Miss Barrows, Dr. Cutler's nurse. Could have fooled me. From the size of her, Notre Dame could have used her last week. What seems to be the trouble, gentlemen? Well, it's, uh, it's somewhat important, Miss Barrow. We'd like to, uh, see Dr. Cutler as soon as possible. My name's Diamond. I see. In just a moment. Yes, Miss Barrow? Doctor, there's a Mr. Diamond and his friend here to see you. They say it's urgent. Thank you. I'll be right out. Won't you sit down? Uh, no, 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 thanks. We'll, we'll stand. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, hello, Doctor. How do you do? What seems to be the trouble? May uh, may we go into your office, Doctor? Oh, yes, of course. Go right in. Uh, Miss Barrow, are those x-rays ready in that impacted molar? I'll have a look, Doctor. Mm, thank you. Now, gentlemen. The doctor was an old, red-faced gentleman with puzzled blue eyes. As tactfully as I could, I told him about Renard and Miller and the fact that they were in trouble. He remembered them. Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. I removed Mr. Renard's teeth last month. As for Mr. Miller, he was in just last week. Uh, the rest of it is pretty blunt, Dr. Cutler. Both of these men are being blackmailed by the same party. And it just so happens, Doctor, that you are the only acquaintance they have in common. What? Now, look here, now, young... Don't get excited, Doc. Rick isn't accusing you. We just have to check these things. I realize that. I think my position and past record in dental surgery are proof enough... If you care to see a statement of income from my practice, plus stock dividends, you'll see how foolish... Yeah, yeah, Doc, you're right. Rick, it just doesn't figure, not for a lousy couple of hundred bucks. No, I know, Walt. It sure looks that way. But if this isn't the end of the line, we'll be on this sleigh ride forever. Dr. Cutler, is there, a, is there anyone else in your office who gets to know the patients well? Just myself and Miss Barrow. She's the nurse's heart side. I could call her in No, and... no, no, in a minute, Doctor. Does she uh, just answer the door and take temperatures or, or what? Oh, no, of course not. 
Miss Barrow is a registered nurse and a trained anesthetist. You mean she gives your patients Novocaine? Is that it, Doc? Novocaine, yes, in some cases. For specific cases, we must use a more general anesthetic like sodium pentothal or gas. Or sometimes... Doctor, doctor, isn't sodium pentothal sometimes called the truth serum? Yes, in narcosynthesis. It's sometimes used in psychiatric treatment. Some patients will answer any question truthfully under the influence of sodium pentothal. See, it weakens the conscious will and... The x-rays are ready, Doctor. Uh, it's Miss Barrow now. I'll call her. No, no, no. Don't do it, Doctor. Stall her. Just ask... Ask her to uh, wait outside. I don't understand, but... Anyway. One moment, Miss Barrow. What are you going to do, Rick? Uh, doctor, I want you to pretend that I'm an emergency case. Must be treated at once. Can you? Oh, of course, but... Now, can you have your nurse give me something harmless instead of pentothal? Well, yes. Distilled water could be substituted. Well, we're in business. Walt, you make like the old friend who came along for laughs. Uh-huh. Now, Doctor, call Miss Barrow in and turn her loose on me. Just relax in the chair, Mr. Diamond. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, I hope not. My, my, my whole mouth feels like it's burning. Now I'll mm. have to strap your hand down for the pentothal injection. Mm. This won't take long, will it? You won't feel a thing. Now, there's the tourniquet. Now we're ready. Now well, let's, let's get it over with. Very soon, Mr. Diamond. Very soon. Mm. 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 You're getting drowsy now. Very tired, aren't you? Um, I... You can talk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I... Patients talk. often talk away their troubles while I take care of them. Oh, yes, talk. Uh, talk away troubles. It's up to you, of course. But if you want to get anything off your conscience, why, just go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Everybody has something that's bothering them. Something they're ashamed of. Ashamed? Oh. You can tell me. Ashamed of? Oh, ashamed. Yes. Go on. I... I used to steal money from a friend of mine. He was a wonderful guy. Big, fat, but... But dumb from the word go. I... I'd steal him blind. His, his watch, his, his cash. He, he never knew what was happening. That was terrible of you, wasn't it? What's his name? Levinson. Walt Levinson. Oh, but then I... Yes, I'm listening. Well, then... Then he... He became a policeman, a, a lieutenant. One night he caught me stealing. I... I had to kill him. He was going to arrest me. And you escaped? Yes, escaped. But his ghost haunts me, haunts me. In fact, Lieutenant Walt Levinson is sitting in the next room, badge and all. Okay, Miss Barrow, we've all heard enough. Andy's going to miss you. Come on, Walt. What? Why, are you... All right, lady, hold it. Watch out, Walt. Walt ducked just in time to miss being scalded by the boiling pan of surgical instruments. But it gave her enough time to run out of the office. I had just freed myself when I heard a scream from the hall. Walt and I rushed out there and found Otis helping Miss Barrow to her feet. Gee, miss, I'm sorry I tripped you, but... But you was wearing a white smock, and I got mixed up. I'm sorry. Honest, I am. Shut up, Otis. What? what? O- Otis, Otis, I don't know what to say. You you doing this? I... Otis, you... Oh, Otis, you are without a doubt. Feel better? Mm hmm. All calmed down. Oh, sure. No more problems? Mm, not a single one. Uh, how's the pigeon? Oh, we found him over at a nurse's house. He was staying with the nurse? In the garage, yes. Had a friend there, too. The nurse worked for Dr. Cutler, an oral surgeon. Well, I thought you said your client was the one with the false teeth. Oh, well, that's right. Then what was the matter with the pigeon? Nothing. He was just a little tired from making all those trips with that money tied to his leg. Uh, why don't you sing something? Mm. Mm, all right. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. 
you should care for me. Soft nights, paradise, what I love to see. You've made my life so glamorous. You can't blame me for feeling amorous. Oh, wonderful, marvelous that you should care for. Honey, how was that? Hmm? Oh, oh, fine. Fine. I don't even think you were listening. Rick, uh, about the pigeon and what you said about money tied to his leg and... Ah, uh, come here. Now, wait a minute. Uh, I'm confused. Come you, here. You said that you had a client who... Do... He had false teeth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a pigeon with money... Mm-hmm. Oh. Still confused? Uh-huh. Confuse me some more. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. You listeners will have at least one of these magazines in your home this week. Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, or the Farm Journal... Pick it up and turn the pages till you come to the two-page ad on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Take a long look at this opportunity to buy twice as much for just a penny more because this ad lists 150 guaranteed Rexall products, all offered at two for the price of one plus a penny. In addition, there are 53 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. So check this ad on Rexall's Big One Cent Sale. And remember, starting October 19th and continuing through October 23rd, you can buy twice as much for just a penny more. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Joe Morheim and Hal Bloom and edited by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Wirth. Dick Powell's soon-to-be-released picture is the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted Osborne, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, Bob Sweeney, D.J. Thompson, and Virginia Gregg. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Check the double-page ad in this week's Life, Look, Collier, Saturday Evening Post, and Farm Journal on Rexall's one-cent sale that starts October 19th. Mark the date on your calendar. It's your chance to buy two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus the penny. Hear a thrilling police drama on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, uh, 
things were a little slow at the office, which is my way of saying I didn't have a client or a dime. And I was indulging in my favorite form of athletics. A fast game of snooker pool with Herb Heidi, the bookie at the deluxe pool hall. Heidi was born with a pool cue in one hand and a cue ball in the other, and I was born with an eight-ball birthmark. He was trimming me like a Christmas tree, and I was glad when the elevator boy from my building yelled into the door that I had a customer in my office. So I shoved off to talk to this volunteer victim. When I opened the door to my office, I saw him standing there, a dignified-looking white-haired gent, with a strong nose, a weak mouth, and the, the nice middle-class air of substantial citizenry. You're Mr. Rogue? That's Ryan. Do you want to talk business with me, Mr. Uh... Uh, Grant? George Grant, yes. Oh, have a chair, Mr. Grant. No, thank you. I prefer to stand. Mr. Rogue, I understand that you have connections with the fire insurance companies, that you are sometimes retained by them to investigate losses which might have been caused by arson. That's right. Go on. Are you interested in the fire at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse a week ago? I could be. That, uh, that fire was arson, Mr. Rogue. Mm-hmm. I can tell you some very interesting facts about it. Well, uh, good, good. That was a pretty important claim, wasn't it? The fire destroyed over $100,000 worth of furs. Huh? Well, start talking, Grant. I, uh, I'd like to have $1,000 before I talk with you, Mr. Rogue. Well, I don't usually pay out that kind of money until I know what I'm buying. I'm not saying a word, sir, until I get $1,000. I've been double-crossed once on this deal, and I don't intend to take a chance on getting the same treatment from you. Just how much did you have to do with this torching, Grant? I don't intend to answer that question. Do I get my thousand dollars, Mr. Rogue? Well, uh, come back in an hour. You have the money for me then? Yeah, yeah, come back in an hour. And your story had better be good, Grant. I'm a busy man. I haven't time to fool around with crackpots. I'll have the proof. Okay. So long now. Oh, it's four o'clock, Grant. I'll see you at five. On the dot, right? I'll be here. Hello. Oh, uh, hello, Flynn. Say, uh, your outfit had the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire covered, didn't they? Who is this? This is Richard Rogue. Yes, yes, we had it. $160,000 claim. Well, fine. Uh, say, uh, would you pay me 10% of what I saved you on that claim if I could prove the fire was arson? $16,000? <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Save $16,000 and lose one hundred and sixty. I can afford it if you can. Wait a minute. How can you prove arson? Well, I've got a man. He wants to talk. He says he can prove arson. I believe him. I'll give you 10000 for a conviction. I'll take it. Look, send the $1,000 retainer over here, special messenger, right away. It's important. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Hello, Flynn. Yes, where have you been, Rogue? Well, my source of information has just been eliminated. But the deal's on. What do you mean? Well, he must have known too much. He's been murdered. Well, as I was saying, I, uh, I was as broke as a New Year's resolution when I ran across proof that the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire was arson. I called Louis Flynn, who headed up the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company, and made a deal with him for ten grand if I could prove that the fire was of incendiary origin. And while I was talking with him, George Grant, my witness, was killed leaving the building. Well, I couldn't afford to lose a $10,000 fee right then, so I took a fast distance to the home of the late George Grant. I knocked at the door. What do you want? I want to talk with you. You're George Grant's daughter? Yes. You're the police? Uh, yes. Come in. Thank you. I suppose you want to question me about my father's affairs. Yes, that's right. 
Come in here, please. I can't believe that Dad is dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Believe me. And if you'll help me, I'm sure we can find the people who murdered him. Sit down, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, Miss Grant, uh, what was your father's business? Oh, don't you know? He was warehouse manager for the Matthews Fur Company. He had been for years. Oh? Did he have any enemies that you know of? No. Dad wasn't the kind of a man who made enemies. He was... Well, he was sweet. Oh, I don't know. There'd been something wrong with him for the last couple of weeks. He wasn't himself. He was worried. And it was all that blonde's fault. Blonde? Yes, Bernice Maxwell. Dad became involved with her. And he was spending too much money on her. Much too much money. Oh, uh... How long ago did he meet this, uh... uh, Miss Maxwell? Oh, about a month ago, I guess. She deliberately chased him. She must have had some reason for it. Dad was no great catch. He... He was just a little guy working for a salary, trying to get along. Oh, you say he's been acting strangely. In what way? Could you break that down a little bit for me? I'll try. You see, for a while he was talking about how he was going to have a lot of money. All of a sudden, he was happy and carefree then. He was gone from home quite a bit. One night he had a meeting here with some rough-looking men. He wouldn't tell me who they were. Yes, go on. Then after the warehouse fire... He was depressed. And he... He talked about... He talked about killing himself. I knew he was in some awful trouble, but... He wouldn't talk with me about it. He just kept calling Bernice Maxwell. She wouldn't answer the phone, even. Uh Oh, uh... Did your father talk with you much about the fire? No. Mm. But I'm sure that that fire had something to do with his... Murder. I know it did. That Maxwell woman has something to do with it, too. Who do you suppose that is? I think I know. Oh, please don't go away. I don't want to talk to anybody else. If you stay here, maybe they'll, maybe they'll leave. Is this the residence of George Grant? Yes. Who are you? Lieutenant Urban, Homicide Squad. Oh. Won't you come in? Uh, hello, Urban. Broke. What are you doing here? Isn't he a policeman? No. What are you doing here, Rogue? I'm working on a case. Do you know anything about a murder that took place outside your office an hour ago? A little? I see. What are you doing out here? Well, I'm working for a client. I've got a license to do that. You want to see it? If he isn't a policeman, who is he? He's a private investigator, which is a Harvard version of a gumshoe. His name is Rogue. Richard Rogue. It is? Well, he told me he was a policeman. I, I, I wouldn't have let him in. Well, that's not very gracious of you, Miss Grant. Shut up. Miss Grant, did you give this man any information which you should have withheld for the police? Well, I don't know. He he kept asking me questions about... about my father. I answered them. What do you know about a murder? That murder, Rogue? Who did it? I don't know. How did you get out here so fast? How did you know who the murdered man was? I don't have to answer that. Well, he'd been up to your office to see you, hadn't he? Had he? Miss Grant, do you know whether or not your father planned on seeing a private investigator today? Well, I don't know. He he didn't tell me if he did. I'm getting a little fed up with your ethics, Rogue. Aren't you getting a little out of line, Urban? You're withholding information. Can you prove it? This man was shot on his way out of your office. What was he talking to you about? Answer me. Did you see him talking to me? Oh, now let's not get technical. No, let's do. Let's do. You're going to take me down to the station and sweat me? Not if you'll be reasonable. I'm not going to be reasonable. So either pull out your cuffs or shut up. Oh, please. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Miss Grant. Believe me, I, I really want to help you. I'm going to take care of the people who are responsible for this murder. Even the cops can't keep me from doing that. Now, wait a minute, Rogue. I'm walking out of here, Urban. I'll see you later. When I deliver the killers to you so you can take a bow for the newspapers. <laughs> Oh, I was burned like a bride's biscuits and feeling just as tough when I walked out of that house and passed Urban's squad car to my coupe. It didn't do my atomic temper any good when a pasty-faced gunman got out of the front seat of my car and pointed a pistol at me. Hello, Rogue. Get in. We're going places. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay, Junior. But be careful of that thing. It might go off. 
Where to, Junior? Straight down the street. I'll tell you when to turn. You, uh, you had a visitor at your office this morning. How much talking did he do? Oh, you mean George Grant? You know who I mean. Well, he doesn't talk much. Why? Who wants to know? The boss. Hey, hey, look out where you're going, Rogue. Well, I'm not worried. I've got the wheel. Let's get this thing out of low, shall we? What are you trying to do, Rogue? Kill yourself? No, it makes me feel safer going this fast. Because you pull the trigger on that heater and you're just as dead as I am. Slow down, Rogue. Hey, hey, that guy almost crashed us. What's the matter, bully boy? You yellow? I've got a tank full of gas and this car will make over a hundred. You're going to kill us both. That's possible. As a matter of fact, it's probable. But you were going to take me for a ride anyway, weren't you? I got nothing to lose. Give me that gun. Hey, keep your hands on the wheel, Rogue. Hey, hey. Cut it off. Give me that gun, punk. Come on. Get your hands on the wheel, Rogue. You're going to crash. Give me that gun or I'll rip right into that wall ahead of us. You know me, kid. I mean it. Now, give me that gun. Would you let me go? No. Give it here. I'll... Oh. Come on. Come on. Hey. Hey. Well, I'll be. He's passed out. Hey. Hey. In the struggle for the gun, I twisted this torpedo's hand around and, well, he pulled the trigger himself with me a contributing factor. He shot himself through the chest, but it didn't look fatal to me. So I drove him to a hospital and left him there. Told them to call Urban. I used the hospital phone to check up on Bernice Maxwell and found that she was a sort of a notorious babe, ran an escort service, which was legitimate enough, but she's had a few sidelines, such as uh, blackmail. I got her home address out of the book and went out there. She lived in a nice enough house out on the east side of town. I rang the doorbell. Yes? Hello, Miss Maxwell. I'd like to talk with you for a moment, please. Who are you? Uh, Let's talk about that inside, shall we? What do you mean, forcing your way in here? I mean business, Blondie. And that's what we're going to talk Now, let's go in the other room and have a chat. You just lead the way. After all, you are the hostess. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to call the police. Don't bother, baby. I'm the police. And I want to talk to you about a fire and a murder. So just get moving. Come on. A murder? Yes, yes, a murder. Doesn't the fire surprise you, too? Sit down. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you, anyway? That's beside the point. I want to know what you had to do with the murder of George Grant. You can talk now or later. I've got nothing but time. George Grant? He's dead? Yes, very. He was murdered about five minutes after four downtown on Grand Avenue. And I think you know who did it. I don't. I don't know anything about it. You never heard of him, huh? I knew him slightly. Oh, now, please, Miss Maxwell. You knew him better than slightly. You've been running around with him or giving him the runaround for the last month. You deliberately set a trap for him, didn't you? You mixed him up in that arson job on the Matthews Fur Company's warehouse. I don't know anything about arson. You can't come in here and threaten me. Oh, look, lady, I'm not going to be polite about this. George Grant has been murdered. You had a hand in that murder, and I'm going to get the information out of you if I have to beat it out of you. And if you think I'm bluffing, just keep on dumbing up. Now, who was mixed up on that arson job that Grant was killed for knowing too much about? Look, I'm going to count three. Then I'm going to come over there and slap the information out of you. Look... Look, if I tell you what you want to know, will you fix it with the district attorney to let me turn state's evidence? It depends on how good your information is. You have nothing on me. Now, don't start that again. You almost had your mind made up to be smart. Don't double-cross yourself. Now, come on. Talk. I have everything you need right here in this desk. Wow. Now you're talking. Now, wise guy, get your hands up. Huh? Oh, no kidding. Now, look, Maxwell. This is nothing you can shoot your way out of, especially with a toy gun like that. Sit down. No. If I'm going to be shot, I want to be standing up when I get it. This is a silly piece of grandstanding, Blondie. I'm going to take that gun away from you before you nerve yourself into pulling the trigger. Don't. Don't come another step. I'm telling you, if you do, I'll shoot. Now, you don't think one bullet from that little twenty-five is going to stop me, do you? It won't, Maxwell. I'll just keep right on coming, and I'll take it away from you. 
And I'll put you in the pen for the rest of your life for attempted murder. I'll be there anyway. If I don't get rid of you, I'll... Don't I'd... be a sucker now. Think of those 13 steps to the death house. I'm coming after that gun, Maxwell. You take one more step and... Well, I hated to slap that gun out of your hand, Blondie, but you didn't want to shoot me anyway, did you? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Now talk. Who was behind that arson deal? Who was the touch-off man? Who was the brain? I can't tell you. I can't. If I don't, they'll kill me. Come on, come on. I haven't much sympathy for dames like you. You killed George Grant just as much as if you pulled the trigger on him. Now talk, baby. Talk, do you hear? Hey. Hey. Hey, Blondie, come out of it. Come on. Well, well, I'm a son of a gun. She passed out on me. Hey, Maxwell, come out of it now, will you? Come on. All right, Rogue. Just stay right where you are. Huh? What did you do to Benitez? Well, nothing. I... Did she talk? No, no, she didn't. That's good. How did you get here, Og? Well, I, I trolled. I, oh, I, uh, I got rid of that little pasty puss gunman you sent after me. Where is he? He's been taken care of. That's funny. That's exactly what's going to happen to you, Richard. Stand still while I get this gun out of that shoulder holster. Okay, okay, you're in the driver's seat. You just couldn't ever learn to stay out of trouble, could you? Trouble's my business, Bob. Get up and keep your hands in the air. Oh, sure, sure. Well, if you're going to let me have it, this is as good a time as any, isn't it? Time's all right. But I don't like the place, that's all. I'm going to take you out in the country. Well, that's nice to think about. I love the country. You know I'm going to have to kill you, don't you? You know too much. Sure, sure. You couldn't stand a police investigation, could you, Bob? No. You know, you uh, you should have covered me yourself when I left the Grant house. <laughs> you should never send a boy to do a man's work. No. Now, you're yellow too, aren't you? You haven't got the guts to pull a trigger yourself. You've got a lot of nerve talking that way when you're looking down the barrel of this gun, Richard. Yeah, you're a two-for-a-nickel penny at a ten horn, Frenchie. And I'm going to take that gun away from you and make you eat it. Yes, well, I have plans for you, Richard. I'm going to bend this gun over your head first, and then I'm going to get rid of you. For good. You haven't got the guts. No. Turn around, Rogue. <laughs> well, I... I wasn't as bad as I sounded there, believe me. I'm... I'm no hero, and, and usually when a guy has the drop on me, I... I obey orders like a corporal bucking for sergeant. But I didn't have much to lose, and... And for once, I wanted to be hit over the head. Oh, I got my wish and rolled with a blow. Those old familiar stars started to circulate around my indestructible cranium, and, and I started to black out. But I pulled myself back and hung on to consciousness. I didn't move after I fell. I, I didn't have to. You see, I, I fell with my left shoulder in the shadows, covering the automatic I'd slapped out of Bernice Maxwell's hand a little earlier. And when I heard this character walk away from me, I, I got my right hand on the gun. He went over to where Bernice was, just coming around to this world again. I could hear him talking to her. Bernice! Bernice! Get away from me! Oh, it's you, Marcel. Where's he? Hog, he's on ice over there in the corner. You kill him? No, but I'm going to. I didn't want to do it here in your house. Drop that gun, Marcel. I'm taking over from here. What? Drop it! Marcel is over there by the piano! I was a little worried about my future as I stood there behind the cover of that piano and pumped lead at Marcel. But if I could get in a lucky shot, I, I knew I could put him away for the murder of George Grant and the arson job at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse. I'd hit him a couple of times, and his girl, Bernice Maxwell, was screaming at me to stop. But Marcel kept on trying to luck a shot into my anatomy. I still got plenty of blood here to stop you if you do. Oh, what are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you both over to the cops, baby. Uh, well, uh, this guy will live to hang. 
Now, here. Here, tie him up. Use his necktie. Come on. He needs a doctor. Well, I'll call one as soon as he's secured. Come on, tie him tight now. He's bleeding to death. Shut up. Here now. Take my tie. Here, tie his feet tight. You're really tough, aren't you, Ralph? Yeah, well, I'm mad, yeah. No. Oh, oh, yeah. Here's my gun, and here's the gun that's going to send your boyfriend to the chair. Now, you want to go with him, or do you want to tell me all about it? You mean I can still turn state's evidence? Were you mixed up in the murder? No. I don't know anything about that. You know about the arson deal, though, huh? Yes. Okay, baby. Now, start talking. And maybe I can get you a deal with the DA. I'll talk. I'll tell. I'll tell you everything. Well, she sang. Yeah, she sang plenty. And the words were music to my ears. When she was through singing, I tied her up tight and called Homicide to tell Urban where he could pick up a murderer and an accessory before the fact. Then I told him where I'd be later. I called Flynn at the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company and told him to meet me at the home of Paul Matthews, owner of the Matthews Fur Company, in ten minutes. He did, and we went in together. The butler sort of unwillingly showed us into the study where Matthews was reading. I'm Richard Rogue, Mr. Matthews. The investigator? The celebrated investigator, Mr. Matthews. This gentleman with me here is Mr. Flynn of the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company. How do you do? Well, I'm puzzled as to the purpose of your visit, gentlemen. Well, I'll unpuzzle you, Matthews. The fire at your fur warehouse was deliberate arson. Oh? Why, why that's preposterous. It's a nice act, but no go. We're not paying the claim, Matthews. We have absolute evidence Let that... Let me tell you, Flynn. You made a deal with Marcel Jarnac, one of the West's leading arsonists, to start that blaze, Matthews. But you needed the loyalty of an old employee of yours, the manager of your warehouse, George Grant. Grant was an honest guy. So you and Marcel sicked a dame on him, a dame named Ber- Bernice Maxwell. Ah, you convinced now that I know what I'm talking about? No. I tell you what... Okay, then I'll give you some more dope. With Grant's help, you took all of the expensive furs out of the warehouse and filled it up with a lot of junk. And then Grant sopped it all down to the gasoline and touched it off. So you want the insurance on $160,000 worth of minks and sables for burning $1,000 worth of cat skin. It was a swindle, Matthews. We're not paying the claim. The cops have the Maxwell woman, Marcel Jarnack, and a pasty-faced gunman who worked with them. They've all talked. You're through. That's the police now, the homicide squad. Show the man, will you, Flynn? Sure. Looks like the end of the road for me, doesn't it, Mr. Rogue? Yeah, yeah, it sure does, Matthews. You know, amateurs like you shouldn't go around uh, mixing up with professional crooks. That's right. Hey, hey, cut it out. Drop that gun. Matthews, hey. Hey, hey what's going on in here, Rogue? Ah, oh, this guy, this, this Matthews tried to commit suicide. I had to take the gun away from him. That's all I've been doing all day long. Is that living... Well, it was Pasty Puss's gun that bumped George Grant. He and Marcel got the chair. Matthews and Bernice Maxwell got ten years apiece, and I got ten grand reward money for cracking the case. <laughs> yeah, I really had a time with that $10,000. Went to Mexico. Mexico City, incidentally. <laughs> ah, las señoritas. <laughs> Muy simpáticas. Yeah. Spent the month of January there. What a month, January. Well, as soon as I get time, I'm going to write a book. You know what the title's going to be? I'm going to call it Lost January. (laughs) Oh, dear. Incidentally, I hope you noticed that I didn't get my brains knocked out and make my regular visit to my alter enemy, Hugo, tonight. Uh, (laughs) What's the idea, Rogie? I missed you. Are you mad because I threw that Betty Dame off our cloud? No, Hugo. Oh, but look, Rogie, you made a reservation. On cloud number eight? I did not. Oh, yes, you did. You said it. I said what? You said, see you next week, Hugo. You said it. I heard you. Okay, okay, I've seen you. Good night, Midget. Goodbye, Rogie. Say, Rogie, aren't you going to wish me a Merry Christmas? Oh, sure, sure. Merry Christmas, Hugo. Merry Christmas, Richard. So long. (laughs) Merry Christmas. (laughs) Imagine that little dehydrated Santa Claus. 
Oh, well, I love everybody. And God blesses one and all. To coin a phrase. You know what I mean? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Uh, listen, you uh, phone down to the drugstore and tell them to send up three gallons of black coffee. Who is this? Are you sure you have the right number? I'm sure I've got the right number, but I'm not so sure who I am. Oh, Sam, it's you. You must have had a frog in your throat. Did you oversleep? Effie, don't say things like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Oh, you poor dear, you've been working. You're tired, that's it. Tired? I've only just brought Lazarus back from the dead. Well, then you better get some rest, Sam. You can dictate your report tomorrow. That's what you think. Now, stay where you are. If I'm asleep when I get there, wake me up. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Lazarus caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Next time you buy hair tonic, be sure you buy Wild Root Cream Oil. For you see, Wild Root Cream Oil gives you these advantages. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin, so much like the natural oil of your skin. Yes, friends, next time you buy hair tonic, look for that famous name, Wild Root. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. In here, Sam, in your private office. Yeah, private, she says. I'd like to know what's private about it. I have everything ready for you, Sam. What's this? Ovaltine, to relax. I don't want to relax. I don't dare. Oh, there you go again, Sam. Going on nerves. How long do you think you can keep it up? With your help, I'll be in a coma inside three minutes. Thank you, Sam. Now, you just lie down here on the couch, and I'll take your shoes off. Now, look, uh... And I can take dictation while you relax. Nuts. Where's that black coffee? Sam, you're angry with me. Your eyes. Please don't glare at me like that, Sam. I can't bear it when you... I am not glaring. I'm trying to keep them open. Now sit down. I got to keep moving around. Oh, you moving shouldn't around. drive yourself like this, Sam. Uh, uh, please, Effie, please. Uh, date, uh, fill it in. Well, it's your life. Go on. Burn yourself at both ends. Yeah, let's see. Uh, two, uh, A.J. Tatspaw, claims manager, all-risk insurance company, Tide Building, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh. Dear sir, the following is an accounting of my services to your company in connection with the claim of Emma R. Lazarus on the life of the assured Timothy R. Lazarus. The latter called at my office yesterday at approximately 11.30 a.m., He was tall, bald, gray-faced, and dusty. He looked as if he'd been buried and dug up several times. This this may sound like a poor sort of jest, Mr. Spade, but my name is Lazarus, and I want you to bring me back from the dead. Well, sounds interesting. Why did you die, when did you die, and how did you die? I was declared dead by the appellate court of the state of California, August 28th last year, by reason of seven years' absence. Who took it to court? My wife, Emma. Insurance? Yes. My wife and I agreed between ourselves to insure my life in the amount of $100,000 that she would collect on legal presumption of death after my disappearance and continued absence for seven years. That's the law, Mr. Spade. Yeah, it's been tried a lot of times. What went wrong in your case? Wife double-cross you? If that's your attitude, I'm afraid I've come to the wrong man. Uh Uh-huh. You're still in love with her. Well, that makes it tough. 
You know they'll nail her for perjury if you prove you're still alive? But that's why I didn't go to the police. Even though we'd planned the deception together, she had reason to believe that I was actually dead. Suppose you cover the whole thing from the beginning, Mr. Lazarus. Yes. I, I, I married her back in 1940. And for a while, we were happy. And then she became restless. You mean you were not able to support her in the manner to which she was accustomed? She was young, lovely, you wanted her to have nice things, but on your meager salary, it was impossible. Oh, I know, it's an old story, but life is like that. Well, uh, you said it. Yeah, well, there you are. I was assistant cashier at the Golden Gate Bank. Oh, no, not that. I, I started taking small sums at first, meaning to repay them later uh, look, on. Look, let's not go through the whole script. How much did you embezzle? Uh, $20,000. Yeah, so you decided to take it on the lamb before the auditors came in, and... I was going to give myself up, but Emma wouldn't let me. We, we made our plans that night, and uh, I left for Mexico the following day. In Mexico City, I had plastic surgery done on my face, and then I settled down to wait the seven long years until I would be declared legally dead. <sighs> I suppose you might call it poetic justice, but just before the end of the seventh year, I contracted malaria was confined to a hospital for more than 11 months. Mm, you have had it. Oh, the doctors gave me up for dead and asked me to notify my next of kin. I gave them Emma's address. I never notified her. To the contrary, because it seemed to, to, to fit in so well with our plan. Too well, huh? Yes. I, I'd been to see her, and she refuses to believe that I am her husband. Oh, of course, my appearance is, is, is very much altered, but there must be some way to prove my identity. You worked in a bank. They must have taken your fingerprints. I removed them from the files and destroyed them. How are your teeth? My, my teeth? Teeth. Who was your dentist here in town? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, 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 Dr. Smith, the Drake Professional Building. You'll still have your dental x-rays on file. They're as good as fingerprints. You go there this afternoon. Don't give your name. Tell them you're Mark Humboldt. I have a new set of x-rays taken, and I'll do the rest. Uh. Uh, what's your wife doing these days? Why, uh, Emma... Emma's married again. Who's the sucker? Pardon me? The man. Oh, he's a doctor. Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. Wilhelm? He's quite well known, I believe. Yeah, and the cops would like to know more. Now, about my fee... Uh... Oh, uh, Mr. Spade, I have no money. Oh, that's great. You have no money, and all you want is to hire a man to bring you back from the dead. And the more I succeed, the less chance I'll have of collecting. If I might make a suggestion, Mr. Spade, I... I don't know the ethics, but uh, perhaps the insurance company? You would be doing them a great service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to live, Mr. Lazarus. They can't keep a good man down. I'll collect from them. I knew there wasn't a chance in 100000 of shaking a fee out of your company. After all, you have your own investigators in the payroll, and contract work isn't deductible under the new tax law, but something about Lazarus had gotten to me. Something else about him got to me at the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, where I stopped for lunch. Mr. Spade? Yes, indeedy. Uh, I'm Emma Wilhelm, Mr. Spade. Emma Lazarus Wilhelm? I see you do know who I am. May I sit down? Slide in, Mrs. Wilhelm. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to know you have a sense of humor, Mr. Spade. Mm -hmm. It's about that man, of course. Surely you didn't believe a word of his story. Which word? Oh, I'll admit there are slight traces of the truth in his raving. My first husband, Timothy Lazarus, was an embezzler. Mm -hmm. He did disappear, and it's quite true that I have collected the insurance on his life. I might even believe that Tim is still alive. But that man is not he. Then what are you so upset about? Oh, it's perfectly obvious what he wants. He's an extortionist. You're wrong. He doesn't want money, Mrs. Wilhelm. He wants you. Oh. Uh, Mr. Spade, how much do you know about my husband? Which one? Don't be flippant. Dr. Ernest Wilhelm? He uh, made his first million panning lead nuggets out of gang war casualties and lost it on the stock market. He uh, cut his second million out of Knob Hill and called it surgery. He lost that on horses, blinds, and malpractice suits. The last time he was mentioned in the paper, there was a big picture of him pumping sleeping pills out of the stomach of an aging burlesque queen. It uh, may or may not have been coincidence that she did not recover and that she was the ex-girlfriend of one of our better-known racetrack haberdashers. And if he got a hundred bucks for the job, he was paid off in boodle. Oh, please. Please don't say any more. That poor girl. And he'll do the same thing to me. Well. 
If you persist in helping that imposter, you'll be responsible for whatever happens to me or anyone else you involve. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything else I should know? Yes. Both you and your client are being watched and followed. You can't escape him. He's not quite the has-been you'd like to think he is. After she had gone, I scraped the tears off my butter, finished my lunch, washed my hands with a nationally advertised soap, and mushed over to the Drake Professional Building. I found my client's dentist in his lab, polishing up a set of gold inlays. Humboldt? Oh, yes, yes. His x-rays have come through. Only set today. They're on the clamp there. Don't touch them. They're not dry yet. Oh, I'm sorry. What's your interest? Uh, Police identification? You guessed it. Always happy to cooperate. Thanks. How about digging in your files for the x-rays on a patient named Lazarus? Oh, yes. Be glad to, of course. Well, let's see now. Larrabee, Lavelle, Lawrence, Lawson, Gluskin. That's G. What's that doing here? Ah, Lazarus. Timothy R. Is that your man? That's the name. Oh, Jimmy, April 1940. Should have been in for dental hygiene. Have to remind Miss Baker. That's my nurse. These uh, pictures, how do they compare with this new set? Well, now let's have a look. Switch on the light there, will you please? And let's see. Malocclusion, love, cuspids, impacted third molar. Ah, erosion inlay. Yes, it's very interesting. You mean they're the same in both sets of pictures? Oh, dear, no, no. A uh, man's mouth could change a lot in seven years, could oh, it? Oh, yes, especially with dental neglect, but that would never cause a man to grow new teeth. Oh, well. You see here, Humboldt has one more lower incisor and two more molars in Lazarus. And the whole character of the mouth is different. Well, these two men would not look even faintly alike. Well, uh, could there have been some mistake in filing? Oh, dear, no. Miss Baker's been with me for ten years. Never made a mistake yet. Mm-hmm. Could I talk to her? Not in today. Been out since Tuesday. Cold. Oh, say, by the way, you're a detective. How's this for a mystery? She phoned me this morning and thanked me for sending a doctor around to examine her. Now, this is the peculiar part. I have no recollection of having done so, and I'm not acquainted with the doctor she said I sent her. That wouldn't be a Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. Why, yes. Wilhelm. That was the name. Do her another favor, will you? Call a doctor you do know and tell him to get over there as fast as he can. Come on, come on, open up. Keep your shirt on, and I'm going to come in as fast as I can. What you want, kiddo? Which is Miss Baker's room? She's sick, ain't having no callers. I'm her doctor. Oh, you can't fool me. Where's your little black bag? If I had one, it would be around your neck. Now, March, show me the way. You can't force me. I know my rights. Oh, you do, do you? Well, it might interest you know that your vents are faulty, your wiring is illegal, your drains are unsanitary, and your apron is dirty. Them's rust stains. I'm neat as a pin. You're as neat as a mud pie. Now get going before I have the Board of Health down on you. All right, but you can't make me climb them stairs. Come on, come the on. sciatica I have. Here's a key. Okay. First door to the right. And whenever she's gone, I hope you catch it. Thank you, Elsa Maxwell. She was stretched out on a bed, her left arm twisted under her and her right dangling over the edge. On the floor beneath it was an empty pill bottle. A few red capsules were scattered near it and some more were spilled out among the bedclothes. It was a standard sleeping pill suicide scene, but I didn't believe it. The body was still warm, but no pulse. I didn't waste time giving her the mirror test. Instead, I looked around for a phone. It was on a table near a window. I meant to dial the police number, Sutter 12020, but SU was as far as I got. It felt like a bee sting or a quick jab with a needle. I spun around and swung out blindly. The face that I missed was suntanned under a shock of iron gray hair. It was wearing the same white-toothed grin that Dr. Ernst Wilhelm always wore for newspaper photographers. I started towards him and he backed away, still grinning. Come ahead, Spade. Come and get me, but hurry. You have only 20 seconds more. Shall I count them off? So far, you have three... Four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The floor kept dropping a foot at a time as I walked toward him. But every time I got to the bottom of the incline, it tilted up the other way and I slipped back. He kept dropping out of sight and every time I got him back into my line of vision, he was farther away. 
The walls of the room opened out and disappeared into some clouds. The ceiling spun around faster and faster until it whirled away like one of those flying discs. Then the floor turned into gelatin and I sank into it. Makers of Wild Road Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen... Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Lazarus Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The dream lasted about 300 years. Around Christmas time in the year 2247, another bee stung me. I opened my eyes, but the lights on the tree were too bright, and Santa Claus was bending over me with a brandy breath. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. A little willpower. You're conscious. Uh, that's it. That's it. Yeah, sensation returning. Uh, here. Try and sit up. The girl. How about her? Uh, too late. Did everything I could. Suicide pact? Uh, one of your brothers in Apollo was a little too handy with a needle. Here's the mark on my arm, and you'll find one on that stiff. Those sleeping capsules were a plant to make it look like suicide. Uh, you'll be feeling better soon. Now, come along. Up on your feet. Must keep moving. Restore circulation. Yeah. Hip, hip. Uh, 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 thanks. Thanks. You, uh, you the man Dr. Smith called? Yes. So, you're a private detective. Uh, how do you feel now? I'm still dopey. You uh, give me something to pick me up? I've given you as much stimulant as it's safe to administer. For the rest, you'll have to sleep it off. And you will. I advise you to hurry home. Get into bed before this wears off. How long have I got? A mm, couple of hours if you keep moving, maybe three. Yeah. Mm, but if I were you, I wouldn't stay out. You don't want to fall asleep in the middle of Market Street, get run over by a bus. Worst things can happen to you in your own bed. Look at her. Murder? Think you can prove it? I don't know. I couldn't. Not on her. And I've been an autopsy surgeon for 20 years. Well, uh, cheer up, doctor. If you miss on her, you may get a second chance. Huh? Yeah, me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those eyes are looking better. I think you'll live. I wasn't so sure. Unless I could nail Wilhelm before my three hours was up, it was a safe bet he'd nail me again with that needle. He had done me one favor. He'd convinced me that my client was really the man he claimed to be and that Wilhelm and Emma knew it. My best hope of smoking him out was to dig out some solid proof. I spent ten minutes of my three hours getting to the hall of records and ten more finding out there was nothing there on Lazarus but his death certificate. I had a gander at the wanted file at police headquarters. They'd checked him out in August of 47 when the court had pronounced him dead. I looked at my watch. With two hours and 17 minutes of wakefulness left, I just didn't have time. I stopped by Lazarus' hotel, got a set of his fingerprints and several samples of his signature, took them to a penman I know down on the mission, and between us we forged the most amazing set of documents ever assembled on one man. All dated, notarized, certified, witnessed, registered, one even bore the great seal of the state of California and the signature of the governor. I squeezed them all into a large briefcase, propped my eyes open with toothpicks while I drank half a gallon of black coffee, then phoned Dr. Wilhelm's night number. 
I told him I was one of Russian Leo's boys, and a cop had just winged me on the lamb from a jewelry store job. He agreed to meet me at his office. Hello, Wilhelm. Yes? Is that all you got to say to the guy you knocked off an hour ago? I'm afraid I don't quite follow. Who are you? Look, I know that you know, and you know that I know. They even wrote a song about it. So let's get off the dime and don't reach for a needle. This gun is bigger and it shoots farther. Well, I can see you mean business. What do you want? First, I want to show you a few things. Here, take a look. Mm Hmm? Well, this is very impressive. Yeah, I thought you'd be impressed. You, uh, need any more proof that Lazarus is Lazarus? What's the matter, Spade? Getting sleepy? Don't get your hopes up. I can squeeze this trigger in my sleep. Mm -hmm. Are these papers for sale? Why do you think I brought them to you? What's the price? Half the take on Lazarus' insurance. That's very high. I haven't finished. This time, Lazarus has got to be really dead and you're going to do the job. Come on, come on, stop stalling. I can't do that. Why not? Why, Emma... She'll make trouble. She said she would. She's still in love with him? Why do you say that? I just wondered. What reason did she give you for not wanting him knocked off? Well, the cops work harder at identifying a dead man than they do a live derelict that looks and talks like a crank. I had the same idea myself. Then you're stupid. With him dead, she can tell any story she wants to. With him alive and all this proof of identity, he's in a position to nail both of you for fraud, conspiracy, perjury. Shall I go on? Uh, one thing. Does Emma know about these papers? Sure. You're lying. Sure, I'm lying. And those documents are forgeries, if that's the way you want it. I haven't got time to argue. I can't stay awake much longer, and you can't bring it off without me. I'll have Lazarus at my apartment in 30 minutes. Bring your needle and the 50 grand. All right, Spade. I'll be there. I made two phone calls on my way to pick up Lazarus, one to Emma and one to Lieutenant Erlinger of Homicide. Dundee was asleep. The lieutenant and Sergeant Poolhouse were perched on the fire escape outside my window, and Emma was waiting in the living room when we got there. Tim, oh, my poor darling. Emma, you recognize me. Of course, darling, from the beginning. But I didn't dare speak out in front of Ernst. I know. Mr. Spades told me. Now, listen to me, you two. You're sure you can go through with this? Oh, are you sure there's no danger? That's him now. Come on, Lazarus, get in the bedroom there. Now, do what I told you. Don't worry, Emma. Oh, I'm so frightened. Quiet. Oh, hello, Spade. I got here just to... Emma, what are you doing here? Uh, Mr. Spade phoned me. I agreed. It's the only thing to do. I wanted you to know that. Well, I'm glad to see that you've come to your senses for a while there. You see, you were wrong, Spade. Did you bring the stuff? Uh, Here's your money. I have the hypodermic in the case here. It's already loaded. (laughs) We won't need a sterile needle. (laughs) Where is he? In there on the bed. He was asleep a minute ago. The grogginess that had kept coming back over me in waves for the last two hours swirled over me again as Wilhelm leaned over the bed where Lazarus lay stretched out with his eyes closed. For a split second, I blanked out, and I was afraid it had already happened. But then I saw Wilhelm's hand coming down at an oblique angle toward Lazarus' forearm. Then my vision blurred again, and my arms felt too heavy to lift. (laughs) It was Emma's scream that jolted me back. I clawed out blindly. Drop it. You let go of it. You, you get it in your own arm. Let go. You swine. You double crossing. Now, here's a little sleeping medicine for you. Okay, boys. Come and get him. Good boy, Sam. Good boy. We won't forget this. Yeah. A likely story. Uh, get that broken glass, Paul House. Put it in the Dixie cup. I handle it careful. One analyze that medicine. You okay? Uh, who are these people, Sam? Accomplices? Yeah, but not for homicide. What about Ernst? They won't let him go free, will they? 
Don't worry. He's out of circulation for good. Mr. Spade. Yeah, Lazarus. I, I, I don't know how to thank you. Yes. You don't know what this means to us. Uh, yes, I do. It probably means another long separation. The state prisons aren't co-ed. But if you insist on being alive, you have to take life as it comes. Period. Uh, end of bedtime story. Oh, Sam, it's so sad. That poor couple, so much in love. Mm. But you had to do your duty, didn't you, mm. Sam? Mm. They had to pay their debt to society, of course. Mm. That's why you had to be so hard and unrelenting and not give in to your better nature. Oh, that's right, that's right. Never give in to the ship. <laughs> Don't tread on me. It was uh, Hobson's... Hobson's... Um, yeah, what was it that Hobson... Uh, you may fire when ready. You know best, Sam. I just go type this up. And now, listen to this. A good friend of the family. That's Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic, folks. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Now, get Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter in a new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, there you go away. Your apron's dirty. Sam, I'm not wearing an apron. <sighs> then why don't you let me sleep? Sam, you've got to wake up. Your coffee's here. And tell him I'm in conference. No, Sam, no. The black coffee. You said to order three gallons. What? I couldn't carry it all. I'll make another trip. Twenty-four cardboard containers. You'll have to drink it up fast now. They're, they're leaking already. Abandoned ship, all ye who enter here. Oh, Sam, what am I going to do with it? Uh, open a restaurant. Good night. Oh, good night, Sam. Number three turrets, open fire. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Down. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie, it keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie, it's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie, start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie, keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy, get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments. Our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Moultrie Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kremel keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster, yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kremel. If you're using some other hairdressing... Change to Kremel. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking when you use Kremel. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable bead and the adventure of Maltry Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. Shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boa and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly... With a plunge, like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Took her a long enough time to to make up her mind, didn't it, Holmes? Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affaire du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. She looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Mm-hmm. I know Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering her. Mm-hmm. Yes, of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man, won't oh, you? Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Davis wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. Uh, supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, <laughs> very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mention your brother's title. 
May I ask what that title is? My brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltree, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful boar, but extremely wealthy. And he, he wants to marry you, sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. Now he's offered Harold £50,000 in cash if he'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of male kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltry, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says, if the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable Bede. A bead or some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bead, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bead. Oui. Yes, spelt B-E-D-E. Oh, B-D. Oh. The Venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Mm, yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that... <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltries were in trouble, they should play a very peculiar piece of music which he composed. Piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltries couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd bring your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Maltry Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. An express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Oh, I say it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. An eighth-century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case, shall you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. I'll just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Maltry Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it. And my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm, what a beautiful building. Must be very old. Or 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly a hundred years later. 16th century? Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you our prize possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes. It's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. No particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... How many times do I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum? Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, what the devil's going on out there? Oh, come on. Come, down your dear and see this. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Jonathan, what's the matter? Harold, I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice today I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago I was taking a walk by the bottom of the tarn, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him sneaking after me here. I say you must discharge him, Harold. But he was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. Is one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African slave driver comes to... Oh, I'll have your blood. Just see if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. 
A clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. How are you, gentlemen? You'll excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. Oh, say, Bully. That poor devil of a groom was half his size. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by the bottomless town half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless town? Oh, it's a lake on the estate, just behind the gamekeeper's cottage. Well, there's a legend that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago, a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. We dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Uh, Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Ah, oh, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Uh, uh, Thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. Well, it says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is in answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltry fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear the Devers covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. <laughs> that Sybil's played that rather dull piece of discordancy. I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltry fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mysterious message. Yeah, blessed if I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to Never me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? <laughs> I, too, have my investigators, Harold. They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. Mm. Uh, There you are again. What are you doing, listening at the door, you filthy swine? I was just going to the kitchen. Uh, Get to the stables where you belong. I see that groom again, Harold. I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sue. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. He's a thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, if you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco. I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow, we... Moultrie Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my... Uh, peculiar modesty and needs your constant reassurance. Uh, I can finally sleep out. Then why not go to sleep, my dear chap? How can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da 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 lot of rubbish. Sit up half the night. We'll get you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to sleep. When the mole trees are in need, seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the Moultrie's problems. You 
You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the Maltese in need, seek the venerable bee. I've got it. Watson, wake up. Wake up. Uh, 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 what's, uh, uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltree Abbey. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kremel massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes dandruff flakes. And it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell. I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as we went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure... That I'm just certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, and, and then close. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Well, that's Jonathan Zever's room. Well, I suppose he knows what we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, yeah. here's the door. Through the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede, Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B, E, D, E, E. B-E-A-D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B-E-D-E -E obviously stand for Bede, the venerable Bede. And we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B-E-A-D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B-E-A-D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, by George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the font. It slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. 
Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltree fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. You must have built these steps for pygmies. Holmes, do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Now look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. A crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer, has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust, and yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table, as though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha! Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots, rectangularly spaced. I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family, and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Devers is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though... What would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question, I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I am a millionaire, and therefore I don't need the treasure. To risk it to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I haven't the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. So I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. A fathomless lick on this estate. That'd be the place. The bottomless tar. Of course. Remember the Devers told us earlier that he'd been walking by it this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. Look, look, look. There, in the moonlight. It's Jonathan Devers. He's running towards the edge of the lake. Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag. Which means that we can run faster than he can. You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have. Don't hesitate to use it. This devil's work must be stopped. Come on, faster. Faster. Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him. He's at the edge of the tower. Drop that bag, Mr. Devers. You're too late, my friend. Drop it or I'll shoot. I'll drop it in the bottomless town. There. <laughs> uh, goodbye to the treasure of the Maltese. You devil. You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. That was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the tarn. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. Good Lord, it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag and went off to get his coat before coming out here, I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book... And I'll fill the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll... No, you skin. won't, Devers. Or you'll end up in the town where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be, they must be, the original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the more trees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. Rubbish. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity. All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. Very satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back for London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. 
The fortunes of the Maltrees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody. And, uh, And Scotland Yard get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Anthony Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltry Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. Then I suppose the first earl discovered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Maltry family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved and uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as uh, our most successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. And how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair. Never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam, even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Divinely Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who had terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the tolling bell. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Keep that baby on the tree. Uh, fix those dolly tracks. And look out for that cable, it's hot. Give me a hand with this thing. 
Mallard, what in the name of the San Francisco Police Department are you doing up here on Telegraph Hill? Working, Candy, in the name of the San Francisco Police Department. Here? With these people who are making the movie? Yeah. How about that? Me, a lieutenant in homicide, and I'm assigned to riding herd on these Hollywood characters. Oh, it's better than murder. I'll take murder any day. <laughs> what are you doing around here? I did some shopping at Speedy's this morning while I was pinching the avocados. They told me that there was a Hollywood gang over by Coit Tower shooting some scenes for a movie with a San Francisco background. They might just as well have stayed in the studio. They brought their own lawns, prop trees, fake bushes, the works. <laughs> if it ever snowed up here on Telegraph Hill, they'd have brought some of that along, too. <laughs> You've never worked in Hollywood, Mallard. Only God can make a tree, but Hollywood presumes to improve on them. <laughs> what are they doing now? Uh, just getting ready to shoot a scene, I think. Oh. They've been rehearsing it all morning. Mm-hmm. What's it all about, do you know? As far as I can figure, it's a story about San Francisco right after the gold rush. Look at all the costumes. Very authentic. Looks like they'd been shipped around the horn. <laughs> By the way, Mallard, do you know who's in the picture? Some lush tomato named Cherry Dana and the Colorado boy, Buff Arnold. Arnold? D- did you say Buff Arnold? That's right. Why? Oh, forgive me, Mallard, dear. I... I knew Buff Arnold when he didn't have a place to house in. He professed to carry a very warm torch for me. Uh Aha. So that's why you so casually dropped by. Oh. An old flame, huh? Don't be ridiculous. I didn't even know the guy was here, let alone still in pictures. A likely story. (laughs) All right, quiet, please. Let's have quiet. Quiet. This is a take. All set, Mr. Dix. We're ready. (laughs) Good. Okay, Cherry, we'll roll this one, take a chance on it. Just remember to keep up against those trees. We don't want any shots of those modern buildings below the hill. Oh, remember, Red. Where is my old pal, Buff Arnold Mallard, dear? By me. Judging by what's been going on, he's not in this particular scene. Mm -hmm. All right, stand by. Roll him. Scene 47, take 10. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Cut, cut. Oh, where's that coming from? Out on the bay, Mr. Dix. A fine thing, a present-day steamer whistle in an 1850 picture. Hold it. Ames. Yes? Let me know when the fool ship is tied up. We won't shoot the scene until it's docked. Yes, sir. Darn it, I was hoping I'd see some action. Well, I'll give you some action. Come on, walk around with me, Candy. I'll show you all the sights. Sites like what, for instance, Mallard? Oh, all the lights they brought up here. I must have a thousand of them. Undoubtedly to wash out the wrinkles on the leading lady's face. And talk about props. They must have taken a whole freight train to get them up here. Well, I have to have them. Uh, uh, for instance, look, uh, right up there. Hmm? Where, Mallard? Uh, up, up there, above. In that tree, hanging by their necks. <gasps> oh, Mallard! <laughs> Don't jump like that, Cupcake. Oh. They're only dummies hanging from those ropes. Three of them, they they look so realistic. Ah, I must admit, they really do. I understand they use them in a scene where they recreate a lynching in Portsmouth Square. Recreate, did you say? Yeah. Maybe you're right. Take another look, honey bun, a good look at the one in the middle. What are you trying to... Fry me for lard. That one in the middle is no dummy. You're no dummy either, boy of mine. How many times have you looked up there? Just a couple of times, but the last time I looked, the one in the middle wasn't an ex-human being. With that, I toss the whole thing in your lap, Mallard. I promote you back to homicide. Oh, why didn't these characters stay in Hollywood? It is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Cluttering up our lovely Telegraph Hill trees with gently swaying corpses. Come on, Mallard. Let's give the director a slight touch of apoplexy. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson. Yukon 2, 8209. It's funny how sometimes when you're lazy and want to do nothing except live the good, pure life, trouble, trouble comes up and belts you over the head with a vengeance. Well, that's the way it happened to me. I'd just finished a deal that took me three weeks to crack. I made some good money out of it, banked it, and sat back to relax. But when I heard about the movie company on location on the other side of the hill, my curiosity got the better of me. As of that moment, my contemplated relaxation was at an end. Period. Paragraph. I literally walked right into trouble because there was Mallard and cut down. Okay, Mr. Dix, take a good look at him. Do you recognize the gent? I recognize him, yes, but I don't know him. 
He was one of the extras we used in a scene yesterday. Did he come up from Hollywood with you? I'm pretty sure he didn't. I think he was hired here locally. Uh, wait a minute. Who's this young lady? I don't want any outsiders in on this. Oh, fret your little head, Mr. Dix. Aside from being a material witness, she's a well-known private investigator. Ah, oh, excuse me. I didn't know. That's all right. No need to apologize. Some of my best friends are movie directors. Uh, who would keep the roster on your personnel? My assistant, Bill Ames. Is he around? Well, I'm right here, Lieutenant. Oh, good. Can you give us any dope on this fellow? Oh, golly, uh, I'm afraid not. I've seen him, but I wouldn't know his name from Adam. How about the payroll? When do you pay off the extras? Yeah, that's a thought. We pay off at 5 o'clock tonight. Why don't we come back then, Mellard? We can check off the names against the pay vouchers. There's one thing extras like to do, and that's get paid. The name that doesn't show up is our friend the corpse. Okay, we'll let it go like that. What do you pay off? Room 873, Montfair Hotel. Make sure everybody's there, unless they want a little trouble thrown at them. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dix. You can go on with your shooting now. Uh, no, no more today. It's too unnerving. Ames, knock it off. Call will be for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, sharp. Right, Chief. Uh, break it up, everybody. 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, in costumes. And that means 8 o'clock, understand? Not morning. You mind waiting here for Mama Caddy? I want to put in a call to the coroner's office for a wagon. Sure, that's all right. Go ahead. Good. It'll only be a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Dix, pardon me. Yes? Can you tell me where Buff Arnold is staying? What, uh, what do you want with Buff Arnold, young lady? I used to know him when he was playing bit parts in Hollywood. Oh. Did you, uh, work in Hollywood? I did a little time down there, sitting around in agents' offices. You know, uh... You're a sharp little cookie. <laughs> Say, all of a sudden, I've got an idea. I'll bet. <laughs> no, no. On the level, believe me. I have a small part coming up that'd fit you to a T. Good-looking gal, wise, supposed to work in her father's store selling supplies to the miners. Can you uh, act at all? I used to shoot a fairly sharp mess of dialogue. Do you live close by? Right over there, one block. Penthouse on the top. Hmm, all the better. As soon as your policeman friend removes the deceased there, uh, why don't we go over to your place and uh, look at the script? You know something? I've got an idea. That's the idea you had the idea about. Okay, I'll look at the script. But for your information, Mr. Dix, I'm interested only in playing a part in your picture. Mallard came back and I told him what had developed with Dix. He shot me a look that had more question marks in it than a government income tax form. I assured him I could handle the situation, and he left with the body, still clad in its 49er prospector's outfit. Dix issued some final orders, took me by the arm, and we strolled over to my place. Ah, charming, but positively charming. Thank you. What a gorgeous view. How long have you lived here, Miss... Oh, <laughs> now, isn't that silly... I don't even know your name. Matson, Candy Matson. Candy Matson. Never have I heard a name match a personality so completely. <laughs> I'm Reginald Dix. Uh, just call me Reg. As you say, Reg. Uh, would you like a drink? Oh, splendid. Soda highball. I think I can scrape one together. <sighs> this is absolutely enchanting. I'm going to ask to make all my pictures in San Francisco from now on. I don't think you'd go wrong. Uh, of <laughs> course, it'd be a little rough if you were making a picture with an Indian background and needed shots of the Taj Mahal and the Himalayas. Oh, simple. I'd change it to the Ferry Building and Twin Peaks. <laughs> Very good. Here you are, Reg. <sighs> Thank you. I can use this after that messy discovery up there on that tree. Well, here's to crime. Uh, that's a charming toast. Now then, about this part you were speaking of, I don't even belong to the Screen Actors Guild anymore. Oh, mere detail. I'll call the studio tonight and have them arrange your membership. As simple as that. You know, I think if some of your bright boys got together, you could win the war in Korea without half trying. Oh, let's not be snide, my dear. <laughs> oh, excuse me a moment. Someone at the door. Uh, certainly. Whoever it is, though, uh, send them away. Yes, master. Hi. Hi. But now that we've established our highs, is there something I can do for you? I'm Cherry Dana. Is Mr. Dix here? Oh, why, yes. Uh, would you wait here, please? I will not wait here. I want in. Now, just a minute. There you are, Red. 
You have a short memory, haven't you? Cherry, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm having a conference. So I see. I hate to mention it, but this happens to be a private home, Miss Dana. I'll have to ask you to leave. Don't be boring. You lured my director up here, and I'm going to see that some little local wench doesn't put the squeeze play on him. Why, you pampered brat, get out of here right now, or I'll show you how a local wench can back up words with action. Oh, now hold on here, both of you. Um, Cherry, I resent this intrusion just as much as Miss Madsen does, I'm sure. I'll bet. What about me? You said you were going to drive me back to the hotel. Very well, it slipped my mind. I'm sorry, Candy. I dislike scenes of this sort. We'll discuss... Our business, uh, later. Good. Uh, I find now that I'm extremely interested. Good afternoon, Miss Dana. I'll see you later. I was so mad I was boiling. If I'd been a thermometer, Quicksilver would have been streaming out of my ears. I did the most natural thing, took a shower, and little by little I simmered down. Actors and actresses are like anybody else. Most of them are darn nice people just trying to make a living, but one ham, like Cherry Dana, can ruin the picture. Just as I was getting dressed, the ferry building siren blew its top, indicating 4.30. I had to step on it if I was going to be at the Mont Fair at 5 in time for the payroll sequence with the extras. So I stepped on it and found myself in a minor mob scene outside room 873 at the Mont Fair Hotel. Mallard spotted me, grabbed me by the arm, and took me inside the room. I really didn't expect to see you, Candy. Hmm? Why not? I thought perhaps you were discussing contract terms with Dex by now. Big Hollywood star and all that. Oh, Mallard, cut it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen. As I call out your names, step up fast and sign the voucher. Anderson, Robert, Apperson, Lou, Bennett, Bert, Beverly... I studied the faces as they stepped by the cashier's table set up in the room. They were all types. Anyone could have been a a villain, a dance hall girl, a hero, an ingenue, or just plain extra. The roll call droned on in the background. The whole thing took about ten minutes. And suddenly, we were alone. Ames, the assistant director, the girl who had done the actual pain, Mallard, and myself. Well, that's it. Who's missing, Ames? You're in for a bit of a shock. How do you mean? Nobody's missing. Everybody listed on our payroll, checked in, and was paid off. What? That's right. Did you recognize every person who had been paid off? I'm pretty sure I did. Well, this is a fine kettle of nothing. We have an extra who's working in the picture, and yet he isn't. So he ends up hanging by his neck from a tree on Telegraph Hill. Who was the Joker? The Joker, the one you can play wild. Are you sure they're all paid? Well, positive. Double-checked with their guild cards and signatures. Well, isn't this cute? Oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Yes, this is Ames. Oh, 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 yes, Cherry. What? He's what? Great Scott. What's the matter, Ames? What is it? You're white as a sheet. Dix. He's just been found shot to death in his room. From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Reginald Dix, well known Hollywood director, shot dead in his hotel room. We were looking for developments. We got them, but not the kind we expected. Mallard led the way up to the suite that Dix had been occupying on the top floor. There was a mob around the door, and my boy Mallard soon dispersed them and instituted some semblance of order. Dix was sprawled out on the balcony overlooking the bay, and an ever-widening pool of blood showed that he'd been hit in the chest. Cherry Dana was pacing the room, smoking a cigarette. Ames stood in the middle with his jaw flapping, and who should be in the room, too, but my old pal from my days in Hollywood, Buff Arnie. Candy. Candy Matson. What a place for a reunion. Yes, isn't it? How are you, Buff? Ill. Terribly ill. If I have to step into the other room, I hope you'll understand. Reg was a great friend of mine. Sure. Sure, let's go in the bedroom. Uh, You look sort of green. Mm. Besides, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, Buff. It's a deal. Anything to get out of here, let's go. Wait a minute, Candy. Who is this guy? Buff Arnold Mallard, the fellow I was speaking about. 
Where were you going? In there, he doesn't feel too good. The closest he's ever been to blood is a bottle of ketchup in color. Okay. Don't let him out of your sight. I have a flock of questions and need a flock of answers. As you say, Miller, dear. And don't get carried away yourself. This the bedroom? Yeah. Well, Buff, you seem to be doing all right. Mm, a lot different than what I knew you in Hollywood, Candy. You look swell, Buff. Too darn swell. Hmm? What do you mean? You bring back too many memories. You look mighty good yourself, Candy. You're no longer a plump little kid just out of high school. You're downright pretty, gal. In the good old days, I'd have jumped through hoops to hear you say that. Got any hoops handy? I'll say it again. No soap. Maybe we could revive some of those memories, Candy. Not a chance, Buff Boy. Things have changed. Hollywood and everyone in it, including you, were a part of a dim, sad past. And instead of just plain Buff, that's a rebuff. Very cute. I haven't heard the gag pull since yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, did you hear about the body that was found on Telegraph Hill this morning? I sure did. Now, poor Reg. I told him this picture of the jinx on it before we left the studio. Little things have happened right from the start. Like what? Well, in the first place, I wasn't even supposed to be in the picture. They were going to give it to some new kid as a build-up. A week before the first day of shooting, he up and disappeared. He hasn't been heard from him since. Well, they shoved me into the breach. Then the assistant director tripped and fell off a catwalk, broke both legs. Mm. He had to be replaced. Anything else, Buck? Yeah. About that time, Jerry Dana whipped herself into a batch of temperament and walked off the lot. Held up production a week. Then the luggage for San Francisco was rerouted somewhere else. Never has caught up with us. Now the body this morning and Dick's just now. Certainly sounds like a jinx. By the way, how do you and the great Cherry get along, Buck? Hmm? Fine, fine. I try not to see her except on the set. Come here, Candy. Just let me hold you in my arms once, just once. I want the feel of someone who's truly genuine. You're still just a little boy, aren't you, Buff? Hmm. Okay, Arnold, I'd like to... Uh... <clears throat> well, pardon me. I hate to break this up, uh, but I want to talk to you, Mr. Arnold. That was a fine time Mallard picked to walk in. And then I got to thinking, maybe it was a fine time. He was due to have a little fire set under him. As I walked out into the other room, the boys in blue had arrived, and they were swarming all over the place. Ames was no longer present. Neither was Cherry Dana. I wasn't going to give Mallard the satisfaction of an explanation, so I eased out the door and went down to the lobby. I asked where Ames was staying and went back up to his room, 672. A knock on the door produced results. Just a moment. Oh, Miss Matson. Uh, something you wanted? Yes. May I come in? Why, I... Yes. I was just lying down. This thing about Reg has knocked me for a complete loop. It seems to be quite a shock to everybody. You've been with Reginald Dix for a long time, haven't you, Ames? Well, off and on, yes. A good number of years. How about La Dana? Cherry? Mm. Well, I've known her extremely well, even before she became a top-flight star. Can you give me any idea who might have had it in for Dix? If you can, you better spill. The truth will come out sooner or later, Ames. It always does and things of this sort. I've only one little thing I can tell. I've already told it to your lieutenant friend. Oh? And what's that? As I got back from Telegraph Hill, I dropped by Reg's suite. Wanted to talk about tomorrow's shooting. As I drew near his door, I heard loud arguing. Arguing? Who were the opponents? Reg and Cherry Dana. Mm-hmm. And what were they arguing about, Ames? You. So that's it. Tell me, is Cherry the kind of woman who would turn killer on an impulse? It's hard to say, she has a terrible temper. Mm -hmm. Does Buff Arnold fit into the picture in any way? I don't know. He's a sly one, that Arnold. He plays his cards in strictly a commercial manner. He may fit into the picture. He and Reg were never too friendly. I see. Oh, thanks, Amesy. I'll leave now. And you'd better lock your door. 
The way things are going, you might wake up to find yourself dead. I went up to Cherry Dana's suite, but I drew a blank there, no answer. So I went back to the scene of the murder, Dix's rooms on the top floor. Mallard was just leaving. He shot me a look that would have knocked out a North Korean tank at a thousand yards and started to brush on by me, but I would have none of it. Now, just a moment, boy blue. Come on back to that over-21 level. Just because Buff had his arms around me is no sign we were playing a scene from Romeo and Juliet. I don't think I've seen that close a grip even in professional wrestling. Oh, cut it out. What'd you turn up in there? Anything at all? No, not a thing. Can't even find the murder weapon. Got any ideas? Lots of them. We've already taken Miss Dana into custody. I had a hunch it was leading in that direction. Uh, uh, incidentally, did you ever hear of a Christopher Seema? He's been a bookie around town here for several years. Christopher Seema? No, can't say I have. Why? Uh, he was the boy who was hanging from the tree. Oh. According to our files, he dabbled in everything from gambling to blackmail. Seema. Seema, that, that name rings bells somehow, Mallard. Uh, one other thing. <laughs> This isn't personal, you understand. Yeah. But stay away from Buff Arnold. We've got our eye on him, too. Little things were suddenly clicking way back in my mind. Awfully vague, but the old processes from years before were coming to life ever so slowly. Mallard had work to do, plenty of it, down at the Hall of Justice, work in which I was included out. I went outside on California Street, watched him get into a squad car with two of his men, and I waved him a goodbye. That was when I had another idea. Dix's suite. Cops were through with it. The body had been removed. But I had a hunch that was the key to the situation. Knowing the manager of the Montfair, it was no trouble at all to get a key to Reggie's suite, and that's where I headed, up to the top floor. I let myself into the darkened room, closed the door behind me. With the lights of the city way below seeping through the balcony window, I found a place in back of the settee and sat down to wait and think. The balcony window being open, the roar of the city traffic underneath came gently through and helped my thinking. And that's when it hit me. Seema. Several years before I had served my term in Hollywood, there was an actress named Vivian Seema. The same face as that of Cherry Dana. Now the clouds were beginning to lift... And at the same time, the door opened in the suite and the silhouetted figure of a man entered the room. Blast the luck. Okay, Buff. Relax. What the... This is Candy. Come on over here by the settee. Hurry. I'm expecting company. What are you doing here, Candy? You've got the wrong page of the script. That's my line. What are you doing here, Buff? Honestly, you've got to believe me. I, I left my lighter here this afternoon. I was afraid the police would find it. Naturally, I can't afford any bad publicity. It ruined my career. I believe you, Buff. You always were fond of that career, weren't you? Don't answer. Just keep quiet. What's up? A guy named Seema, if I'm right. Shh. Who's this? Reginald Dix didn't like him. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone coming along the hall. <laughs> the door slowly opened and closed again. The dim light from the hall showed the form of another man. Then the dark figure moved slowly but surely across the room. It stopped for a second or two, as though listening for something. Then moved again to the balcony, out onto the balcony, and... Whoever it was grabbed the ledge above, hoisted his feet up under the iron grill work, and hung over the city. That's when I acted. Okay, Ames. Stay right where you are. In that position. What? You think I'm a fool? Candy's out on that ledge. He's ducked around the outside on that ledge. I'm a fool. Quick, Buff. Go down the hall and get out on the fire escape. Cut him off. Okay. What are you going to do? Go out on that ledge after him. You better come back, Ames. You're cut off at both ends. Oh, no, I'm not. Not with this gun I've got. That's the same gun you killed Dix with, isn't it? Very clever hiding it up on this ledge out here. No wonder Mallard and his boys didn't find it. Look out there on the city, Ames. One misstep and you go off into space. Think it over. You better come back. Not on your life. I'm coming after you. I'm down at the other end, Candy. Good. Now we've got him. Yes. Yes, you have. Obviously, this is the end. 
Perhaps you don't know what it is to love. Perhaps you don't know what it is to be scorned. I do, painfully so. This is the end. But I'm not going to go alone. You're going with me, Miss Matson, like this. No! No, the recoil. It'll knock you right out of the neck. Oh! So it was just a matter of jealousy. Is that right, Candy? That's right, Nellie, dear. The same thing you developed when you walked in on Buff Arnold and me. Okay, okay, so I was burned up. Tell me more. It was the name Seema that did it, Mallard. Uh, Do you know what that is? All right, I'll play quizzies with you. What's the name Seema? Seema is Ames, spelled backwards. Uh Uh-oh. You see, that was Ames' real name. At at one time, he had married Cherry Dana under the name of Seema. When she began to be big in pictures, she divorced him. But he carried the eternal torch. Silly, she wasn't worth it. Of course not. Because she collected men. Reginald Dix, not because she loved him, but because she was fading in pictures and because Dix was the only one who could keep her in front of the public. Logical. But what about the Seema hung up in the tree on Telegraph Hill? Uh Uh-huh. There we have the plot. The Seema up in the tree was Ames' brother, a 'er ne'er-do-well. The night that Ames arrived in town here, he looked up his brother, got a bit tight, and told him what he'd done. Caused the original leading man to disappear, shoved the original assistant director off a platform, breaking his legs. In general, did everything he could to sabotage the picture. Then he pulled the strings to get himself named as assistant director so he could be near Cherry. Love and jealousy. Now, Lord, I'll get to that in time. Cherry had vaguely promised that she'd remarry Ames. When he saw his own brother was going to blackmail him, he went crazy. That's when he strung him up with the dummies in the trees. From there, it was just a step to knock off Reginald Dix and have a clear track for himself. I'll go back to what I said to begin with. Why did these characters from Hollywood have to come up here to San Francisco and louse up our scenery, as well as our police department? Oh, to heck with your police department. That's the last time I'm going to climb around a ledge hundreds of feet in the air. Not so strange. Buff Arnold was out on that ledge, too, wasn't he? Oh, Mallard, sometimes you make me... That reminds me. I have a date tomorrow night. Sure. With Buff Arnold. No, no, that's tomorrow morning. I'm driving him down to the railroad station. Date for tomorrow night? With you, Mallard, dear. We're going to see a Roy Acuff movie. Oh, Candy. Roy Acuff. Monarch of all the cowboys. Yeah, monarch of all the cowboys. I'll see him with you. Oh. And if that isn't love, I don't know what is. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight for Hal Burdick as Reginald Dix. John Grover as Ames, the assistant director. Mary Milford as Cherry Dana. Kurt Martell as Buff Arnold. And included in the cast was Ken Langley. Henry Left plays the part of Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's play were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Tonight's engineer was Clarence Stevens. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Ethelbert, do you ever take a word association test? I don't think so. How's it go? Oh, it's simple. Look, I, I give you a word and you answer immediately with a word that comes into your mind, see? Okay, try me. All right, red. Blue. Boy. Girl. Run. Walk. Bottle. Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey Crime Photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, Pick Up. Nine o'clock in the evening, the Blue Note Cafe. Ethelbert, the head bartender, is chatting with a customer, a tall, thin, white-haired man with a gentle face, when he hears a familiar voice. Hi, Ethelbert. Huh? Oh, good evening, Casey. Excuse me, will you, Mr. Hutchins? Sure, Ethelbert. I ain't seen you all day, Casey. Where you been? No, I've been busy, pal. You told me you were on the lobster shift this week, which means you don't start to work till midnight. <laughs> Listen, shut in. This is spring. Miss Williams and I have spent the day in the park. We've been taking pictures of the birds and the bees. Where's Miss Williams? I left her at the office. Hey, look, give me four packs of cigarettes, will you? Two of Miss Williams' kind, two of mine. Okay. Hey, listen, pal, wait a minute. Huh? Who, who's the guy you were talking to when I came in? His face is familiar. Oh, he's Brett Hutchins, Casey, the horse trainer. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, well, what's he doing in town? His stable is racing out west right now. I got an idea. He's here looking for the murderer of Cass Marlin. Yeah? You know, Cass Marlin yes, was the jockey yeah. who got bumped off down in Florida just before he was to ride. Yeah, of course I know. Yeah. Well, did Hutchins say that he was looking for the murderer? No, I just got the idea because he and Cass were such good friends. Uh-huh. All he really said about the killing was what the papers had been saying, that it's still a complete mystery who done it. Well, it's pretty obvious why it was done. With Cass Marlin in the saddle, Fireball will have won the... Alderstone Trophy race. I hear the cops have questioned Steve Harold about it. He's supposed to have won a lot of money when Fireball didn't even show. Well, they've questioned all the big betters who've been known to fix things when they can. But Captain Logan investigated Steve Harold at the request of the Florida police and found that Steve looked pretty clean for once. Listen, you know, I think I'm going to have a talk with Britt Hutchins. He trained Fireball, and as you say, he and Cass were pretty close. You won't get any more out of Hutchins than I did, Casey. That's what you think, pal. Ah. Say hello to him, anyway. Hi, Britt. Remember me? Casey, Morning Express. Casey. Oh, yeah. Hi. How about the same? Mm. You know, we've been, uh, we've been hearing a lot about the Cass Marlin killing up here. I knew Cass pretty well, so... If you're going to pump me for inside dope on it, fella, I don't know any. Cass was like a son to me. He worked for me. Set to ride one of my horses. One of my owners, Mr. Ashley's horses, I mean. When somebody put a bullet in his head and... That's the whole story as far as I'm concerned. I see. Well, guess I'll be going. Got business to tend to. Yeah. Okay, Brett. Well, I'll run into you again sometime. So long. So long, boy. Hmm. I'll see you later, Ethelbert. Going so soon, Casey? Well, I gotta take Miss Williams her cigarette. <laughs> Didn't I say you'd get the old brusheroo? Uh, uh, I hate guys who pull the I told you so gag. So long, pal. <laughs> Excuse me. Huh? Yeah? Your name's Casey, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Morning Express photographer? Right again. Let's take a walk. Well, say, it's a little sudden, sister. I don't think I know you. Or uh, do I? You don't. Well, then what? Call it a pickup. Well, I don't go in for pickups. Well, call us anything you want till we get someplace where we can talk alone. I've got news to sell. You interested? Always. Okay, where are we going? Well, there's a little place around the corner, Farley's Tavern. That suits you? Mm, a little do. But I don't like the place from a social standpoint, sister. So the news you want to sell had better be on the level. <laughs> Okay, sister, now speak your piece. Well, after a waiter leaves. Oh, jittery, huh? You'd be jittery, too, if you were in my spot. In a jam? Afraid of being bumped off, that's all. Oh, you're beginning to interest me. Anything else? No, not now. Gee, thanks, pal. All right. Well, he's gone. I'm listening. How much of your paper pay for the exclusive inside dope on a murder? Well, it depends on the murder. Some are in the dime a dozen class, you know. How about the Cass Marlin killing? Cass Marlin? Yes. Yeah, this is a coincidence. What's a coincidence? 
Well, I was thinking about that shooting when you picked me up, that's all. The dope on it's worth plenty, isn't it? The real dope is. I can give it to you. Well, I'll have to be sure of that before I go to my city editor and proposition. You know. I can't pay out dough on my own. You if know. I tell you who I am and how I know about the case, will you promise to keep it under your hat? Whether we make a deal or not? Yep. I guess I can trust you. Cass told me you never double-crossed anyone. Cass told you about me, huh? Yeah, well, that's why I looked you up when I hit this town tonight. I phoned your office first, and they said I might find you at the Blue Note Cafe. I was on my way over there when I saw you come out. I recognized you by a picture Cass had. You, uh, you must have been a close friend of Cass's. He was going to marry me. Huh? What's your name, sister? Edith Landell. Edith Landell. It's funny, I've seen most of the police reports on the case, and I've come across no mention of a gal named Edith Landell. You've heard Cass was getting a divorce, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, on that account, very few people knew I was his girlfriend. It had to be that way because his wife's lawyers might have made something out of it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a pretty good answer. Well, give me one for this. If you cared enough for the guy to want to marry him, why didn't you go to the cops with this inside information? You think I'm a phony, don't you? You might be. Well, listen, wise guy. I didn't say I cared anything about Cass. I was going to marry him because he was in the big dough. When he died, I saw myself out of his dough. The cops wouldn't pay me a dime for the information I had, and Cass owed me something one way or another. So I decided to cash in with a big newspaper. A bigger one than there is down in Florida. Yours. Is that straight enough for you? Too straight to like very well. I don't care what you think of me. I've got a story to sell. But you've got to act quick. I can't keep it bottled up any longer, even for Doe, because the killer knows I'm onto him and he's after me. Now, any more questions? Only the one for the big prize. Who's the killer? Uh-uh. I'll tell you that when I see money. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand? My story's worth it, and papers like yours can pay it. <laughs> I've always wanted to see my city editor drop dead. He will when he hears that figure. Well, come on, I'll take you over to him. No. Nobody must know anything about my part in this till the killers are all behind bars. It was killer before, now it's plural. Well, I'm pretty sure there's more than one man mixed up in this. And I'll tell you something else to prove that I'm on the level. The cops' theories are all wrong. They think Cass was killed so he couldn't ride fireball, but I... What's the matter? That big guy just walked up to the bar. He knows me. Uh, yeah, I know him. And you know who he works for? Yeah. Steve Harold. Look, I gotta get out of here quick. Mr. Casey, don't let him follow me. Stall him, hold him by force if you have to till I get away. Promise me you will. This is an act, sister. I swear it isn't. You say you know who that man is. Okay, I'll hold him. And lend me five dollars. Lend you... I haven't got enough for cab fare, and I've got to get away fast and far, please. Well, well, I've always been a sap. Here's a fin. Thanks. Look, I'll phone you at your office in an hour and tell you where to meet me, where it'll be safe. And don't let Denver Lane follow me. I'm going. Goodbye. Hmm. Hi, Denver. Hello, Casey. Noticed your gal friend left in quite a hurry. Yeah. Had to run for a bus. You know her, Denver? Never saw her before. Not a bad-looking bimbo. Who is she? Well, just a pickup, I mean. Didn't know you went in for pickups. I have my moments. Cigarette, Casey? Yeah, thanks. You, uh, in a hurry to leave here? Why should I be? I just come in. Hmm. Yeah, Denver, I have my moments. <laughs> With that story, you let her take you for five dollars, Casey? Ah, uh, well, Annie, oh. the act she put on was pretty solid. She had me hooked when she pulled a big scared act about Denver Lane. You know, the guy's a gunman and he works for Steve Harold, who's up to his neck in the racing racket. For a moment, the parts all seemed to fit. Until Denver made no attempt to follow your little chum. He stayed in the joint for half an hour, and then he walked over here to the express building with me. In the rain? Yeah. <laughs> That's one break I got tonight, anyway. We were within ten feet of where my car was parked when it started, so I just... Reached in and got my raincoat. <laughs> Denver got soaked. <laughs> well, put the raincoat on again. Let's go over to the blue note. Yeah. Yeah, I see enough of this photographer's room when I'm on duty. It's over an hour now since Edith Landau said she'd phone me in an hour, so... Have you been waiting here thinking that she might phone you? Well, Annie, her act was almost too good for a $5 take. 
Oh, nuts. When I start being a sap, I keep it up, I guess. Come on, let's go. Casey! Uh, hello, Moocher. Are you a guy I'm glad to see? Uh, now, listen, Moocher, I'm short on dough Who today, Who wants though? dough? You, uh, you don't start on the job till midnight, do you? No. Swell. You won't need your car till then. My car? Mine just had to be towed to the shop, and now City Desk has given me an assignment out in the sticks. Give me your keys, pal. Uh, no, no, no. The last time you borrowed my car... Could I help it about them two fenders? Well, you could have paid to have them fixed, didn't Miss you? Williams, I'll leave it to you. Shouldn't us press photographers stick together and help each other out? that's with that stuff. Now, oh, I, uh, I, I admit Casey's a better button pusher than I am. He's a genius. The only one of his kind. Now look here. Which is all the more reason why he should give me succor in my hour of need. Casey, can a master like you let down a bum like me? Yes. Don't say that. No, no. Oh, come on, give him the car keys, Casey. You huh? know you'll get them if he has to cry real tears. Oh, I guess you're right, Annie. All right, take him, Mooch. Ah, my pal. My beloved colleague. Get out. Nay, nay. I tarry for one further little favor. Oh, my. Yes, the uh, the weather is inclement, and I came to work without my raincoat. All right, take mine. Ah, uh, my friend in need. And a perfect fit. My undying gratitude, Monsieur. And uh, can you uh, spare a cigarette? Oh, that too. All right, here's half a pack and a book of matches. Now, get out before I commit a little mayhem. I go, Master. I do those bidding. Goodbye, Miss Williams. Fair lady. Farewell. <laughs> He's really a character, Casey. Oh, some character. You you wouldn't think so if he was in your department. As I said before, when I start being a sap, Annie, I... Oh, uh, well, there's your desk phone. Yeah, it might be that either. Uh, oh. As you said before. Uh, mm, yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Casey speak. Oh, city desk. Listen, Burke, I don't go on duty till 12, so I'm not going to take any assignments now. I, uh, well, of course I'll let you talk. Who's stopping you, Joe? Oh, murder, huh? Strangled in a vacant lot. Sounds good. Yeah, I got the address, yeah. Mm, here we go again. Any details? Identification found on the bus. What? What's that name again? Yes, we'll grab a cab and get out there right away. Hey, what is it, Casey? That dame, Edith Landau, was murdered about 15 minutes after she left me. <laughs> Our story will continue in just a moment. It's here! It's here! The Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle for beer and ale. You pay no deposit. You don't have to return it to the store. It holds a full 12 ounces. A full 12 ounces, just like an ordinary beer bottle. Yet it's so compact it takes up a minimum of space in your refrigerator. It's perfectly balanced and light as a feather. Easy to handle, easy to pour from... Chills beer quickly, holds the chill longer. And it's easy to open, safe to open. A flick of your wrist and into your glass pours a golden stream of wholesome American beer, brewed and bottled and served the American way. In glass. Yes, in glass. Glass which brings you beer and ale brewery bright. Glass which can't affect taste or flavor. Glass, the sanitary container for beer and ale. Your favorite beer and ale is on its way to you right now in the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle. Another great contribution to convenience and to gracious living and entertaining. The Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle is a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Look at that body again, Casey. You're sure it's the woman who told you that story? Definitely. I was sure of it after my first look, Logan. Captain, her story must have been the truth. I told you, Annie. I was more than half sold on that story of hers. And she borrowed that five spot to take a cab from Farley's Tavern, huh? So she said. Yeah. This place is about three miles from Farley's. Now, assuming her story was true, she might have paid off the cab after the first mile or so to save money and started walking. The killer had been following her, and when she came to this block of vacant lots, he hopped out of his car and strangled her. But Denver Lane was the guy she was afraid of, Logan. And Denver didn't follow her. He was with me at the time she was being strangled. Yeah, but his boss, Steve Harold, wasn't with you. Well, you cleared Harold of suspicion in the Cass Marlin murder, Captain. No, we didn't clear it, Miss Williams. It was simply impossible to prove he had any part in it. Hey, Captain Logan. Yes, yeah, Sergeant? We just got a message for you on the car radio that I... Casey. Huh? What's the matter? 
stopped looking at me as if I was a ghost, Flanagan. Casey, you're dead. I'm what? Well, if you're not, the message to just come in is all cockeyed. What do you mean? Headquarters says that Casey's dead body has just been found in the wreck of Casey's car. Oh, Mooch, your Annie. Oh, sure, he borrowed your car. And had an accident. Accident, nothing. There's two bullet holes in the dead guy's head. <laughs> Well, the thing's plain enough now, Casey. Jen Verlaine had spotted that girl before you and she went into Florida. Yeah, maybe before she picked me up outside the Blue Note, Logan. He had another of Steve Harold's guys with him. And the other gunman followed Eve Landell and killed her while Denver stuck close to you. Sure, Miss Williams. Denver figured the Landell dame had given Casey the dope she had on the Marlin murder. He couldn't risk any rough stuff during our walk to the express building, so he waited outside in a car... And when he saw a guy my size wearing my raincoat come out and get into my car... Well, the information he thought you had had to be suppressed. With you and the dame out of the way, there'd be no evidence. Well, now, what are you going to do, Captain? I'll show you, Miss Williams. Hey, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get headquarters on your radio and instruct everyone concerned to let no outsider have a close look at the body found in Casey's wrecked car. And tell him to give out information that it's definitely Casey's body. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, Sergeant. Yes, also, I want Denver Lane and Steve Harold brought to headquarters as soon as they can be found and kept in separate rooms and instruct arresting officers to tell them nothing about anything. Uh, that's all. Right, sir. I get it, Logan, the old surprise treatment. <laughs> and a big surprise. If Sergeant Flanagan thought you were a ghost, the guys who think they killed you, <laughs> they just might go to pieces and tell us what we want to know. <laughs> Steve Harrell's cooling off in this room, Casey. Now, I'll go in alone and you follow and you hear me uh, clear my throat. <clears> throat> okay, love. Well, I hope this works. Oh, it'll work, Miss Williams. Hey, you stay here with Casey. Here goes. Hello, Harold. Oh, good evening, Captain. And good morning, rather. Well, now that you're here, perhaps I'll get some information as to why I've been rudely conducted to this, uh, well, unglamorous place. My boys didn't tell you? No. No, no. All they told me was to come along, and naturally, as a law-abiding citizen, I made no resistance despite the invasion of my constitution. No, right. stop talking like a book. <laughs> All right, Captain. But look, none of you cops have anything on me, and I'm definitely in the clear with your homicide bureau, so well, what's the big idea? A girl named Edith Landell was killed tonight. Oh, really? Now, you've never heard of her, I suppose. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I have. Really? Yes. Well, Landau isn't a common name, so I presume it's the same girl I met with Cass Marlin several months before he was killed. He'd uh, fallen rather hard for the little gold digger. Well, why didn't you tell me about the Landau girl when I questioned you on the Marlin case? My dear fellow, you didn't ask me. Uh... Hmm. Why do you suppose she was killed tonight? Because she knew too much about Cass Marlin's murder. Uh -huh. And she told what she knew before she died, Steve. Hmm. You interest me. Uh, by the way, uh, whom did she tell? A man who also was killed. And you're still out on a limb. No, not quite. This man told the story to his newspaper associates before two bullets got him in the head. Their evidence will be only second-hand hearsay. It wouldn't be an admitted at a murder trial. You know your law, don't you, Steve? Yeah, I know a little. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little cold. <coughs> hello, Steve. Oh, hello, Casey. Nice to see you, boy. Uh, hmm. Uh, go on with your story about the man who was killed, Captain. Uh, uh, you two chaps look kind of strange. Uh, anything upset you? Nothing at all, Steve. No, nothing at all. Denver's the guy who tried to kill you, Casey. He obviously didn't get word to Steve Harold about the things that happened tonight. Now, we worked the gag on Denver now. All right, all set, pal. It ought to work on Denver. <laughs> You say this newspaper guy who was shot spilled the dope he got from the Landel dame? That's right, Denver. Well, it's no break for you, Captain. The courts don't accept that kind of third-hand evidence. You're right again. Oh, well, if only the poor guy was alive. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me a little cold. <clears throat> Hello, Denver. Well, nice to see you again, Casey. Uh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Casey and I had quite a get-together at Parvey's place tonight, Captain. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't spill this on him, but he was in there with the crummiest-looking pickup you've ever seen. 
Nuts to you and your ideas, Logan. Oh, Casey, nuts to you. Your big act? Fell flat with both Denver and Steve Harold, huh, Casey? Yeah, so flat it busted all over the place, Ethelbert. Well, neither of those men could have thought Casey was dead. Both of them are ice-cold characters, but no guilty person could have taken the shock of his appearance without some giveaway reaction. Yeah, you'd think so. They didn't even flicker an eyelash. Either one of... Maybe they was tipped off in advance that it was really poor Moocher who was shot. No, no, no. Logan went over that angle before we made our play. He says a cop on the scene kept everybody away from the body. Nobody got close to it at all except other cops. Besides, after two heavy caliber bullets go through a guy's head, Alphabert, it's uh, sometimes pretty hard to tell who he was. Hmm. Maybe the killer knows by now he didn't get you, Casey, so he'll try again. Oh, that's covered, thank goodness. Captain Logan has assigned two bodyguards to Casey. Hmm. Yeah. A louse. That uh, innocent-looking gray-haired man over in the corner is one. And Sergeant Flanagan is hanging around outside. You know, I just got to find the killer in order to get those guys out of my hair. I can't stand it. Hey. Yeah? Annie, I just remembered something. You know, I've been a dope. Hmm, that's a surprising confession. Hey, look, Edith Landau was about to tell me something when she saw Denver. And then she got scared and stopped cold. She said... Wait a minute, let me see. She said the cops' theories are all wrong. They think Cask was killed, so he couldn't ride fireball. And that's as far as she got. Well, all the original suspicion of Steve Harold was based on the idea that he didn't want fireball to win. Sure. Uh, Ethelbert! Uh, oh, 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 don't, don't oh, bark at me you. like that, Casey. I'm a nervous guy. Certainly are. Well, okay, all right, but look... When did Britt Hutchins leave this joint tonight? Tell me that. Uh, Britt Hutchins? Yes, yes, the, the horse trainer who was on vacation while his stable is racing out west. Why, he, he went out the door right after you did. Ah, then he saw me talking with that girl. He could have seen me going to Follies with her. He could have followed when she left there alone. He, he, he even could have strangled her to death and gotten back to the express building in time to see Moocher get in my car. Then Hutchins could have followed him and thought it was me. But Hutchins was a friend of Cass Marlin's. He, he couldn't no, have... No, no. Friendship in a gambling racket seldom goes deeper than the money pocket. And horse trainers should only take vacations when their horses do. Annie, come on. Where? We're going to tell Logan to find Hutchins. Yeah, Casey... See you later, Ethelbert. No, wait for your gray-haired bodyguard, oh, Casey. Never mind. He needs to... Those bodyguards can't keep up with me. I'll be very happy. There's a cab, Annie. Hey, taxi! Oh, Casey! Annie, come on. I'm shooting you. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, no. Flanagan, get him. Get him. Get him, Casey. No. Let me go. Well, hello, Britt. So you were the guy. And you missed me again. Huh? No, I didn't miss you. I've got a doctor. There's blood all over Casey's head. He's dying. Annie. Annie, I'll bet you two to one. <laughs> that for the second time tonight, the report of my death will be greatly exaggerated. What will you have on your breakfast toast? Orange marmalade where tart and sweet commingle? Or blackberry jam evoking memories of that cool early morning walk through the woods? Apple butter fragrant as an autumn orchard? The ruby flash of currant jelly or strawberry jam? But why choose only one? Serve them all. Grace the breakfast table with a symphony of delicious taste and luscious color. Stir up appetites. Start the morning right. Supply quick energy for an active day. Yes, brighten up the breakfast toast with preserves, jellies, and jams brought to you by those packers of the finest foods, the preserve industry of America. Now, naturally, these experienced packers bring you preserves packed in glass. Clean, sanitary glass safeguards wholesomeness and flavor. Crystal clear glass provides a rainbow of color on your table. Anchor glass containers and modern anchor hawking sealing methods bring you flavor at its peak. Anchor glass containers and anchor caps are both products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. You feel okay? 
okay now, Casey? Oh, no, sure, Ethelbert. That bullet only grazed my forehead. Yeah, well, if it struck you only a half an inch deeper... Well, as Britt Hutchins will tell you, Annie, many a horse has lost a race by half an inch. And I think, as a matter of fact, this bandage is very becoming. <laughs> so is the little hospital nurse who put it on. It isn't, and she wasn't. Uh, Annie, you shouldn't be like that, not to an invalid. Hmm. Tell me, Casey, what did Hutchins have to say when they got him down to headquarters? Well, he confessed that he killed Marlin because his jockey friend had double-crossed him. That was a hard one. You see, he made Cass Marlin a little proposition. And Cass but... was to ride Corn Popper and lose. Yeah. Corn Popper? Yeah. Well, that was the last horse Cass rode before he died. Corn Popper was a comparatively unimportant horse, Ethelbert, in a comparatively unimportant quarter-mile race. So attention was centered on Fireball in the big Alderstone trophy. Well, to cut off the alibis, Ethelbert, instead of riding Corn Popper to lose, as he promised Hutchins, Cass Marlin brought him in first. And Hutchins lost every dollar he'd been able to beg, borrow, or steal. So his feelings were hurt, and he killed Marlin. Cass had told his gal about the play, and she witnessed the shooting. So Hutchins had to get her, too. And when he finally caught up with her, she was being confidential with Casey. Well, you know the rest. Yeah, you better be careful about making pickups from now on, Casey. Mm-hmm. I'll say he had. Oh, I don't know. I, I have my moments. Yeah, but like my sister Edna says, quote, you can never tell when one moment's going to be the next. Oh, no. Yeah, unquote. <laughs> Time Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Deeks. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town. So stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. that gun away, Mr. Harper. Get in the car, do you hear? Well, we'd better do as he says, Jerry. Okay. Not in the back seat, in front. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. I'll kill you both. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Dead Giveaway. The theory that you can judge people by the kind of friends they have is not necessarily true. Take Pam and Jerry North, for example. They have a friend named Clara Kendall. She's not a close friend, true, but she's a friend nevertheless. So what kind of people would you say Pam and Jerry were if you judge them by dowdy, middle-aged Mrs. Kendall as she stands white-faced and trembling, talking on the telephone? But my dear Mrs. Kendall... Don't my dear Mrs. Kendall me, Dr. Cowles. Do you realize that your incompetence has endangered my life? Nonsense, Mrs. Kendall. Your brother... My is... brother is insane. Mrs. Kendall. Dangerously insane. That's why I placed him in your sanitarium, Dr. Cowles. No, Mrs. Kendall, that is not why... You... I'm not going to discuss it with you any further, Doctor. Now, are you going to notify the police of Charles' escape, or aren't you? But it's not necessary to notify... Then I will. Mrs. Kendall, will you please... The fool... Philip? In here, Clara. What was that all about on the telephone? It was Dr. Cowles. Cowles? Oh, yes, the sanitarium fellow. What did he want? Not more money, I hope. Philip, 
Charles has escaped. Oh, no. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think Charles likes it there. Philip. I can't say I blame him. The Middle West never appealed to me as a place This to... is no joking matter, Philip. Charles has been gone two days. He could be here in New York by now. Oh, why in the world would he want to come here? He hates me. Well, what do you expect? You have the poor old devil declared mentally irresponsible. You have him committed to an institution. Then you get control of his money. <laughs> Do you think he should love you for that? My goodness, Clara, you can't have everything. Stop it, Philip, stop it. Charles is dangerous, you know that. I know nothing of the kind. The worst thing I know about him is that he slobbers when he eats. If he ever gets the chance, he'll kill me. Oh, Clara. He will. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Where's my coat? Are you going out? Yes. Where? Just out. I have an appointment. A business appointment? Oh, don't be bitter, dear. Please, Philip, don't go. Don't leave me here in this apartment alone with Charles. For oh, heaven's sake, Clara, stop being so silly. Charles isn't within a thousand miles of here. They'll find him just the way they did before, curled up, sound asleep in a haystack not two miles from the sanitarium. Now, look, I'm already late, so... What time will you be home? I'm not sure. Late, probably. Will you be here for dinner? No, I... Philip! Oh, for... <laughs> Let go of me, Clara. Clara, let go. Please, Philip, stay home with me. I'm frightened. Let go. Now, will you please... I know where you're going, Philip. I know. You're going to see her. Her? Who? Vivian. Vivian? Yes, Vivian. Vivian Ames. You didn't think I knew, did you? But I do. I know all about... You don't know anything because there's nothing to know. You're a liar. And you're a silly, suspicious, neurotic old woman. Why, you... Get don't... out! Do you hear me? Get out! Yes, I hear you. Then pack your things. You keep them, Clara. You paid for them. Don't think you're ever going to come crawling back. Oh, don't worry, Clara. You haven't got that much money. <laughs> oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? Yes? Uh, this is Pam North, Mrs. Kendall. I-, I wonder if I could drop by and talk to you for a few minutes. Oh, what about? Uh, about serving with me on the finance committee of the Women's Club. Uh, I'd like to make it around four o'clock, if, if that's convenient for you. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I couldn't see you today. I... Mrs. Kendall? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I thought I heard something... Um, what time did you say you wanted to see me? Well, about four o'clock. Uh, but if you can't... No, no, it. no. Four o'clock will be fine. I'd love to see you. Oh, that's awfully nice of you. Bye. Goodbye. I didn't hear anything. I couldn't have. I... I just didn't... Let... I did. Someone came in. Philip, he came back to... Philip? Is that you, Philip? No, Clara. It isn't Philip. Charles! Hello, Clara. Charles! Go on, Philip. Then what happened? Oh, nothing, darling. Clara told me to get out. I took her at her word. Here I am. And you didn't admit anything about us? Of course not, Vivian. Well, then, it probably isn't as serious as you think. I wouldn't be surprised if Clara's calling all over town right now, frantically trying to find you to ask you to come home. Well, it won't do her any good if she is. I'm through. Now, Phil. I am, Vivian. I mean it. For the first time in four years, I feel like a young man. You are young, darling. But you don't feel young married to a woman nearly 15 years older than you are. When she pays your way, you don't even feel like a man, young or old. All right, Philip. So you're through. Now what happens? When Clara gets a divorce, we'll be married. On what? I'll get a job. Doing what? Well, you sound like you think I can't get one. Oh, of course you can. You'll have to. But what kind of a job will it be? And how much will it pay? Well, how should I know? Then I'll tell you, Philip. Based on your business experience so far, you could make 
$50 a week, if you're lucky. At that rate, we could just about pay the rent on this apartment. Of course, we couldn't eat, buy any clothes. Well, or... We wouldn't have to live like this. But I like living like this. And if I can't pay for it any longer, you'll find someone who can. <laughs> I thought you loved me. I did. When you were a man. A man? Yes, Philip. That's what Clara's money made you. A smart, attractive, self-assured man. I don't care what you felt like. That's what you were. Well, now look at you. Without her money, you're nothing but a frightened little boy. I'm sorry, Philip, but there's no use kidding ourselves. No. <laughs> no, I guess not. Now, look, darling. Go back to Clara. You can. She'll take you back. I know she will. And then we no. can go on. All right, Philip. But you're being a fool. Maybe. Where are you going, Philip? I'll be back. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. The candles are in 318. Oh, thank you. Here we are. Turn to your left, third apartment on your right. Thank you very much. Fourteen, three sixteen, three eight. Well, that's funny. Door's open. She must be in. Mrs. Kendall. Where in the world could she be? Anybody home? Mrs. Kendall, uh, are you here? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? Oh! Mrs. Kendall! Mrs. Kendall! Hello? Jerry! Oh, hello, darling. Oh, Jerry, something horrible has happened. Pam, what's the matter? Call Bill Wagon and get over here as soon as you can. Over where? Clara Kendall's apartment. Oh, what is it? What's happened? Clara Kendall's been murdered. What? S strangled, I think. I, I had an appointment with her, and when I got here, the door was open. I walked in and I saw her lying on the... Pam. Pam. Jerry. Darling, I just heard a noise. There's someone else in the apartment. There's someone... No! Pam! <laughs> Sure, I got a pass key to the Kendall apartment, but that don't mean I can let in just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Can't who... you get it through your head that Mrs. Kendall's been murdered? That's what you said. And something's happened to my wife. Here's the third floor. Come on. Look, mister, I think we ought to call the police. Oh, but I told you I've already called them. Or my secretary did. They'll be here in a minute. Now, are you going to unlock the Kendall apartment, or do I have to take okay, the Okay, buddy, okay. Let's go. This is the key. Here's 318. Open it. Okay, okay. Hurry, will you? I'm hurrying. There. Pam! There's the telephone. Pam! Hung up just like it should be. Oh, well, come on. Let's look in. Hold it. What? Listen. I don't hear Quiet. any. No. That's Pam. Pam! Sounds like she's in that hall closet. No. The key's in the door. Pam, darling. Are you all right? Just hold me for a minute, darling. Shall I... Oh. Oh, darling. I've never been so frightened in my life. What happened, sweetheart? I was talking to you. I, I heard something. I, I started to turn around. Someone grabbed me from behind and dragged me into this closet and locked me in. Did you see who it was? No. It was a man. That's all I know. Where's Clara Kendall? In, in the living room. Well, let's go in and... Jerry! Bill! Hey, what's all the excitement? Well, didn't Jerry tell you on the phone? I had Miss Brown call while I got over here, Pam. And uh, all Miss Brown said was for me to get to this address right away. There's been a murder, Bill. It's Clara Kendall, a friend of mine in the woman's club. She's been strangled, Bill. I, I found her body. It it's on the couch in the living room. Well, let's have a look. Right. This way. There 
she is. On the couch over by the whip. Bill. Jerry. She's gone. Well, what are you standing there looking at me like that for? You, you can see for yourself she's gone. We've got to do something. Is uh, this the couch she was on, Pam? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. You don't think I imagined it, do you? Oh, of course not, dear. Well, you, you could at least say it with a little more conviction, Jerry. Clara Kendall is dead, I tell you. And I didn't imagine it any more than I imagined that someone grabbed me and locked me in that closet. Well, let's have a look around the apartment. The telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Philip? No, this is the police. Police? Who's calling? I, I'm Vivian Ames, a friend of the Kendall's. What are the police doing there? What, what's happened? Well, we're not sure, Miss Ames, but we think Mrs. Kendall's been murdered. What? Oh, you... You're joking. Clara can't be dead. Oh, how do you know? Because she just walked out of my apartment not five minutes ago. That's all I can tell you, Lieutenant. What time did Mrs. Kendall arrive here at your apartment, Miss Ames? About four. That's impossible. Well, it, it might have been a little after four. It's I don't... still impossible. Damn, dear. Well, it is, Jerry. At four o'clock, Kara Kendall was lying no, on No, no, no. Take it easy, Pam. Oh, that must be Philip. Mrs. Kendall's husband? Yes. I, I took the liberty of calling him at his hotel after you said you were coming to talk to me. I hope I didn't do wrong. No, not at all. <laughs> Excuse me. Bill, that woman's lying. Please. She Pam. is, Jerry. She must Let be. Let me handle this, Pam. Uh... Philip, this is Lieutenant Wigand. Hello, Mr. Kendall. And you know Mr. and Mrs. North. Hello, Bill. Oh, yes, hello, hello Pam. Pam. Jerry? <laughs> now, what's this wild story Vivian gave me on the telephone? Well, Pam says she saw your wife lying in the living room of your apartment strangled to death. Now, Miss Ames says your wife was here in her apartment at about the same time Pam says she saw the body. Well, obviously, someone is mistaken. Or oh, lying. Well, why should I lie about a thing? Uh, like just that? a moment, Miss Ames. Well, I assume you searched the apartment, Lieutenant? Of course. But uh, someone could have carried the body out of the apartment, uh, out the back way, while I was locked in the closet. Locked in the closet? Just after Pam saw Clara's body, some man grabbed her and locked her in the closet. Uh, Mr. Kendall, Miss Ames says she called you at your hotel. Now, uh, does that mean that you and your wife had well, a... Clara and I had a quarrel, that's all. Uh, it must have been rather a serious quarrel if you moved out. Oh, but it wasn't not really. That's... Well, that's why Clara came to see me. To see if I knew where Philip was so she could get in touch with him and make up. And you told her where Mr. Kendall was? Yes. And she said she'd call him right after she kept her date with her brother. What? Her, her brother? Well, that's where she was going when she left here. Good Lord. What's the matter, Bill? Clara must be out of her mind. To see your brother? Yes. You don't understand, Lieutenant. Charles Harper's been in a private sanitarium, a, a mental institution in the Midwest. Mm. We just found out today that he'd gone away from the place two days ago. Is he dangerous? Oh, he is to Clara. She's the one who had to have him committed. He hates her for it. Once he threatened to kill her. Then why should she make a date to meet him? I don't know. We've got to do something. Yeah, well, there's only one thing we can do. I'm going to headquarters and get out a bulletin on Harper. Uh, Jerry, you and Pam take Kendall to his apartment. Okay, Bill. And you can give me a description of your brother-in-law on the way downstairs, Kendall. All right, Lieutenant. I'm coming with you, Philip. Oh, come on, Pam. Let's... Hey, Pam, what's the matter? Darling, this is crazy. Everyone's acting as though Clara Kendall was still alive. Oh, sweetheart, isn't it barely possible that you were mistaken? Jerry, you mean you're taking Vivian Ames' word against mine, even though you've got proof that she's lying? What proof have I got? What proof? For heaven's sake, didn't you hear me when, when I told you she was? <laughs> Up right in front, Jerry. Right. Clara's got to be home. She, she has to be. Please, Philip, you mustn't get your... But if anything happened to her, I'll never... It's her car. What? It's her car. The one right ahead of us. It's Clara's. You sure? Well, it's just like hers. Well, let's have a look. Then maybe Clara's home. Maybe she stayed. And maybe she didn't drive the car today. But she did. She told me she was driving. It is Clara's. That's her license number. Yes, it's Clara's. She's in it. What do you mean, Jerry? Look on the floor of the back seat. 
Oh, Jerry. Clara. Clara! No, Phil, don't touch her. She's dead. Close the door. Now, look, Philip. Go up to your apartment and call Bill Wigan. Pam and I'll wait here. Oh, all right, Jerry. Uh, you'd better go with him, Miss Ames. Oh, yes. All right. Go, go. You see, darling, I was right. Clara was killed up in the apartment and, and then carried down to the car while I was locked in the closet. That still doesn't jibe with Vivian Ames' story about seeing Clara after you found her. I don't care. Vivian Ames... Oh, hold is... it, hold it, dear. We've uh, got company. Excuse me, but you're in my way. I want to get in my car. <laughs> Your, your car? Yes, mine. Mine. It's my car. Everything she owns is mine. She? This car, her apartment, everything. It all belongs to me. She stole it from me. My money. She stole it. Now, get out of my way. I'm sorry, Mr. Harper. How but do it... you know my name? Well, we don't, but... You call me Mr. Harper. Why do you call me Mr. Harper if you don't know who I am? Now, look, we... You're from there, aren't you? Uh, there? That place. The sanitarium. That's where you're from. Yeah, she lied to me. She said I didn't have to go back. And I won't. I won't. Oh, take it easy, Mr. Harper. You don't... Look out, Jerry. I won't. Put that gun away, Mr. Harper. We're not Be going... Be careful, darling. Get in the car. Now, now wait a minute. Get you... in. Uh, we'd better do as he says, No, Jerry. not in there. In the front seat. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. <laughs> All right, I'll be right over. Thank you, Lieutenant. I mixed you a drink, darling. Here. I don't want it. Now, don't be nervous, darling. I'm not nervous. Oh, but you are. All right. All right, so I'm nervous. Why shouldn't I be? We took a big chance moving Claire's body down to the car, running the risk of Pam North spotting me as the guy who locked her in the closet. We had to give you an alibi for the time Clara was killed, didn't we? I'm not sure we have. Pam knows you're lying about seeing Claire at four o'clock. And Jerry and Lieutenant Wigan probably know it, too. Well, they don't know anything they can prove. And Unless, of course, you really didn't see Clara's brother leave the apartment this afternoon. Did you see him, Charles? I told you I did. You told me a lot of things, but... But what? Oh, for heaven's sake, Philip. You know you can trust me, so why don't you be honest? Why don't you admit you killed Clara? But... Don't you ever say that again, Vivian. You understand? Don't you ever say that again. Jerry, we're going much too fast. Please, slow down. Don't talk to me, darling. You know as well as I do that the man who's really driving this car is in the back seat. And every time I try to slow down... Faster, I'll really... drive faster. You see? Oh, please. Uh, Mr. Harper, we're going too fast already. This road is like a sheet of glass, Harper. Do as I say, go faster. If we ever start to skid, Harper, we'll all... Jerry, be... Jerry, we're skidding. You're telling me... Oh, stop, Jerry, stop. I can't stop at this time. Jerry, we're going to... Look out, Pam. Ah! Jerry. Pam, darling, are you all right? Uh, I think so. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay. Here, let me help you out. Uh, oh, easy now. Uh, I'll be all right as soon as I stop shaking. Uh, Hopper. Darling, you may be hurt pretty badly. Look, there's a gasoline station up ahead. Get up there and get some help and then call Bill. Right. I'll stay here with Hopper. <laughs> through, please. Now, come on, folks. Stand back. Stand back. Let us through. Uh, here we are, Bill. Oh, over this way, Miss Ames. Come on, Kendall. Well, you've got yourself quite a crowd here, haven't you? Yeah, everybody loves an accident, Bill. Where's Harper? On his way to the hospital. How badly was he hurt? He'll live. I hope so. At least long enough to pay for Clara's murder. But he says he didn't kill Clara. Did you talk to him? Yes, Bill, while we were waiting for the ambulance. Harper says he saw Clara just after Philip left the apartment at two this afternoon. She told him she wouldn't have him sent back to the sanitarium. And if he came back about five, she'd have a certified check for the money she took from him. He's lying. He killed Clara because he's the only one who could have killed her after she left my apartment. Uh, Miss Ames, if you saw Clara Kendall after four o'clock this afternoon, uh, why did you call her apartment? You mean when I answered the phone, Pam? Yes. 
called to talk to Philip. But you told us before that you knew Philip had quarreled with Clara and, and gone to a hotel. Well, I... So you knew Philip wouldn't be at the apartment, didn't you? Well, Miss Ames? All right, Lieutenant. Uh, Mrs. North wins. I, I didn't see Clara this afternoon. I just said I did to protect Philip. Philip? Well, he went back to the apartment at 3 o'clock and found Clara dead. He telephoned me. I, I went over. Charles Harper had killed her. We knew that, but... Philip didn't have an alibi for the time she was killed, and well, after that stupid fight he and Clara had, I was afraid the police would think he was the murderer. So the only thing to do was move Clara's body and try to make it look as though she'd been killed later. So you're the man who grabbed Pam and locked her in the closet, huh, Phil? Yes. Well, we knew she was going to be there at four, and well, we thought we could get Clara's body out before then, but we couldn't. That's why I had a lie about Clara being my apartment. How did you know I was going to see Clara at four, Miss Ames? Well, Philip told me. Well, then Charles Harper didn't kill Clara. How do you figure that, Pam? Because Clara would have been dead when Philip went back to the apartment at three o'clock. She was? Oh, oh, no, she wasn't. She was alive. Alive enough to tell you that I was going to be there at four. She's the only one who could have told you that. <laughs> oh, you fool. Why didn't you tell me Clara had... Shut up. Shut up. It's all your fault. I didn't want Clara's money. But you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Come on, Kendall. And you too, Miss Ames. What are you arresting me for? You'll probably be charged with being an accessory after the fact. And that's a mighty polite name for your kind of woman. <laughs> Mr. North speaking. Oh, hello, it's Jerry. Oh, hello, dear. Darling, on your way home this evening, will you stop in a stationery store and buy me a bookkeeping ledger? A bookkeeping ledger? Oh, what for? I was re-elected chairman of the finance committee of the Women's Club, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, we're starting a new fiscal year, so I'll need a new ledger and a bottle of black ink. Black a... ink, huh? Well, it sounds like you did a good job of managing the club's finances. And the other thing I want... Uh, I wish you could do as well with our personal finances, dear. We've never wound up in the black at the end of the year. Jerry, dear, will you let me tell you the other thing I'll need? Uh, how, how do you account for it, Pam? Why can't you manage our money just as well as you manage your clubs? But I do, darling. Uh, what do you mean? That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'll need a bottle of red ink, too. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. 